This is Audible. Tantor Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Luminous by Noelle Marie. Narrated by Sarah Mollo Christensen. Chapter 1 Warmth. An overwhelming sort of heat that licked at her skin and burned her from the inside out. It caused little beads of perspiration to form on the back of her neck and wayward strains of hair to stick to her slick forehead. It had taken Catherine months to get used to this strange comfort that was waking up encased in the arms of a living, breathing furnace— said Furnace's nose was currently buried in her hair, digging into her scalp as the scruff of his half-formed beard brushed along the sensitive skin of one of her shoulders. After tightening his arms around her in a single light squeeze, however, he was pulling away. Bastion, Catherine whined. Waking up in Bastion's arms had been comforting, anyway, until he'd started getting up at the crack of dawn. It had been going on for weeks. Catherine forced her heavy eyelids open and confirmed the fact that not even the slightest hint of the sun's yellow and orange rays were attempting to peek in through the bedroom window's shuttered blinds. In a half-hearted attempt to keep Bastion from getting out of the massive bed they shared, Catherine turned and burrowed her head into the juncture of the man's neck, her arms moving to wrap themselves around his torso. Or, at least as much of his muscled chest as she was able. "'Stay,' she demanded petulantly, lips brushing against his hot skin as she spoke. "'Catherine,' Bastion sighed, her name sounding strained as it left his mouth. Like they'd had this discussion before. They had. Pretty much every morning for the past handful of weeks. He gently carted his fingers through her hair— Please. She didn't even care how pathetic she sounded as the word escaped her mouth. She pressed her lips to his skin on purpose this time, nipping at his neck with her teeth. She smirked when she felt his stomach tighten, the hand running its fingers through her hair coming to an abrupt halt. She peered up at him defiantly, glinting green eyes connecting with intense blue. Do you have to go? she asked. All you do is work. Disappointment threatened to swallow her whole when instead of giving in to her admittedly underhanded tactics, Bastion just inhaled the lungful of air before slowly letting it out. He freed his hand from her hair. You know I'd rather be here with you, he pointed out reasonably. It didn't seem that way to her. As head Alpha, there are duties I have to attend to. You know this, he added softly, brushing a strand of hair still plastered to her sticky forehead behind one of her ears. Catherine fought the urge to bat his hand away. What about your duties to me? she said instead, blatantly challenging him. She purposely peeked her tongue out, licking her bottom lip with the tip as she stared him down. Bastion stiffened, and she watched with satisfaction as his eyes immediately zeroed in on the action, his pupils dilating until she didn't know where they ended and his irises began. Are you saying that I don't please you? he asked, voice gravelly in his disbelief. Catherine pressed her lips together, mouth suddenly too dry to speak. She did, however, manage to shake her head back and forth. Bastion leaned in until his nose was mere inches from hers. That's not what you were saying last night, he teased. If I really wanted, I could have you on your belly again, moaning my name within seconds. Catherine dared to inch forward, her fingers running up and down Bastion's side as she leaned in far enough to whisper in his ear. Prove it. She pulled away her eyes once again flickering upward to meet Bastion's, but he was already moving. His mouth crashed onto hers just as green met blue. Catherine didn't have time to bask in her victory before heady arousal overtook her senses. A fire burned in her belly as Bastion demanded entrance into her mouth, probing at the soft cavity with his tongue. 
as one hand held her head in place, like she was going to go anywhere anytime soon. The other grabbed at the bottom of the oversized T-shirt she was currently using as pajamas. The shirt was Bastion's, and hung nearly to her knees when she was standing, but Bastion had the material hitched up over her thighs in seconds. She wasn't wearing anything under the shirt, and with nothing to get in his way, Bastion quickly found the heated juncture between her thighs. He palmed her there, ignoring her breathy moan into his mouth as he— Knock, knock, knock. Catherine nearly jumped out of her skin at the sudden vigorous knocking on their bedroom door, and whatever arousal she'd been feeling shriveled away into nothing when the door opened a moment later to reveal Marcus. He stood there, seemingly frozen in shock for a second before a lewd grin spread across his face. He looked seconds away from outright laughter as he rested one of his shoulders against the doorway. Catherine could feel the beginnings of a growl vibrate in Bastion's chest as the man all but sprang on top of her, covering her body with his despite the fact that she was still wearing his T-shirt. It was a little ridiculous, really, considering the general lack of privacy amongst the pack. They woke up stark naked next to each other once a month. Nudity wasn't exactly sacred. Ever heard of knocking? Bastion demanded tersely, apparently unwilling to move a muscle from his position as her human shield, despite its inherent inanity. I did, Marcus pointed out, unimpressed by Bastion's sour mood, judging by the way he raised both his eyebrows. No doubt he thought Bastion's actions were as silly as Catherine did. Bastion rolled his eyes. Well, since you didn't have the patience to wait for an answer to your knocking, the like-a-sensible person was heavily implied. Kindly look away before I rid you of your eyesight altogether. Too late, Marcus retorted. My retinas are already burning from what they've seen. He obligingly turned around nonetheless. Did you forget that the meeting was this morning, or what? He asked a moment later, all too eager to change the subject. Bastion adjusted himself, covering Catherine with a blanket before standing and beginning to get dressed. He met her gaze, eyes sparkling with mischief, as he pulled on a pair of pants. Hardly, he drawled. Then what, you enjoy making me wake up at the ass crack of dawn while you take your sweet old time getting ready? How can he not when you're so pleasant to deal with this time of day? Catherine quipped. Marcus didn't swivel around to face her, but released an amused-sounding snort as he continued to stare out into the dark hallway. Same thing could be said about you, princess. She childishly stuck out her tongue at his back. All right, I'm ready, Bastion said, and Catherine redirected her attention back to him. He leaned over the bed, smoothing her hair back with a gentle hand. Try to get some more sleep, okay? Catherine folded her arms across her chest, watching with irritated eyes as he crossed the room to meet Marcus, who'd finally turned back around and was waiting for him. Fine, Catherine spat, gathering as much of the bed covers as she could in her arms before flopping around, turning her back on the two jackasses. Logically, she knew that she was acting like a spoiled brat, but she couldn't bring herself to care. Especially when the soft sound of the door clicking shut behind Bastion reached her ears. Stupid, ridiculous tears gathered in her eyes, and she angrily blinked them away. She didn't know what was wrong with her lately. Bastion's presence had always invigorated her, but she'd never been so anxious about his absence before. In fact, lately all she wanted to do was be around the man and bask in his comforting presence. It was absurd. Catherine had always prided herself on being an independent person, so the downright clinginess she'd been displaying lately was probably more embarrassing for her than it was annoying for Bastion. The man didn't seem inconvenienced at all, in fact, which only made it doubly frustrating. Closing her eyes as tightly shut as she could, Catherine attempted to force thoughts of Bastion from her mind and obediently tried to sleep. No matter what way she arranged the blankets around herself, however, their warmth wasn't the same as the heat that projected from Bastion's body, 
and an hour and a half of tossing and turning later, Catherine begrudgingly admitted defeat. Pulling back the layers of sheets and blankets she'd covered herself with, she got out of bed. After taking a moment to stretch her arms, she headed in the direction of the bathroom, intent on shedding her crummy mood with a nice, relaxing bath. Once she'd adjusted the faucet so that hot water was spurting into the tub, she pulled Bastion's oversized T-shirt over her head and stepped into the giant whirlpool tub, turning on the jets and sinking into the steaming water. When the water was shoulder level, she turned off the faucets and allowed the warm water to relax her tense muscles. She once again attempted to clear her mind. Unfortunately, such a task was easier said than done. In the quiet of the bathroom, Catherine couldn't help but fixate on the strange changes that not only her mood had been suffering lately, but her body as well. Mostly her stomach. While she'd never had quite the appetite that Bastion and Marcus always showcased at mealtimes, lately her enthusiasm for food had been practically non-existent. She had to force herself to eat at meals when she felt Sophie's appraising gaze on the side of her head or spied Caleb's concerned glances. Besides her increased amour with Bastion and her lack of appetite, apparently her natural scent was off as well. She smelled weird, basically. At least according to one member of the pack. What are you doing? Zane was sitting next to Catherine on the couch for their weekly study session. Bastion was adamant that although school may have been over for her, she continued to learn and take in as much information as she could about the werewolf society she found herself an important member of. And who better to teach her than the resident know-it-all, Zane? The man had positioned himself strangely close to her today, though. Instead of his usual perch on the other side of the sofa, the least touchy member of the pack was crowding her by sitting on the middle cushion— his leg pressed against hers, and his nose all but poking into her shoulder as he breathed in as deeply as he could. Zane frowned, pulling away at Catherine's question, but seemingly unconcerned about being called out for his odd behavior. You smell funny, he informed her bluntly. Catherine blinked. Yes, because you always smell like a peach, she sassed. Not at all like a canine who regularly rolls around in his own filth. Oh, wait. Zane shrugged, rolling his eyes at the dog joke. I didn't say you smelled bad, just different. Catherine attempted to discreetly lift her arm and sniff under the pit. It was an unsuccessful endeavor, judging by the way Zane amusedly raised an eyebrow. Regardless, she didn't smell anything inordinate, just faint traces of her usual deodorant and shampoo. Well, I smell fine to me. Like I said, you don't smell bad. Just different. Sweeter, I guess. He rubbed the back of his neck in sudden discomfort. At Catherine's raised brow, he continued. Your scent isn't as floral as usual. More citrusy or something. I don't know. You smell riper, maybe? Riper? she asked incredulously, feeling the telltale signs of heat creeping up her face. Zane huffed. Yeah, I know. It's weird. It draws me in and makes me want to be closer to you. At Catherine's alarmed look, he cringed. Jesus, not like that. Just... He leaned forward. The front door's hinges squeaked loudly as they were pushed open, and Zane jolted away from her. Caleb came strolling through them, arms laden with at least three or four bags of fresh produce from Haven Falls's farmer's market. Catherine hid a grin behind her hand at Zane's reaction to the sudden noise. He'd clearly thought that it would be Bastion who came walking in through the door. Zane spotted the smile, and he scowled at the humor she found in the situation. Here, let me help you with those, Catherine said to Caleb rising from the couch and shooting Zane one last amused look before leaving her pouting tutor and the subject of her change in scent behind her. That had been close to a week ago. And although Zane hadn't brought up the strange change in her aroma again, 
The odd expression Bastion sometimes wore when he dug his nose into her hair made her think that maybe he, and the others, noticed it too. As peculiar as it was, that wasn't the only odd development. And it wasn't nearly as concerning as what else had happened. Or, rather, what had not happened. Catherine had been looking forward to the group hunt for weeks. Besides the animals she would sometimes chase down during the full moon, she'd only been out hunting once before. It was with Bastion, but it had only been for practice. All they'd tracked were small animals, rabbits and squirrels. Two days ago was supposed to have been her first time out hunting with the entire pack. Eager, are we? Catherine rolled her eyes at Marcus's special brand of teasing, but didn't bother to deny it. How could she when her body was practically thrumming in suppressed excitement? She'd been positively giddy since Bastion had announced the day before that the town butcher was running low on meat and that they'd be going on a group hunt in an effort to down some large game per his request. She could already feel the rush of endorphins, the explosion of adrenaline running through her veins as she chased her imagined prey. She could sense the power encased in her limbs as they moved in sync beneath her, could envision her teeth sinking into the jugular of some unsuspecting deer. Maybe even a moose. Catherine wasn't one to take pleasure in killing things, but the excitement of the hunt was something that catered to her wolf's baser instincts. Besides, they weren't just killing animals for the sake of killing them. They filleted every last scrap of meat from the ones they downed, and they used said meat to sustain the pack. Or the entire colony, in this instance, if most of the meat was going to be sent off to Haven Falls's butcher. At the moment, she and the rest of the pack were gathered outside of the prince house, they were in the backyard near the tree line of the surrounding forest and moments away from transforming and beginning the hunt. Remember, no one gives chase without my express permission, Bastion spoke, forcing Catherine to concentrate on his words instead of the overwhelming anticipation building in her belly. It's best to have our prey completely surrounded before anyone lunges. Caleb and Sophie... I want you to latch onto and immobilize the legs while the rest of us aim for the neck and upper torso. He turned towards her. Catherine, I need you to stay with me for the most part. Try to copy my movements when the time comes to attack, okay? Catherine was a little annoyed, but understood that her cooperation was needed for the success of the hunt, so she just nodded. Well, what are we waiting for? Marcus asked a moment later. The man showcased his own eagerness to get on with it when, without further ado, he stripped down to his boxer shorts before shifting, his body morphing into that of a wolf's. He raised his snout high into the air and released an excited howl. Zane, Sophie, and Caleb followed suit. Attempting to force away the sudden onset of jitters that threatened to overtake her, Catherine closed her eyes and inhaled a lungful of oxygen before slowly releasing it. When she opened her eyes again, Bastion was in front of her, his face mere inches from hers. "'You can do this,' he murmured encouragingly before stepping forward and nuzzling his stubbled cheek against her smooth one. After bestowing a quick kiss to the tip of her nose, he tugged off his clothes and transformed. "'You can do this,' Catherine repeated the words to herself before stripping down to her underwear. She closed her eyes again this time urging her inner wolf to surface and for her body to shift. After a handful of seconds had ticked by and nothing happened, not even the slightest twinge in her spine, something disconcerting twisted in Catherine's gut. She squeezed her eyes even more tightly shut, clenching her hands into fists until the dull edges of her fingernails were digging into her palms. But still, nothing happened. It was like she couldn't access a part of herself. The wolf part. One minute passed, then two. She opened her eyes, taking in the group of wolves who were staring at her in confusion. I don't, she stuttered, choking on the words. I mean... Bastion wasted no time transforming back into his human form. Ignoring his nudity altogether, 
not that Catherine was complaining, even if she wasn't in the right frame of mind to really appreciate it. He stepped into her space, placing his hands on her bare shoulders. What's wrong? he demanded, a worried frown tugging at his mouth. I don't know. I... I can't... Something resembling panic made the words impossible to access, and while Catherine had never had a panic attack before, she imagined that suffering one felt something like this. Her chest felt too tight, and she could feel her heart battering itself against her ribcage as her constricted lungs refused to expand to take in air. The hands on her shoulders were suddenly on either side of her face, incredibly tender, despite Bastion's obvious alarm as he forced her to look at him. Breathe, he demanded sharply. It was as if her body had no choice but to obey the hasty command, and she gasped, taking in a painful lungful of air. She took another breath, and another, and slowly felt her panic begin to subside. A sharp whistle from Bastion had her confused packmates shifting back into their human forms. What? Marcus grouched as he got to his feet. Don't tell me that nerves are seriously getting the best of her. Bastion glared, baring his teeth at the man in a threatening manner. Marcus backed down, but Catherine suspected it had more to do with the fact that the man had caught sight of her crestfallen expression, more than that he was actually intimidated by Bastion's blunt incisors. "'What's going on?' Sophie asked. Bastion didn't answer, and Catherine quickly realized it was because he didn't know either. She swallowed around a non-existent lump in her throat. I... I can't shift. What? Really? Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure, Catherine snapped, immediately feeling guilty in the tense silence that followed. It's like it... She... Isn't there, she attempted to explain. My wolf. They stared. Zane hesitantly spoke up after Bastion turned his probing gaze onto him. Catherine supposed that if anyone had any useful information on her apparent inability to shift, it'd be him. I guess it could be considered a somewhat normal setback among bitten wolves to fail to voluntarily transform even after they've accomplished it before. It sounded more like a guess than anything. Besides, it had been months since Catherine had first learned. Over half a year, even. Her first time voluntarily shifting into a wolf was when Cain had attacked her last winter. It was August, now. That hardly seemed like a normal setback to her. Nevertheless, she turned her eyes to Caleb, the only other bitten wolf in the pack. Did you ever... she began but trailed off at his sheepish shake of the head. No, he admitted. But, like Zane said, it's probably completely normal, he immediately added when her shoulders slumped in defeat. Right? I think so, Zane reiterated. Bastion spoke up a moment later. Go without us. The disappointment everyone felt at the order was obvious, but no one's was as clearly painted on his or her face as Catherine's, and not a single one of her packmates said a word in protest. She watched as Marcus, Zane, Sophie, and Caleb transformed back into their wolf forms, the ease at which they shifted convincing her further that what had happened, or hadn't happened, in any case, wasn't normal. Something resembling trepidation swirled in her belly— it was a feeling she hadn't experienced in a long time, at least not at this level. In fact, the last time she could recall feeling it so intently was nearly a year ago, when she'd been staring into the light-filled windows of the abandoned house at the end of Miller Road. It was stupid, Catherine knew, but she couldn't help but think that between her lack of appetite, the strange change in her natural scent— and the mental block she'd experienced when she had tried to shift, something was drastically wrong with her. What if she was losing her supernatural abilities? What, what if her inner wolf was disappearing altogether, 
and she was slowly morphing back into a normal human. It was an impossibility, surely, but Catherine didn't know what else to think. She grew distraught at the thought of it, tearing up at the idea of the connection she shared with Bastion and the rest of her pack fading away into nothing. What in the world? Attempting to shake off the flood of emotion suddenly threatening to do her in, Catherine dunked her head under the water. She stayed there, submersed in the bath until her lungs began to burn in their desire for oxygen. She broke free of the water's surface, gasping for air. As soon as she'd successfully caught her breath, she dragged herself out of the tub and pulled its plug. The water was getting tepid anyway. Since clearing her mind was proving to be a hopeless endeavor, Catherine chose to focus on Bastion's strangely busy schedule instead of the weird upheaval her body had been experiencing lately as she dried herself off with a towel. He'd been gone a lot lately, meeting with the community's Council of Alphas close to every other day, instead of the usual get-together once every couple of weeks. Whenever she asked him the reason for the increase in meetings, however— he only assured her that everything was fine. Right. Probably about as fine as her not being able to voluntarily shift. At any rate, she was sure that whatever the reason behind the influx in meetings, it was something much more important than her sudden reluctance to be away from Bastion, or the onset of turbulent emotions making her alternately as angry as a bull or as clingy as an eight-armed octopus. Once she was dry, Catherine wrapped the towel around her damp hair before using a hand to wipe away the condensation that had formed on the bathroom mirror. She stared at her reflection, at her pale skin and the way it contrasted starkly with her dark hair, at her small, nondescript nose. Mostly, she stared into her own eyes, watching as they sparkled determinedly back at her. She made a promise to herself right then and there— even if she couldn't figure out what was going on with her, she could, and would, find out exactly what it was that was going on with Bastion. Chapter 2 It was an unfortunate fact that Catherine wasn't exactly known for her investigative skills, at least not her subtle investigative skills, Taking that into consideration, she decided to give Bastion one more chance to explain the sudden surge of council meetings he'd been forced to preside over before taking matters into her own hands. Despite the meetings steadily increasing in number over the past month, the length they lasted seemed to be decreasing, with the latest one only lasting an hour. Catherine wasn't sure whether the shorter meetings meant that Bastion and the Council were getting closer to finding a solution to whatever it was that was bothering them, or if Bastion was simply growing more and more riled at the lack of a solution. Judging by the moods he often returned home in, Catherine thought it safe to assume that the second scenario was closer to the truth. Either way, she figured that if the pattern held true, he'd be home sooner rather than later. After pulling on a pair of jeans and throwing a three-quarter sleeved shirt over her head, she managed to drag herself out of the bedroom and into the kitchen. After all, the sun was up now, and even if no other sane person was, she knew that Caleb probably would be, making himself busy in the kitchen as usual. She was right, of course. The smell of sizzling fat hit Catherine's nose immediately, causing her to wrinkle it in disgust. Caleb was frying what looked like a couple dozen strips of bacon on the stovetop, and the heavy aroma of grease permeating the air made her stomach churn. He was the only person in the kitchen, and Catherine assumed that the remaining members of the pack, Sophie and Zane, were still nestled away in their bedrooms, sleeping. Like normal people. "'Good morning, Catherine,' Caleb greeted her cheerfully, waving at her with the spatula he was wielding and completely oblivious to her reaction to the nauseating smell emerging from the stovetop. "'Well, it's morning,' she agreed, less joyously, shuffling to the refrigerator in search of something to drink. She poured herself a tall glass of orange juice before taking a seat at the kitchen table. "'You hungry?' he asked over his shoulder, 
not waiting for an answer before continuing. The bacon's almost done. How many pieces do you want? Uh... She was saved from having to answer by the sound of the front entryway bursting open, double doors banging against adjacent walls. Both she and Caleb startled at the sudden noise, and their attention was immediately directed to the source of it. She took in the forms of Bastion and Marcus, freshly back from the council meeting. They were home even earlier than Catherine had anticipated. She caught sight of the dark expression cast across Bastion's face— when he spotted her, however, he quickly attempted to disguise it, forcing the wrinkles of his brow to smooth over and his snarl-like frown to lift into something more closely resembling a grimace as he nodded at her. Marcus, ignoring the tension radiating off the man completely, he was probably used to it, took the time to offer Catherine a leer before grabbing a half-dozen pieces of bacon from the pile Caleb had cooling on a plate and shoveling them into his mouth. Then he headed up the stairs, presumably in a bid to catch some more shut-eye. Ignoring Caleb and how she could see him watching her with concern out of the corner of his eye, Catherine approached Bastion, who'd opened the fridge and was busy pouring himself a glass of milk. "'You okay?' she asked quietly when he'd finished guzzling it down. He spared her a glance before returning the gallon of milk to the fridge, eyeing its contents like he was searching for something." not just blatantly avoiding her gaze. Fine. There was that word again. Fine. Catherine narrowed her eyes, crossing her arms over her chest as she fought the urge to fidget. So the meeting went well? She pressed. Yep. She pursed her lips at the one-word answer, fighting, and she suspected failing, to hide her irritation. What was it about? She finally outright demanded. Bastion shut the refrigerator door, turning to look at her. Despite the frown tugging at his mouth, his hands were gentle as they insisted on taking and holding onto one of hers. Nothing you have to worry about. Catherine snorted, pulling her hand out of Bastion's grasp. Actually, if it put that expression on your face, then yes, it is something I have to worry about. Bastion shook his head, undoubtedly about to deny the accusation. She continued on before he could. And before you ask what expression, I'm talking about the thundercloud of rage you were sporting when you walked into the house a minute ago. Bastion closed his eyes, taking a deep breath before reopening them and laying his hands on her shoulders. He leaned down until his face was level with hers. Catherine, I promise, if the subject of these meetings was something that concerned you in any way, I would tell you. As it is, it doesn't, and I don't want to unnecessarily burden you with what I consider to be a non-existent issue. Catherine opened her mouth. But— Look, he interjected sharply, causing her to snap it shut. I'm in a hurry. I have to go check out some suspicious tracks a few miles north of Luther's house. He thinks some misguided big game hunters might be looking to set up a stand there or something. Catherine frowned. So we can talk about this later? Her heart squeezed in her chest when he failed to answer, merely dismissing her concerns with a distracted nod of his head. Her gaze traveled to the floor, and she eyed a cracked bit of tile as she attempted to suppress her disappointment. A moment later, a calloused thumb was forcing her chin up. Hey, I love you. You know that, right? Catherine swallowed, nodding. She did know that. As she watched Bastion walk towards the door, however, she couldn't help but wish that he trusted her, too. At least enough to realize that he didn't need to protect her from every little thing, especially what may very well be important information despite his stubborn insistence that it didn't concern her. She'd just have to ask Marcus. And she wasn't going to feel bad about going behind Bastion's back to do it, either, not when she'd given him plenty of opportunity to tell her what was up himself. Are you all right? Caleb asked delicately, after the sound of the SUV's engine starting up outside reached their ears. Catherine offered him a wan smile. Peachy, she assured. Before he could give her any sympathetic advice— 
or worse, ask again how much bacon she wanted, Catherine turned and darted for the stairs. She took them two at a time before reaching the top and rushing to Marcus's room. She knocked but returned the favor of not waiting for an answer before letting herself in. Marcus sprang up from where he was lying in bed at her sudden entrance, the blanket that had been covering him falling to his waist. Although his burly chest was bare, Catherine was relieved to spot the waistband of his boxers where the blanket had landed in his lap. He scowled at her, but she wasn't about to apologize for the exact same bad manners he'd showcased a few hours earlier. "'How are you?' she blurted instead, immediately feeling stupid." She hadn't exactly had time to rehearse what she was going to say. Marcus stared. What do you want? Nothing, Catherine immediately denied. Why would you assume— She trailed off at his raised eyebrows, stepping fully into the room and plopping down on the edge of his bed. Okay, fine. So maybe I do want something, she admitted. Marcus groaned, throwing himself backwards and tugging the blanket over his head as he muttered something about it being too early for this shit. A moment later, he was whipping the sheets back down. Well, he demanded, not bothering to sit back up. Out with it. Although I must confess that I don't know why you're asking me instead of Bastion. Catherine curled her toes into the carpet. I already asked him, she confessed. Really? Marcus sounded half intrigued, half disbelieving as he turned onto his side. Okay, now I'm curious. What could you have possibly asked for that Bastion wouldn't give you? Catherine fought off a blush at the insinuation behind his words. Information? It was as if a light bulb went off in Marcus's head. Ah... Yeah, so will you at least tell me what all these meetings are about lately? Marcus frowned. I can't, he said bluntly. He sounded annoyed, not with her, but the situation. Catherine stiffened at the unexpected answer from the one person in her life she thought she could always count on to give it to her straight. Can't or won't, she demanded. Marcus sighed. Does it matter? he asked. Look, I promised Bastion that I wouldn't. He doesn't want to upset you. It was unfiltered anxiety now, instead of the smell of fatty bacon frying on the stove that had Catherine's belly churning in discomfort. Why would whatever these meetings are about upset me? What's going on? Is it something really bad? A dozen dangerous scenarios flew through her head. Had hunters somehow located the colony? Was someone vying for Bastion's position as head Alpha? Catherine tensed. Or, or do the meetings somehow have something to do with me? Marcus's eyes danced away from hers for only a second, but it was all the confirmation she needed. That's it, isn't it? She demanded hotly. They're about me. She was stunned. And what? You big, strong men think that even though they're about me, they somehow don't concern me at the same time? She asked, spitting Bastion's words back at Marcus. That I have no right to know about them? Marcus sprang up into a sitting position, forcing a rough hand over her mouth. You want everyone to hear you? He hissed. She glared, and he reluctantly released his hold on her face. Look, Marcus said with a sigh. The meetings aren't actually about you. Not really. They involve you in a roundabout way, maybe, but it's not my place to explain how, all right? But if Bastion thinks you need to know, he'll tell you, he reiterated. He wouldn't leave you oblivious to danger. Just let it go, okay? Just this once. Yeah, right. Whatever, Marcus. Thanks so much for your help. Sarcasm was infused in her words as she stood. Catherine, he groaned in protest. She ignored him, striding over to the door before promptly slamming it shut behind her. She took a minute to compose herself at the top of the stairs before descending them and reluctantly returning to the kitchen, where Caleb and now Sophie sat at the kitchen table, eating their respective breakfasts. 
Sophie offered her a smile while Caleb stood at the side of her. Bacon? he asked. I made some scrambled eggs, too, while you were upstairs. No, thanks, Catherine declined, searching the cupboards for something a bit blander than bacon and eggs to fuel her upset stomach. She eventually settled on a box of instant oatmeal she spotted pushed to the very back of the highest cupboard. It was hiding behind a box of mashed potato spuds that Catherine was sure Caleb had never touched in his life. She had to climb atop the counter to reach it. Do you need help? Caleb asked, immediately leaping from his chair in concern as she nearly lost her balance. Catherine rolled her eyes in fond exasperation. I got it, she assured, outright ignoring Sophie's loud snickering in the background. Caleb reluctantly returned to his chair when her feet were back on the floor, and Catherine busied herself blending together a bowl of oats and milk before heating the mixture in the microwave for a minute. Caleb and Sophie both frowned in concern at her choice of breakfast as she joined them at the table. She couldn't exactly blame them. Oatmeal didn't make a regular appearance in most werewolves' diets. She was surprised there was even any in the house. In hindsight, she probably should have checked the box's expiration date. "'You feeling all right?' Sophie demanded as she eyed the bowl of gruel. She looked seconds away from slapping a hand on Catherine's forehead in an attempt to take her temperature. "'Yeah,' she assured, but didn't bother to elaborate. "'What could she say? "'Your brother's misguided attempts to protect me have ridden me of my appetite completely?' I think I'm losing my inner wolf and with it my craving for meat. Neither were particularly heartening explanations. Sophie and Caleb didn't look like they believed her, but Catherine couldn't bring herself to care as she stared sullenly into her bowl of cereal. Zane wandered into the kitchen a few moments later, shooting a bemused look at Catherine as he dished himself up a heaping helping of bacon and eggs. Who pissed in your Cheerios? he asked. Sophie offered him a glare on her behalf, but Catherine just rolled her eyes. This is oatmeal, actually, she pointed out, forcing herself to take a bite of the lumpy concoction. Zane snorted. The point still stands, he muttered as he sat next to her. Before he or anyone else could pester her more, Caleb stood from his seat at the table, rinsing his empty plate in the sink before heading to the entryway where he began pulling on a pair of tennis shoes. Where are you going? Catherine asked, jumping at the chance for a distraction. Caleb glanced up at her from where he was kneeling and tying his shoes. I was going to head into town. I need a few things for the pantry and want to get to the farmer's market before all the best produce is gone. I need some things, too. Catherine didn't hesitate to latch onto the opportunity to get out of the house. I'll go with you. Count me in, Sophie added. Lord knows my fall wardrobe could use an update. A few minutes later, she and Sophie were rinsing their dishes out in the sink. Catherine couldn't bring herself to eat more than half of the oatmeal, and pulling on their shoes and coats. It was only late August, and fall wasn't quite upon them, but it was Canada, and certainly felt like it outside. They bid Zane goodbye, and stepped outside into the cool breeze. "'What do you need to get in town, Catherine?' Caleb asked as they trudged their way down the dirt road that led to the hearty middle of Haven Falls. Oh, well, Catherine stumbled on her words, not really needing to pick anything up as she'd claimed. I just need to replenish some of my, uh, feminine supplies, she finally managed to spit out. Caleb's ears went red, and Sophie erupted into laughter at the man's obvious embarrassment. Meanwhile, Catherine fought to contain her own mortified blush. She wasn't even sure if the excuse was true. She was awful at keeping track of her monthly frenemy, and hadn't checked on her stockpile of tampons in a while. One would think that a full moon coming around roughly once a month would help a werewolf keep better track of her period, but if anything, it seemed to make her even more forgetful. Either way, the excuse got Caleb and Sophie off her back. When they arrived into town twenty minutes later, they dropped Catherine off at the joint drugstore and apothecary with instructions to meet up with them in the middle of town square, near the farmer's market, in an hour or so. You can always come find me at the closet if you get bored, Sophie reminded her cheerily before they took their leave. 
As much as she loved Sophie, that wasn't likely to happen. Clothes shopping with the blonde was just short of torture, as far as Catherine was concerned. She entered the small shop, grabbing one of the straw baskets placed near the door, and wandered aimlessly up and down the aisles for a while. Her feet eventually took her to where generic tampons were stocked. She figured she might as well get a package of them while she was there. She also picked up a couple bars of handmade soap and was examining the naturally brewed lotions. She was debating between buying the one that smelled like strawberries and the one that smelled like lilacs, when a familiar voice reached her ears, drifting down from the aisle directly in front of hers. The voice was feminine, but loud and domineering. It triggered something in her memory, but she couldn't quite place the owner. Her brow wrinkled in consternation as she listened in and fought to recall who the voice belonged to. Personally, I think he's just being stubborn, the owner of the voice drawled. Something must be done. I agree, another feminine voice, this one Catherine didn't even faintly recognize, answered. But is this really the answer? I mean, your Briggs says Bastion insists— the mention of Bastion's name had Catherine stiffening, and sparked a much more thorough interest in the conversation. After glancing back and forth down the empty aisle, she carefully leaned her back up against the shelf that separated her from the owners of the voices. She rested her head against it, trying to look inconspicuous as she strained her ears to listen. "'I don't care what Bastion insists,' the brash voice replied. Our population is dwindling before our very eyes. My son and his mate have been trying to conceive without any success since they claimed each other last spring. Now, I know there's nothing wrong with my son, but that right girl. She trailed off. Something clicked in Catherine's head at the mention of that right girl. Surely the woman must be referring to Priscilla. And Priscilla was mated to Rip— Rip Briggs. Plus, the second voice had said something about your Briggs. Julius Briggs. The voice must have belonged to the wife, or mate, rather, of the Alpha. Catherine had only met the woman once before, at a council meeting nearly a year ago after Rip had assaulted her. Unsurprisingly, she hadn't made the best impression on Catherine. She's a born wolf, the owner of the second voice pointed out skeptically. It must have belonged to another member of her pack. It's not as if she's a bitten wolf. Now, they can hardly conceive at all. Catherine blinked. She was a bitten wolf, and she hadn't known that. The new tidbit of information caused something peculiar to twist in her gut, which was ridiculous because she'd never once even contemplated the idea of having children. She was only seventeen, for God's sake. Why would she? Shaking off this strange feeling, she strained her ears to hear Briggs's mate's reply. Yes, but the Wrights have invited bitten wolves to join their pack in the past. They've infiltrated their gene pool. Perhaps even just being around them has begun to rub off. Come now, Vanessa, that seems awfully far-fetched to me, the other woman disagreed. Briggs's mate, Vanessa, apparently, huffed. Yes, well, fresh blood certainly can't hurt, anyway. I say that we merge with the Western colony. I'm sure that the right girl will understand that removing herself from the picture for the sake of conceiving a child is in everyone's best interest. Western Colony? What were they talking about? I don't know. If Bastion says that inviting them here and combining the colonies would be a mistake, he's probably right. Didn't he tell the Council that they were uncivilized? Dangerous, even. More wolf than human, I think, is what Briggs said were his exact words. Nonsense, Vanessa dismissed. They're the only other colony in Canada— Bastion probably just doesn't want to upset his mate. 
After all, as Alpha, he'll probably want offspring soon himself, and she is a bitten wolf. She, too, will have to step aside for the sake of producing an heir, or else run the risk of him losing his position as head Alpha. The voices faded away as their owners traveled towards the front of the store, undoubtedly to pay for whatever items they'd picked up. Catherine couldn't have followed them if she wanted to. She felt as if her feet were glued to the floor, a lump the size of Mount Everest stuck in her throat. Stepping aside so that Bastion could produce an heir? What? Why do you look so surprised? Catherine nearly jumped out of her skin at the sound of the voice to her right. It wasn't Briggs's mate or her friend who had addressed her, however, but someone she knew more intimately. Or had used to know, anyway. Melanie Black. One would think you'd be in the know, the girl continued. What with being mated to the head Alpha and all? She rolled her eyes. Or is there trouble in paradise? Catherine forced herself to swallow the lump in her throat. Melanie, she greeted. The girl snorted. Catherine took a moment to take Melanie in. She'd caught glimpses of her once or twice since the other girl had been ostracized from the community, but she'd never had the opportunity to truly examine her as she did now. She looked largely the same as Catherine remembered. More gaunt in the cheeks, maybe but it was impossible to say whether that was due to an inefficient diet or merely a natural side effect of maturing and growing older. Her hair was longer, too. It didn't look like it had been cut in a long time and easily fell past her shoulders. Choppily cut black bangs hung over her equally dark eyes. As much as her appearance hadn't really changed, however— her attitude and the stiff way she held herself hardly resembled the girl she used to know. Catherine knew she should just walk away. Bastion would probably have a fit if he found out that Melanie had been anywhere near her. But for some reason, she couldn't bring herself to do so. After all, she genuinely liked the girl before... well, before everything that had happened. How are you? she finally managed to ask, forcing her clumsy tongue and lips to work together and form the question. Melanie shot her a disbelieving look over the plastic tub of all-purpose detergent she was examining. Great, she deadpanned. It's wonderful being packless, living in what basically amounts to a shack on the outskirts of town. She threw the tub into her otherwise empty basket before continuing to peruse the shelf adding a tiny bottle of shampoo and a single stick of deodorant to her haul. Catherine's stomach clenched as something that felt suspiciously like guilt swirled in it. Which was stupid, because she knew that she had absolutely no logical reason to feel that way. She'd never done anything to Melanie. It was the other girl who'd betrayed her to Cain. And yet... Maybe... Maybe I can talk to Bastion? Catherine suggested hesitantly. Melanie jerked her head in surprise, and her eyes immediately zoomed to her. They looked her up and down, apparently assessing whether or not she was telling the truth. Her dark eyes softened after a moment, and Catherine could have sworn she caught a glimpse of the old Melanie. What's the point? But she quickly transformed back into the bitter shell of a girl who'd replaced her, her eyes hardening once more. No alpha is going to want to take in a shunned, bitten wolf like me, especially not with everyone freaking out about the population. But don't bother, she cut Catherine off sharply. Not all of us can win the meat lottery. Their stilted conversation came to a close after that and an awkward, tension-filled silence descended. Neither girl made an immediate attempt to move away from the other, however, despite the fact that they were no longer actively shopping the aisle. Catherine bit her lip. "'Is it true?' she asked finally. Melanie eyed her. "'Is what true?' "'What they were saying about Haven Falls's population,' 
she clarified. Is, is it really dwindling? Melanie shrugged. It's hard to say for sure. All I know is that no new babies have been born so far this year, and it's gotten a lot of people on edge. In case you didn't notice, our graduating class was by far the largest at the school. Most grades are made up of less than a dozen students, and I've heard that the newest batch of kids eligible for school is half that number. Catherine frowned. That sounded like a legitimate problem to her. And what they said about bitten wolves, she asked. Is that true? Can they... can we... really not have kids? Melanie huffed. It's not that we can't, it's just rare. I think the last time a bitten female gave birth in Haven Falls was a few decades ago. Long before either of us got here, anyway. But what do they expect? It's not like there are many of us. Still, it's just like those stuck-up bimbos to blame us for the town's population problem. I mean, I'm sure it has absolutely nothing to do with all the inbreeding. Melanie's last sentence was practically drenched in sarcasm, but Catherine didn't get it. She furrowed her brow. Inbreeding? Well, it's not like born wolves are mating with their brothers and sisters, but think about it. Haven Falls was established sometime in the mid-1800s. Born wolves have inhabited this town for well over a century. Most of these families have been here since the very beginning. Surely everyone is everyone else's distant cousin by now. Melanie snapped her mouth shut, abruptly realizing who it was she was ranting to. Anyway, she interjected sharply, I've got to go. The girl turned to leave, but Catherine quickly reached out and grabbed the sleeve of her dingy coat. Wait. Melanie stiffened, but turned back around to face her. Catherine gestured vaguely at her basket. If you don't want me to talk to Bastion, at least let me get this for you. Melanie stared. Knock yourself out, she said finally, handing Catherine her merchandise. Without further ado, the two girls made their way up to the front of the store. Catherine was relieved to see that Vanessa Briggs and her friend were gone. After paying for their items with one of Bastion's many shiny credit cards, Catherine handed Melanie her basket back. Thanks, I guess, the girl muttered, glancing at the door. You're welcome, Catherine replied, hoping that Melanie recognized the sincerity in her voice. It was hard to get a good read on the other girl, though, as she refused to meet her gaze. See you, Catherine, she finally said shouldering past her before the brunette could reply. Bye, Melanie, Catherine mumbled to the empty space beside her, watching as the other girl ducked out of the shop and disappeared from sight. Catherine glanced at the clock behind the counter, blinking owlishly when she realized that more time had passed than she'd thought since running into Melanie. In fact, it had already been an hour since Sophie and Caleb had dropped her off. She hurried out of the store, forcing her legs into a jog as she headed towards Town Square. It was only a few blocks from the dual apothecary shop drugstore, but Catherine found herself uncharacteristically out of breath once she'd arrived. She rested her back against a brick building, trying to catch her breath and shake off the sudden wave of dizziness she felt as she searched the area for a familiar face. After a moment, she was able to spot Caleb through her slightly blurred vision— he was standing near a vendor that looked to be selling a variety of fresh berries. She began making her way over to him, but quickly realized that something was wrong. She felt more and more lightheaded with every step she took. She forced herself to stop, shaking her head and blinking hard in an effort to lose the wooziness. She opened her eyes to blackness encroaching upon the edges of her vision. Catherine! She heard Caleb address her from across the street, and she watched through her hazy vision as he hurried over to her. I was starting to worry. His mouth dipped into a frown the closer he got to her. Hey, what's wrong? I... Catherine pressed a hand to her forehead. Nothing. That's what she wanted to say. That's what she wanted to be true. 
but she couldn't even get her lips to begin forming the lie when she felt her knees suddenly buckle beneath her. Caleb's startled face was the last thing she saw before the black in her peripheral vision finally crept completely in, and all was dark. Chapter 3 When Catherine peeled her eyes open, it was to welcome a distinct pounding in her head and Marcus's face hovering over her own instead of Caleb's. "'Welcome back to the world of the living, princess,' the man quipped, signature smirk firmly in place despite the fact that his words were strained, and there was an unprecedented wrinkle of concern etched in his forehead. Catherine licked her dry lips and glanced around, taking in her surroundings. She quickly realized that she was no longer in the middle of town square, but rather laying on the couch of their living room, a raggedy afghan thrown over her lap. Marcus was kneeling beside her, pressing a washcloth full of ice to the side of her head. Caleb, eyes wide with worry, was looking on from a few feet away. "'What happened?' she managed to mumble, feebly pushing the hand holding the homemade cold compress away. Marcus rolled his eyes, but set the ice sack down on the coffee table. "'Why don't you tell us?' he shot back. "'I mean, you're the one who fainted. Honest to God, Scarlet O'Hara, someone fetch the smelling rocks, fainted, if Caleb and Sophie are to be believed.' He shook his head in disbelief. "'Oh.' She did recall that. But more importantly, or more bafflingly at the very least, "'You know Scarlet O'Hara?' she asked skeptically. Marcus released a surprised guffaw of laughter. Caleb, however, could no longer contain himself and darted forward, shooing Marcus out of his way. "'Nothing about this is funny,' he scolded the other man. "'Are you okay?' he asked her hands spasming nervously at his sides like they wanted nothing more than to somehow fix her. "'How's your head? Oh, I knew you should have eaten more than oatmeal this morning,' he fretted. "'Hey,' she said, trying to sit up in her attempt to reassure him. "'I'm fine. A little achy, maybe. No,' Caleb commanded, gentle hands pushing on her shoulders and forcing her to lay back down on the couch. "'Just rest. You hit your head when you fell.' Well, that certainly explained the cold compress and the dull throb originating from the side of her skull. Sophie and Zane went to go find Bastion. They should be back any minute. The sound of the front double doors bursting open, ricocheting loudly against their adjacent walls, had Catherine cringing into the cushions. Make that right now, Caleb corrected himself, releasing a relieved gust of air. Catherine wished she felt that same relief. Bastion sprang into the room, his entire body exuding tension. When his frantic eyes caught hold of hers, the barest hint of it fled. That, however, didn't stop him from striding over and kneeling down next to her in the same spot Marcus had occupied mere minutes before. He grasped either side of her face, eyes roaming over her features as he searched for any obvious sign of injury. They fixated on her left temple— where Catherine knew a pretty bruise must have been blossoming. Sophie and Zane appeared in the living room moments later, both looking rather harried as they hurried in after their ruffled alpha. "'What happened?' Bastion asked, brushing a tender thumb over the bruise on her forehead and unknowingly repeating Catherine's earlier words. She fought to contain a ping of annoyance when, instead of addressing the question to her, however, he turned his head and directed it at Caleb— who continued to look on with worried eyes. "'I don't know,' he admitted, sounding pained at the confession. "'She just fell. I tried to catch her, but it happened so suddenly. I mean, she looked a little pale this morning and didn't eat much for breakfast, but that's not totally abnormal for her lately,' he rambled nervously. Catherine fought the urge to wriggle in guilt at the obvious worry in his voice. Sophie laid a comforting hand on Caleb's shoulder, shooting her brother a pointed look. "'It's okay, Caleb. It's not your fault. It's not anyone's fault. I was making my way to the farmer's market when I saw it myself. She just fainted, and I don't think anyone, not even Catherine, knows why.' 
Sophie's eyes shifted to the small brunette. She raised her eyebrows, giving her a chance to speak up and deny it. Catherine bit her lip. Bastion nodded determinedly at her lack of response. Marcus, go get Gabriella. Catherine couldn't stop an automatic scowl from spreading across her face at the woman's name. I don't need a doctor, she argued. Bastion spared her a glance. Gabriella's a healer, not a doctor. She narrowed her eyes at the obvious brush-off. I'm fine, she reiterated, attempting to prove the point by throwing her feet on the floor and maneuvering herself into a sitting position. Despite the fact that she'd fainted for no apparent reason, she did feel fine. And okay, maybe she was a little worried that if Gabriella looked at her, she'd somehow catch on to the fact that Catherine was losing her inner wolf. Then the pack would know, Bastion would know, and they'd... they'd... Well, she didn't know what they'd do. She didn't know what she would do, if it was true. You just collapsed. Bastion snapped. You're not fine. Like Caleb said, maybe I should have eaten more for breakfast. She skipped supper yesterday, too, he piped up. Catherine shot him a betrayed look, attempting to communicate with her eyes what a tattletale he was being, but all he did was shrug helplessly in return. It was true. She had skipped supper, but who could blame her when the meat-stuffed calzone Caleb had made had smelt like death warmed over? Bastion could, apparently. His blue eyes bore into her green ones. Why are you skipping meals? he demanded. It was just one, she shot back. The last I checked, it wasn't a crime not to be hungry. Although her packmates with the more vigorous appetites— Marcus and Zane, for example, were probably baffled by the concept. Bastion ran an agitated hand through his mop of hair. Why are you trying to get out of this? Catherine felt backed into a corner by the question, and so grasped onto the only ace she had up her sleeve, and, hoping it would aptly distract Bastion, she flung it at him. I don't know. Why are you trying to hide the fact that Haven Falls' population is dying out? Bastion balked in surprise. A tense silence fell. Where did you hear that? he asked after a while. He shot an accusing glance at Marcus, who immediately threw his hands in the air, shaking his head in denial. Don't look at me. I haven't said jack to her about it. I overheard it in town, she admitted easily. Did the rest of you know about it, too? she asked, surveying the room. By the way Zane shifted uncomfortably, Sophie bit her bottom lip, and Caleb suddenly refused to meet her eyes, she knew she had her answer. Anger burned hot in her belly. So what? Why was it so important that I didn't know about this? Is it because I'm a bitten wolf and you blame me for this mess? Because I'm pretty much barren or whatever? Catherine, no. Why would you think enough? Bastion bellowed. He pressed the palms of his hands hard into his eye sockets. Everyone but Catherine, out, he commanded, the authority in his voice leaving no room for argument. But Catherine was always up for a challenge. She scowled. You can't kick everybody out. This is their house, too. God, you can be such a prick. Fine, Bastion interrupted her. She released an embarrassing yelp when he abruptly stood throwing one arm over her shoulders and looping the other under her knees so that he could heave her up with him. He cradled her like a child, and she scowled as he marched her to their shared bedroom, closing the door behind them before depositing her on the bed. She glared up at him. Well? What exactly did you hear? She narrowed her eyes. Why, so you can pick and choose what to tell me? I heard enough, all right? When he didn't immediately explain, Catherine rolled her eyes. I heard that Haven Falls' werewolf population is slowly diminishing, that no one's had a baby in nearly a year, that some people think allowing born and bitten wolves to mate is behind the problem, and that a solution has been offered before you to join forces with another colony, but you've refused. 
And oh yeah, the same people who think that bitten wolves have somehow diluted the gene pool think you're rejecting said solution because of me. Catherine took a deep breath. That's what I've heard. Bastion's scowl grew more pronounced the more information she spewed at him. By the end of her rant, his nostrils were flared and the dark blue of his eyes more closely resembled the black of his pupils. That's not why, he spat. You have nothing to do with my decision. Catherine crossed her arms over her chest. Oh, really? Why haven't you told me any of this, then? Because I didn't want you to think that any of this shit had anything to do with you. Well, good job with that one, she retorted. Bastion took a moment to compose himself, drawing in a deep breath through clenched teeth before stiffly taking a seat next to Catherine on the bed. He reached over, and she reluctantly allowed him to take one of her hands in his. The Western colony is primitive, he finally settled on after making sure she was looking at him. When I was a kid, my father visited there as an ambassador of sorts. When he returned, he told me how they live. They reside in primitive huts, sleep in the dirt, and eat meat raw straight from animal carcasses even when they're in their human forms. Worse, they know nothing of order. Violence is prevalent, and there are constant battles for power with no lone alpha serving the community for long. I assure you that it would be a mistake to have them here. They would never assimilate. Catherine pressed her lips together. She understood what Bastion was saying, and yet... But that was what? Five, ten years ago when your father visited? Maybe they've changed since then. How would you know? You've never been there. And if there really is a problem, if the werewolf population of Haven Falls is dying out— Bastion snorted at that, probably thinking the proclamation dramatic, but she ignored him and continued on. Joining with them seems like a logical solution. No. His answer was flat, void of emotion, and left absolutely no room for argument. But, Catherine, he snapped, it's perfectly normal for our population to fluctuate. As far as I'm concerned, there is yet to be cause for panic. If the time comes when that changes, I'd still think of another solution before inviting them here. Like what? she asked sharply. Are you going to go around biting innocent people on the full moon? Bastion shot her a betrayed look, but he needn't have bothered. She felt horrible as soon as the words escaped her mouth. Of course not, he said after a moment. You know as well as I do that survival from the bite is far from guaranteed. I would never willingly subject anyone to it. I know, Catherine murmured, not quite meeting his eyes as she played with a loose thread at the bottom of her shirt. I'm sorry. Bastion sighed dropping her hand and throwing a muscled arm over her shoulders instead. He pulled her to him until she was practically on his lap, her head buried in the crook of his neck. Just trust me on this, all right? He said after a moment, pressing a chaste kiss to the crown of her hair. I know what I'm doing. Catherine felt any anger she may have still been holding on to dissolve. So you're not just refusing to invite this western colony to join us to spare my feelings or something? She asked, words coming out half-muffled as she talked into his shirt. Since they have a plethora of potential bedmates for you to choose from and I apparently can't get pregnant? What? He asked, sounding truly baffled. He pulled away and forced her to look up at him. Of course not. She believed him, and yet she bit her bottom lip. When were you going to tell me that the odds of us ever having kids are next to nil? Bastion frowned, tucking a wisp of loose hair behind her ear. I thought you knew. I mean, didn't you have some sort of sex ed class at school? Plus, we haven't exactly been careful. Catherine felt a heated blush threatening to climb up her neck at that. After all, the second part of his statement was true. As for school, 
She'd either been gone when they'd covered that particular subject, or it was considered common enough knowledge that it was never even brought up. Does it bother you? he asked, and Catherine realized she'd been silent for a beat too long. She shrugged. Until that day, she'd never really had reason to think about it. Why would she? She was only seventeen. Does it bother you? she shot back. No. His answer was immediate and absolute. Catherine, to be frank, I don't want kids. After what happened to my parents, I mean, I don't think I could handle the emotional investment. He paused. I have enough people to worry about as it is, he added more lightheartedly, shooting her a playful smirk. Catherine rolled her eyes, but couldn't deny the fact that a smile was threatening to break loose across her face. And your position as head alpha? I mean, don't you need an heir or whatever? She asked, repeating one of the words she had heard earlier that morning. Won't the other alphas make you step aside if you don't produce one? Bastion snorted, waving off her concerns. No one's a good enough fighter to challenge me. Catherine was tempted to call him arrogant, but she knew deep down that he wasn't being conceited. He was simply stating the truth. It's a worry for far in the future, anyhow. I'll probably just hand the title over to one of Sophie's kids if they display alpha tendencies. He paused. Well, if she ever settles down, anyway, he added, almost offhandedly. Are you sure? Catherine pressed. Bastion gently grasped either side of her face, forcing her to meet his eyes. All I need is you. The mix of relief and elation those words caused had Catherine darting forward and pressing her lips to his. Bastion reacted immediately, his hands slinking down to her hips, where he grabbed her and lifted her fully into his lap. One of his hands remained there, at the small of her back, pressing Catherine fully to him, while the other tangled itself in her hair, holding her still while his lips battled eagerly with hers, his tongue lapping at her mouth. Not to be outdone, Catherine busied her own hands, sneaking them up under his shirt to explore the lines and dips of muscle they knew so well. When one of her hands drifted lower to play with the waistband of his jeans, however, Bastion pulled away. Don't think, he said, breathing heavily, that I've forgotten about the fact you fainted a little more than an hour ago. He kissed her jaw before sucking on the sensitive skin below her ear. She gasped, and he groaned against her. If you feel the slightest bit sick, or if I even suspect you do, he continued, downright panting, you're going straight to Gabriella so she can look you over. Got it? Catherine smirked. Yes, sir. She had the pleasure of seeing his eyes darken with lust before his mouth once again connected with hers. Catherine spent the next hour in a blissful daze as Bastion used his tongue and teeth to show her over and over again just how much he meant it when he said he didn't need anyone but her. Catherine's stomach churned, and she felt the bile burning up her esophagus about two seconds before it happened. She managed to make it to the bathroom just in time— throwing herself over the rim of the toilet bowl where she promptly puked. The vomit burnt the inside of her nose and mouth as she violently heaved. Again and again she gagged on the foul liquid as her stomach spasmed and forced it out of her body. Hot tears stung her eyes, and she was gulping in lungfuls of air by the time the organ had completely emptied itself. Wholly spent, she flushed the toilet before resting her forehead against the cool porcelain seat. The bitter, unpleasant taste of vomit stuck to the roof of her mouth, and acknowledging her gawking audience for the first time, she gestured vaguely at it. "'Can someone get me a, a toothbrush?' she asked, voice cracking on the last word. Caleb was quick to oblige, ducking out of the doorway where the rest of her pack, Sans Bastion, was standing." He wasn't standing there because he'd been the first to follow her when she'd abruptly booked it from the kitchen. She'd been forcing down a second helping of Caleb's meat-filled pot pie under Bastion's watchful gaze, 
when the urge to vomit had abruptly struck her. Bastion had thrown himself down beside her on the bathroom floor, where he was still kneeling, one of his hands rubbing soothing circles on her back. She risked a peek at him, and immediately regretted it. His brow was creased in concern, his eyes tight with worry. She knew what was about to come out of his mouth before he even opened it. You're going to see the doctor. If she wasn't so exhausted from puking her guts out, Catherine would have been tempted to sassily point out that Gabriella was a healer. As it was, she barely had enough energy left to argue about seeing her. With what the woman might discover, namely that Catherine was losing her inner wolf, looming in the forefront of her mind, however, she had to try. But it's the full moon tonight. I promise I'm— I swear to God, Catherine, if the next words out of your mouth are that you're fine, I'm going to— She has a point. Both of their heads swiveled towards the doorway at the unexpected interruption. It was Sophie, pushing her way into the room past a frowning Marcus and Zane. Caleb had returned from fetching her toothbrush and was standing in the doorway as well, grip lax on her brush as he stared. What? Bastion snapped. Not about being fine, the blonde was quick to explain. Something is obviously wrong. Sophie eyed Catherine, something curious in her eyes that the brunette couldn't quite place. But tonight is the full moon, she continued, directing her gaze back at Bastion. Everyone will be meeting for the gathering in a few hours. Gabriella probably doesn't have time to see her right now. Bastion snorted. She'll make time. The or else was implied. Yeah, except she and her pack could already be gone, well on their way to the clearing, Sophie pointed out. Bastion frowned, the tick in his jaw the only physical sign of his annoyance as he stared hard at the floor, thinking his sister's words over. I'll go see Gabriella first thing tomorrow, Catherine piped up hesitantly. After all, surely she'd feel better after a night spent running around as a wolf. It would give her a chance to reconnect with that side of herself. Fine, Bastion said finally, though his frown didn't ease. But no moon gathering for you. The hand rubbing circles on her back drifted down to grasp one of her hips. You're stuck here and I'm staying with you. Catherine was about to agree when Sophie once again spoke up. You've got to go to the moon gathering. Surely it's not a good idea for the head Alpha to miss it with all the recent unrest. Bastion scowled. I don't care. Actually, she's probably right, Marcus piped up hesitantly from the doorway. You don't want other Alphas getting ideas. Go, Sophie reiterated before Bastion could argue more. I'll stay here with Catherine. Everything will be fine. Trust me. Bastion's eyes hardened. I've trusted you with her before. Uh, the her you're speaking of is right here, Catherine pointed out, the utter annoyance at being talked about as if she wasn't in the room enough to finally inject her with some of her usual spunk. She used the edges of the toilet to push herself into an upright position. Besides tightening his hold on her, his fingers curling possessively around her hip bone as he helped her stand— Bastion didn't acknowledge her words. Fine, he finally said, directing the word at Sophie. But if anything happens to her, I'm holding you personally responsible. Sophie nodded earnestly. Of course. Rolling her eyes at their disregard of her, Catherine returned the favor and ignored them as she turned to look at Caleb. Toothbrush? she asked. Caleb quickly handed it over. Here. Thanks, she said, eyeing him and the rest of the pack as they continued to stare at her. It's almost like they expect you to faint next, a dark voice inside her head jested. Show's over, she added abruptly, taking two strides towards the sink and roughly twisting the handle labeled cold. She shoved the soft bristles of her toothbrush under the running water. She really shouldn't have been surprised when they looked to Bastion for confirmation. Out, he agreed, and while the pack grumbled at the order, they obeyed. Well, 
all of them but the man who'd issued said order, of course. Catherine could feel his stare on her, burning a hole through the back of her head as she brushed her teeth. Eventually, he spoke. Are you sure you're going to be all right until tomorrow? he asked. Exasperated, Catherine caught his eyes in the reflection of the mirror in front of her. A little of the irritation she was feeling melted away, however, at the very real concern painted on his features. She turned to face him. I swear to you I'll be fine, she said, trying to convey with her voice that it was absolutely true. Bastion didn't look convinced, but nodded anyway, and after pressing a chaste kiss to her forehead, left the room to let her clean herself up in peace. Despite his decision to allow Catherine to hold off seeing Gabriella until the next morning, Bastion remained agitated for the rest of the evening. Catherine didn't think his eyes left her form once over the next hour. Mostly, he watched to make sure she didn't overexert herself. After all, heaven forbid she stand on her tiptoes to reach a book from the highest part of the bookshelf in the living room or walk to the kitchen to make herself a sandwich. She had just thrown up and her belly was growling at her for sustenance. Pretty much the only thing she was allowed to do on her own over the next sixty minutes was breathe, and Catherine was pretty sure that if there was a way Bastion could have done that for her, he would have. Thankfully, for her sanity's sake, the sky was darkening quickly, and Bastion and the others, excepting Sophie, would have no choice but to leave shortly. Bastion pulled Sophie aside for a private conversation after tugging on his boots, and while Catherine couldn't hear what they were saying, she could plainly see the many exasperated sighs and eye-rolls Sophie offered her brother, and she could assume well enough what was being said. When he was done speaking to Sophie, he approached Catherine where she sat on the couch, kneeling before her. Just be safe, he said, before running a tender hand through her hair. I will, Catherine assured, wrapping her arms around him in a hug. Try not to worry too much, she added, whispering the words softly in his ear. A minute later, he, Marcus, Zane, and Caleb were forced to leave. It didn't even occur to Catherine until Bastion was out the door that it would be their first full moon apart since she'd been turned. Even when she'd run away to Middletown, he'd been there with her for the event. She felt a pang of sadness at the realization. You okay? Sophie asked, plopping down next to her on the couch. Catherine offered the girl a forced smile. Yeah, I'm not about to barf again, anyway, if that's what you're asking. The blonde laughed. Good. I'd be forced to take revenge if you upchucked on this shirt. It's brand new. Catherine's smile became a little more genuine at that. Considering the fact that the guys had left to go to the moon gathering as late as they possibly could and still arrive on time, she and Sophie had to get ready to leave the house not long after that. They retreated to their separate rooms in order to get dressed into the typical dregs they wore every full moon. Ready? Sophie asked when Catherine had finished changing and returned to the living room. She'd settled on an oversized T-shirt with a large hole in the collar and a pair of pants that had seen better days, while Sophie was donning a ridiculous floral button-up and ratty pair of sweats. Yeah. Without further ado, Sophie grabbed the backpack they had packed earlier. It contained a change of clothes for them both. After they slipped on their shoes, Catherine followed her out the door. Where are we going? she asked as the blonde led her into the woods. She carefully stepped over fallen branches and overgrown roots as she trailed after the other girl. She kept close to Sophie, the fact that the moon was currently hidden behind a thick layer of clouds making it difficult to see in the dark. She hoped they weren't going all the way to the clearing Bastion and the others had taken her to during her first full moon when no one had quite been sure if she'd survive it. It was a hike from the house nearly as far away as the clearing where the regular moon gathering took place. Not much further, Sophie assured, sneaking a peek at Catherine over her shoulder as she continued to walk. We're just going a half mile or so from the house. She smiled. I wouldn't want you to strain yourself, after all, or Bastion would have my head. Hardy har har, Catherine offered dryly in return. 
It wasn't long before they reached their destination. Sophie ended up leading them to a tiny space that was nearly entirely taken up by a large overturned tree. The blonde took a seat on the fallen trunk and patted on a bit of bark beside her, indicating that Catherine should sit as well. She did so without complaint. He doesn't mean to be such an overbearing prick, you know, Sophie offered after a minute of comfortable silence. I know it's not an excuse, but he just loves you so much. It said a lot that she didn't have to name the he she spoke of. I know he does, Catherine agreed, and she did know that. She also understood that it was not only in his nature as a werewolf, but as an alpha and a pack leader to be the way he was. It didn't help, and she'd be the first to admit this, that she had an independent streak a mile wide paired with an unfortunate talent for falling ass-backwards into trouble. Still, she couldn't help but feel suffocated at times. All the same, Sophie piped up, shaking Catherine from her reverie. If you ever want somebody to punch him for you, and, you know, actually live to see another day, I'm your best bet. Catherine laughed outright at that. I'll keep that in mind. Seriously, she would. A minute later, the moon became visible above them, emerging from behind the clouds. Catherine leapt from the log in her excitement, shooting Sophie an ecstatic smile when the other girl followed suit. Her smile lost some of its vigor, however, when she noticed that the blonde was watching her oddly, head tilted to the side as she stared at her with unknown intent. But Catherine didn't have time to question the odd, almost searching look before she felt the bright rays of the full moon upon her face. She closed her eyes in anticipation. She waited for the familiar feeling of her body heating up and twisting bones and shifting organs to overtake her. After a long minute of waiting, however, she felt nothing of the sort. Confusion, and yes, okay, a little bit of panic tickling her senses, Catherine forced open her eyes. The first thing she noticed was that Sophie was in her wolf form beside her, cerulean eyes still drilling into her from where she stood. The second thing she noticed was that as for herself, well, despite the beckoning power of the full moon above her, she had remained as human as could be. Chapter 4 Shock It was an emotion Catherine had grown bitterly familiar with over the past year, so familiar that she thought she had mastered the feeling by now. Werewolves exist? Okay. She was one such creature now? She could deal with that. Her parents were alive, Bastion was her destined mate, Bastion's uncle, rogue, and a hunter she'd thought long dead all wanted to kill her. Well, she'd survived, and promptly dealt with all of nature's surprises, hadn't she? But Catherine clearly wasn't as used to the feeling as she'd thought, because the shock that threatened to overwhelm her as she realized that despite the fact that the full moon had reached, and indeed surpassed, its highest peak in the sky, she was still human, wasn't a dull, used-up version of the sensation at all. She stood there, frozen in her disbelief for what had to have been a solid minute. Catherine's brain whirled as she desperately tried to think up a logical reason for the fact that she was still in her human form, a reason that didn't entertain the possibility that she'd somehow lost her inner wolf. She couldn't come up with anything, though, and the harder she tried to think of a reason, the more her train of thought began to falter, stuttering along until it came to a grinding halt on its tracks. She couldn't think. She was so numb that just the act of breathing was almost too much for her right then. She wasn't even sure if her heart was beating. But then a sudden noise, a growl, low, menacing, and reverberating from the back of Sophie's throat, made Catherine perfectly aware of the fact that her heart was, in fact, working. Her eyes traveled to Sophie, 
and the tiny hairs on the back of her neck stood on end as she took in the white wolf. Sophie's ears were lying flat against the sides of her skull, her sharp teeth bared in an ugly snarl as she growled menacingly. At Catherine. You see, the reason that she was so suddenly aware that her heart worked just fine was because the organ had somehow climbed from her chest into her throat, where it pounded away as she stared at the she-wolf she thought of as a sister. But the question was, did Sophie still recognize Catherine as her sister? Fear threatened to overtake shock as Catherine considered the situation before her. Despite the pull the full moon should have had over her body, she hadn't shifted. Zane had also informed her not long ago that her natural scent was changing. All things considered, it was perfectly plausible that Sophie may not be able to identify Catherine as a member of her pack in her more primitive state. It was an unpleasant realization that made the small brunette's belly swirl with a kind of sickness that had nothing to do with her earlier nausea. After all, if Sophie no longer recognized Catherine as Pack, there was nothing stopping her from attacking her right then and there, as evidenced by the growling that grew increasingly louder and more threatening. Sophie, Catherine managed to choke out past the jackhammering organ in her throat. She prayed that even as a wolf, the girl somehow recognized her name. And then Sophie lunged. Before Catherine could react, her fight-or-flight instinct seemed to be malfunctioning as she simply froze. She heard something move from within the undergrowth behind her. As foolish as the action undoubtedly was, Catherine turned her back on the wolf before her and managed to spot the source of the noise. Leaves rustled as what looked like a large muskrat, or maybe even a beaver, darted out of the bushes and scurried away. By the time Catherine realized her mistake and managed to whip her head back around to face the real threat to her well-being, it was to take in the sight of a much more relaxed Sophie. In fact, the she-wolf looked downright tranquil as she sat with her hind legs on the ground, seemingly congratulating herself on chasing off the muskrat that had been invading her space, their space, as she lapped at one of her paws. She met Catherine's bemused gaze and tilted her head just the slightest to the side, as if asking her companion, "'You didn't really think I was growling at you, did you?' The relief that rushed through her at the sentient stare had Catherine dropping to her knees. She was practically choking on the feeling and didn't register the jolt of pain that shot up her knobby joints as they connected with the hard, dirt ground beneath her. She buried her face into her hands. Holy crap, she muttered, digging the palms of her hands into her eyes. Holy crap. She didn't hear Sophie's approach, but felt her soft snout press against her hands as the wolf attempted to nuzzle Catherine's face with her own in a show of comfort. Catherine accepted the figurative hug throwing her arms unthinkingly around the wolf before her and burrowing her face into the soft fur of her neck. "'Oh, God, Sophie, what's wrong with me?' she murmured lowly into the white pelt. She didn't even care that at that moment she was talking to someone who couldn't talk back. Sophie managed to respond in her own way, regardless, circling Catherine and rubbing her fur-covered body against the brunette's in an action not unlike that of an affectionate cat before going so far as to lap one of her cheeks with a long canine tongue. Catherine couldn't help but release a snort of laughter, even if it was tinged with just a touch of hysteria. She wasn't amused for long, however, because after another minute of attempting to comfort Catherine, Sophie was bounding away. What? Before Catherine could truly fear that Sophie would leave her, however, the she-wolf came to stop near the fallen tree they'd earlier been sitting on. She used her teeth to pick up the knapsack they'd packed by one of its straps, and she dragged it across the forest floor before finally dropping it in front of Catherine, who'd remained sitting on her knees. "'What do you want me to do with this?' she asked, grabbing the bag by its unabused strap. 
Sophie stepped forward and nipped at the knapsack's zipper. You want me to open it? Sophie yipped excitedly. Catherine's eyebrows rose to nearly her hairline. I'll take that as a yes. Without further ado, she did what Wolf Sophie had essentially ordered of her and unzipped the bag. She was surprised when the first thing her eyes took in wasn't the spare change of clothes that she and Sophie had earlier packed for themselves, but a puffy, worn-looking sleeping bag. Catherine knew her confusion must have been painted plainly enough across her face, a prominent crinkle etched into her brow, as she pulled out the rolled-up sleep sack. "'What's this?' she asked. Sophie huffed, somehow managing to sound equal parts exasperated and condescending. "'Yes, I know it's a sleeping bag,' Catherine retorted waspishly. "'But why—' She paused as realization dawned. "'Wait, did—did did you know this was going to happen? That I wouldn't be able to shift tonight?' It was impossible to discern the answer by the way Sophie merely continued to stare at her. "'Sophie, did you know?' Catherine demanded more sharply, honestly expecting the wolf in front of her to either shake her head in denial or nod her head in admittance. She did neither, of course. In fact, Sophie had the audacity to snatch the sleeping bag from her hands, clamping down on the fabric with her teeth and depositing it on the forest floor. She nosed the sleep sack, clearly expecting Catherine to follow her unvoiced instruction and unroll it. Catherine ignored the pseudo-order completely. Sophie, if you know what's going on, you have to tell me. Sophie shot her a particular look that made her response to Catherine's own order obvious enough. I can't exactly talk right now, honey. I swear to God, Sophie— Sophie pressed forward and shoved the flat of her snout firmly against Catherine's chest, the force of the push nearly knocking Catherine over. Oof! She managed to prevent herself from toppling backward by shooting her arms out on either side of her. Sophie continued to push her weight on her, however, and Catherine was forced to concede before she ended up sprawled out in the dirt. Okay, okay, fine! The wolf immediately backed off. Catherine righted herself and ran an agitated hand through her mess of wavy hair before reluctantly unrolling the sack. There, happy, she snarked. Sophie nodded her head towards the sleeping bag, clearly expecting Catherine to follow the next logical step and get in the thing. Catherine rolled her eyes, incredibly tempted to defy the wolf in front of her. She wasn't in the mood for arguing, however— and decided to agree on one condition. Fine, she relented, unzipping the sack. But you better be ready to explain yourself in the morning. Catherine took the responding yip as a promise to do just that. Grumbling about the unfairness of the situation under her breath, Catherine reluctantly climbed into the sleep sack. Despite its poofy appearance, it wasn't terribly thick and didn't provide much buffer from the hard ground beneath it. Still, Catherine was much more comfortable than she would have been attempting to sleep without it, and she would have thanked Sophie for so thoroughly considering her well-being if she wasn't also incredibly irritated by the girl's refusal to answer her questions. She hadn't shifted, not even with the full moon shining above her, demanding it. What did it mean? As Sophie settled herself beside Catherine, however, standing guard and using her large canine body to keep her warm, Catherine couldn't bring herself to be as mad as she knew she rightly should. After all, despite her recent inability to shift, she was clearly still considered pack. The knowledge of that indisputable fact caused something in her chest that Catherine hadn't even known was tight to loosen. And, desperately clinging to the comfort it brought her, she eventually managed to fall asleep. Catherine awoke to the unpleasant sensation of something hard poking into her lower back. It wasn't a fun sort of hard something, either. In fact, it felt remarkably like a... rock? 
Oh, right. Memories of last night came flooding back to her. As she recalled the panic that had threatened to overtake her when she'd realized that she couldn't shift, not even with the aid of the full moon, Catherine was tempted to feign sleep for longer. She wanted to be able to pretend, at least for a few more minutes, that last night hadn't happened the way she remembered, that she hadn't failed to transform into her wolf. But it had happened that way, and the more prudent side of Catherine realized that pretending wouldn't get her anywhere, certainly not any closer to the answers she so desperately needed. With that thought in mind, she forced her eyes open, blinking the bleariness from them before taking in her surroundings. It was still dark outside, only the faintest hints of orange and pink peeking through the trees to indicate the fact that dawn was indeed upon them. Or upon her, at least. A frown pulled at the corners of her mouth when she realized that Sophie was nowhere in sight. Catherine wriggled halfway out of her sleeping bag, using her hands to push herself up into a sitting position. She scanned the small clearing again, too concerned to appreciate the sound of a family of sparrows chirping above her, or the feeling of the cool breeze blowing against her flushed skin. "'Sophie?' she called out hesitantly. The tension gathered in her shoulders fled when the girl in question immediately emerged from the thick of trees to Catherine's right. Because the sun had begun to rise, she was no longer stuck in her wolf form— and was very much human as she busied herself buttoning up the spare shirt she'd packed herself for the morning. Sophie appeared remarkably well-kempt, not a single one of her blonde hairs out of place, considering the fact that she spent most of the night lying on the ground next to Catherine as a wolf. Catherine was sure Sophie looked more put together than she did, at any rate. She was still wearing the shirt she'd been donning last night, the one with the gaping hole in the collar, and it was wrinkled enough to resemble an elephant's skin. She could also feel hair sticking to the back of her sweaty neck. "'Good morning,' Sophie greeted, sounding irritatingly chipper, all things considered. "'Did you sleep okay?' she asked, but didn't wait for an answer before plowing onward. "'You seem to rest peacefully enough, considering the circumstances,' Speaking of said circumstances, Sophie, Catherine interjected sharply, what is going on? Sophie stared searchingly at Catherine for a solid minute, exhaling once before running a hand through her annoyingly perfect hair. Well, I'm not completely sure. Catherine blinked in disbelief. Sure enough to pack me a sleeping bag? she refuted. I mean, did you know that I wouldn't shift? She shook her head. What am I saying? You had to have known. I'm sure it's also why you insisted I not go to the moon gathering. Sophie's eyes guiltily flitted away. Like I said, I suspected that something like this might happen, but— But what, Sophie? Catherine demanded angrily kicking off what little of the sleeping bag remained on her legs before standing and taking a step towards the other girl. I need to know what's going on. You will, Sophie assured, sounding completely calm, more like she was attempting to soothe a disgruntled dog than a human girl with very real concerns. Oh, the irony. You'll learn everything at Gabriella's, she insisted wrapping a gentle hand around Catherine's elbow. Come on, let's go. What? Catherine jerked her arm out of Sophie's grasp. Sophie, she protested, the other girl's name bursting forth from her mouth in a near soprano in her distress. If you know what's going on, why I'm not shifting like I should, you have an obligation to tell me. She took a deep breath, forcing her racing heart to slow. I'm freaking out here, she added more quietly. I, I mean, what if I'm somehow losing my inner wolf, becoming normal again? Who knew the idea of that would ever be so horrifying? Please, if you have any idea, 
Sophie abruptly interrupted what was undoubtedly going to turn into a hysterical rant by pulling Catherine in for a fierce hug. Don't be ridiculous, she scolded softly, before loosening her grip so Catherine could pull away enough to look her in the eyes. You are not losing your werewolf abilities. Lycanthropy doesn't work that way. As far as I know, there are no known cases of the condition miraculously reversing itself. Catherine resisted the urge to point out that there was a first time for everything. Then what's wrong with me? she asked instead. Sophie sighed, tucking a piece of wavy hair behind one of Catherine's ears in a gesture that reminded the girl sorely of Bastion. It was absurdly comforting. Nothing is wrong, I swear. I just... I don't want to be wrong about this. She finally released Catherine completely from the one-sided hug. Come on, we can get to the clinic before Bastion even gets back from the moon gathering. Catherine narrowed her eyes. It was an incredibly odd suggestion for Sophie to make, considering how well they both knew Bastion's temperament, and she realized nearly immediately that it was a ploy to get her to agree. Catherine hesitated. She was sure that Bastion meant to come with her to visit Gabriella in the morning. That didn't necessarily mean that she wanted him there, however— just the thought of his overprotectiveness when he found out that she hadn't shifted last night stressed her out. There was no way she wanted to worry him unnecessarily. Catherine sighed. Fine, she agreed, helping Sophie pack up the sleeping bag before they began the short trek back to the house. When they reached the brick building, Catherine quickly ducked into her room to change into something decent, while Sophie started the SUV. She stripped and pulled on a pair of black leggings and a plain dark green sweater before reluctantly making her way to the running vehicle. Gabriella Atkins and her pack only lived a handful of miles to the north of them, and it was a mere five minutes before they arrived at their residence. Sophie threw the SUV into park before killing the engine and daring a glance at Catherine. For her part, Catherine knew she was pouting, but she couldn't bring herself to care about her petulance as she slouched into her seat, arms remaining stubbornly folded across her chest. Sophie frowned. We might have to wait a while for them to get back from the gathering. She cut herself off mid-sentence, however, as she caught sight of the same scene as Catherine out of the corner of her eye. A gaggle of dirt-streaked, near-naked women were making their way out of a section of forest near Gabriella's house. Sophie's frown immediately transformed into a blinding grin, which, honestly, Catherine thought rather inappropriate considering the circumstances. Perfect. Sophie wasted no time hopping out of the vehicle, impatiently gesturing for Catherine to do the same. Releasing a put-upon sigh... Catherine reluctantly followed suit. Gabriella spotted them immediately. She seemed perturbed but not unhappy to see them, and Catherine anxiously towed the dewy grass as the red-headed woman approached them. As Gabriella made her way across the lawn, Catherine allowed herself to eye the group of women who were unabashedly watching them from Gabriella's large wraparound porch. The all-female Atkins pack. Some of Catherine's nerves fled, a tiny uptick of a smile pulling at her mouth, even, when she spotted her friend Agnes amongst the group. The girl enthusiastically waved when she caught Catherine's eye, and Catherine allowed herself to wave back. Then Gabriella was upon them. "'Sophie, Catherine,' she greeted them. "'What can I do for you? Does Bastion need something?' Catherine fought the urge to conceal the unreasonable flash of jealousy that burned hot in her belly at the obvious warmth in the woman's voice when she said Bastion's name. No, no, nothing like that, Sophie assured, batting her concerns away with a wave of her hand. Catherine just needs to be looked at. Gabriella's brow crinkled, a frown pulling at her mouth as she turned careful eyes onto Catherine, searching her for any sign of visible injury and finding none. Okay, she agreed, a bit of confusion in her voice. Just let me— It's urgent, Sophie stressed, 
interrupting Gabriella and shooting her a peculiar look that Catherine didn't have even the tiniest hope of deciphering. Instead of attempting to figure it out, Catherine merely glared at the blonde. After all, her lack of shifting ability certainly hadn't seemed all that urgent a half hour ago when Sophie had outright refused to tell her what was going on. All right, sure, Gabriella agreed, despite her lengthening frown. I'll shoo the girls inside and get dressed. Then I'll meet you in the clinic. Sophie offered her a relieved smile. Thanks. Clinic? Catherine asked once Gabriella was out of earshot. She'd just assumed that the woman would be checking her out in the pack house. It's in the back, Sophie explained, beginning to make her way around the left side of the building and gesturing for Catherine to follow. Come on. Catherine begrudgingly trudged along after Sophie, the green grass they were walking on soon giving way to a narrow dirt path. As soon as they turned the corner of Gabriella's house, the clinic was revealed to Catherine. She couldn't help but find the sight lackluster at best. The clinic looked more like an oversized shed than anything else. Like most of the residences of Haven Falls, the small building was made of brick. It also had a warped steel roof that looked like it had seen better days and two tiny windows. Catherine couldn't quite decide if it was anxiety or relief she was feeling as she stared at it. When they reached the building and Sophie unceremoniously pushed open its wooden door, Catherine realized it had been relief. Unfortunately, that feeling all but fled as the inside of the shed-like building was revealed. It gave off a much more clinic-y vibe than the outside. The floors were gray, the walls painted a pale blue, and the smell that all medical establishments seemed to reek of lingered in the air. The small space contained two beds that had the option of being separated by a single curtain and a small desk and chair located in the corner of the room that seemed to be a staple of every doctor's office that Catherine had ever visited. There were also three mismatched chairs pushed up against the wall near where they had entered. Sophie took a seat on one of them, the wooden dining chair, and gestured for Catherine to sit next to her in the more comfortable-looking cushion chair but the brunette ignored her and the chairs in favor of exploring the room a bit more. There were only two other doors besides the one they had entered in, and when Sophie didn't protest her obvious snooping, Catherine took a peek inside both of them. The first mystery room revealed itself to be a standard-looking bathroom. It had white walls, a dark blue tiled floor, and was adorned with a toilet, sink, and shower. The second room was a bit more interesting and intimidating. It was a closet jam-packed full of scary-looking, probably outdated medical equipment. She recognized some of the smaller devices, such as the collection of stethoscopes hanging along the wall in an almost decorative design. Most of the equipment, however, she didn't know the names of or what they could possibly be used for. Curiosity sated, and more than a little unsettled by the pile of machines in front of her, Catherine closed the closet door and wandered back over to Sophie, where instead of sitting, she rested her back against the wall. "'Why don't you sit?' Sophie asked, once again gesturing towards the seat to her right. Catherine shook her head. "'I'm fine here,' she assured. Truthfully, she was just feeling too jittery to sit still as they waited for Gabriella to arrive." Luckily, she didn't have to wait for long. True to her word, Gabriella breezed through the clinic's front door a minute later. She'd changed into a pair of plain jeans and a t-shirt, and had pulled her long red hair back into an efficient bun. She only took two full steps into the room before turning to confront Catherine and Sophie, hands placed strategically on her hips as she looked back and forth between the two of them. She seemed to come to the rightful conclusion that the former didn't know what was going on any better than she did, and settled her attention on the latter. All right, what's the problem? Catherine opened her mouth to answer, despite the fact that the question hadn't been aimed at her. Well, Catherine didn't shift last night. 
the betrayed look she shot Sophie went largely ignored. It was only a small consolation that when she turned back to take in Gabriella's reaction, she had the pleasure of seeing true surprise flicker across the woman's face. Really? Are you sure? Catherine felt her thinly contained annoyance surge forth at the ridiculous question. After all, how could they not be sure? Was there any way they could not know whether or not she'd transformed into a giant hairy werewolf the night before? Instead of offering a scathingly witty response, however, Sophie just nodded. Excitedly? Wait. What? Yes, the blonde confirmed distractedly before prattling on. Her appetite has been absolute crap as well. She even threw up last night after supper, and I'm sure you heard about how she fainted in town the other day. She's been tired and irritable. Plus, I'm pretty sure her overall scent has changed. It was disorienting for Catherine to hear her quasi-sister eagerly jabber on about every little thing she'd been so concerned about the past few weeks, and something stronger than mere irritation began building in her belly when the blonde was nearly breathless by the end of her enthusiastic explanation. The red-hot anger she could feel brewing beneath the surface must have been obvious enough, because Gabriella frowned in concern when she finally, finally, turned to look at Catherine. Does she know what it means? Sophie shot Catherine a glance, wincing at the undoubtedly stormy expression on her face. No, I mean, I don't think she does. I wanted to be sure before saying... And that was all it took to spark Catherine's ire beyond containment. In case you haven't noticed, she spat, the she you two are talking about is right here. Sophie winced, and Gabriella flashed her a contrite smile. You're right, of course. Sorry about that, the redhead offered. But she hardly seemed properly chastised in Catherine's opinion. Catherine stiffened when the healer took a step forward and placed an uninvited hand on her forehead. So why don't you tell me how you're feeling? I think Sophie just about covered everything, she replied brusquely, pushing herself off the wall and sidestepping so that she was out of Gabriella's reach. The redhead didn't seem offended. In fact, Catherine was pretty sure it was amusement pulling at the corners of her mouth as she observed her. Well, let's get right down to it then, shall we? Gabriella headed over to her desk where she promptly sat. She seemed content to let Catherine remain standing, and Catherine wondered if it was done in a conscious effort to make her feel like she had at least some power over her situation, namely being effectively sandwiched between two powerful women. When was your last period? Catherine blinked. What? What? When was your last period? Gabriella repeated calmly. Catherine glowered, folding her arms defensively across her chest. What does that have to do with anything? she demanded. Gabriella released a put upon sigh like she was the one whose patience was being tested. Just answer the question, please. Catherine's glare hardened. I would if you would answer mine. Gabriella shot an exasperated look at Sophie, who merely offered her a helpless shrug in return. Pursing her lips, the redhead redirected her attention back at Catherine. You're what? Seventeen? Eighteen? Do I really need to explain this to you? At Catherine's blank look, she threw her hands into the air in exasperation. What's the metaphor I'm looking for? Oh, right. The birds and the bees. Well, sweetie, you see, when a man and woman love each other, they might decide to let him have a go at pollinating her flower. Stop, Catherine said, choking on her spit, all too aware of the furious red flush she could feel crawling up her neck. Well, Gabriella asked after giving her a moment to compose herself. Your period? Guess, Catherine mumbled as she fought to remember. I mean, I don't know for sure. 
she trailed off. As that particular realization dawned, and Catherine took in the expectant twin looks the two women were giving her, she finally realized exactly what it was that Gabriella was getting at. Fierce denial of the possibility of something she didn't even want to mentally acknowledge, however, had her quickly adding, Though I hardly know why you're asking. But Catherine did know, and as panic threatened to well in her throat, she desperately wished she was as ignorant as she was a few seconds ago and didn't. Her sudden knowledge must have been obvious enough, however. I think you know exactly why, Gabriella gently contradicted. Catherine sent a desperate glance in Sophie's direction, but the blonde only gave her an encouraging nod. Feeling suddenly too exhausted to stand, Catherine finally took a seat next to the other girl. But that's impossible, she pointed out. I mean... I'm a bitten wolf. She'd learned only a few days ago how rare it was for one to... for... one to... Improbable, Sophie disagreed before Catherine had the fortitude to finish the thought. Before last night, anyway. Now it's looking very, very likely. But what does... that have to do with not being able to transform... Catherine demanded. Well, pregnancy does odd things to the body, Gabriella said, finally naming exactly what condition it was that she and Sophie clearly thought was ailing her. Pregnancy. They thought Catherine was pregnant. Catherine couldn't suppress a flinch at the word, but Gabriella either didn't see or ignored the reaction as she continued her explanation. In werewolves, the influx of pregnancy hormones actually suppresses many of our usual instincts. For example, pregnant werewolves often lose their craving for red meat. She made sure to catch Catherine's eye for the next part. And they certainly can't shift. After all, werewolves can't properly transform into their wolf forms until puberty hits. This holds true for wares in the womb as well. If a mother shifted while pregnant the fetus growing inside of her would die. Mother? Womb? Fetus? Catherine desperately pushed down the hysteria that was threatening to make its appearance in the form of vomiting. No, she managed to blurt when it became obvious Gabriella and Sophie were waiting for a reaction. She ran a shaking hand through her wild hair. I mean, I just don't think... But Catherine couldn't bring herself to finish the sentence. Even she knew that whatever protest was about to leave her mouth would be half-hearted at best. As much as she wanted to deny it, Gabriella's explanation made perfect sense. The woman must have sensed her crumbling resolve, and she wasted no time taking advantage of it. Well, it's easy enough to find out for sure. Come sit, she said pointing at one of the empty beds as she stood and made her way to the door that Catherine knew led to the closet full of medical equipment. Operating completely on autopilot, Catherine obliged. Gabriella emerged from the closet holding what looked like a blocky walkie-talkie. It had a curled cord that was attached to a sort of short, fat wand. She placed whatever the device was down on her desk before digging into one of its drawers and pulling out a squeeze bottle of clear jelly. Leaving the tool on her desk, she approached Catherine with the goop. Lay down, she instructed, using a gentle hand to push Catherine back against the mattress. I'm just going to squirt some of this on your stomach and see if we can get a heartbeat on my Doppler. Gabriella had grabbed the bottom of her sweater and lifted it up past her belly button before Catherine's brain managed to process the word Doppler, and it occurred to her to protest. Because that device on Gabriella's desk was a Doppler, as in a fetal heart rate Doppler. Feeling the beginnings of panic balloon in her throat, Catherine shot her hand forward and grabbed onto Gabriella's before she could apply the jelly to her stomach. Stop. Catherine wasn't ready for confirmation. At least not right now. Not in this way. 
The relief she felt when Gabriella immediately took a step back was immense, and Catherine didn't waste a minute yanking down her sweater and pushing herself back into a sitting position. She pulled her knees up to her chest in an inherently self-protective gesture. She was so relieved, in fact, that she didn't even care about the concerned looks Gabriella and Sophie shot each other. Gabriella recovered from her surprise quickly enough, however, and abandoning the bottle of jelly near the Doppler on her desk, she began digging through her drawers for something else. Okay, look, I can't make you do things my way, she granted, but I insist on you having a definitive answer before you leave. If you are, indeed, pregnant, and I strongly suspect that you are, Bastion and the rest of your pack needs to be aware of the delicate condition you're in so that they can take care of you properly and ensure that they aren't overly rough with you. Catherine bristled at the insinuation that Bastion, or any of her packmates for that matter, were ever overly rough with her, but at the same time, she couldn't really bring herself to dispute the implication because, well, they were all werewolves, not exactly known for their self-control and handsy by nature. Gabriella pulled out what ended up being a small, thin box. Judging by the picture on its side, it contained a single pregnancy test. She thrust the box at Catherine. The instructions are simple enough. You can take the test in the bathroom right now, she said. All you have to do is pee on the stick, she added when Catherine didn't immediately move to take the box. Catherine stared. Her mouth was dry, and she desperately wanted to protest. But as much as she tried to think of a good reason why she shouldn't take the test, she kept coming up empty. Catherine, Sophie prodded softly, jolting her out of her stupor. Yeah, okay, she said, reaching forward and hesitantly taking the boxed test before she could second-guess herself. Gabriella pointed her in the direction of the bathroom, and Catherine reluctantly shuffled into the small room, closing the door behind her. All you have to do is pee on a stick. It was a lot harder than it sounded. Catherine took her time unpacking the test stick from its box and carefully read through the tiny pamphlet of instructions that came along with the test at least three times. Then she had to wait for her nervous bladder to finally relax enough to pee on the damn thing. If she'd thought she'd been jumpy before taking the test, however— it was nothing compared to how she felt after she'd urinated on the stupid stick. Said stick was currently lying face down on the edge of the sink, as Catherine waited the advised three minutes for it to finish detecting the result. Knock, knock. She nearly jumped out of her skin at the sudden noise. You okay in there? Sophie asked through the door. Catherine took a deep breath. Fine, she assured. Relieved, her voice didn't crack in the middle of the word. The lie. She knew it wouldn't be long until the two women demanded she come out, or worse, they decided to barge in. So, just look at it, she told herself sternly. Forget three minutes, it's already been well over five. Taking a deep breath, Catherine did just that. She reached forward before she could lose her nerve, picked the test up off the counter, flipped it around, and looked at the tiny little screen on the widest part of the stick. She stared at the result for a solid minute. No matter how intently she gawked, however, it didn't change. Catherine had read the instructions that had come with the test from start to finish enough times to know exactly what she was looking at. One line meant the test was negative. No baby. Two lines meant the test was positive. Surprise, you're going to be a mommy. She was staring at two solid, perfectly pink lines. Tears blurred Catherine's vision, and a whirlwind of emotions she didn't dare examine too closely made breathing suddenly difficult. As much as she tried to bat them away, however, she couldn't help but pinpoint the panic and fear amongst them. She was surprised that there was an unexpected burst of joy somewhere in this swirling mess, too. 
but Catherine's emotions hardly mattered. All of her feelings were overshadowed by the words Bastion had uttered mere days ago, ringing with clarity in her head. I don't want kids. Chapter 5 This is so exciting. I can't believe I'm going to be an auntie. I wonder if the baby's a boy or a girl. A pause. I bet it's a girl. I can already picture all the cute little dresses she'll wear. Of course, we'll have to go shopping at the mall in Fort Saskatchewan. There's not exactly an abundance of baby clothes to choose from here in Haven Falls. Catherine was only minimally aware of Sophie's babbling as the blonde drove them back to their house. She stared out the passenger side window, her eyes trained on the vivid green that surrounded them on the small gravel road they traveled but Catherine wasn't taking in the trees either. Her mind refused to focus on anything but those four stupid words. I don't want kids. Catherine was forced from her numb state when the SUV began to slow, coming to a dawdling halt on the side of the road. She shot Sophie a confused look. After all, the prince house was still a solid mile away and immediately wished she hadn't. The blonde's features were twisted in blatant concern. Catherine, are you okay? Catherine opened her mouth to declare that she was fine, good, maybe even to offer a sarcastic, just dandy. But the words got stuck in her throat, refusing to come out. And then, to her horror, she could feel the tears she thought she had successfully battled away in the clinic bathroom return to her eyes. Am I okay? she repeated, her voice cracking on the last word before irrational, and if she was being completely honest, misdirected. Anger took hold of her. Really, Sophie? What do you think? As you're pandering on about how thrilled you were to be an auntie, I'm trying to come to terms with the fact that I'm about to become a mom at the age of seventeen. She wrenched her gaze away from the blonde, digging the heels of her hands into her eyes, willing the wetness she could feel threatening to spill out of them to just go away. God, I'm just like those stupid girls on that even stupider MTV show. She took a deep breath. Like those girls that judgmental grannies stare at in supermarkets, making snide comments under their breath about how they couldn't keep their legs closed. Sophie wrinkled her nose in confusion at the television show reference, but understood well enough what Catherine was saying. Oh, honey. Jesus, Sophie, my mom used to make those comments, she said, turning to face the other girl. It was one of her biggest fears that one of her daughters would get pregnant before graduating college, much less high school, and here I am about to make her a grandma before she's even turned fifty. Catherine, you have graduated school. Maybe not the high school in Middletown, but certainly the one in Haven Falls. And in Haven Falls, you're very much considered an adult. Besides, you don't know for sure what your mom will say. Maybe her views have changed since then. After all, you certainly have. Despite Sophie's attempt to comfort her, Catherine knew very well what her mother would say. What were you thinking? How could you do this to me? Haven't you already thrown enough of your life away? Get your butt home right now, young lady. Catherine's father hadn't exactly told her why it was that Catherine had to leave Middletown last spring, and while Catherine made the effort to call home at least twice a month, her relationship with Elaine had been rocky at best since she'd left. Though, if she were being honest, it had been shaky for a long time. And trust me, Sophie continued, ignorant of Catherine's inner dialogue, no one in Haven Falls will be looking at you like you're some sort of slut when you start to show. Catherine shot Sophie a disbelieving look. Sure, she deadpanned. Well, you will get looks, Sophie admitted, but hardly for the reason you think. New life is treasured here, especially with the recent concerns about our population. Old ladies will be fighting to be the first to rub your belly, not making nasty comments behind your back. 
That did not make Catherine feel any better. She didn't want any attention directed her way, good or bad, and the idea of people she hardly knew grabbing at her stomach caused an oddly protective feeling to buzz under her skin. It was a strange thing to feel something so strongly for something... someone. She hadn't even been aware existed a mere hour ago. I don't think I'm ready for this, Catherine admitted in a near whisper, crossing her arms over her stomach as if the baby she was now thoroughly aware was in there could hear her words and take offense. Sophie gently took a hold of Catherine's chin, forcing her to meet her eyes. Of course you're ready. If you were ready enough to mate with my brother, then you're ready enough for this. After all, falling pregnant is a pretty normal result of having sex. Feeling a hot blush creep up her neck, Catherine jerked her chin out of Sophie's hand. Her words had sounded suspiciously like a lecture, a lecture Catherine really didn't need right now. After all, she knew perfectly well that sex could lead to pregnancy, and she and Bastion had had plenty of it, all of it unprotected. She just hadn't thought. She hadn't thought. That was it. She just hadn't thought. Catherine squeezed her eyes tightly shut, willing away the stupid, traitorous tears she could feel threatening to well in them again. Hey... Sophie said, tone of voice much gentler as she tentatively took one of Catherine's hands into her own. All I meant was that you faced so much adversity this past year. The life you had always known was abruptly ripped away from you. You've helped take down men twice your size who were trying to kill you. You even managed to put up with my brother on a daily basis. If you can do all that, you can do this. And you won't be doing it alone. You have me, the pack, and Bastion, of course. Bastion. Dread pooled in Catherine's stomach as she once again recalled his words. I don't want kids. How was she supposed to tell him? As much as Catherine worried about all the other obstacles that came along with having a baby— not the least of which was the actual having a baby part. It was his reaction to the news that truly scared her. But she couldn't tell that to Sophie. She took a deep breath, squeezing Sophie's hand once with her own before pulling it away. You're right, she said, pacifying the girl instead. I know you are. I'm just overwhelmed and kind of tired. Can we please go home? Sophie offered her a soft smile. Sure. The blonde shifted the vehicle back into drive, and they were once again on their way. Only a few minutes later, they were turning into their graveled driveway. Sophie didn't even have the chance to put the SUV into park before Bastion was storming out of the house's front doors, his expression dark and his pace brisk as he lumbered down the porch steps and marched to the car. Unimpressed by her brother's display, Sophie just rolled her eyes. She reached for her door handle, apparently intent on meeting him in the yard. Before she could open the door, however, Catherine hurriedly grabbed her sleeve. Please don't say anything about, well, you know, she hurriedly requested as she eyed the man's approach. I want to be the one to tell him. Sophie's face immediately softened from an irritated pinch to an understanding smile. Of course, she assured. Catherine hadn't gained Sophie's compliance a second too soon because a moment later, Bastion was ripping open the passenger side door. His hands went to her face, the gesture almost involuntary as he took her between his hands, thumbs smoothing over the skin under her eyes as he looked her over. While his gaze may have been focused on her, the question that tore out of his mouth was directed at Sophie. "'Where have you been?' he demanded angrily. "'The clinic, of course,' Sophie responded in an offhanded manner that she must have known would annoy Bastion. "'You did want her to go first thing in the morning, didn't you?' Bastion sent Sophie a glare over Catherine's head, 
clearly debating while he glowered if it was worth it to point out that he'd obviously intended to go with her. Ultimately, his thirst for answers must have been greater than his urge to tear into his sister. He turned his eyes back onto Catherine. Well, how'd it go, then? Did Gabriella look you over? What did she say? When Catherine opened her mouth to respond, she intended to tell the truth. Truly, she did. But the words got trapped somewhere between her throat and her tongue. Uh, well... Catherine was frozen, utterly unsettled by the concerned azure eyes boring holes into her green ones, and before she had even made the conscious decision to do it, she was talking. Nothing, really. She just said I probably have some sort of stomach bug, which is why my appetite has been so shoddy lately, which led to me passing out a few days ago. Otherwise, I'm fine, in perfect health, just like I tried to tell you. Except the words that poured out of her mouth were lies. A stomach bug? Bastion repeated doubtfully, and Catherine could hardly blame him. Werewolves weren't exactly known for catching common illnesses with their evolved immune systems. Well, I did manage to get pneumonia seven, eight months ago, too, she pointed out. Bastion's skepticism cleared at the reminder, but his concern didn't disappear as he finally let go of her face. Only you, he muttered, shaking his head before pulling her into a fierce hug. Well, simple stomach bug or not, I want you to take it easy until your appetite is back to normal. Catherine buried her face into Bastion's shoulder, content to ignore Sophie's burning gaze on the back of her head for now. But guilt caused her stomach to churn, and the words were bitter on her tongue when she responded, Don't worry, I think I feel better already. Liar. Catherine felt like she had the word inked across her forehead in big block letters. Almost an entire week had passed since she'd found out she was what she had started mentally referring to as the P-word, and still she hadn't managed to tell Bastion. It wasn't that she hadn't tried. It was just that every time she managed to work up the courage to do it, something would go, well, not wrong, exactly but sideways at the very least. For example, she'd been intent on correcting her mistake, her lie, that very first night. Nude except for her underwear, Catherine stared at herself in the bathroom mirror. Specifically, she stared at her stomach. She didn't know what she expected to see. It had only been a little over twelve hours since she'd found out she was... Well, expecting. It wasn't like she thought she'd somehow sprout a giant beach ball of a belly over the course of a single day, but she thought that with the knowledge that there was a baby somewhere in there, she might notice at least some difference. But there was nothing. As far as Catherine could see, her stomach looked the same as it always had. The same flat planes. The same curve of her hip. It was disconcerting, in a way, to have no physical evidence of something so monumental going on inside her own body. For God's sake, it was growing a baby. A baby whose father had no idea it existed. Catherine sighed, ripping her gaze away from the mirror at the traitorous thought, and turning her attention to the tub she was running behind her. She'd accidentally let it get fuller than she generally liked, and quickly moved to shut off the water. Tearing off what remained of her clothes, she settled herself into the steaming bath. Instead of the usual soothing effect the hot water had on her muscles, however, she could feel them grow tauter and tauter the longer she sat. It was obvious to her why. After all... How could Catherine possibly relax with the knowledge of Bastion's lack of knowledge heavy on her mind? It had been foolish to even try. There would be no reprieve for her until she told him. So that was exactly what she was going to do. Tell him. Despite the fact that she'd just lowered herself into the water five minutes ago, 
she braced her hands on either side of the tub and prepared to use them to pull herself out of the bath. She was going to march right up to Bastion and tell him, Consequences be damned. Before she'd even moved more than an inch, however, the bathroom door squeaked open, and, in a twist of events, the man she had intended to seek out found her. He peeked his head in the door, and Catherine let her hands fall back into the water, an entirely involuntary blush crawling up her cheeks as she quickly arranged the bubbles to make sure all her bits were amply covered. She was glad she'd made the last-second decision to add the bubble bath to the water. "'Do you need something?' she asked, hoping the snark she injected in her voice disguised her embarrassment as he unabashedly stared. She'd failed to hide it completely, judging by the amused uptick of his mouth. She couldn't bring herself to be properly mad, though. Not really. Not when she knew how illogical it was for her to even be self-conscious in the first place. He'd seen her naked countless times, after all, and most every instance she wound up wrapped in his embrace. He'd never seen her in the bath before, though, and there was something different about it. Something taboo. Just you, he replied, stepping the rest of the way into the room and closing the door behind him. Catherine's blush heightened, and her eyes widened as she took in the fact that Bastion was naked. She couldn't help but allow them to roam over his bulging arms, sculpted chest, and lower. They fixated for a brief moment on the thick organ between his muscled thighs before she forced them back up to his face, and quickly realized that his little, amused smirk had grown into a full-blown grin. Catherine rolled her eyes. Really? she demanded, not knowing if she was responding to the cheesy line or Bastion's blatant nudity. He released a full belly laugh in response that warmed Catherine from the inside out. Yes, really, he said, sitting on the edge of the tub. So are you going to invite me in, or what? Catherine huffed. Well, you're hardly playing fair, strutting in here in only your birthday suit. Ah, yes, I've heard that bubbles are much more in season. Shut up, she said, as she fought not to laugh, taking the opportunity to splash him for the teasing remark. Bastion's smile somehow widened further before straightening out into a straight line. May I? he asked again, this time more seriously, the respectful way he held himself making it clear that no was a perfectly acceptable answer. Except it wasn't. Not to Catherine, anyway. Get in here. Bastion wasted no time in complying. He lowered himself into the bath on the opposite side of Catherine so that they were facing each other. The tub was big enough that it accommodated both of them, but not so large that their legs weren't entangled with one another's under the water. It was only a slightly tighter fit than what Catherine may or may not have daydreamed about. She watched with a dry mouth as he grabbed the unscented bar of soap resting on the back edge of the tub and began building a lather by rubbing it between his hands. In fact, so entranced by the action was she that when one of said hands shot forward in an attempt to take hold of her elbow, Catherine startled away. "'What are you doing?' she demanded in an embarrassing squeak. Bastion blinked, a rarely spotted flush beginning to creep up his neck. I was going to wash you. The way he seemed almost embarrassed by the urge was the only thing that kept Catherine's own blush at bay. It seemed like such an intimate thing. The inner sap in her, small as she may have been, couldn't help but find the notion romantic. Unless, was this some weird thing about her being sick and Bastion thinking he had to take care of her? You don't have to, Catherine argued, knowing she probably sounded more defensive than the situation warranted. I'm perfectly capable of doing it myself. Bastion frowned, but didn't seem deterred by her response. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. I know you can do it yourself, but I want to do this. 
If you'll let me, that is. The words were delivered so sweetly that Catherine didn't even have it in her to be ashamed of her initial prickly reaction. Well, when you put it that way, she mumbled. Bastion's frown quickly transformed into a smile, and when he reached forward to grab her elbow, this time Catherine let him. He slowly brought the bar of soap up to her arm, giving her ample time to change her mind if she wanted, before running the sudsy bar up and down her arm. He took his time, spending a large amount of it on her hand, rubbing soft circles into her palm with his thumb and stroking between her fingers before moving on to her other limb, giving it the same treatment. Turn around, he requested softly when he was done and having melted into little more than a puddle of goo under the ministrations of his magical fingers, Catherine obeyed without question. He didn't even bother with the bar of soap, abandoning it on the edge of the tub after coating his hands in another sudsy lather, and Catherine couldn't help but release a moan of approval when he dug his fingers into the tense muscles of her back, working them into her shoulders before allowing them to glide up and down her spine. It felt so good that Catherine could almost forget why her muscles were so tense in the first place. Almost. But even that retreated to the back of her mind when she suddenly felt Bastion's mouth on the back of her neck, his teeth scraping lightly over the claiming mark there. Bastion, she groaned in a half-hearted protest. She could feel the way his lips lifted into a smirk against her skin before he placed an innocent kiss there and obediently moved away. Catherine didn't even have time to feel disappointed before his arms were suddenly around her, maneuvering her back around so that they were once again facing each other. Then he lifted her out of the water, setting her down so that her butt was resting on the edge of the tub. Bastion, she half shrieked, what are you doing? she demanded tightly pressing her legs together and crossing her arms over her chest. "'I've yet to wash your legs,' he pointed out, voice so blasé that if a mischievous glint wasn't present in his eyes, she may have just believed his actions were as innocent as he claimed. She narrowed her eyes at him. "'Bastion!' He pressed a chaste kiss to the knob of her right knee in response. "'Okay?' Was it? Oh, who was she kidding? She took a deep breath. Okay. Catherine tried her hardest to push down the self-conscious induced wariness she felt as Bastion once again used the bar of soap to build a lather before rubbing the suds into her calves. His hands were large enough that each one nearly wrapped around her entire limb. He rubbed her calves up and down going so far as to massage her feet in his efforts to help her relax. He dug his thumbs into the arches and rubbed circles into the balls of her feet before dragging his hands back up to her knees, pressing kisses to both of them this time as he allowed his hands to trail up her thighs, stroking the outsides before daring to wedge his fingers between the inner thighs that she'd kept tightly closed, asking without words that she spread them apart. As silly as she knew it was to be nervous, Catherine couldn't help the flush she could feel burning from her chest all the way to the tips of her ears. There was just something so intimate, almost endearing, even, about Bastion sitting between her legs, asking her to open herself up for him. Teeth digging into her plump bottom lip, little more than a chew toy at this point, Catherine complied. Bastion didn't bother reapplying the soap that had long since worn off his hands. He just trailed them up her inner thighs, massaging her muscles with his thumbs. The closer he got to the juncture between her thighs, the more Catherine's flush burned. Even her insides felt like they were about to catch fire as the inferno of want in her belly grew until she was trembling. And then one of his thumbs brushed against her outer lips, and she was beyond thankful for the wall against her back as she arched backward and sucked in a noisy breath. Bastion glanced up at her at the sudden commotion. She was sure that his glazed eyes matched her own love-drunk stare, and without releasing her from his gaze, 
Bastion's other hand crept upward until his thumb was pressed snugly against the little nub that operated as the pleasure center of her body. Bastion, she cried, her voice cracking halfway through his name when he began rubbing his thumb in slow, soft circles. You're so beautiful. Catherine huffed at the compliment. How could he even talk right then, let alone string together a coherent sentence? It wasn't fair. Please, she begged. Please what? he asked, daring to press his thumb down harder against the little nub and sending sparks of pleasure shooting up Catherine's spine. She swallowed down a moan, her entire body trembling in anticipation, but she couldn't put into words what she wanted him to do. It wasn't something he'd ever done before, but the very thought of his mouth on her down there, well, it was enough to have goosebumps erupting all over her body. Please, this? he asked when it became apparent that she wasn't going to answer, and Catherine couldn't have taken her eyes off him if she'd wanted to when he slowly leaned forward. She felt his warm breath against her, before his mouth was suddenly where his thumb had been a moment before, pressing a kiss to her right there. She couldn't control the spasms that rocked her legs when he sucked the little nub between his teeth before pulling away. While a small part of Catherine fumed at the teasing, the overwhelming majority of her was too submerged in mindless pleasure to even think of being mad. It helped that she could see his heavy erection pressed hard against his stomach under the mostly clear water. As a result, she was shameless in her begging. Yes, that. Please, Bastion. Those words were all it took for him to dive back between her legs, burying his head in her thighs as his eager mouth lapped and sucked at her most intimate place. The life growing inside her— and the guilt she felt about Bastion knowing nothing about it, were the last things on her mind as he pushed her trembling body past its breaking point, bringing her over the edge of pleasure into ecstasy. It hadn't seemed appropriate to tell Bastion after that. After all, what was Catherine supposed to have said— Thanks for the awesome orgasm, by the way, no big deal, but in nine months or so you're going to be a daddy. Not likely. Nevertheless, Catherine had still been intent on telling him, and she'd made an honest effort to do just that multiple times since the first attempt, one of the most prominent being when she invited Bastion on an afternoon walk to the falls two days later under Sophie's approving gaze. After all, she was much less likely to get distracted on the prickly forest floor— Unfortunately, Catherine had underestimated how tired the walk through the woods would make her in her condition, and she couldn't hide the fact that she was short of breath only ten minutes in. Oof, Catherine gasped when she was suddenly grabbed around the waist. Bastion used her surprise to his advantage and easily maneuvered her so that he held her in a cradle-like position, one arm under her knees and the other curled around her middle back. She huffed, crossing her arms over her chest. Just what do you think you're doing? Carrying you, he answered plainly, the intrinsic, duh, going unsaid. I know that, she snapped. But why? I am perfectly capable of walking, you know. I've been doing it since I was, oh, I don't know, about one year old. Bastion did little more than raise an eyebrow at her tone. Maybe, but you sounded like you were having a hard time, he pointed out, continuing to trudge along like he hadn't abruptly added a solid 120 pounds to his load. Catherine wanted to protest, to remind him that she would have asked for help if she needed it, but she hardly saw the point when they both knew it would be a lie. Asking for assistance wasn't exactly her strong suit, after all. It was a personality trait they shared. You're sick, he added gently when she didn't respond. It's okay to accept help. It's what the pack is for, what I'm for. Guilt caused her stomach to clench uncomfortably, 
and Catherine buried her head in Bastion's chest in an attempt to hide the self-reproach she was sure was painted across her face. Because she wasn't sick. Not the way he thought, anyway. And it certainly wasn't the reason for her shortness of breath. It was those pesky pregnancy hormones wreaking havoc on her body. And Bastion had no idea. But she couldn't tell him that. Not just yet. I know, she muttered into his jacket instead, acknowledging his words. They spent the remainder of the hike to the falls in a comfortable silence. Despite her nagging conscience, Catherine allowed herself to enjoy the sensation of being encased in Bastion's warm embrace, and she occupied herself by playing with the dark hair that liked to curl around the nape of the man's neck. It wasn't long before they arrived. We're here, Bastion announced when they reached the clearing that contained the waterfall Haven Falls was named after, easing Catherine back onto the ground. She took a moment to allow her eyes to drink in the sight like she always did whenever she managed to make it out to the falls. It marveled her how Mother Nature could be responsible for forming such a magnificent landmark and she watched as water trickled peacefully down the tower of jaded rocks into the pool of water beneath it. It's so beautiful, she muttered. I swear it takes me by surprise every time. Yeah, Bastion agreed softly, but when she glanced his way she quickly realized his gaze was fixated on her, not the falls, and that a little grin was tugging at the corner of his mouth. She rolled her eyes at the shameless flattery. Really? The tiny grin matured into a full-blown smile. Yeah. You're impossible, she muttered before using her hands to gesture at the ground. Now sit. Bastion raised a suspicious eyebrow at the blunt order. Why? he asked. Catherine sighed. Just do it, please. Bastion's eyes retained their distrustful gleam, but he complied, lowering himself onto the bed of grass beside her until he was sitting with his legs stretched out before him. Now what? Now, Catherine said, shifting so that she was standing behind him. You relax. Without further ado, she positioned her hands on both of his shoulders and dug her fingers into the tense muscles located there. Bastion's immediate response was to groan at the sensation, and Catherine couldn't have stopped the proud grin from stretching across her lips if she'd tried. Bastion pulled his legs up to his chest so he could rest his head against his knees and give her better access to his back. Catherine was all too happy to oblige. Unfortunately, only a few minutes into the massage, Catherine's happiness had all but dissipated. Bastion's back was a mess of stress-induced knots, and was so tense in some places that it felt more like she was trying to force her fingers into the hard planes of a statue instead of the muscles of a living, breathing person. He already carried so many burdens, and she was about to add another one to his load. She just hoped that this one didn't break him. Catherine was slowly massaging her way down his spine when Bastion finally spoke. Not that I'm complaining, but what's this for? Oh, she was only trying to butter him up before dropping a bomb on his life as he knew it. I just thought you could use a little something to remind you of how appreciated you are, she said instead. I know you've been under a lot of pressure from the council with everything that's going on. Catherine pressed her lips together. I mean, you know that you can lean on me for support, too, right? She asked, regurgitating his previous statement. Asking for help isn't a one-way street. I... She paused, fighting a blush that threatened to overtake her. I like taking care of you, too, she admitted softly. Oh, Catherine... Besides, she added, in an attempt to lighten the mood before Bastion decided to get too sappy on her, a little massage is the least I can do for your poor muscles after you carried me practically the whole way here. He snorted at that. 
Please, you're a tiny thing, he said, speaking into the worn knees of his jeans. I can hardly even tell the difference between walking with you in my arms and without. Catherine bit her lip. Even if that was true, it wouldn't remain that way for long. Caleb had managed to get his hands on a watermelon from the market the other day, and she'd attempted to picture her stomach swelling to the size of the huge rounded fruit and nearly cried. What if she got so large that Bastion's attraction to her withered away into nothing? She could hardly bring herself to even think such a thing. The longer Catherine rubbed his back, the tenser the silence between them seemed to grow, and the heavier the secret she carried seemed to be. She had to tell him. Catherine was moments away from combusting, and she opened her mouth to choke out the life-altering information when Bastion abruptly twisted around, and she ended up releasing a surprised yelp instead when he pulled her into his lap. How do you always know exactly what I need? he asked softly, pressing his forehead to hers. Catherine blinked. Huh? Bastion brushed his nose against hers, and it became apparent that while the silence they'd been sitting in the past five minutes may have been uncomfortable for Catherine, it was anything but for Bastion. This, getting out of the house and clearing my head, the massage and spending time together, just us. Catherine swallowed. Just us? Just us, he reiterated offering her a smile that shone brighter than the sun or moon ever could. And just like that, Catherine's throat swelled shut. She couldn't possibly tell him about the plus one in her belly and that it would never be just them again. Instead, it was all she could do to force herself to return his smile before hiding her face in his shoulder. As shaky as she knew her smile had been, it must have also been convincing enough because Bastion didn't question it. Catherine almost wished he would have. She hated feeling like a coward, and while she'd never thought of herself as one before, the quickly stacking evidence suggested otherwise. Unfortunately, every day, every hour that passed, the more difficult it was for her to work up the nerve to tell him. Thus, she tended to spend her time alternately avoiding Sophie and hiding her food in her napkin at mealtimes, artistically rearranging her plate to make it look like she ate more than she actually did. It was a risky endeavor to employ under such watchful eyes, but still a better option than being caught throwing up again. Regardless, Catherine knew she just needed to get it over with and tell him. She'd convinced herself to do it that very morning, in fact, come hell or high water, come oral sex or sentimental comments about just us. Unfortunately, she'd woken up to Bastion getting ready to go to yet another impromptu council meeting, and now she sat at the kitchen table, trapped between Caleb and Zane with Sophie drilling holes into her from across the table. It was no wonder, really, why she felt like she had the word liar etched into her forehead. Catherine pushed the pile of scrambled eggs Caleb had prepared her across her plate, eyeing the buttery trail they left behind and trying to control the churning of her stomach. Are you sure you don't want Caleb to make you something else, honey? Sophie asked. You don't seem all that hungry for eggs. Caleb not at all offended at his services being offered without his permission, nodded eagerly from his spot on Catherine's left. I can get an early start on those banana muffins I was planning on making this afternoon, he offered. The idea sounded ridiculously mouth-watering, but... No thanks, this is great, Catherine assured, shoving a forkful of eggs into her mouth and making herself swallow. She braved a glance at Caleb, and then Sophie before focusing her eyes once more on her plate. Besides, even if I wanted something else, I could make it myself. Oh, really? Like you've done other things yourself? Catherine tensed at the pointed comment, forcing herself to look back up at the woman who'd made it. 
Sophie's eyebrows were raised and her arms were crossed over her chest disapprovingly as she waited for a response. But Catherine wasn't sure what she expected her to say. It was obvious enough what Sophie was referring to. Catherine knew very well that she hadn't told Bastion the news yet. And she also knew very well that she had to soon or the blonde in front of her would do it for her. Catherine wrenched her gaze away from Sophie's, fighting the urge to fidget in her seat as Zane and Caleb warily watched on. They'd obviously picked up on the strain between the two girls. Luckily, the foursome wasn't sitting in the tension-filled silence for longer than half a minute before the front doors burst open. Relief flooded Catherine at the sound, but when she turned to greet the two men who'd unwittingly rescued her, it just as suddenly vanished. Bastion and Marcus looked pissed. There was no other way to describe the expressions on their faces. Bastion's jaw was clenched to the point of veins bulging out of his neck, Marcus's nostrils were flared, and both of their brows were furrowed in blatant distress. Maybe their abrupt entrance wasn't so lucky then. For a second, Catherine feared that Gabriella, the only other person besides her and Sophie that knew of her condition, had spilled the beans. She'd worried about the exact scenario already once earlier in the week, when Bastion had been called away for a meeting, but so far the woman had kept the information to herself. What's going on? Zane asked the question for all of them. Oh, the same crap as usual, Marcus spit out as he stomped over to the stove, and Catherine allowed her stiff shoulders to relax. Oh, Bastion, my son's mate got her period again, he mocked. What if she never gets pregnant? What if nobody does ever again? Please, we need to bring in fresh blood. He shook his head as he shoved a sausage into his mouth. I swear to God, if I have to hear another damn word about any woman's monthly cycle again... Catherine bit her lip. As relieved as she was that her secret was still safe, she did feel more than a little bad about the fact that she held the solution to the Council's growing hysteria in her uterus. This is ridiculous, Zane complained from his seat at the table. A lull in reproduction is hardly unprecedented. It's likely pure happenstance that no babies have been conceived thus far this year, and if not, there's probably good reason for it. After all, if our population got too large too quickly, we'd be at risk for discovery. Mother Nature is merely nixing such a risk. Marcus snorted. Yeah, well, you tell them that. They're not taking no for an answer. Catherine felt her entire body stiffen at Marcus's proclamation, and her eyes darted over to Bastion, who'd yet to say a word since his return from the meeting. Not only hadn't he said anything, he wasn't looking at them. His back was turned to the pack as a whole, with his hands braced on the countertop in front of him. What does that mean? Sophie demanded incredulously. When Bastion still didn't speak up, Marcus sighed. The Council wants to send a group of envoys to the Western Colony in a bid to see if they really live as crudely as Bastion claims— and possibly even extend an invitation to merge colonies if their living conditions and pack-specific traditions are found acceptable. He paused. Of course, as head Alpha, they expect Bastion to lead this group of envoys. What? What? Sophie asked, the disbelieving tone of her voice matching exactly what Catherine was feeling. For a long moment, no one spoke. Is it true? Catherine asked quietly, finally able to make her lips and tongue work together to speak actual words for the first time since the two men had returned from the meeting. You're leaving? Bastion's entire body somehow tensed further at the question before he finally forced himself to turn around, his blue eyes immediately finding Catherine's green ones. Only for a few weeks. A feeling of such despair came over Catherine at the confirmation that for a second it felt like Bastion had punched a hole through her chest 
instead of announcing he'd be inaccessible to her for a couple of weeks. But just the thought of being alone, of Bastion willingly leaving her, made it difficult to breathe, and she had to force herself to keep taking in air around the quickly enlarging hole, despite the fact that it felt like her entire being was caving in on itself. It was utterly ridiculous, but also incredibly real. Bastion, you can't go, Sophie snapped, breaking the tense silence the kitchen had fallen into at his announcement. She shot Catherine an imploring glance. For once, Catherine was in complete agreement with the other girl. You think I want to? Bastion demanded harshly, showcasing his blatant anger at the Council's decision for the first time in words. It's the only way they're going to drop this goddamn asinine idea of joining colonies. Tell him, Catherine ordered herself sternly. So you're just going to leave the pack alpha-less, then? Sophie shot back, standing from her chair. Unprotected? You're going to leave Catherine unprotected? Bastion pulled his lips back to form a downright wolfish snarl at the accusation. Shut your mouth he snapped. Marcus will remain here to protect the pack, and I've already talked to Luther about patrolling the house at night. Just tell him. The distress Catherine was feeling must have been obvious, because Caleb placed one of his hands over hers where he continued to sit on her left, and offered it a supportive squeeze. Catherine gratefully squeezed back. You can't go. Why not, Sophie? And what the hell makes you think you have any say? I'm pregnant, Catherine muttered, finally managing to force the truth past the lump in her throat and bracing herself for the pack's, for Bastion's, reaction. But there was none. She'd spoken the words so hesitantly, so softly, that no one, not even Caleb, who hovered worriedly over her shoulder, had heard them. She pressed her lips together, blinking back sudden, furious tears as Bastion and Sophie's argument continued to escalate. Their raised voices, mostly Bastion and Sophie's, but occasionally Marcus and Zane would interject too, became nothing more than incessant buzzing in her ears. Catherine took a deep breath. Would everyone just shut up? she exclaimed loudly using the courage that her sudden anger had granted her to pry her hand from Caleb's and stand. Everyone quieted at the sudden clamor, five pairs of eyes zeroing in on her with varying degrees of surprise. I just said, she pointed out calmly, somehow successful in keeping her voice steady, that I'm pregnant. The last word was spoken with such conviction that Catherine wasn't sure if it actually echoed throughout the kitchen or if it was only reverberating in her own ears. Pregnant, pregnant, pregnant. Everyone stared. Caleb's eyes were blown wide, Zane's eyebrows rose to his hairline, and Marcus looked downright gobsmacked. Even Sophie, who'd known about the pregnancy— looked a little shell-shocked at the sudden announcement. But Bastion, his expression remained stoic. Besides freezing, he showed no visible reaction to her proclamation, and Catherine's ire-induced courage abruptly fled. That's why you can't go, she added quietly, the words hardly more than a whisper. Still, no one spoke. I tried to tell you earlier, she bit out in a rush, the words she'd kept locked up suddenly flying past her tongue in their desperate bid for freedom. But I didn't know how, and it never seemed like the right time. I found out last week at the clinic after the fainting and puking. I also failed to shift on the full moon, she added, grossly aware of the fact that she was rambling, but also unable to stop herself. Besides me, only Sophie and Gabriella knew. I'm sorry I didn't say anything before now. I just didn't think... I just didn't think you'd be happy. I just didn't think you'd want it. 
she swallowed. I guess I just didn't think. The oppressive silence stretched on until finally... Is it true? Bastion asked, voice void of emotion. It hurt more than Catherine could ever say when he directed the question and his gaze at Sophie instead of her. Yes, Sophie confirmed quietly. Somehow, Catherine knew what Bastion was going to do before he did it, keeping his eyes directed steadfastly away from her imploring gaze. He walked. He didn't run or even stomp, just walked. Out of the front double doors, pulling them open before letting them shut behind him. Not with a resounding bang, but rather a somehow much more poignant, quiet click. Chapter 6 Bastion had left her. She'd finally told him and he left her. Logic thought to break through the dumb sort of daze that fell over her in response to his actions. After all, Bastion hadn't left her, left her. Not only were they essentially soulmates, but she was a member of his pack. They lived in the same house together, slept in the same bedroom. He'd be back. He had to be, at some point. But there was no room in her bludgeoned heart for logic at that very moment. To protect herself, Catherine shut down. She felt numb, a tingling sort of feeling buzzing in her fingers and toes as she stood paralyzed, her feet stuck to the kitchen floor as her eyes remained glued to the front doors through which Bastion had just disappeared. He left her. Unfortunately or, fortunately, whichever way one looked at it, Catherine knew the shock couldn't and wouldn't last long. It was only a matter of time before the dam holding her messy emotions back burst and they flooded all over the place. Oh, honey, I'm sure, Bastion... She was right. All it took was those handful of words offered to her sympathetically in Sophie's voice and tears swamped her eyes. Before they could fall, Catherine bolted. She hightailed it out of the kitchen, not running out the front door after Bastion. She would never follow after someone who so deliberately walked away from her like that, but retreating to her bedroom. She slammed the door after herself, so very opposite of the way Bastion had calmly clicked closed the front entrance, and she would have locked it, too, if that option had been available. Then she threw herself onto her bed, burying her face into one of the pillows there, and allowed the floodgates to open. She cried into the pillow until it was damp with her tears. They weren't loud, heaving sobs that escaped her, but softer, broken little cries as she tried to wrap her mind around the hormonal-induced emotions threatening to overwhelm her. She didn't know how much time passed while she wept, but her eyes were sore, and she'd ignored knocks on the door from all of her packmates, except Bastion, of course. Knock, knock. Catherine, look, I'm sorry about my brother. I'm sure he'll come around sooner rather than later. Won't you please come out? Knock, knock. Catherine, I made those banana muffins I was talking about earlier. Come out and try to eat. Here, I'll leave them by the door. Knock, knock. While denying your body substance for a few hours at this stage of pregnancy is hardly likely to cause any harm to the fetus, you do realize that it's not exactly healthy either, right? Catherine? Knock, knock. If I were you, princess, I'd get your scrawny little ass out here before I'd come in there and drag it out myself. Despite his threats, Marcus didn't even jiggle the door handle before she eventually managed to tire herself out enough to fall asleep. When she finally woke up, the skin around her eyes was even more swollen than when she'd fallen asleep. There was an annoying ache thrumming through her temples, and she was enveloped in a familiar warmth. For a second, she thought it was Bastion, that he had returned and snuck into bed and wrapped her up tightly in his arms. Except... 
The arm draped around her belly wasn't possessive in the least. It lay over her hip passively, no fingers curling around the bone there. Not only that, but the limb felt just a tad bulkier than usual. And the soft beard that tickled the back of her neck definitely wasn't the same scratchy stubble she was used to. Whoever had crawled into bed with her while she was sleeping was not Bastion. Catherine stiffened, her heart suddenly pounding twice as fast in her chest as she forced her heavy eyelids open. She quickly took note of the fact that despite having hid herself away in the room shortly after breakfast, darkness had already fallen outside. There was no light filtering in through the shuttered blinds. The body behind her shifted at the tiny movement, the arm around her waist tightening a fraction. Relax, princess, a familiar voice muttered in her ear. Marcus's baritone sent such a strong wave of relief rushing through her that Catherine couldn't help but obey, her heart nearly immediately slowing back down to its regular pace and the stiffness in her shoulders fleeing. Still. What are you doing? Catherine hissed, grabbing the man's wrist and pushing his arm off her. She sat up, turning around to face him. Marcus's hazel eyes were open, clear, and focused. No sign of drunkenness or sudden lunacy present, the only two explanations Catherine could think of for his presence in her and Bastion's bed. He didn't seem particularly impressed by her indignation, merely raising an eyebrow. I was sick of listening to your damn whimpering, not to mention the tossing and turning. Someone needed to do something, he explained bluntly except they both knew that that someone wasn't him. Now lay back down and go to sleep, he added impatiently, when she didn't immediately respond, just continued to stare incredulously at him from her sitting position on the bed. Catherine pressed her lips together, sorely tempted to literally kick the man out of her bed. Truthfully, though, she couldn't deny that the man's presence— even if it wasn't the person's she really wanted, acted as a sort of soothing balm to her wounded heart. Silly as it was, the company of a capable protector calmed the extra serving of crazy brought on by her recent uptick in hormones, and made her feel just a tiny bit less hysterical about Bastion's very intentional absence. So Catherine allowed herself to flop back down onto the mattress— Fine, she muttered, as she pulled the covers up to nearly her chin. But don't blame me if he kills you. They both knew what he she was referring to. She made sure to keep a respectable distance from Marcus, leaving a good two feet between them as she settled into her side of the bed. Marcus snorted. It's all part of the plan. Climbing into your bed will have set off instinctual alarm bells in his head that will eventually lure him back here. The beating I suffer will be worth putting a stop to your incessant crying. Catherine rolled her eyes at his teasing, but she couldn't help the first real smile from pulling at the corners of her mouth since her morning announcement had gone so horribly awry. You'll have to excuse me if I don't mourn your death. Marcus laughed at that, and to Catherine's embarrassment, she dissolved into giggles, too, the uncontrollable kind marked with a tinge of hysteria. "'Only you,' he muttered once she managed to get a hold of herself. "'Good God, the first bitten wolf to get pregnant in decades. What luck!' He sounded both appropriately odd and horrified. It matched her feelings about the matter pretty much exactly— and she couldn't help but be relieved that someone actually got it, even if it was only Marcus. She reached over and playfully slapped his shoulder. Shut up. Shockingly enough, the man listened, and a comfortable silence descended after that. Unfortunately, Catherine wasn't as apt at keeping her own mouth shut, not with the multitude of emotions she could still feel roiling under her skin, begging for release the most noticeable of which being outright worry. She gnawed at her bottom lip until she couldn't take it any more. "'What am I going to do?' she asked, tentatively breaking the quiet. 
Marcus sighed but didn't seem truly annoyed by the question. Nothing. From what I understand, the female body's been doing this for centuries. Millennia, even. Marcus, she threatened quietly. He propped himself up on his elbow and stared down at her. The anxiety she was feeling must have been plastered clearly enough on her face, because his features almost immediately softened. He sighed. Seriously, Catherine. Nothing. Just relax. We'll take care of you. The only thing you have to worry about is when the time comes, doing the right thing and naming the little beast after who will undoubtedly be his favorite uncle. Catherine rolled her eyes. Caleb, she challenged. He snorted, raising an unimpressed eyebrow. So what if it's a girl, she pointed out. He shrugged one shoulder, seemingly unconcerned as he rolled over onto his back. Marcella has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Catherine laughed, and to her surprise, even though she'd already slept the day away, she could feel her innate tiredness catching up to her. Exhaustion pulled at her eyes. Thanks, Marcus, she managed to mutter before a yawn took over. Yeah, yeah, he muttered. Go back to sleep, princess. She did. The next time Catherine woke, her headache was gone, but she was cold. The skin around her eyes was still incredibly tender, so she kept them shut as she turned from her side onto her back and blindly reached a hand over to the other side of the bed. Instead of encountering a warm body, however, she only felt cool sheets. The place beside her was empty. Catherine frowned. Marcus, she asked, voice thick with sleep as she finally forced her eyes open. He left. Catherine nearly jumped out of her skin at the blunt answer, spoken not in Marcus's baritone, but an even more familiar timbre. The owner of the voice was standing over her. The room was still so dark that Catherine couldn't make out his features, only the general outline of his body. But she'd recognize him anywhere. Bastion. Catherine shot up, quickly pushing herself into a sitting position and throwing her legs over the side of the bed. She intended to stand, but a firm hand on her shoulder stopped her. Her heart, which didn't seem to know if it wanted to crawl into her throat or sink to her belly, fluttered wildly in equal parts joy at the man's return and worry at his reaction to having found Marcus lying with her while he was gone. She knew the two of them had joked about his demise at Bastion's hands earlier, but surely her mate wouldn't go so far as to actually kill the other man. Right? M Marcus was only— She hurried to defend him, but Bastion cut her off with a shake of his head. I know he said, before she could attempt to justify the man's presence in their bed. I get it. He was here when I wasn't. I thanked him and sent him to bed. He sounded as disbelieving of his actions as she felt. Still, relief rushed through her at his surprise understanding. Oh, she responded dumbly. Yeah. She chewed nervously on her inner cheek before taking a deep breath, mentally preparing herself for the conversation she knew she needed to have with Bastion about the tiny life growing inside her belly. Look, Bastion, she said, staring at her knees and fiddling with the frayed end of the shirt that hung there. I should have told you about, well, everything, as soon as I found out. I'm really sorry. Stop. He sounded pained as the hoarse word escaped his mouth, and it had Catherine immediately shutting her own. She swallowed around the lump suddenly present in her throat. Her heart must have finally decided to climb there, and forced herself to look up at him. What she saw there took her by surprise. His brow was pinched in consternation, his eyes shining with something that looked remarkably like remorse. Don't, he choked out. Don't you dare be sorry. I'm the one who should be sorry. I am sorry. Bastion collapsed onto his knees, taking her face between his hands. He smoothed his calloused thumbs over the skin beneath her eyes, 
and she could tell he was beating himself up about the pink puffiness still present there. Catherine vaguely wondered if Marcus had told him she'd pretty much been crying ever since he'd fled that morning. I should never have left you to deal with this situation on your own. Catherine appreciated the apology. Really, she did. But she couldn't help but notice that Bastion didn't speak a single word about his feelings behind the reason he'd run from her in the first place. In fact, the way he referred to the tiny life growing in her belly, this situation, had her feelings shockingly defensive considering she didn't even know how she felt about it. She jerked away from him. And what about this situation? She gestured vaguely at her still flat stomach, knowing that she was being unfair but hardly able to stop herself. After all, Bastion had had less than twenty-four hours to process the fact that he'd knocked her up. She'd had a week to reflect on the matter, and only recently had she been able to mentally refer to the thing growing inside of her as a real, live baby. "'Are you even going to acknowledge the fact that I'm pregnant? Or are you going to pretend that there's not a little werewolf baby growing inside of me? Your little werewolf baby. I mean, what happens when I start swelling up like a balloon, or I go into labor? Are you going to run away like a scared little boy then, too?' Bastion grabbed her hands from the air, where she was waving them around wildly as she talked, refusing to let either go even when she attempted to tug them out of his grasp. "'Look at me,' he commanded. Catherine refused, knowing that the silly tears she could feel swimming in her eyes would be beyond obvious. Instead, she stared firmly at her own lap. But Bastion wasn't about to let her get away with ignoring the order. He rubbed his thumbs soothingly over the pulse points of her wrists. Catherine, he said, his voice infinitely more gentle when he addressed her. Please look at me. Knowing she didn't really have a choice in the matter, and honestly wanting to get whatever he had to say over with, Catherine tightly squeezed her eyes shut once, and then twice, in an effort to rid them of tears before finally obliging and directing her gaze up at him. What? Bastion stared at her for a long moment before speaking. I won't lie to you. I am scared. I'm goddamn terrified. I've never given much thought to becoming a father before, and it's a shock to the system. It's an overwhelming concept to wrap my mind around. Catherine forced herself to keep looking into the man's eyes, despite the heavy disappointment she felt looming over her at his words. But underneath all that... He paused, shaking his head like even he couldn't believe it. There is this ridiculous joy, this absolutely stupid pride in my chest at the thought of you carrying my child. And just like that, the disappointment fled swiftly replaced by surprise and a powerful surge of hope that Catherine quickly worked to suppress. After all, she still remembered his words from barely over a week before, and couldn't quite chase the nagging doubt from her mind at his confession. But you just told me a week ago how much you don't ever want to be responsible for a child, she accused quietly. Bastion squeezed her hands. You're right, he admitted. That was an opinion I held long before I met you, and an opinion I never bothered to re-examine once I had. The odds of us conceiving were so slim that I didn't see the point. But now that I know... Catherine, how could you think that I wouldn't want this? How could I ever not want something, someone, who was half you? Tears filled her eyes for an entirely different reason now and Catherine sniffled in an attempt to keep them at bay. She could feel the fear and anxiety that had been plaguing her for the past week slowly lifting as his sweet words took hold. How do I know you're not just saying that? Bastion rested his forehead against hers. Would I do that? Yes, Catherine immediately snarked finally succeeding in shaking one of her hands loose to quickly wipe at her eyes. 
a ghost of a smile pulled at Bastion's lips. Well, I'm not. The tiny grin quickly fell back into a frown. But what about you? How do you feel about all of this? I don't know. I mean, I want to be happy, but mostly I'm just scared, Catherine confessed, feeling unbelievably foolish considering she'd just railed into Bastion for any fear he may have felt at the thought of abruptly becoming responsible for a little life. Talk about projecting one's own feelings onto others. I mean, I'm only seventeen. I don't know the first thing about giving birth or raising a child. Me neither, Bastion admitted quietly. Catherine snorted, once again looking down at her knees. A fine pair we make. Hey, Bastion protested the self-deprecating comment, releasing the grip he still had on one of her hands so he could tilt up her chin. We'll figure it out together, okay? One day at a time. Unwilling to fight the comfort and relief that such a sentiment caused to roll over her like a blanket, Catherine nodded. The corners of Bastion's mouth rose at the tiny motion. Good. His eyes flickered to her lips. Now, can I please kiss you? He sounded like he'd been holding the question back for a while, like he'd been wanting nothing more than to kiss her since the moment she'd woke up but had known it hadn't been appropriate to ask until now. A genuine smile pulled at Catherine's lips. Only if you mean it. I always mean it, Bastion assured softly before leaning forward and pressing his lips to hers. Chapter 7 No! Just no way! The mere thought of what Bastion was asking her to do caused a million butterflies to spontaneously erupt in Catherine's stomach, their tiny wings flapping incessantly against her insides. Stand in front of the Alpha Council and blatantly announce her condition? Catherine could think of an infinite number of things she'd rather do, including giving birth in nine or so months and she'd had to endure her great-aunt Minnie's overly detailed descriptions of the Ring of Fire multiple times over the course of her young life. The only thing stopping her from snarkily informing Bastion of this was the fact that he looked about as upset about his request as she felt. I know, and you know I wouldn't ask you to do this unless I thought it was absolutely necessary, he said, confirming her suspicions. But why is it necessary? she asked, stubbornly crossing her arms over her chest. Do you really think they won't believe you? Bastion sighed, running an agitated hand through his already disheveled hair. They know how fiercely I fought against a potential merger with the Western Colony. I wouldn't put it past the Council to assume I made this up as a last-ditch effort to avoid sending a group of envoys there. But even if you're right and they don't believe you, why would they believe me? She argued. I mean, I'm your mate. Won't they just think I'm lying for you? Bastion reached one of his hands forward and tucked a loose strand of hair behind Catherine's ear, his fingers lingering on her cheek as he stared at her. I know this isn't easy for you. It isn't for me either, but I need you to trust me on this. Can you do that? Please? Catherine narrowed her eyes. Bastion had to know he wasn't playing fair when he looked at her like that with his blue, blue eyes. Like he needed her. Depended on her. Like he trusted her more than the air he breathed or the food he consumed to sustain him. Tempted as she was to call him out on the underhanded move, Catherine just sighed. Fine. And that... Trust, along with being a sucker for Bastion's ridiculously pretty eyes, was precisely how Catherine landed herself in the uncomfortable situation she was currently in. Namely, fighting not to sink into her chair, the head chair stationed at the very end of the long rectangular table that the werewolves who made up the Alpha Council crowded around every meeting, as over a dozen sets of eyes bored into her. Most stared with neutral curiosity, 
but she could sense the hidden hostility in a few of their eyes, the ones belonging to the Alphas who had never quite accepted the fact that their leader had claimed such an unimpressive-looking bitten wolf as his mate. Catherine was grateful for the protective stance Bastion took where he stood behind her, his hands curled tightly around the back rungs of her chair, as she took in the eyes that continued to stare. She imagined what the minds behind them were thinking. What's Bastion up to? This ought to be good. Why is she here? Well, they were about to find out. I've called this meeting to order with the intent of suspending, at least temporarily, our planned trip to the Western Colony. Bastion's frank announcement garnered an immediate reaction. There was an explosion of activity around the table, men immediately attempting to speak over each other in loud, booming voices. Three even shot up out of their seats, completely red-faced as angry words spewed from their mouths. Catherine was only able to catch a handful of them as they buzzed by her ears. What? Preposterous. I told you. Already voted. It's a complete breach of protocol to— Can't believe you'd put the entire colony at risk, and all to spare the feelings of some little girl. That's enough. Somehow Bastion's voice was the loudest of all as he slammed his hands down on the table on either side of Catherine. He was leaning over her his breastplate brushing against the hair atop her head as he took deep, labored breaths in an obvious attempt to calm himself. The council obeyed the order, all but a single person falling silent at the command and reluctantly lowering themselves back down into their seats. The only Alpha who dared to remain standing opened his mouth to speak. It wasn't at all shocking to Catherine that the Alpha in question happened to be Briggs. Bastion, you call me Head Alpha, Bastion snarled, interrupting the man. Briggs grit his teeth at the demand. Head Alpha, he nonetheless amended, face twisting like the words tasted sour in his mouth as he spit them out. I'm afraid I must protest. Not only has there already been immense discussion about this issue, it has already been voted on and a course of action decided. I undecided. Bastion rebuked tersely. Briggs's already red face all but purpled, his nostrils flaring. But that's insanity, he protested, losing any pretense of respect as he pounded on the table with a meaty fist. Our population is dwindling at an alarming rate. Doing nothing will doom us all to an eventual extinction. The words were tinged with the faint hint of hysteria as they escaped his mouth, and as silly as his fears sounded to Catherine, she could acknowledge that to Briggs, at least, the threat of extinction was very real. Any sympathy that realization may have pulled from her disappeared, however, when he glanced her way, his eyes shining with obvious malice. She could feel Bastion stiffen behind her, his form radiating tension as Briggs continued to stare. After a tense moment, however, he pulled his eyes from her, snorting in what sounded like disgust as he trained his gaze back on Bastion. We all know that you don't want to admit your little mate is a part of the problem, but we must face the facts. The recent influx of bitten wolves that first your father and now you have welcomed into this colony have somehow contaminated Haven Falls' gene pool. What will it take to open your eyes? We need fresh blood. No child has been conceived in nearly a year. How can you even think that is no longer true? What's no longer true? Briggs snapped, rethinking his words before something akin to realization began to dawn in his eyes. You can't possibly mean... He trailed off, seeming to truly struggle to comprehend Bastion's words. Catherine and I are expecting, Bastion confirmed bluntly. Silence met the announcement. Then, even more chaos. The unexpected bomb Bastion dropped on the council detonated, and another eruption shook the room. This time, though, Bastion's words were met with excitement instead of anger, although there was certainly a strong sense of disbelief in the air as well. Could it really be? What joyous news! Downright miracle! It's been decades since a bitten wolf has successfully conceived— 
and she's not pregnant with just any babe but the head Alpha's firstborn. Unbelievable. This calls for immediate celebration. Unbelievable is right. How can we be sure this isn't some sort of ruse in an attempt to ensure quiet? Bastion bellowed, the power laced in his voice demanding obedience, and once again all but one council member fell silent. That's awfully convenient, Briggs pointed out evenly once the excitement of Bastion's announcement settled. I certainly hope you don't just expect us to take your word for it. While some of the Alphas seated around the table looked disgusted by the insinuation that their leader would lie, just as many others nodded their heads in apparent agreement, glancing slyly over at their neighbors to see if they concurred. Catherine felt her heart sink. Bastion had been right. They didn't believe him, at least not wholeheartedly. You dare question me? Bastion asked softly voice thick with authority, as he continued to lean over her. For a second, Catherine thought he might actually throw himself at the other man for what he undoubtedly viewed as a direct challenge to his honor, to her honor. Acting quickly, she placed a hand over each of his, squeezing them tightly in a show of support that she hoped would remind Bastion that he knew very well that this would be a likely reaction to his announcement. Gentlemen, if I may take the floor? Nonetheless, Catherine couldn't deny the strong sense of relief that enveloped her when Gabriella, the only female alpha of Haven Falls and the town's resident healer, stood from her seat, breaking the ominous stare-down between Bastion and Briggs. There's a simple solution to this dilemma, the woman continued when no one objected. I'll examine Catherine myself to confirm the pregnancy. As much as Catherine had been dreading such an exam, she could acknowledge that Gabriella's plan was a sound one. Besides, she supposed that the woman would have needed to look her over sooner or later anyway. Briggs, though, wasn't appeased by her suggestion in the slightest. In fact, he snorted in open revulsion. "'You voted against sending the envoy, too,' he reminded Gabriella. That was news to Catherine." though she supposed it made sense considering the woman's secret knowledge of Catherine's condition. "'Why would we believe you any more than we'd believe him?' he jabbed a thumb in Bastion's direction. Catherine fought the urge to reach over the table and twist the insulting digit right out of its socket. After all, what did Briggs want? Was Catherine supposed to strip down in front of everyone and let Gabriella examine her on the cold, hard table right then and there? "'What do you propose, then?' Gabriella asked irately, seeming to be riding the same brainwave as Catherine. "'I agree that performing an exam is a fine idea,' Briggs conceded. "'I just also think there needs to be at least one reliable witness present throughout it, is all. Catherine's instinctual reaction to the idea was strong and immediate, denial twisting in her gut. No. Every single pair of eyes zeroed in on her as the first word she'd spoken since the meeting began escaped her mouth, but she paid them no mind, directing her own insistent gaze on Bastion alone. To his credit, a troubled frown pulled at his mouth at the suggestion. However, he didn't immediately swat the idea down, either. No way, she reiterated tersely when Bastion finally lowered his eyes enough to meet hers. It makes sense, Gabriella spoke carefully, breaking the tense silence that threatened to descend. She refused to meet Catherine's eyes when the brunette's head nearly swiveled off her body as she spun her neck to stare incredulously at the woman. So much for occupying the same brainwave. Why not? Briggs demanded, adamant on adding his own two cents. What do you have to hide? Nothing. It was the truth, too. Excuse Catherine for wanting desperately to hang on to the tiniest sliver of modesty that still resided in her since being introduced to such a frank society nearly a year ago. Then I see no reason not to agree to my terms. Catherine twisted her head back around to face Bastion, trying to communicate with her eyes exactly where she thought he ought to shove Briggs's terms. 
A tense moment passed with no response from Bastion, and murmuring began to break out at his apparent reluctance to answer. Unfortunately for Catherine, the tiny crinkle of apology she saw form between his eyes told her exactly what his answer was going to be before he sighed and opened his mouth. One witness. Catherine ripped her eyes away from the contrite glance he tried to shoot her, staring resolutely at the tabletop instead, tracing the complicated grain patterns with her eyes in an attempt to calm her suddenly racing heart. She wasn't sure if anxiety or anger fueled the thumping thing more. Excellent. Assuming there are no objections, I'll volunteer myself as the witness in question. Catherine grit her teeth in an effort to remain silent, knowing logically that there was no reason to protest. Fine, Bastion agreed tersely. Great. A pause. Well, there's no time like the present, is there? The nerve of the loud-mouthed brute. I agree, Gabriella spoke, interrupting what was undoubtedly about to turn into a derogatory mental spiel of epic proportions. In fact, I was informed of the subject of this meeting beforehand, and I happen to have my sonogram machine in the back of my truck. I suggest dispersing for the time being so that I can perform the exam, and then reconvening here again in another hour to confirm the results. Gabriella just happened to have... She was really going to examine her in this room right then? Agreed. Catherine was going to kill Bastion. She sat stiffly in her seat as council members around the table took turns either nodding or verbally consenting to the plan. Moments later, they were dismissed by Bastion. She watched them leave the room one by one, even Gabriella left to go fetch her equipment, until only she, Bastion, and Briggs remained. Ignoring Briggs entirely, Catherine wasted no time standing from her seat, the chair's legs scraping noisily against the floor as she turned to face Bastion. She had enough restraint left in her to grab his hand and pull him into the corner of the room, for the sense of privacy, at least, before laying into him. Really? she demanded heatedly. Gabriella just happened to have brought along her equipment? You knew this was going to happen, didn't you? It's why you insisted I come in the first place. Bastion ran an agitated hand through his hair at the accusation. Yes, I suspected as much, he admitted frankly. But I didn't know that Briggs— the way he spit out the man's name made it clear enough how he felt about him, would insist on being present through the exam. That doesn't make hiding it from me any better. He should know very well by now how she felt about surprises, especially unpleasant ones, and this most certainly qualified. Bastion raised an eyebrow at her. But you're allowed to hide things from me? He shot back, eyes glancing down at her stomach before he could stop them. It was obvious enough what he was referring to. Catherine crossed her arms defensively over her belly, hiding it from his sight. That's not the same, she objected quietly, willing away the tears she could feel threatening to flood her eyes. She'd been scared. She must not have been entirely successful at holding the tears back because Bastion's own eyes immediately softened his shoulders deflating like those four little words sucked the fight right out of him. Of course it's not, he conceded, leaning forward and pressing his forehead against hers, forcing her to keep eye contact with him. I'm sorry. Catherine could see that he was, and quite frankly, she didn't think she had the energy to hang on to any anger at the moment, justified or not. She sighed, releasing her frustration with the man along with the carbon dioxide. I know. Me too. A moment later, they were startled apart by the room's door bursting open, four tiny wheels squeaking loudly as Gabriella pulled her sonogram machine into the large space. She allowed the door to swing shut behind her before finding a plug-in to attach the ancient-looking thing to. She also took the fuzzy-looking blanket she had tucked under one of her arms and spread it out over a section of the table and to think Catherine had been joking about being examined on this slab of sturdy oak. Ready? 
Gabriella chirped when she was finished arranging the blanket, clasping her hands together excitedly and glancing around the room, ignoring the somber air of the gathered trio altogether. They all stared. After a moment, Catherine realized the question was directed at her and nodded stiffly. Let's just get this over with, she muttered, hesitantly approaching the table. The redhead snorted at the less-than-enthusiastic response. That's the spirit. Here, why don't you let me help you, she began, reaching forward to take one of Catherine's hands and aid her in hauling herself onto the table. Before Gabriella could even finish her sentence, however, Bastion's hands were around Catherine's waist, easily lifting her and depositing her gently onto the blanket-covered table. The healer raised an eyebrow. That works, too, she admitted, pulling the machine closer. All right, Catherine, I'm going to need you to lay down for me, okay? And go ahead and pull your top up. Catherine obeyed, pulling her T-shirt up to nearly her sternum while Gabriella grabbed a familiar bottle of clear-looking jelly off the top of the machine. Catherine stiffened, however, when the woman reached forward with her free hand to tuck in the waistband of her pants, tugging them down far enough so that the very top of her hip bones were on display. Babies sit really low the first few months of pregnancy, Gabriella explained at her deer-in-the-headlights expression. Catherine risked a peek at Bastion, who was glaring openly at Briggs, who, in turn, was interestedly observing the proceedings. The two men had gathered on either side of the table where she lay, and Bastion bared his teeth at the man. Just keep your damn eyes on the screen, he demanded, more than a hint of growl escaping along with the order. Briggs snorted, but submitted to the command, moving his eyes away from Catherine's stomach to the small ten-by-ten-inch screen. Like I'd be aroused by a skinny little brat like her, he muttered. A much louder growl sounded from what seemed like the inside of Bastion's chest, but before he could physically lash out at Briggs for the comment, Gabriella very strategically cleared her throat. I apologize, but this is probably a little chilly from sitting in my truck, she warned Catherine loudly in an effort to redirect everyone's attention. It worked, and more than that, Catherine appreciated the warning, though still couldn't quite suppress a flinch, when the cold jelly was unceremoniously squirted onto her bare belly. Gabriella grabbed the wand-like tool attached to the sonogram machine. "'Here we go,' she muttered, before beginning to use the device to spread the goo around Catherine's stomach. Catherine forced herself to focus her eyes on the screen. After one tense minute passed, however, and then two, and the center of the screen, which Catherine assumed showcased her uterus, remained black— she felt something akin to panic form inside her. What if she really wasn't pregnant? Or worse, what if something had happened to the baby? Catherine was shocked by the intense disappointment and even loss she felt at the possibility. Hmm, Gabriella muttered to herself after another half a minute had gone by and a tension so thick it might as well be its own entity began to befall the room. I suppose the baby may still be small enough that I'll need to use a transvaginal wand to pick up a proper image. Catherine stared incredulously at Gabriella. A transvaginal what now? Oh, never mind, here it is. Catherine jerked her eyes back to the screen at the exclamation. And just like that, she forgot the name of what had to be some sort of medieval instrument of torture. Because there it was. The baby her baby. Bastion's hand was suddenly entwined with hers, his borderline too tight grip nearly crushing her fingers, but she paid neither the clutching hand nor the man attached to it any mind. Because the tiny, wriggling thing on the screen was much more human-like than Catherine could have ever anticipated. She stared in astonishment at what were clearly little arms and legs extending from a small body— and despite the blurry quality of the picture, the sonogram machine was dreadfully old. She swore she could even see a dainty nose protruding from the baby's head. What? Catherine began, but it felt like something, disbelief or maybe even awe at the image presented before her, was sticking the inside walls of her throat together, and she couldn't get any more words to come out. 
everything she'd been taught in high school biology told her that a baby shouldn't be so developed at this stage of pregnancy. When Gabriella wheeled the sonogram machine in the room, she'd been expecting to see something that more closely resembled a lima bean in her uterus than an actual human being. Catherine swallowed around the emotion in her throat, once again attempting to speak, and this time succeeding. I didn't know you could see so much already, she muttered weakly. Gabriella frowned at the observation, carefully looking over the screen. Oh, I'd say he looks right on track for an eight-week fetus, as long as we're counting from the first day of your last period. Does that sound about right? Implantation of the fertilized egg likely occurred shortly after the full moon two months ago, which explains why you still transformed then, but not on the night of the most recent full moon. Catherine didn't take anything more in than the first sentence. He? she questioned faintly. She could see a lot of detail on the tiny screen, but certainly not anything that indicated that particular gender. Gabriella laughed. Generic title, she assured. It's impossible to tell if it's a boy or a girl yet. Ignoring the blush she could feel creeping up her neck, Catherine nodded, taking a moment to absorb all the other information Gabriella had spewed at her. Eight weeks? She supposed that sounded about right, but... And you're sure that we're supposed to be able to see all of this at eight weeks? I didn't think anything more developed than a blob with a heartbeat would show up on the screen. Realization dawned in Gabriella's eyes, and something akin to dread tickled under Catherine's skin at the woman's sudden understanding. It didn't help that she could feel the intense gazes of Bastion and Briggs drilling into either side of her head. Oh, oh, you're thinking of the gestation period of a typical human. Catherine stiffened. What do you mean, typical human? Well, Gabriella explained matter-of-factly, Human females are usually pregnant an average of 280 days or so before giving birth, but werewolf pregnancies are generally much shorter and last between 180 and 200 days. What? What? Catherine's mind fought to comprehend the new information. 200 divided by 30. That was like, what, about six months? But if werewolf pregnancies generally only lasted six months, and she was already eight weeks along, that meant that the baby would be here, that she'd be pushing a melon-sized human being out of her vagina in four months, give or take a few weeks. A kind of nausea that had both everything and nothing to do with her condition suddenly hit Catherine. I don't feel good, she managed to express weakly before unceremoniously snatching her hand free from Bastion's grip and pushing the wand-like device Gabriella still had pressed against her stomach away from her. She used her other hand to sit herself up, praying that the bile she could feel swirling in her belly would stay put. It makes sense if you think about it, Gabriella explained gently after a moment, like she could feel the panic rising in Catherine. She imagined all three alphas in the room could feel it. Regular wolves experience a gestational period of about sixty days or so, and while we're certainly human, no one can deny there is a bit of wolf in us as well. Plus, considering the fact that the mother isn't capable of transforming and properly defending herself while pregnant or even nursing, it's logical from an evolutionary perspective that the body has naturally sped up the process over time to ensure a greater chance of offspring survival and thus the continuation of our species. Catherine nodded, but the dumb sort of shock she was still suffering prevented her from actually taking much of the explanation in. The words offspring, species, and evolutionary perspective flying right over her head at the moment. Not that you have to worry about much protection with Bastion here, Gabriella added in a blatant attempt to lighten the mood. At the mention of his name, Catherine finally risked her first peek at the man since the image of the baby their baby, had popped up on the screen of the sonogram machine. His blue eyes were as intense as Catherine could ever recall, displaying a conflicting mix of joy and somberness so powerful that Catherine could almost feel the emotions in her own chest. Mostly, though, his eyes exuded concern, 
like he was physically resisting the urge to reach out and comfort his obviously distressed mate. What he clearly didn't realize, however, was just the way he watched her somehow worked to soothe her frazzled nerves and calm the nervous swirling of her belly. Catherine only wished she'd looked to him sooner. She hoped her own eyes were as good at conveying feelings as his were as she mentally flung her thanks at the man. Anyway, Gabriella continued, seemingly oblivious to the nonverbal emotional exchange taking place in front of her, or blatantly ignoring it, anyway. It's September. I'd wager that the baby will be here by mid-January at the latest. January. Right. And just like that, the panic was back, threatening to force her stomach to heave its minuscule contents out all over the floor. She jerked her eyes away from Bastion's, but instead of allowing her to drown in the anxiety threatening to consume her, he gently took her by the chin and forced her to return her focus on him. We can do this, he assured her quietly, leaning forward and making it clear that his words were intended for her ears alone. One day at a time, remember? The reminder caused a startling amount of tension to flee from her, and for the first time that morning, Catherine offered Bastion a smile, shaky and watery as it was. One day at a time, she agreed. <clears throat> Catherine blinked at the sound of Briggs clearing his throat. The man had been so quiet since the beginning of the exam that she'd almost forgotten his presence altogether. She glanced his way, and to her shock, he didn't look upset at all about the revelation that she was actually expecting. Instead of wearing an angry or defeated expression, Catherine was tempted to say that the man looked downright awed. It was a strange look on him. Congratulations, Briggs spoke after garnering their attention. He reached across the table to clasp Bastion's shoulder, eyes traveling down to meet Catherine's just briefly, before once again reconnecting with Bastion's. You're a lucky man, he managed to mutter, shaking his head and looking so pained to admit it that it nearly startled a laugh out of Catherine. Bastion, though, didn't seem amused in the least. In fact, despite Briggs's attention, his focus remained solely on Catherine throughout the entire exchange, and it was as he was looking into her eyes that he murmured softly in agreement. I know. Chapter 8 As far as Catherine knew, mental illness didn't run rampant in her family— Sure, her mother's multiple aunts were all a bit eccentric, and before her grandfather had passed on her dad's side, he'd developed an odd habit of scolding his beloved, and very much deceased, cat for a variety of imagined misconduct. But the last that Catherine had checked, yelling after a zombified cat named Whiskers did not quite a schizophrenic make. But she wasn't on drugs— and if neither drug use nor family history explained away the unpredictable and often violent mood swings she'd been experiencing as of late, Catherine had little else to blame for the bipolar mess she'd dissolved into over the last three weeks but the pregnancy hormones rapidly flooding her body. Nearly every day over the past month, she'd managed to either explode into a tyrannical rage or burst into passionate tears. Unfortunately for her packmates, they were often the targets of her wayward emotions. She'd even punched Marcus right in the nose for attempting to dub the little life growing inside of her with the nickname Cub. Like he or she was actually an animal. She'd nearly broken his nose, and no one had uttered the nickname since. What had been perhaps the most infamous of her many meltdowns, however, had been dubbed the Great Cookie Debacle. Something smelled divine. Not just good, but truly heavenly, like whatever was responsible for producing such an aroma surely must have been handcrafted by God himself. Catherine had little choice but to follow the tantalizing scent to the kitchen, where Caleb stood baking near the oven. He had a mitt covering both hands. They were yellow, floral-patterned things that looked ridiculous covering his large appendages, but obviously did their job of protecting them from the heat well enough, 
and was currently pulling a tray of what looked like cookies out of the oven. And not just any cookies, either. Peanut butter cookies. Catherine didn't think she'd ever been more appreciative of the fact that she shared a sweet tooth with the resident baker of the pack. None of the others cared one way or the other for the sugary confections he'd often make. It was her personal theory that born wolves didn't crave sweets because they weren't brought up on them. Why would they be when large, meaty meals were much more efficient at sustaining them? Their high metabolisms absorbed sugar much quicker than protein. As bitten wolves, however, she and Caleb had intimately known the taste of delicacies like peanut butter before being changed, and as such, they found it much harder to abandon such foods. In fact, the large tray of peanut butter cookies before her was the first thing Catherine had actually wanted to eat in weeks. The dozen or so perfectly round morsels, each about as large as the palm of her hand, looked as good as they smelled. They were that perfect shade of golden brown that implied a warm, chewy inside and an outside with crunch. The tops were dusted with a thin layer of crystallized sugar. And were those... Yes, the cookies were liberally sprinkled with what looked like chocolate chips. In short, they were everything that peanut butter cookies should be. A loud, sudden cough to her right had Catherine blinking, temporarily losing focus on the cookies as she turned to take in the person responsible for the unexpected noise. Marcus and Zane sat at the kitchen table, looking amused. While both of their eyes shone with humor— Zane, at least, had the forethought to hide his grin behind a mug of some sort of steaming liquid. Marcus, on the other hand, wore his smirk proudly, his lips stretched so widely across his face that it almost looked like it hurt. What? Catherine demanded, folding her arms defensively across her chest. Oh, we were just wondering if we ought to leave the room, Marcus quipped. Catherine frowned irritated with herself that she'd been so distracted by the heavenly-smelling confections in front of her that she not only hadn't noticed that there were people other than Caleb in the room, but that she had no idea what they were talking about. Huh? So that you can be alone with the cookies, Zane clarified. You look like you want to do unspeakable things to them, Marcus added. Don't worry, we won't tell Bastion about your adulterous slip— he threw in a wink for good measure, and when Zane sniggered at his antics, Catherine merely rolled her eyes, hoping that the blush she could feel creeping up her neck stayed firmly hidden under the high neck of her blouse. Ha ha, she offered dryly, while subtly thumbing the small bit of drool she could admit had formed at the corner of her mouth. Not subtly enough, though, judging by the matching smirks the two jackasses at the table shot each other. Don't mind them. Caleb interjected from where he continued to work near the oven, rolling globs of cookie batter into perfectly formed balls between his palms before plopping them down onto a greased pan. Peanut butter is my favorite, too. My mom used to make them for me all the time before... Caleb trailed off, a frown suddenly pulling at the corners of his mouth as he relived what was undoubtedly a painful memory. Sympathy welled in Catherine's chest. Well... Before, Caleb finally finished, stressing the word. Catherine opened her mouth, wanting to say something encouraging or offer some sort of condolences to the man, but the words got stuck in her throat. After all, what could she say? Unlike Caleb, she was lucky enough to have both her pack and her blood family in her life. Sure, she couldn't actively see her parents, but she could contact them basically whenever she wanted unlike Caleb. Caleb. Anyway, he continued a bit too brightly, voice practically drenched in manufactured cheer as he cut her off before she could even really begin to speak, not that she knew what she was going to say anyway. I think these have cooled enough, he said, gesturing at the pan he'd been busy taking out of the oven when she'd first walked into the kitchen. Want one? I'd say, even more than Bastion's di— a harsh glare in Marcus's direction had the man shutting his mouth before he could finish the suggestive statement. It didn't stop him from offering Catherine a leer, however. 
The brunette huffed, turning her attention back to Caleb. I'd love one, thanks. She meandered over to the pan of cookies, making sure to take her time to pick out the biggest one. To prove a point, she didn't immediately shovel the thing into her mouth, but took a moment to admire the treat. The cookie was warm and crumbly between her fingers, and she slowly brought it up to her lips, her taste buds practically tingling with excitement. A moment later, they were rewarded for their patience. The cookie was everything Catherine imagined it to be as she finally dug in and took a bite. It was buttery, moist, and... Wait. Catherine snapped open her eyes, not even aware that she had closed them in anticipation of the exquisite taste of the cookie, three-quarters of which she still held between her fingers. She stared at the confection as an awful realization hit. Those hadn't been chocolate chips, she saw, decorating the cookies, but raisins? She gnashed one of the tiny dried-out grapes between her teeth, trying to stifle her gag reflex as she forced herself to swallow the vile thing. What do you think? Caleb asked a nanosecond later, and as Catherine's dismayed eyes met his, she imagined she resembled almost perfectly a deer in the headlights of an oncoming car. I... I... She stumbled over her answer, tears filling her eyes at the prospect of either hurting his feelings by admitting she disliked his mother's recipe, or forcing another bite of the raisin-infested cookie down her throat. She blinked down at the treat in her hand, feeling stupidly betrayed by it, especially when she glanced back up to see all three of the men in the kitchen looking mildly horrified by the sight of the oncoming waterworks shining in her eyes. "'What's wrong?' Caleb asked, more than a hint of alarm in his voice. "'I... well... I mean...' Catherine furiously tried to bat away the tears, but to her horror she could feel one, then another, trickle down her cheek. "'I don't like raisins!' She finally managed to spit out, the words infused with much more passion than the situation called for. I... I'm sorry. Utterly embarrassed by the emotional display, Catherine dropped the remainder of the cookie down onto the counter before fleeing the room, wasting no time in escaping back to her bedroom, where she promptly shut the door and threw herself down belly first onto her bed. She buried her face in the pillow like it would somehow shield her from her internal embarrassment. What in the hell was wrong with her? What would Bastion think if he'd seen her completely illogical meltdown? He'd think she was insane, that's what. Thank God Sophie had dragged him off that morning to talk with Haven Falls' clothing vendors about stocking up on baby clothes, of all things. The blonde had wanted Catherine to come, too, to peruse the tiny section they did have of newborn clothing, she'd explained, but Catherine had feigned a headache to get out of it. She didn't feel bad about it, either. Thinking back on the scene she'd just made in the kitchen, however, maybe she should have gone. Seriously, poor Caleb. Knock, knock. Catherine was forcibly dragged from her sulking by the sound of two soft knocks on the door. Yes, she called, seriously considering ignoring whoever was on the other side of it especially if it was Marcus come to poke fun at her for her latest meltdown. Catherine? Great. It was the soft tenor of Caleb. She could hardly ignore him. She felt bad enough about her behavior as it was. Heck, he was probably coming to apologize to her for some insane reason. Like he was supposed to somehow know that she had despised raisins since she was three years old and had nearly choked to death on a glob of them. Thank God her father knew the Heimlich. Catherine sighed, pulling herself out of bed to go open the door. Caleb, look, I'm really sorry. She immediately began to ramble. I don't know what's gotten into me lately. I mean, what's this? Catherine finally slowed enough to notice that Caleb was holding a plateful of peanut butter cookies out to her like a peace offering. A plateful of raisin-free peanut butter cookies. I had plenty of batter left over to make an extra batch, he explained bashfully. I just made sure to leave the raisins out of these ones. 
To Catherine's dismay, and to Caleb's panic judging by the widening of his eyes, Catherine could once again feel tears filling her green orbs. This time, though, they weren't disappointed, but unbelievably grateful ones. You didn't have to— I don't, I mean, I, I could, Caleb stuttered, clearly thinking he'd done something wrong to inspire the sudden onset of tears again. Before Caleb could escape, Catherine took the plate of cookies from his still outstretched arms, quickly pivoting to set them on top of a nearby dresser before turning and pulling him into a fierce hug. But I'm really glad you did. Thanks, Caleb. Don't tell Bastion, but I think you're my new favorite. She felt the man relax in her arms, and he returned her embrace in his usual gentle manner. For my own sake, I won't, and you're welcome. Unfortunately, the whiplash from her own sporadic emotions wasn't even the worst part about being pregnant. No, that was reserved for the plethora of stares she received whenever she dared to venture into town. Honestly, it was like they'd never seen a pregnant person before. Okay, so it had been nearly an entire year since anyone in Haven Falls had, but still. Catherine wasn't even showing yet. And the townsfolk kept getting bolder. In fact, the last time she'd gone into town, Sophie had finally managed to drag her out to check out the baby clothes, and while the blonde was distracted, she'd wandered over to the shop's selection of patchwork fabrics— she had been cornered by two middle-aged women with wandering hands. Catherine stared at the swatches of fabric before her, hesitantly reaching forward to finger each one in an attempt to gauge the quality. She hoped it wasn't glaringly obvious that she had no idea what she was doing. Sophie had been attempting to convince her of the necessity of frills whether the baby was a girl or a boy, although she insisted it was a girl— when her eyes had caught hold of the sewing supplies stocked in the back of the store, and Catherine had mindlessly wandered over to them. She could hardly help it. The urge to make something warm for the baby, maybe a blanket or a quilt, had struck her as soon as she'd lain eyes on the piles of fabric. It was weird the way her instincts could become so suddenly insistent on ideas, regardless of how problematic they were. After all, Catherine had no clue how to knit or even use a sewing machine. She supposed she could manage to poke some thread through the eye of a needle if she needed to, but that was about the extent of her homemaking abilities. Heaven forbid her mind attempt to explain that logic to her hormone-driven instincts. Sophie, who had merely sighed at her lack of interest in children's fashion— hadn't protested, and had merely reabsorbed herself back into the stack of clothing catalogs the store owner had managed to dredge up for them at the blonde's insistence. Catherine watched from the back of the store as Sophie engaged said owner in a discussion that probably involved debating whether ballerinas or the pink and purple owls that seemed to be featured on most of the girls' clothing Catherine had seen in the catalogs was cuter. It hardly mattered what the clerk thought— Catherine suspected that Sophie would just end up ordering whatever she wanted regardless. So, like, all of it, basically. Who cared that the baby would probably only be in newborn clothing for a handful of weeks? But Catherine supposed she could hardly blame the blonde for her lack of rational thinking when there she was seriously considering making a quilt. She didn't even know how to start such a project. Should she buy cotton or linen fabric? What colors worked best together? Did she need any special equipment to make the quilt? And if so, how the heck did she use it? She was pondering this, considering whether or not asking the store owner for assistance was worth the risk of getting pulled in a discussion that would undoubtedly lead to debating the merits of fire trucks or dinosaurs on baby boy clothing, when two shrill voices suddenly sounded behind her and nearly caused her to jump out of her skin. Oh, my! What do you suppose she's doing out of the house? Catherine turned to the source of the noise, taking in the two women who were staring at her with such mystified expressions. They both appeared to be in their late forties, a hint of gray in their hair and the first sign of crow's feet near their eyes. One was nearly six feet tall, and the other was rather squat, and although Catherine couldn't say she knew their names, she did vaguely recognize them from around town. I'm shocked. 
Bastion's let her out of his sight, the taller one said as she continued to ogle. Why, excepting my baby shower, Charles kept me locked away day and night back when I was pregnant with my Vincent. Yes, well, I can't say I'm all that surprised, the other interjected. Times have changed since then. Not for the better, either. Plus, I hear that she can be quite stubborn, you know. Ah, yes, the taller one agreed, as if a revelation had suddenly dawned. It's been said he's a bit of a pushover when it comes to her, too. Catherine bristled at the comment on Bastion's character. It was bad enough that they were talking about her as if she wasn't there, but to openly gossip about Bastion, her mate, and their head Alpha. Well, it was enough to raise her metaphorical hackles. After all, she knew that if he was there, he wouldn't appreciate any of his perceived weaknesses being pointed out. Even if it was her. And sort of true. Excuse me? Catherine demanded, hoping that the women had some sense and would offer forth an apology. Oh, don't mind us, dear, the shorter insisted with a wave of her hand. Satisfy an old woman's curiosity and tell us, though. How are you faring? Have you been very sick? Tired? Any feelings yet on whether you're carrying a boy or a girl? Catherine blinked at the bombardment of inappropriately personal questions. Um, well... Oh, I remember that when I was pregnant with Vincent, I was practically bedridden I was so exhausted. The other inserted herself before Catherine could think of a suitable response. Ah, yes, and if I recall correctly, any time you didn't spend resting, you spent eating. Both women chuckled at the remark. Then they turned their attention back to Catherine, and she watched with rising annoyance as both sets of eyes flickered down to take in her still-flat stomach. Their mirthful expressions transformed into concerned frowns. Why, it hardly looks like you've gained any weight at all. You're such a skinny little thing for someone who should be heavy with child by now. Are you sure you're eating enough, dear? Why, I find it hard to believe that there's a baby in you at all. Catherine tensed as one comment after another about her lack of weight gain spewed forth from their mouths. She knew that werewolf pregnancies were much shorter than a typical human's, but did they really expect her to have an extended gut already? She was only two and a half months along. Worry trickled down her spine as the two women continued to chatter. After all, what did she know about werewolf pregnancies, really? Maybe she should have been showing already. All of Catherine's concerned thoughts fled, however— as soon as the shorter woman had the audacity to reach forward and place a hand on her stomach, palming her right over her belly button, like she was actually trying to check if there was a baby in there. Protective instinct had her own hand darting forward, fingers wrapping themselves around the woman's wrist in a crushing grip and ripping the limb away from her. Even once she'd removed the woman's hand from her belly, however, she refused to release her, only tightening her hold on the surprisingly bony wrist as she continued to squeeze without mercy. She was probably only seconds away from truly breaking the lady's wrist when another voice sounding behind her caused her to freeze, her senses abruptly returning to her as she hastily released the ashen woman's hand. You realize that it's your own health you'll be worrying about when I tell the head Alpha that you've been touching his pregnant mate without permission, right? It took a moment for Catherine to grasp the words, and another for her to recognize the owner of the voice. She turned on her heel to take in Melanie. The girl looked as ornery as she'd been when Catherine had seen her last, arms crossed over her chest as she sneered at the two women on the other side of Catherine. "'We were only making friendly conversation,' the taller woman pointed out primly, eyes worriedly roaming over to her friend as she clutched her hurt wrist to her chest. Yeah, well, from over here, it looked more like you were being rude old hags, too busy reliving their glory days to realize that they're making the head Alpha's pregnant mate uncomfortable. Why, you insolent! Now, now, Dolores, there's no use going off on her, the taller woman quickly cut off her friend. But Denise! After all, she's nothing but riffraff, she pointed out, glaring in Melanie's direction. She doesn't even have a pack to call her own. 
Bastion should have truly banished the little ogre last year. Honestly, he must be going soft. Can I help you, ladies? Both of the middle-aged women stiffened at the sound of Sophie's voice. Catherine, however, could physically feel relief flood her at the blonde's sudden appearance, her tense shoulders finally relaxing for the first time since they had cornered her near the quilting supplies. Because I swear I just heard you talking about my brother, Sophie continued, and I'd be happy to relay a message to you for him. Oh, no, the taller one immediately attempted to backtrack, hands fluttering nervously at her sides. What I meant was, well, you see. No, no, that won't be necessary, the other woman interjected a bit more strongly. We were just leaving. Sophie offered them both a falsely bright smile, showing off her teeth. I figured as much. They tilted their heads in a respectful sort of nod before hurrying out of the store, not even bothering to buy whatever it was they'd come in for. And you. Melanie raised an eyebrow as Sophie turned her piercing cerulean stare onto her, not nearly as impressed as the two fleeing women. Me she deadpanned in return. Why are you hovering over Catherine? What do you want? Melanie snorted at the hostile questions. Yeah, because I'm the one who's hovering. Sophie pursed her lips. I asked what you were doing here. The girl rolled her eyes, holding up the spool of thread she held in one hand and gesturing vaguely at the gaping hole near the bottom of her shirt with the other. Not all of us can afford to buy new clothes whenever the urge strikes us. It was quiet for a long moment, as Sophie stared down the girl before finally seeming to accept the explanation. She huffed. Whatever. Just go. She gestured vaguely towards the front of the store. Melanie's eyes flashed with annoyance at the order, her bottom lip curling into an ugly sneer. Gladly she muttered before slinking away. Catherine tried to catch the girl's eyes as she walked by, wanting to thank her for her earlier interference, but not willing to offer the words under Sophie's watchful gaze. She could only hope that Melanie would see the gratefulness shining in her eyes. But she didn't look up, and Catherine's shoulders slumped in defeat. She felt badly about the way Sophie had treated the girl who she'd once considered a friend— but could hardly blame the blonde for her enmity either. After all, Catherine hadn't been the only one injured due to Melanie's actions nearly a year ago. Sophie sighed, the loud exhale forcing Catherine's attention to focus back on the blonde in question. Honestly, I can't let you out of my sight for two minutes, can I? Catherine raised a pointed eyebrow. Really? she demanded. Sophie's mouth dipped to form a frown. I sounded a lot like my brother just then, didn't I? Yep, Catherine agreed, popping the pea. The blonde winced. Sorry. Catherine shrugged. It's okay, I guess. I get it. And she did. The fact that she was pregnant seemed to bring out everyone's protective urges even more intensely than usual. Even her own, as she'd just experienced a few minutes ago. But that didn't make her pax hovering, as Melanie had put it, any less annoying. Anyway, Catherine said, turning her attention back to the swatches of fabric before her, I don't suppose you have any idea how to go about making a quilt? Sophie hadn't had any more of a clue than Catherine did, but that didn't stop her from conferring with the store owner before purchasing every instructional manual the shop had stocked, as well as more fabric, batting, thread, needles, thimbles, and pins than Catherine knew what to do with. She'd been teased mercilessly, mostly by Marcus, when she'd come back to the house with the pile of supplies nearly a week ago. Apparently, the instinct to make her baby something warm for winter was both adorable and hilariously out of character. She'd been quick to inform him that he was being an asshole, which was completely in character, and then to spite him, as well as the rest of her pack, who seemed equally, if less vocally, amused by her sudden interest in quilting, she'd let the materials sit untouched in a haphazard heap on her bedroom floor since she'd bought them. 
Besides, she had a hard time focusing on the page upon page of directions when her mind was so preoccupied with the confrontation, if it could be called that, she'd had with the women in the store she'd purchased the materials from. Catherine couldn't help it, though. Their words had gotten to her. The damned things had sunken their claws into her brain and refused to release. In particular, it was the comments about how small she was. Worry nagged at her as their words rebounded in her head. You're such a skinny little thing for someone who should be heavy with child by now. I find it hard to believe that there's a baby in you at all. Which was probably why she was standing in front of the bathroom mirror for what had to have been the fifth time that day, the bottom of her shirt pulled up and tugged under her chin, as she examined her belly from every possible angle in the reflective surface. If she stared at it from the side long enough, she could swear there was a little swell present just under her belly button. Still, for someone who was supposedly close to halfway through her pregnancy, Catherine couldn't help but think that she was rather small. What if something was wrong? Before her concern could completely spiral out of control, the bathroom door swung open and Bastion walked into the room. He shot her a bemused look on his way to the toilet. What are you doing? Feeling the telltale heat of a blush creeping up her neck, Catherine hastily pulled down her shirt. Nothing, she grouched, the words coming out more hostile-sounding than she wanted. Then she swiftly exited the room so Bastion could relieve himself in private. As soon as she got to the bedroom, Catherine flopped down onto the bed, pulling the covers up to her nose. When Bastion wandered into the room a minute later, he had a frown etched onto his face. Catherine's belly did a guilty little flip at the sight of it, and she quickly averted her eyes. Bastion stripped down to his boxers and crawled into bed. He wasted no time in pulling Catherine into his arms, wrapping them around her in a warm embrace before burying his face into the crook of her neck, pressing his nose against the sensitive skin there and inhaling. "'Are you feeling all right?' he asked softly a second later, pulling back enough that his warm breath tickled her cheek. "'I'm fine,' she attempted to assure him. "'Just, you know—' pregnant. It was amazing what she could all get away with blaming on her fluctuating hormones. Unfortunately, Bastion wasn't letting the excuse fly this time. You don't sound fine, he disagreed, pulling back even further and forcing Catherine to meet his eyes. Tell me what's going on in that head of yours. It's nothing, Catherine insisted, hoping she sounded convincing. I was just thinking about how much it'll suck to not be able to transform tomorrow. It wasn't a lie, exactly. The next night, the full moon was due to rise, and the fact that she couldn't physically access the more animalistic part of herself caused her greater strife than she ever thought it would. Bastion loosened his grip on her so that he could run a hand through her hair, pushing the dark strands that had fallen into her eyes behind an ear. You won't even have to leave the house, he assured and I'll be right outside all night, keeping watch. Catherine nodded her understanding. Right. Hey, he said more firmly, sweeping his thumb over the apple of one of her cheeks. I would never let anything happen to you. I'd gladly protect you with my last breath if I had to. Catherine felt her insides turn to mush at the proclamation. Even if she was pretty certain that she'd never survive something happening to Bastion and simply follow him into the unknown of death, there was no need to point that out to him. I know, she allowed. Thank you. Bastion allowed his hand to wander lower after that, brushing over her shoulder and the side of her breast. There was nothing sexual about the action. It was just reverent, before hovering uncertainly over her belly. May I? he asked quietly. Despite her lack of baby bump, Bastion liked to touch her there. She suspected it was his way of bonding with his unborn child. Catherine thought it was unbelievably sweet. Of course. Bastion hadn't been cradling the underside of her belly for more than a minute when she felt it, a sort of fluttering in her stomach. Catherine froze. 
Did you... Did you feel that? Bastion's voice sounded completely lax when he answered. Did I what? Catherine wasn't sure what it was that made her lie. Maybe it was the fear that the minuscule movement she felt was her imagination. Maybe it was shock. Either way, when she finally managed to force her tongue and lips to work together to form words, it was to spit out, Nothing. Never mind. But then she felt it again. A tiny quiver of movement right under where Bastion's hand lay, and Catherine knew that it wasn't nothing. It was just that the movement was so tiny that it couldn't be felt from the outside. Only the inside. It was their baby. Catherine's entire body warmed as something that felt distinctly like pride threatened to overwhelm her, and she wondered if it was what all new mothers felt when they sensed their baby move for the first time. I love you, she choked out, emotion thick in her voice. If Bastion noticed her strange behavior, he didn't comment on it. I love you, too. And as Catherine lay there, experiencing her child move inside her for the first time, she could acknowledge that while many things about pregnancy sucked, maybe not absolutely everything did. Perhaps, though, she wouldn't have been quite so content if she'd known that while she would get to experience the feeling of their baby move in her womb many times in the upcoming months, Bastion never would. Chapter 9 The night of the full moon passed without incident. Well, as long as one didn't consider Bastion snapping off the back door's sliding lock in his efforts to get to Catherine once he'd transformed an incident. Apparently, Bastion the wolf was even more protective of his pregnant mate than Bastion the man. His sudden presence came as a bit of a surprise to Catherine because she knew that whenever she shifted into her wolf form, she absolutely loathed being indoors. The walls were confining and made her feel suffocated. Apparently, however, the walls only seemed to bother Bastion when they separated him from her. Catherine wasn't about to complain— it turned out to be one of the best nights of sleep she'd gotten in a long time. She spent it curled up next to Bastion in front of the fireplace in their bedroom, her face buried in the dark fur of his thick coat. The next month, and the next full moon, passed without spectacle as well. Before Catherine knew it, November had arrived, and with it, snow. The white stuff fell to the ground inches at a time and formed massive piles. That— along with the ice, made the terrain particularly hard to travel for Catherine, mostly because she couldn't step foot out the front door without someone from her pack immediately springing up behind her, prepared to catch her if she lost her footing on the slick forest floor. It was as irritating as it was endearing. They did it, of course, because Catherine was pregnant. Heavily pregnant. By Gabriella's calculations, she was about four months along, give or take a week. Catherine's appetite had increased infinitely the past month, and so had her waistband. While the sudden weight gain had inspired Sophie to wax poetic about how cute her belly was, Catherine couldn't help but feel like she resembled a whale. She wondered how most normal women did this for nine whole months, though— she supposed the weight they put on was spread out over more time. They probably didn't feel like they fell asleep one day and woke up to discover they'd somehow consumed a twenty-pound beach ball in their sleep. A beach ball that liked to sit on their bladder all day long, causing them to waddle around like a penguin and pee constantly. That was an accurate summation of events. Somehow she'd gone from a ferocious werewolf to some sort of pathetic whale-penguin hybrid. That's how she felt, anyway. The baby kicked her in the ribs, and Catherine winced. There was that, too. Stop it, Mohammed, she scolded lightly, rubbing her sore stomach. The tiny movements she'd been so amazed at a short time ago had turned into forceful elbows poking her in the ribs and violent kicks to the bladder. Like she didn't already pee enough. The baby's movement had definitely become strong enough to be felt from outside of the body, 
and everyone in the pack had gotten the opportunity to feel the baby move. Everyone, that was, except for Bastion. For some reason, the baby seemed intent on teasing his or her father, steadfastly refusing to move whenever he palmed Catherine's belly. Even if the stubborn little thing had been moving mere seconds before. Catherine thought Bastion would knock Marcus's head clean off his shoulders when he'd been the first to feel the baby move three or so weeks ago. The beta had prodded at her stomach, making fun of her for the pouch she'd seemingly grown overnight when he'd felt the baby shift and loudly declared that fact to the room. Since then, the others in the pack had been all over her, often crowding her on the couch or at the kitchen table as they clamored for a chance to feel the baby inside of her move. Catherine couldn't even bring herself to be properly annoyed. Their enthusiasm for the baby to join the pack was just too endearing. She just wished the baby would cooperate and jab, kick, or twist for his or her father as well. Besides that, however, and the fact that she had yet to work up the courage to tell her parents about the fact she'd managed to get knocked up, her pregnancy was going surprisingly well. At least, it had been, until Sophie had to go and bring up throwing her a baby shower. It was precisely why Catherine was looking at her reflection in the mirror with mild horror at that very moment. Her belly looked particularly massive in a floral print monstrosity of a maternity dress, and Catherine was regretting letting Sophie pick out her outfit for the shower so very, very much. Do I really have to do this? she whined, toying with the tacky bow Sophie had insisted upon wrapping around her stomach with ribbon. She didn't even care that she sounded like a petulant brat. Sophie rolled her eyes, taking hold of Catherine's elbow and forcibly leading her out of the bathroom. Honestly, you'd think I was leading you to the gallows to be hanged instead of a room full of presents waiting to be unwrapped. Yeah, but there's people down there with the presents. People that I'll have to talk to. Sophie shot her an unimpressed look. So you'll have to make nice with a few women. Honestly, you and my brother really are made for each other. Two standoffish peas in the pod. I am not standoffish, Catherine protested as Sophie continued to drag her along. Just shy. She grimaced at the blatantly inaccurate description of her personality. Sophie's eyebrows nearly disappeared into her hairline. Really? You weren't sounding very shy last night when... Catherine hastily slapped a hand over the blonde's mouth, a mortified blush exploding across her cheeks. Okay, fine, she conceded. Maybe antisocial is a better word than shy. She paused, removing her hand from Sophie's mouth. You didn't really hear us last night, did you? Sophie grinned. No, she admitted. But that reaction told me all I needed to know about your love life. Catherine groaned. Sophie. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Now get yourself admittedly antisocial but out there. Without further ado, Sophie thrust Catherine into the crowded living room, stepping in after her. Catherine couldn't help but be impressed with how many people Sophie had managed to fit into the prince household. The weather had made it impossible to host the party outside, so fifty or sixty-odd women had crammed themselves into the living and dining areas of the house. She spotted Gabriella, Agnes, and Penelope. She even saw Priscilla, who'd been surprisingly amicable with her ever since their run-in at the Tattered Dignity concert months ago. There were also many women present who Catherine only vaguely recognized, including the two old birds who'd cornered her in the closet over a month ago. She wished that Mac and Nathaniel could have come to the shower instead of the near strangers, but Sophie had been clear that no boys were allowed. She'd even convinced Bastion to keep his distance for the event, although with all the people in the house, he refused to be any further away from his pregnant mate than up the stairs. Even more impressive than the crowd was the mountains of finger food that lined the kitchen counters, mostly meat-stuffed sandwiches, that had been generously prepared by Caleb. There was punch available, too, both berry-flavored blue and cherry pink, since they didn't know the baby's gender. 
Gabriella had performed an ultrasound on Catherine a few weeks before the shower and had offered to tell her, but Catherine had declined. She hadn't done it specifically to spite Sophie, but could admit that the sulky frown she'd worn for days afterwards had been a satisfying side effect of the decision. Catherine loved the woman like a sister, but the blonde was driving her crazy with her zest over her pregnancy. As the women who dutifully gathered at the prince household caught sight of Catherine and immediately began to flock towards her, she couldn't help but think that all the females of Haven Falls were a bit too enthused by it. She didn't know if they reacted similarly to all new life or if her baby was just special because it was the head alpha's firstborn. Either way, she had to mentally trample down her panic-induced fight-or-flight response when the women swarmed her. If she didn't, she was liable to either run away to her room, or worse, and probably more likely, punch some well-meaning lady in the face. Catherine attempted to focus as the women yapped at her. Why, look at you! What a healthy flush! You're positively glowing! Luminous, even! Uh... Catherine hated compliments, especially when they were just creative ways of calling her fat. My goodness, the last time I saw you, you were practically skin and bones. Now look at you and that round belly. It almost looks like you've swallowed a melon whole. Er, she hated blatant insults, too. Do you recall what position you were in when you conceived? I hear it can influence the child's gender. Prying questions inspired her wrath as well. I don't think— All right, everyone, all right. Let's give Catherine some space, Sophie said finally having mercy on the shell-shocked brunette. There will be plenty of time for socializing later. First, let's eat some food and open some gifts. Then, when everyone is ready, we'll end the party as tradition dictates and play the scenting game. As everyone reluctantly backed away and headed towards the kitchen, Catherine leaned over and hissed in Sophie's ear. A game? she demanded. You never said anything about games. Don't worry, it's only the one she assured with a condescending pat on Catherine's head. And I promise it's as easy as can be. Then Sophie flounced away before she could protest. Catherine sighed, but dutifully wandered over to the food. Glancing over the generous spread, she was warmed to see that the peanut butter cookies Caleb had taken to baking her once a week, and she wondered how her belly had ballooned so fast, were amongst the array of goodies. After filling a plate, Catherine glanced around the room in an effort to relocate Agnes and Penelope. She was successful in her endeavor and spotted them near the couch. She walked over to them. Hey, guys, she greeted. Agnes offered her a grin. Hey, yourself. She looked Catherine up and down. Look at you, making fertility look so ridiculously adorable. Penelope snorted. What I think Agnes means is that you sure have packed on the pound since we last saw you. Catherine stiffened, the peanut butter cookie she'd grabbed halfway to her mouth. Excuse me? she demanded, before deciding to shovel the cookie into her mouth despite the rude comment. For good measure, she stuffed one of the ham sandwiches she'd snatched up into the black abyss as well. Penelope grimaced at the animal-like display. Oh, don't get me wrong, she attempted to backtrack. You look cute and all now, but what happens when that baby pops out of you and you're left with a saggy stomach full of purple stretch marks? It's not worth the hassle of bearing a child, if you ask me, especially when you consider the shape your vajayjay will be in postpartum. Catherine blinked. Vajayjay? Really? Gee, thanks, Penelope, she offered dryly. Agnes glared at the human girl before returning her attention to Catherine. Don't mind her, she said, making sure to speak loudly enough to ensure Penelope heard. She's just jealous that you're all the town can talk about. I mean, you're carrying the head Alpha's firstborn. Nothing she can ever do will compete in importance. I hardly see what's so important about acting as a breeding mare, Penelope snapped, before remembering she was in said breeding mare's presence. She winced. Sorry, she offered her voice just this side of snide. Seriously, though, not everyone is as obsessed with you as you think they are. Catherine wasn't aware that she thought people were obsessed with her. 
Oh, that reminds me, the girl said, abruptly shoving her hand in the small tote that hung off one of her shoulders and pulling out a crumpled-looking envelope. Here, she said, holding it out for Catherine. I'm supposed to give this to you. Catherine frowned, hesitantly reaching forward with her free hand to take the thing. What is it? Penelope shrugged. A card of some sort, I suppose. Melanie asked me to give it to you since, you know, she wasn't invited to your shower. Agnes bristled at Penelope's tone. And why would she be? She did almost get Catherine killed, you know. Yeah, due to an honest mistake. Melanie used to be your friend, too, in case you don't remember. Yeah, used to be, before she was proven to be in cahoots with a traitorous cane. Oh, come on. Growing tired of their debate, especially considering she wasn't completely sure where she stood on the issue, Catherine tuned Agnes and Penelope out. Instead of paying their argument any mind, she set down her plate, and carefully sliding her thumb under the envelope's seal, she opened it. Penelope was right. It was a homemade card of sorts. The folded piece of cardboard paper had the words, Congratulations, Catherine, written on the front. When she opened the card, however, she saw that a more substantial note was scrawled on the inside. Catherine, I never got the opportunity to congratulate you on your pregnancy in person that day in town, so I guess this is my way of doing so. Way to shove it to all those prejudiced harpies. Despite the front I put up, I also want you to know that I really am sorry for what happened with Kane last year. I have a present for the baby I'd like to give you if you can bring yourself to stop by. I've been thinking about what you said regarding talking to Bastion about lifting my restrictions, too. I was curious if that offer was still on the table. Melanie. Before Catherine had time to properly react to the note, Sophie popped up out of nowhere. What's that? Catherine blinked at the woman's sudden appearance. Nothing, she hastily assured, fighting the urge to tuck the paper back into the envelope and hide it behind her back before Sophie could make a grab for it. Just a card. Sophie frowned, likely picking up on her strange defensiveness, before apparently deciding not to question it. Okay, well, if you're that eager to open gifts, I guess we could get started. Catherine's eyes widened in dismay, but Sophie merely offered her a toothy grin and forced her to take a seat on the nearby couch before she could protest. "'Attention, everyone!' she hollered. "'Catherine's ready to open presents, so if you could all gather around, that'd be great. Agnes, honey, why don't you start bringing over the pile of presents in the entryway so we can get started?' Agnes looked a bit taken off guard by the order, but after shooting Catherine an apologetic glance, nodded her assertion. Within minutes, all the guests who Sophie had invited to the shower managed to pack themselves into the living room, and Catherine had a mound of gifts stacked in front of her. "'Here goes nothing,' she muttered. As fifty-plus pairs of eyes bored into her, Catherine carefully began to unwrap present after present. Gift wrap wasn't readily available in Haven Falls, so many of the items she received were wrapped in newspaper or stuffed in decorated paper bags. She made sure to smile and offer as sincere a thanks as she could manage after each gift was revealed. She truly did appreciate most of them, especially the stash of cloth diapers she received from Priscilla's mom, Juliana, of all people, and a basket full of lotions and creams brewed specifically for the baby by the local apothecary owner. She was also gifted well over a dozen handmade outfits for the baby— they were absolutely adorable with all sorts of frills, collars, and buttons. The craftsmanship that had gone into making them put the rather pathetic-looking quilt she'd finally finished sewing a few days ago to shame. Someone had even used their immaculate skills to make the baby a pair of booties. Her absolute favorite present, however, had been a hand-carved cradle for the baby to sleep in. Bastion had apparently been working on it in secret for weeks and had asked Sophie to sneak it in with the gifts. That being said, there were a few gifts that were a bit more, well, out there. One woman, she had to have been in her seventies at least, had given her a sheer lingerie set that was supposed to emphasize her distended belly. A woman is never more beautiful or alluring than when she's round with child, 
she'd said sagely when Catherine had shot her an incredulous look. Then there was Gabriella, who'd gifted her a nursing bra and a small tub of what was apparently cream for her nipples. Trust me, if you're breastfeeding, those things are going to get sore. All in all, by the time Catherine had finished opening presents, she was feeling more than a little overwhelmed. The mountain of gifts before her, the cradle, diapers, clothes, and even the nipple cream, had her feeling suddenly nervous about the whole, well, parenting thing, for lack of a better term, that lay before her. After all, growing and expelling a child from her uterus was one thing, but actually keeping the baby alive, raising it to be a decent person, well, that was a whole other thing altogether. And she had no idea how to go about doing it. Thank you, ladies, for all the wonderful gifts. Your generosity truly knows no bounds. Sophie's polite soprano infiltrated her worry-laden thoughts. That being said, I think we can all agree that it's time to play the much-anticipated scenting game. An excited murmur swept through the crowd at the announcement. If Sophie had known how overwhelmed Catherine was feeling at that moment, perhaps she wouldn't have sounded quite so gleeful when she added, Catherine, if you could please stand. Catherine sighed but obeyed trying her hardest not to look entirely reluctant about it. Now, just in case no one's played this before, Sophie said, her eyes subtly glancing in Catherine's direction, it's really very simple. The concept behind this ending game is that a woman's sense of smell becomes so enhanced when she's pregnant that she can actually scent when other women's bodies are gearing up for pregnancy as well. Catherine did not like the sound of this. The game is played by all the women of childbearing age forming a line. Ladies, if you could please report to the center of the room and do just that. And the shower recipient, Catherine, in this instance, picking who she thinks will be the next to be blessed with a child. She turned to Catherine. Ready to do your thing? She teased as the eligible ladies moved to do as she instructed. Do my thing? Catherine demanded incredulously loud enough for only the blonde to hear. The entire tradition sounded like some ridiculous version of throwing a bouquet at a wedding. Instead of the results predicting who was next in line to get married, however, supposedly they'd somehow designate who was next to get knocked up. It was completely nonsensical. And, judging by the dozens of eager eyes staring her down, widely believed. That's what I said, Sophie reiterated before taking Catherine by surprise and pulling a blindfold from seemingly out of nowhere. She wrapped it around her eyes before beginning to tie it behind her head. Catherine froze. What are you doing? she asked out of the corner of her mouth. Relax, it's part of the game. Taking away your sight is supposed to help you better concentrate on scent. Catherine changed her mind. This game wasn't like throwing a bouquet at all. It was much more similar to a demented version of pin the tail on the donkey, except, of course, it was pin down the future Pregasaurus. And what exactly am I supposed to smell? she demanded. How should I know? I'm not the pregnant one, Sophie teased. Catherine snorted. You're so helpful, she grumbled. Sophie laughed. Just follow your nose, she suggested bestowing an affectionate flick on said nose before stepping away, presumably to join the line of women who were of childbearing age. "'Whenever you're ready, Catherine,' she called a moment later. Feeling incredibly foolish, Catherine shifted nervously before delicately sniffing air. As silly as the notion behind the game was, she felt a lot of pressure to somehow get her prediction right. After all, Despite her surprise pregnancy, there was still a town full of people who were anxiously awaiting more babies to maintain their tiny population. Not really knowing what else to do, Catherine took one step forward and then another. She drew in a deep breath of air through her nose and, relying on nothing other than instinct, pivoted left, praying that her nose wasn't leading her to some weathered octogenarian not even standing in line 
Catherine followed the innate feeling until it told her to stop. She inhaled once again through her nose, picking up two individual scents. They beckoned her in different ways, both smelling of citrus, but one was sweeter and stronger than the other. Not giving herself a chance to second-guess the decision, Catherine reached forward, her hand landing on the bony shoulder of whoever stood opposite her. There was a sort of gasp that swept the room, and Catherine hesitantly pulled the blindfold off, taking in the stunned woman before her. She looked to be about mid-thirties, her brown hair pulled back into a sensible ponytail. Catherine was fairly certain that she recognized her as one of the teachers of the younger kids at school. The woman only remained in her shock for a moment, her open mouth soon closing and forming an elated grin. She pulled an unsuspecting Catherine into a fierce embrace, muttering, "'Thank you so much,' into her shoulder. Catherine wanted to point out that she didn't do anything. After all, she wasn't some sort of fertility goddess who could bless someone with a pregnancy. She couldn't bring herself to do it, though, and merely offered the woman a smile in return, hoping it didn't look as much like a grimace as it felt. Curious to see who she'd almost picked, Catherine glanced to the right to see a blank-faced Priscilla. Despite her lack of expression, however, she could see that Priscilla's eyes were suspiciously wet, and Catherine felt the ridiculous urge to apologize bubble up in her throat. Before she could say anything, though, the blonde merely offered her a tense nod before turning on her heel and disappearing into the crowd of quickly approaching onlookers. Sophie threw an arm over Catherine's shoulder. You know, I don't put much stock into traditions like these, but I really hope you're right. Charlotte's about as nice as they come, and it's well known that she and her mate have been trying for a baby for well over a decade. Catherine nodded her bottom lip. She really hoped she was right, too. Parenting for dummies? Should I take that as some sort of declaration? Catherine rolled her eyes so hard that she was shocked she didn't catch sight of her brain. She clutched both of the books in her hands, Parenting for Dummies and Caring for a Newborn 101, tightly to her chest. She and Zane had traveled into town to pick up some books they'd asked one of Haven Falls's runners, Harrison Smith, to pick up for them. Runners were people who had been designated by Bastion to make monthly runs out of town to collect certain supplies in bulk. They drove one of a handful of trucks to cities like Fort Saskatchewan to pick up things like fabric, cutlery, and feminine supplies. Things they couldn't extract from nature, basically. Runners also took requests for specific items, and Catherine had been lucky enough to catch Harrison before he had left on his run yesterday, and she had asked him to pick up some books on how to take care of a baby. Her baby shower a week ago had served as a wake-up call of sorts. The realization that she hadn't a real clue of how to care for a baby had been a sensation not unlike being doused with icy water. Sure, she'd been forced to pretend a sack of flour had been a baby back in middle school with the rest of her class, but as little real-life value as that exercise had offered, she'd failed at even that. The day before she had been supposed to hand the sack of flour back into her teacher, her clueless father had accidentally made pancakes with half of it. Catherine had tried duct-taping the sack back together, and she'd received a C- minus for her efforts. She couldn't afford to get a C- minus at real parenting. Even if it did mean she'd endure some teasing for her newest taste in reading material. Ha ha, Catherine offered dryly. I suppose I should just be happy that you're showing an interest in learning something, at least. Catherine assumed that was a dig at her lack of study sessions with the man lately. They had taken a bit of a back seat to the whole, surprise, you're pregnant, thing. Hey, I like learning, she protested. At least when what I'm learning about actually pertains to my life. She took a gander at the heavy textbook Zane had requested Harrison pick up. Fundamentals of cognitive psychology? Really? Maybe you should back up a bit before your nerdiness somehow rubs off on me. Zane snorted. There will be no rubbing going on, thank you very much. I don't have a death wish. Catherine stuck her tongue out at the ribbing. And I'll have you know, 
Zane continued, that cognitive psychology is a very useful subject to learn. And how is that? It aids in predicting behaviors. He shot back immediately. For example, you bite your lip when you're nervous, and when you cock your hip to the right just so, it's usually indicative that you're about to rip into someone. Catherine blinked. While she was aware that she had a penchant for chewing on her bottom lip, she hadn't known she tended to cock her hip when she was mad. As she searched her memory, however, she realized it was true. Oh. Yes, oh. Furthermore, you don't always know what kind of knowledge you'll need before you need it, so why not read up on as much as you can? I like knowing things. I consider my arsenal of knowledge a weapon of sorts, a weapon that this pack often relies on. It's my way of contributing. Catherine frowned, elbowing Zane good-naturedly. I suppose you have a point. As long as you realize that we like you for more than your annoyingly clever mind. In spite of it, even. It was Zane's turn to look dumbfounded, a rare sight on the usually serious man's face as a red flush slowly crept up his neck. Yes, well, I mean, I suppose. Before Catherine could comment on the flush or Zane's flustered rambling, however, the feeling of someone's eyes on her had the hairs on the back of her neck sticking up. She turned on her feet and spotted a familiar couple on the opposite side of the street. Priscilla and Rip. The latter was so absorbed in ogling her ass that he didn't even notice the former's heated glare focused on the side of his head. Gee, Rip, could you stare any harder? Rip spared Priscilla an annoyed glance. Don't you ever shut up, he muttered meanly. The blonde visibly bristled. Don't you ever stop staring? You spent half the time we were at the market looking down various stand owner's shirts, and now this. You're absolutely shameless to do it right in front of me. I mean, I'm your mate. You're supposed to love and cherish me, not lavish your attention on the bodies of every attractive woman you happen to stumble across. Catherine was secretly impressed by the little shove she delivered to Rip's bicep. She froze, however, her entire body filling with white-hot rage when Rip pushed Priscilla back hard enough that she stumbled and nearly fell. Then he grabbed Priscilla by her arm and pulled her back to him, thrusting his face into her space. Yeah, and you're supposed to provide me with an heir, but that's kind of hard to do when you're working with a barren womb. I guess we've both been duped, huh? That was it. It had been a long time since Catherine had been so mad, the fury she felt lapping at her collar. She didn't think, just acted, and began storming over to them. What? Zane started, attempting to grab a hold of her coat sleeve and stop her, but Catherine shrugged him off. Hey! she yelled as she stomped her way across the street. What do you think you're doing? Leave her alone! Rip eyed Catherine up and down, his surprise at her approach quickly turning into a sardonic sort of amusement. Why don't you mind your own business, girly? As worthless as Priscilla is, she's right about one thing. She's my mate. That means she's mine to do with as I please. Catherine snorted in disgust, crossing her arms over her chest. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's not how it works. Actually, I'm pretty sure it is, he mocked throwing one of his meaty arms over Priscilla's shoulders and squeezing her to him. Isn't that right, honey? Priscilla winced as his grip on her tightened when she didn't immediately answer. Catherine just barely managed to bite her tongue. Eventually, the blonde offered a terse nod, and Rip released her. God, you're such a bully, Catherine said, intoning as much abhorrence into her voice as possible. You're pathetic, picking on Priscilla instead of someone your own size. Rip snorted. Oh, yeah? Are you volunteering, you heifer? Smack. The urge to slap him came on so suddenly, so fiercely, that Catherine followed through with the impulse before she had a chance to question its wisdom. Still, she couldn't help but admire the shiny red imprint of her hand on Rip's cheek before she took notice of his rage-darkened eyes, his black pupils nearly completely overpowering his lighter-colored irises. He bared his canines at her and growled. 
Catherine didn't get the chance to react before she was abruptly jerked backward by the back of her coat, Zane stepping in front of her and masking her with his larger body. Zane's responding snarl was easily as loud as Rip's. The man practically roared at him, really, spittle flying into Rip's face. I'd back away if I were you, he suggested, his voice low and vibrating with more than a hint of a growl. Before the head alpha finds out you've been growling at his mate, his heavily pregnant mate, given your shared history, I don't think it'll take much more than that to convince him that the town, the world, in fact, would be better off without you. The air between the two wolves remained tense for a solid minute, before Rip was apparently finally able to gain control of the animal rippling beneath the surface. Whatever, he muttered, taking a jerky step backward. Come on, Priscilla, let's go. Priscilla looked conflicted for a moment, offering Catherine an odd sort of half-embarrassed, half-apologetic look before ultimately trailing off after Rip. As soon as they were out of sight, Zane turned towards Catherine and took her by the shoulders. He looked for all the world like he wanted to shake her and was only refraining due to the fact that she had his alpha's child growing in her belly. What were you thinking? he demanded incredulously. Catherine frowned, taking a step backward out of Zane's grasp. What do you mean? she asked. What do I mean? he repeated dumbly, his incredulity at her apparent naivete obvious enough by his tone. I mean, why in the hell did you think it was a good idea to get in the middle of their spat and provoke that idiot? Catherine's eyebrows rose in disbelief. Did you not see what Rip did? Did you not hear what he was saying to her? That's not your concern, Zane immediately dismissed. Regardless of how uncouth Rip's words and actions were, he has a point. He and Priscilla have claimed each other as mates. It's a sacred connection that's looked down upon for others to involve themselves in. Catherine gaped. Oh, so if Bastion was treating me that way, it'd be okay? You'd just stand aside and let him push me around because we're mated? Zane looked downright insulted. Bastion would never do that, he refuted. That's not the point. Did you get my point? You can't go around thoughtlessly putting yourself in harm's way like that. Why, when I tell Bastion... Catherine stiffened at the mention of his name. When you tell Bastion what, she demanded, cutting Zane off mid-sentence, that I stood up for a girl getting bullied? No, that you slapped the six-foot-tall, muscle-bound man who tried to assault you last year clear across the face. Honestly, I thought you were smarter than that. You have to think about more than just yourself now. He glanced down at her protruding belly. Catherine's face felt so warm that she was nearly positive it was glowing red enough to put Rudolph's nose to shame. She wanted to point out that she had been thinking about more than herself— She'd been thinking of the girl Rip was pushing around, Priscilla. At the same time, Catherine knew that Zane was at least a little right. She hadn't been thinking of the baby at all when she'd marched up to Rip, and having that fact pointed out to her, well, it stung. Badly. Catherine wasn't sure if she was a second away from crying or slapping Zane across the face, too. Before she could embarrass herself by doing either— she spun on her heel and began walking in the opposite direction of where she and Zane had originally been heading, back to the prince house. Where do you think you're going? Zane called, sounding exasperated. Away, she said shortly, sparing the man a glance over her shoulder before continuing on. He threw his hands in the air. You can't just take off by yourself. She heard the sound of his footfalls behind her. She spun around to face him. Away from you and everyone else, she clarified. Zane was quiet for a moment, just staring at her. If Catherine didn't know better, she would think the typically stoic man seemed repentant over her obvious distress. We're only trying to protect you, he finally said. Yeah, well, what you're actually doing is stifling me, she shot back. Catherine knew she wasn't being very fair. Their instinct demanded that they protect her, after all, and most of the time their nearness reassured her. Right that very second, however, 
All Catherine wanted to do was be alone. Zane pressed his lips together, looking conflicted. What about the ice? He asked. And Rip, the man you just carelessly pissed off. I don't think Bastion- God, Zane, I don't care. She ran an agitated hand through her hair. Look in your damn psych book. What does it say about never allowing someone a frickin' moment to themselves? Zane remained stone-faced for a long minute before abruptly releasing a put-upon sigh. Fine. Thank God, Catherine muttered, wasting no time in once again turning her back to him and striding in the opposite direction. She was a little shocked at his compliance, but mostly just relieved. You have one hour, Zane called after her retreating back. If you're not back home by then, I won't protect you from the worried search party that will undoubtedly commence. Yeah, yeah, she muttered, throwing up a hand to acknowledge that she'd heard him before continuing on her way. Despite the one-hour time limit Zane had imposed upon her sudden freedom, Catherine took her time walking back into the heart of town. After all, regardless of what Zane had accused her of, she did care for the little being growing inside of her, and she didn't want to slip on the ice and fall. As she walked, Catherine took the opportunity to clear her mind and just not think. She breathed in the fresh, wintry air and concentrated only on the sound of snow crunching beneath her boots. About ten minutes into her walk, a light snow began to fall, and she gave in to the childish urge to stop and catch a large, wet flake on her tongue. It wasn't until she began meandering around Haven Falls's marketplace that the idea to visit Melanie occurred to Catherine. She thought of the note that she'd had Penelope deliver to her baby shower. Catherine had known as she'd read it that even if she had wanted to go talk to the girl, clear the air, so to speak, that Bastion, the entire pack, really, would never allow it. But for the first time in forever, they weren't around. Catherine bit her bottom lip. This would probably be her only opportunity to talk to Melanie in private before the baby was born. Maybe even her only opportunity ever. After a moment of indecision, Catherine decided to take it. She only had a vague idea of where Melanie lived, but knew it was somewhere on the outskirts of Luther's property. He was the alpha who'd housed her before her perceived betrayal, after all. Luther lived on the opposite side of Haven Falls as Bastion, so Catherine was forced to pick up her pace. Still, she was exceedingly careful to keep her balance as she trudged through the snow. She managed to reach Luther's house in fifteen minutes, and after another minute of searching, she spotted a well-worn path that led into the woods behind his house. Figuring that it must lead to where Melanie lived, Catherine started down it. She only had to walk a quarter mile or so on the packed snow before she reached it. Melanie's... habitation, for lack of a better word. Catherine stared at the shack-like building she'd stumbled upon. It was small, maybe three hundred square feet, and wasn't much to look at. Despite its singular window and dingy door, however, it was protected from the elements, at least, with solid wood walls and a steel roof. After a moment of indecision, Catherine walked up to the door, and, juggling the books she still carried under one arm, hesitantly raised a hand. Knock, knock. Melanie? Catherine frowned when there was no answer. Her gaze wandered down to the doorknob, and she was debating whether or not it'd be appropriate to just twist the thing and let herself in, when the sensation of being watched rippled down her spine. It wasn't the same feeling that had overtaken her when she'd felt Rip's eyes on her less than an hour ago. It was something else entirely. The impending sense of danger buzzed under her skin— and made the hair on the back of her neck stand up on end. Catherine took a shaky step back from the door, intent on leaving and practically running back in the direction she'd come. But she didn't get the chance. Before Catherine could even pivot on her foot, something heavy and blunt hit her in the back of the head, and she knew no more. Chapter 10 Dark quiet. Catherine was floating. Trapped in a murky sort of fog that suspended thought, she remained there for an undeterminable length of time, 
aware of little but a vague pounding in her skull. It was the only thing anchoring her to reality. As the fog slowly thinned, however, and consciousness beckoned her, the dull throb intensified to the point that Catherine was able to recognize that the acute pain was originating from the left side of her head. Her shoulders were sore, too. And her mouth. Why did it feel so dry? She tried to swallow. And just like that, panic took hold. Alarm forced her eyes open. Catherine winced at the light that immediately assaulted them. It caused her pupils to constrict into tiny dots as she furiously tried to blink away the sting. But that was the least of her concerns. There was a cloth gag stuffed inside her mouth. She desperately tried to force it out with her tongue, but it was held in place by something. Catherine assumed duct tape. She tried to move, intent on ripping the piece of tape off her mouth and removing what felt like a bunched-up sock shoved down her throat, but as soon as she did, a sharp pain exploded in her shoulders and shot down her arms. The sensation took her breath away, and for a moment all conscious thought ceased. When Catherine came back to herself a second later, her panic had doubled. Because her arms were bound behind her back— linked together at the wrists with what felt like the same duct tape covering her mouth. Fear danced up Catherine's spine, threatening to spread to the rest of her body and overtake logical thinking completely. She tried to stomp down the overwhelming feeling, but was losing the battle, showcased by her heavy breathing and the tears she could feel gathering in her eyes. A sudden, strong kick delivered to the inside of her abdomen, however, made her freeze. The baby. The timely movement from the little being growing in her belly grounded Catherine. She couldn't afford to break down when there was someone, an unborn baby, maybe, but still a person, depending on her. With that thought in mind, Catherine was able to choke back the tears. Then she made herself stagger her breathing until she had it under control. Once she was calm, it was a forced sort of calm that was almost entirely feigned, but that was beside the point. She urged herself to concentrate. First, she knew, she ought to take stock of her injuries. How badly was she hurt? Well, her head was pounding, of course. Catherine took note of the way a bit of her hair had plastered itself to her left temple— it itched, and she was pretty sure that side of her face was caked in what was probably dried blood. Judging by the location of the ache in her skull, she was going to assume she'd had an open wound on her head at some point, and the crusted-over blood was from that. Her jaw also ached something fierce from being forced open with a gag for what was probably hours. Her shoulders were sore, too, from the way her arms had been tied behind her back. None of those maladies were life-threatening, however, and they were fairly minor complaints in the grand scheme of things. After all, as far as Catherine could tell, she'd been kidnapped. Panic threatened to rise again as that word, kidnapped, resonated in her head. Catherine immediately worked to snuff it. Focus on something else, she ordered herself, like the room she'd woken up in. Where was she? Forcing herself to take in her surroundings, Catherine eyed what looked like a small motel room. There were four walls covered in muted green paint, two doors, one of which Catherine assumed was the bathroom and the other the exit, and a moderately stained carpet. It wasn't all that dissimilar to the motel room she'd been forced to stay at with Bastion and his pack when they had saved her from the men at that gas station. Gary's rest stop over a year ago. The reminder caused a pang of longing to shoot through her. But Bastion wasn't there, and neither was her pack. In fact, it looked like the room Catherine had awakened in was empty. Vacant. She was sitting on the floor, her back propped up against the portion of wall between two queen-sized beds. The covers of said beds smelled like smoke and something mustier to her sensitive nose. She curled her knees up to her chest as a queasy feeling took hold of her stomach. Focus. 
she scolded herself. After all, there was still another important question to address. How in the heck did she get here? Catherine closed her eyes, keeping them clenched tightly shut as she tried to remember. The image of a snarling rip and then an exasperated Zane flashed through her mind. And last, the picture of a tiny house in the middle of the woods. That's right, she'd been going to visit Melanie. But then what? Judging by the way it felt like her brain kept throwing itself against her skull, someone had hit her in the head. And then kidnapped her? But why? Before Catherine could delve into any theories, the muted sound of running water suddenly halted. Catherine tensed. Her eyes zeroed in on the door she assumed led to the bathroom. She'd been so distressed over the predicament she found herself in that she hadn't even noticed the din of running water splattering against tile until it had abruptly ended. Someone was in the shower, or had been in the shower, at least, and now they were seconds away from coming out of the bathroom. Catherine was about to find out who'd taken her. Watching the doorknob twist, she held her breath, keeping carbon dioxide trapped in her lungs until they burned. Then a man stepped out from behind the door, and Catherine had no choice but to release it in a forceful gust. He was tall and strong, judging by the muscles that protruded from his bare arms and chest. Catherine briefly took note of the black cargo pants he was wearing before focusing her attention on his face. It was largely unexceptional, his most distinguishable feature a pair of bushy eyebrows situated above two gray-colored eyes. His hair was neither brown nor blonde, but some shade in between. If pressed, Catherine would say it reminded her of dirty dishwater. The most remarkable thing about the man's appearance, by far, were the scars that littered his chest. What looked like claw marks had been carved into his pale skin and went in at least a half-dozen different directions. Then, of course, there was the fact that Catherine had never seen the man before in her life. The realization that she didn't recognize him sent a tingle of fear down her spine. It settled in her stomach, making Catherine feel decidedly nauseous. He waltzed into the room without a care in the world, using one of the motel's towels to dry his still-sopping hair. After throwing the towel to the floor, he glanced in her direction. When his eyes met hers, he froze. Catherine imagined she would have frozen, too, if she wasn't already largely immobile. As it was, her heart stuttered to a stop in her chest before suddenly starting up again in a gallop. It raced in her chest— and she could practically feel it hammering against her poor ribs as an odd sort of smile slowly spread across the man's face. "'Well, well, well, look who's finally awake,' he taunted before walking over to her. He cocked his head to the side, peering down at her huddled form. "'I bet you're probably wondering who I am.' Amongst other things, he crouched down to her eye level, and Catherine's stomach did a little flip when she caught the silver glint of a knife near his waistband. Gerard's going to award me big time for nabbing you. He reached forward, boldly rubbing a thick piece of her hair between his thumb and forefinger. So soft, he marveled. Catherine jerked away from his touch, instinctively lashing out at the man with her foot. Instead of connecting with his shin as she'd intended, however, her limb was caught by the man's free hand. He wrapped his fingers around her ankle and jerked her forward by it so that she fell backward, landing awkwardly on her bound arms. Catherine shrieked around the gag in her mouth, but the man only laughed at the pained squeal. You're even feistier than Melanie said. She was feistier than... who had said... Surely he didn't mean— Catherine hadn't fully wrapped her mind around the implications of the man's words when the other door to the room opened, and the girl in question, Melanie, walked in. Her arms were laden with plastic bags of supplies that Catherine assumed she'd purchased from a nearby grocery or convenience store. 
Catherine didn't understand. Any non-nefarious reason for Melanie to be there didn't compute. Despite how things looked, however, Catherine couldn't stop hope from blossoming in her chest at the sight of the other girl. Surely Melanie would help her. She'd explain, at the very least. Somehow, some way, this all had to be some sort of bizarre misunderstanding. The black-haired girl spotted them as soon as she entered the room. She frowned at the scene before her, and after taking a second to set down her bags on one of the beds, she marched over. "'What are you doing?' she demanded of the man still looming over Catherine. "'I was just introducing myself to Sleeping Beauty here.' Melanie rolled her eyes. "'You were supposed to come get me if she woke up,' she scolded before pushing past him. She knelt down next to Catherine, carefully helping her back into a sitting position. "'How are you feeling?' she asked when Catherine was once again propped against the wall. The question was ridiculous, really. How did Melanie think she was feeling? She'd been hit in the head, tied up, and taken against her will with absolutely no idea as to why. Clearly, Melanie was involved in the plot, somehow. She was there, after all. Yet the girl only exacerbated Catherine's confusion by showing what seemed like genuine concern for her well-being. Catherine jutted out her chin, trying to communicate with her eyes by glancing down at the tape covering her mouth before returning her gaze to Melanie. Melanie pursed her lips at what was obviously a request for her to remove the tape. She seemed to inwardly debate something for a minute, before ultimately sighing. Fine, she said shortly, reaching a hand forward and grabbing hold of the frayed edge of tape on the left side of her mouth. But if I take this off and you scream... Things aren't going to end well for you. She glanced meaningfully at the man behind her. Show her. Catherine knew what Melanie must have been referring to before the man even pulled the knife out. The weapon was long and serrated, with a blade much longer than the handle. It looked like a hunting knife of sorts, probably used to butcher large animals, and Catherine couldn't help but feel a spark of terror at the sight of it. If the man saw the fear in her widening eyes, he only smirked. Melanie redirected her gaze onto Catherine, raising her eyebrows and clearly inquiring if she understood the threat. Catherine took a deep breath through her nose before nodding. Less than a second later, the tape covering her mouth was ripped away with a singular, brutal yank. Catherine winced at the sting the action caused. She knew that her skin would be red where the adhesive on the tape had stuck to it, but she hardly cared. She was just relieved to finally be able to spit out the cloth gag that felt like it was choking her. She stretched out her jaw before attempting to swallow. The dryness of her mouth made it nearly impossible. "'What's going on?' she asked, her voice scratchy from the gag. "'How's your head?' Melanie asked instead of answering the question." It was an odd thing to inquire, considering she had just threatened Catherine with a knife. "'It's fine,' the small brunette forced herself to reply. The statement wasn't true, exactly, but the throbbing of her skull was the least of Catherine's worries. She just barely managed to bite back her protests when Melanie reached forward and began to run probing fingers through her hair. They passed over a lump on the back of her head, and Catherine couldn't suppress a flinch. Melanie turned to glare at the man behind her. I told you that you shouldn't have hit her so hard. He shrugged, not looking the least bit apologetic. Melanie huffed. Wait here, she instructed Catherine, like she could go anywhere, before stretching over the bed she'd earlier thrown her bags on and grabbing a water bottle out of one of them. After twisting off the cap, she once again knelt next to Catherine and pressed the opening of the bottle to her pink lips. Drink, she instructed. Knowing she wouldn't be any good to anyone, let alone the baby in her belly, if she was dehydrated, Catherine obeyed. In fact, she guzzled down the water until Melanie pulled the bottle away, over half empty. What's going on? Catherine repeated, her voice firmer now that her throat had been soothed with water. I think she's getting impatient, babe, the man watching the scene from a few feet away teased. 
Babe? Who exactly was this guy to Melanie? It was like the other girl could read her thoughts. This is Lucas, she said, gesturing vaguely at the man. My mate. Surprise had Catherine's eyebrows shooting upwards. What? But when? And how? Catherine was certain that she'd never seen him, this Lucas person, before in her life. What, and I'm afraid, Melanie continued, before Catherine could ask any of the questions her announcement had caused to spring forth, that he is the reason you're here. Catherine frowned at that assertion, glancing back and forth between the two of them. They were staring intently at her, seemingly waiting for a reaction of sorts. But she had no idea what they expected her to do. She didn't even know what Melanie's words were supposed to mean. And where is here, exactly? she finally asked, keeping her tone as cordial as possible considering the fact that she was the strange duo's captive. Lucas stepped forward, throwing an arm over Melanie's shoulders. We're on our way to what your lot likes to refer to as the Western Colony, to present you to my Alpha. Present her to his Alpha? Catherine's brow wrinkled in consternation. Why, what could he possibly want with me? Well, Lucas said, it's not that he wants you so much as he wants your uterus. Catherine stared. Dread pulled in her stomach at the implication behind his words. W what do you mean? She finally managed to spit out, stumbling over her suddenly clumsy tongue as she fought to contain her shock. Surely he couldn't mean what she thought he meant. Could he? Catherine couldn't tell if she felt so disoriented because what Lucas had suggested was so absurd, or she'd truly been hit that hard in the head. Lucas just laughed at her distress. I think you know what I mean, he said, confirming her fears. You see, our pack has been suffering from the same fertility issues as your little tribe— it's presented a bit of a problem because Gerard, he's our alpha, desires an heir. He's tried out most of the women in our camp, but... Lucas shrugged. No luck. Catherine felt sick. Tried out? Surely Lucas didn't mean that this Gerard person had... Well, that he'd taken these women to bed in an attempt to impregnate them. Catherine's stomach clenched. Don't look so horrified, Lucas teased. Anyway, when none of them got pregnant, he sent me to scout out your colony and find a suitable woman to bear him an heir. It was pure happenstance that I stumbled across Melanie's cottage. He offered the girl a wolfish grin. And while she didn't make a good candidate for Gerard, her hips aren't nearly wide enough for childbearing— She's been a wonderful help to me. Catherine thought she might retch when Lucas kissed the delicate curve of Melanie's shoulder. The girl's face remained indifferent as he spoke about her like she wasn't even in the room. She's the one who told me about your little town. Lucas paused, frowning. What's its pretentious name again? he asked, addressing Melanie. Heaven Falls, she supplied blankly. Right, she's the one who told me about Haven Falls' shrinking population. I was prepared to leave, take the brunt of Gerard's wrath for returning without a suitable bedmate for him. But then, of course, news of the head Alpha's mate falling pregnant reached us. I asked sweet Melanie to help lure you to her cottage, and the rest, as they say, is history." Catherine was surprised at how betrayed she felt at Melanie's involvement in the scheme. She recalled the girl sticking up for her to those two old biddies in the store a handful of months ago, and she wondered if that had been a part of their ruse even then. Still, there was something Lucas had said in his spiel that Catherine could work with. But you acknowledge that I'm already made it, to the head alpha of Haven Falls, no less. Not only am I used goods, Catherine felt sick saying the words, but he— Gerard won't care, Lucas interrupted, brushing her concern away. 
Catherine bristled. I care. Your opinion doesn't matter, he scoffed. Your belly is proof enough that you can get pregnant. That's all that matters to Gerard. He knelt next to her, leaning forward and leering. Though you aren't too sore on the eyes, either. Catherine looked to Melanie, who remained expressionless. Clearly, she wasn't going to interfere with the actions of her mate. Catherine was on her own. There wasn't much she could do about his staring when her hands were tied, literally, behind her back. Still, Catherine wasn't about to just take it when the man reached forward and brushed the underside of her jaw with the back of his fingers. She spit in his face. The glob of saliva landed with a wet smack on Lucas's cheek, and he froze. The room was suddenly eerily quiet. He calmly reached up and wiped the spittle from his face, and for a second, Catherine thought he wasn't going to retaliate. She was wrong. He pulled the knife he'd earlier threatened her with from its sheath, and in one quick movement brought it to her throat. He applied enough pressure that Catherine could feel the coolness of the blade pressed against her neck, but not enough that he actually broke the skin. Catherine's heart jumped into her throat at the action, and she swore she could feel it there, pounding against the sharp edge of the blade. Do that again, I dare you, Lucas threatened, his breath hot on her face. It smelled rancid. That's enough, Melanie said, finally deeming the situation dire enough to intervene. She pulled at Lucas's arm until he lowered it, and Catherine watched as he resheathed his knife. It's late, she pointed out, and I've got to get her cleaned up if we're going to get her out of here without any issues tomorrow. Fine, Lucas said after a moment, though his gray eyes didn't leave Catherine's green ones. Gerard's going to have fun with you, he muttered before standing. It sounded like a threat. Lucas finally broke eye contact when Melanie inserted herself between them. Come on, let's get you up, she said, bending over and taking Catherine by the bicep. She struggled to haul her up. Help me, Lucas, she ordered after a minute. The man rolled his eyes like it was an inconvenience, but stepped forward nonetheless. Yeah, because she was thrilled about having his grubby hands on her. With her arms trapped behind her back and her belly round with child, though, there was no way Catherine could get to a standing position on her own. She fought not to recoil as Lucas's fingers wrapped around her other arm, just above her elbow, and together he and Melanie pulled her to her feet. Melanie didn't waste time after that. She grabbed one of the plastic bags still sitting on the bed and led Catherine to the bathroom by her arm before shutting the door behind them. They were alone. Despite the anger Catherine felt towards the other girl still simmering in her lower belly, Catherine knew she had to use the opportunity to try to talk some sense into her. Melanie, it's not too late to let me go. Take me back to Haven Falls. I'll make sure Bastion pardons you, and together we'll protect you against Lucas if you're afraid he'll retaliate. Melanie frowned. I'm going to take the tape off your wrists now, she said, and for a moment hope swelled in Catherine's chest. But you're not going to rush me. Not with that baby in your belly, and not with Lucas outside the door wielding a knife. And just like that, that hope shriveled away into nothing. Melanie had ignored her suggestion completely. Still, she was offering to free her sore arms, so Catherine agreed to her conditions with a jerky nod. Melanie forced Catherine to turn around so that her back was facing her, and without further ado began pulling the tape off her wrists. As soon as she was done, Catherine brought the limbs to her chest, massaging the pink tender skin where the tape had been. She also began surveying the room for some semblance of a weapon. If you're looking for a cheap razor or something similar to attack me with, forget it, Melanie said, causing Catherine to stiffen. Melanie leaned back against the sink, crossing her arms over her chest. I already told Lucas to remove anything that could be construed as a weapon from the room. He's cute, but not exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. The derogatory words gave Catherine an opening. How well do you really know him? She asked, trying to appeal to Melanie's logic. 
How do you know he's not just going to hand you over to this Gerard person, too, as soon as we reach the Western Colony? I know you said that he's your mate, but is it possible he's only using you? Melanie stared. What? You think I can't get a mate on my own? She demanded, pushing herself away from the sink and standing ramrod straight. That I'm not good enough? Not deserving enough to have someone care for me? Or is that sort of thing only reserved for picture-perfect pretty girls like you? Catherine was completely taken aback. That's not what I said. It's what you meant, the other girl accused. Catherine pressed her lips together. Is that why you're doing this? Some demented kind of payback? Melanie scoffed. I think Lucas made our motives pretty clear. Catherine couldn't quite hold back the tears threatening to gather in her eyes. I thought we were friends, she murmured. Don't, Melanie snapped, the sudden ire in her voice taking Catherine by surprise. Don't even pretend to care about me or our supposed friendship. Bastion, your mate, practically banished me from Haven Falls. He had me ostracized, shunned. Where were you and your caring during that? That's not fair. Catherine protested quietly. No, Melanie disagreed. What isn't fair is that some people get everything handed to them in life for no discernible reason. I mean, look at you. You're mated to the frickin' head Alpha, live in a warm house surrounded by pack, and now you have a baby on the way. I mean, why? Because some bitch named Fate deemed it so? Catherine bit the inside of her cheek to stop herself from pointing out that the road she'd traveled to get to where she was now with Bastion in the pack had hardly been obstacle or pain-free. It's asinine, Melanie continued. All I did was try to earn myself a place in a pack. I didn't mean for you to get hurt. And what do I get for my efforts? Cast out and left to fend for myself. Catherine swallowed. I'm sorry, she tried. No, Melanie cut her off. Don't bother with your insincere drivel. Just strip and get in the tub. Catherine shifted uncomfortably at the order. She certainly didn't want to undress in front of Melanie, but didn't see what choice she had as the other girl's eyes bored into her. She towed off her boots and peeled off her socks before reluctantly tugging her blood-stained shirt. She assumed that, like the crusty red stuff sticking to the side of her face, it was from her head wound, off over her head. It was a slow, tedious process as sharp jolts of pain sparked down her shoulders, but Catherine wasn't about to ask Melanie for help. Then, with nervous fingers, she fumbled over the button of her blue jeans before shimmying out of them. She was left feeling unbelievably vulnerable as she stood in nothing but her underwear in front of Melanie, arms crossed over her chest in an effort to cover herself, at least a little. Luckily, Melanie didn't demand that she take that off as well. Instead, she merely gestured at the tub. Get in, she ordered. Catherine reluctantly obeyed, the white porcelain incredibly cold against her bare feet as she stepped in. Sit, Melanie directed, and Catherine gingerly kneeled as the black-haired girl lowered herself onto the little rug in front of the tub and cranked on the water. It shot out of the tub's spout, and Melanie allowed the water level to reach Catherine's navel before turning it off. The water was lukewarm, borderline cold, but Catherine wasn't about to complain. Melanie handed her one of the small white towels that had been placed throughout the room. Scrub, she ordered shortly, and make sure you get all the gore, she added, gesturing at her face. Catherine quietly did as she was told. There wasn't all that much blood, really— just enough to stain the towel pink as she cleaned her face and wiped the rest of herself down. I tried to talk him out of it, you know. Melanie spoke, breaking the tense silence they sat in after a few minutes. Lucas, she explained at Catherine's confused frown. You were on his radar even before you got pregnant. He thought you were pretty, she added with an eye roll. Catherine stared at the other girl incredulously. Did she want a thank you or something? Because that wasn't about to happen, all things considered. Sure, she's young and pretty, I said, but small, like me, Melanie continued, ignorant of Catherine's inner monologue. 
It helped that you were a bitten wolf and already perceived as weak in his eyes. He decided against it, against nabbing you, she clarified, shaking her head. But then, of course, you had to go and get knocked up. I could hardly deter him after that, so I wrote you that note and hoped for the best. Catherine wondered what she meant by that. What had been the preferred outcome for Melanie? That Catherine had never shown up at her house? Or precisely what had happened? There was something else Catherine was curious about, too. Did Penelope know when she gave me... Melanie waved away the question before she even had a chance to finish it. She didn't know a thing. Like Lucas, she's not the cleverest person. Catherine bit her lip. Then she took a deep breath, preparing herself to try to talk some sense into the girl. Again. But you are clever, Melanie, she said. You know very well how Bastion is going to react when he notices that I'm missing. He probably already knew she was gone, but Catherine was trying her very hardest not to think about her mate's mental state right then. You know what he's going to do. The to you was implied. Melanie shook her head. He can't do anything, she dismissed. How could he? He has no idea where we are, and unless you told someone you were coming to visit me before you disappeared, she said, shooting Catherine a knowing glance and making it clear that she knew Catherine hadn't. I doubt he or anyone will even notice my absence. Catherine bit her lip. He won't stop until he finds me. Catherine knew it was true, but dreaded the length of time it would take him. Please, Melanie, for both of our sakes, save it. But, Melanie, I said to save it. The other girl's sudden and very potent rage took Catherine completely by surprise. Before she could blink, Melanie had her by the back of her hair, her fingernails grazing her scalp as she yanked Catherine backwards and dunked her head in the bathwater. Water immediately invaded her nose. Catherine was only submerged for a handful of seconds, but it was long enough for her to accidentally inhale water. When Melanie pulled her back up, Catherine struggled to breathe, simultaneously trying to cough up the water she'd swallowed and suck in oxygen. Melanie ignored her distress completely. There, you're clean she announced indifferently. The rage she'd been overcome by mere moments before completely wiped from her face. No one will suspect a thing when we leave tomorrow morning. Now get up. Catherine eyed Melanie warily as the girl unplugged the drain. Not wanting to set her off again, she shakily got to her feet. Melanie stood, too, and threw a towel her way. Taking the hint, Catherine stepped out of the tub and methodically dried herself off. Melanie dug into the plastic bag she'd brought into the bathroom with them. Here, she said, shoving a pair of cotton underwear still in its package at Catherine. She also handed her a new shirt. It was black and long-sleeved, and judging by the white outline of British Columbia on the front, intended for tourists. There was a little red star labeled Vanderhoof in the center of the outline. It was helpful for Catherine in the sense that she now knew, geographically at least, where she was. At that point in time, however, the knowledge didn't do her much good. Come on, Melanie said, opening the bathroom door once Catherine had changed, pulling on the same pair of jeans and footwear she'd been wearing before. Lucas, who had settled in on one of the queen-sized beds, glanced their way as they exited the bathroom, but made no comment on Catherine's wet hair or change of clothes, merely refocusing his attention on the television a moment later. Some sort of animated movie was playing on the screen, and Catherine couldn't help but take note of the man's almost childlike fascination. She supposed that, like the residents of Haven Falls, the people of the Western Colony didn't have many opportunities to watch TV. Cable, after all, was an impracticality in a supposedly unoccupied chunk of woods. The outdated, boxed sets owned by the people of Haven Falls were only ever used to watch movies when they were purchased from Fort Saskatchewan or other nearby cities every once in a blue moon. Moon. Ha. Huh. Lay down. Melanie's order jerked Catherine back to the present. What? Lay down, the girl repeated, nodding towards the empty bed. Catherine glanced at Lucas, who, thankfully, was still absorbed in the television. Why? she demanded. 
Melanie rolled her eyes. What do you think? Unless you want to spend your night on the floor in the same position you woke up in earlier, just listen to me. Catherine eyed the room's exit, wishing it weren't so far away. There was no way she could successfully make a go of escaping, and knowing that Melanie and Lucas would probably just force her down if she didn't comply, Catherine reluctantly climbed onto the bed and laid stiffly on the covers. Melanie grabbed the roll of silver duct tape that Catherine only just then noticed on the room's tiny nightstand. "'What are you doing?' she demanded, pushing herself into a sitting position. "'What does it look like?' Melanie asked, equal parts sarcasm and annoyance laced in her voice. Catherine swallowed. "'Look, I don't need to be tied up, okay? I'm not stupid. I would never put my baby at risk by trying to run.' God, shut her up, would you? Lucas interrupted snappishly, shooting Catherine a glare before turning the volume of the television up. Melanie raised an eyebrow, offering Catherine a pointed look, and she reluctantly swallowed her protests. After all, she'd still rather deal with her ex-friend than Lucas, who was still a relatively unknown entity. The girl approached her, placing a hand on either of Catherine's shoulders and forcing her back down into a laying position before pulling her hands up over her head one at a time. She bound first her right wrist to one of the wooden rails of the bed's headboard, and then her left, using a generous amount of duct tape with each of them. Catherine remained quiet throughout the ordeal, but she could no longer hold back when Melanie bit off a piece of duct tape that was roughly the size of her mouth from the roll. Please don't. I swear I won't make a peep the entire night. I can hardly breathe with— Melanie slapped the tape over Catherine's mouth mid-sentence, smoothing it out with her palm afterwards to make sure it was good and stuck. Bitch. Try to rest, Melanie suggested offhandedly. We have a long day of travel in the morning. Yes, because sleeping with her kidnappers less than ten feet away was a probability. Despite Melanie's complete lack of sympathy for her plight, Catherine's unease increased when she disappeared into the bathroom shortly after that, presumably to shower. Anxiety that had nowhere to go buzzed under her skin, threatening to take hold any minute as she kept her eyes firmly glued to the man lying in the other bed and watched for any sudden movements. Luckily for Catherine, Lucas remained entranced by the television and left her alone. It wasn't until Melanie emerged from the bathroom twenty minutes later, wearing nothing but a towel that she held clinched near her chest, that Lucas finally shut it off. Catherine's stomach rolled at the lust she could smell wafting off him. "'That's my girl. Come here,' he said, beckoning Melanie to him. Catherine was horrified when she obliged, shamelessly dropping her towel to the floor as she approached the bed. She crawled under the covers with him. Surely they weren't going to. Not with her right there. Lucas leaned over the edge of his bed, the edge near Catherine, as he reached for the switch of the wall lamp positioned between the beds. He met Catherine's eyes and offered her a wicked wink. A moment later, the room was cast into darkness. The sheets rustled next to her before the unmistakable sounds of sex filled the room, soft sighs and unabashed groans coming from the other bed. Despite the near-pitch black of the room, Catherine kept her eyes clenched tightly shut throughout the ordeal, not daring to open them until twenty agonizing minutes later, when the sex noises finally ceased and the sound of a soft snore emerged. Catherine took a deep breath through her nose, trying to calm her frazzled nerves as she stared at the dark ceiling. She couldn't help but think of the last time she'd been kidnapped by a ragtag group of werewolves, Bastion and his pack. Tears gathered in her eyes and the base of her throat at the thought of them. She'd been trying not to, but it was an impossible task in the dark, quiet room with nothing else to occupy her thoughts. They must be so worried, especially Bastion. Her stomach churned at the thought of his mental state. Catherine felt the baby inside of her move, one of his little feet or elbows connecting with her ribs, and the tears nearly started to fall. After all, 
she wasn't the only one whose life was at stake. And as long as she had that life to protect, and she would protect it under any and all circumstances, her hands were tied in more ways than one. Chapter 11 Catherine spent hours picking fruitlessly at the tape that held her wrists to the wooden rails of the headboard. Her fingernails were chipped and cracked, the skin under their beds raw and bleeding before she finally gave up and acknowledged that she was well and truly stuck, completely helpless and at the mercy of the two people sleeping one bed over. She glanced at the glowing green numbers of the room's clock— it was the only way to keep track of the time since the heavy maroon curtains of the room's lone window were drawn. The clock flashed twelve twenty-seven. Catherine shifted her hips, trying to ease the ache in them. Ever since her belly had begun rounding out, she'd been uncomfortable laying on her back. And at that moment, not only did it feel like a twenty-pound bowling ball was sitting on her bladder— but she felt incredibly vulnerable, with no way to protect her protruding stomach. The pain was a good thing, in a way. The constant twinges coming from her hips, and shoulders whose overstretched muscles felt like something akin to rubber, grounded her and prevented her from falling under the Sandman's spell. Catherine didn't think it was possible to fall asleep under such a circumstance— mainly being held captive against her will, but the urge to let unconsciousness take her was strong. The room was dark and quiet, only the occasional snore interrupting the peace, and exhaustion tugged at her eyelids despite the discomfort she was in. Her body practically demanded she rest and give it a chance to begin healing her injuries. But she didn't want to let down her guard— not with her two kidnappers sleeping less than ten feet away. She was defenseless enough as it is with her hands tied above her head. She glanced at the clock. Twelve forty-three. To distract herself from the sleep that beckoned her, she tried to focus her mind on other things, like the baby in her belly. As soon as she thought of the little life growing inside her, however— Fear would cause her stomach to roil. Half terrified she'd puke if she focused too long on the dire situation that life was in, Catherine banished thoughts of the baby from her mind. She didn't want to end up choking to death on her own vomit, after all. Instead, Catherine thought of Bastion. The pack, too. Knowing how she was literally sick with worry every time she thought of her baby— she tried not to envision that they were experiencing the same feeling. Unfortunately, her imagination wasn't that good. She could picture them all in her mind. Caleb, trying to hold it together for the rest of the pack, probably attempting to force food down their throats even though his own empty stomach was a twisted knot of anxiety. Zane... Catherine hoped he didn't blame himself for her disappearance, but knew he must have. She imagined he would retrace their footsteps from earlier in the day, trying to follow her boot marks and figure out where she'd gone, all the while cursing her stupidity for wandering off alone. He'd never figure out she went to visit Melanie, of course. Her tracks had become muddled with everyone else's when she'd walked through town. Marcus was probably cussing her out right along with Zane, his usual sarcastic front on full display so that no one could see he had real feelings, like concern, panic, fear. She imagined Sophie with her somber, cerulean eyes, simultaneously acting as the voice of reason and trying to comfort her brother. Bastion. Catherine could hardly stand to think of him his instincts undoubtedly screaming for him to protect a mate that was no longer there. She could imagine the volatile cocktail of emotions swirling within him, anger, despair, and a twisted sort of self-loathing eating him up from the inside out. Catherine pressed her lips together. This isn't helping, she told herself firmly. 
concentrate on something else. So she did. Catherine put her mind to actual use by trying to think of a way, any way, out of her current situation without putting her baby in imminent danger. No matter how hard she thought, however, she couldn't think of any plausible plan. She strained her neck in order to look at the clock. 204. How could time be moving so slow? She was so tired. Catherine sucked in her bottom lip. Maybe if she just closed her eyes for a minute, she'd feel revived enough to focus on forming some sort of plan? That was it. She'd close them for a minute, two at most, just to let them rest. She was not going to fall asleep. Catherine slept. Blue eyes, a striking azure unique to one person alone, stared at her. But the eyes weren't set in the human face that Catherine was so familiar with. It was her dream wolf. He bore a striking resemblance to Bastion in wolf form, and a tiny piece of Catherine even believed it was him. She knew that was unlikely. Her dream wolf was probably just her brain's subconscious way of providing comfort when she was under duress. After all, he only ever made an appearance when she and Bastion were separated or she needed the man in some way. Still, a secret part of Catherine liked to imagine that the wolf truly was him, that their connection was so special he could insert himself in her dreams and console her the only way he had available to him at the time. In this instance, though, in this particular dream, Catherine couldn't help but hope that secret part of her was wrong. Maybe the wolf represented Bastion, but he couldn't really be him, because the creature in front of Catherine was deranged, absolutely inconsolable in his grief as he dipped his head back and howled at the moon like he was in actual physical agony. Catherine's knee-jerk reaction to the heartbreaking sound was to reach out for the wolf and touch him. She smoothed her hand over his thick pelt, attempting to offer the comfort he so often provided for her, but he wrenched away from her. He stared at her with the same unseeing, pain-filled eyes that had pierced her just moments ago, before lifting his snout into the air and releasing another jarring howl. Catherine snapped her eyes open. Her dream wolf's grief, Bastion's grief, felt heavy in her chest. It was like an actual weight sitting on top of her lungs, and Catherine struggled to breathe. It took her two attempts to successfully take a deep breath in through her nose. Still, the image of the wolf and his despairing blue eyes tormented her, and panic threatened to lace up her spine. Catherine quickly stomped it down. When she felt calm enough, she glanced at the clock. 4.51. It was nearly dawn. A sudden sense of foreboding befell her. As much as Catherine had wished for the dark of night to pass so she could make some bit of escape, she absolutely dreaded the moment the two people next to her awoke. She didn't want to deal with them and any fresh dangers the day would bring. But she didn't want to deal with her dream wolf's anguish, either. When sleep threatened to take her under again, Catherine clamped down on the inside of her cheek with her teeth. The sharp burst of pain did its job to keep her cognizant. For lack of anything else to do, Catherine passed the time by resuming her efforts to peel the tape off her wrists. When she next looked at the clock, the numbers flashed 6.35. At 7.13, someone finally stirred on the other bed. The sound of rustling blankets reached her ears, and Catherine instinctually snapped her eyes shut and feigned sleep. There was more rustling, some murmuring, then a creak of the mattress before finally the sound of feet hitting the carpet. She heard two footfalls before a small hand grabbed her elbow and jostled her. Catherine peeled open her eyes to see Melanie looming over her. Glancing at the bed confirmed that Lucas was awake as well. 
He had yet to get up, however, and was using the palm of his hand to apply pressure to the bottom of his chin and crack his neck. "'Rise and shine,' Melanie greeted, and Catherine's eyes darted back to her. The words were offered dryly, but regardless, the girl seemed to be in a better mood than the night before. It was apparent in the way she unbound Catherine's wrists with much more care than she had last evening. Despite the fact that Catherine's arms felt like something akin to jello when they were released, her hands immediately sought her sore shoulders, attempting to rub the ache away. Melanie watched her all the while, a frown pulling at her lips when her dark eyes traveled down to take in her belly. "'Do you have to use the bathroom?' she asked. "'Holy Mother of Hell, yes.' "'Yes,' Catherine said, managing to restrain herself. Her bladder felt like it was about to burst. Melanie nodded, leading her to the bathroom much like she had the night before. When Catherine had finished her business and they'd returned to the main room, Lucas had climbed out of bed. He was pulling a shirt on over his head similar to the one that Melanie had bought for Catherine. Here, Melanie said, regaining Catherine's attention by thrusting a puffy purple coat into her arms. But it wasn't the coat she'd been wearing when she'd been kidnapped. In fact, now that she thought of it, she hadn't been wearing a coat at all last night when she'd come to. She shot Melanie an inquisitive look. "'Your jacket got some blood on it, so I threw it out with your shirt,' she explained with a nonchalant wave of the hand, like she was discussing the weather or something equally as dull. "'Oh,' Catherine managed to mutter, looking over the coat in her arms. It wasn't exactly her style, but she couldn't exactly afford to be picky, could she? She supposed she should just be grateful they were giving her a coat at all. "'And a hat,' Catherine took note, as Melanie handed her one of those as well. It was plain black and looked like it would fit snugly over her head. "'Put that on. Then why don't you stretch?' Melanie suggested. "'It's a long drive to where we're going.' Her almost friendly demeanor was completely at odds with the business-like air she'd put on the night before. Catherine wasn't about to complain, though, and heeded her advice— taking a moment to touch her toes and then pull her calves tight behind her thighs. When she was finished, Melanie stepped into her space. Okay, this is how this is going to work, she said, completely straight-faced and suddenly sounding very stern. So much for affability. Lucas is going to go check us out of the motel. When he comes back to the room to retrieve us, we're going to walk you out to the car. I'll be on one side of you and Lucas the other. Lucas is going to keep a hand on your lower back under your jacket. In that hand, he'll be holding his knife. If it even looks like you're going to make a break for it, he's going to slice you open. Got it? Catherine stared. Do you got it, Catherine? Melanie repeated. You can't run. Catherine managed to force down this strange mix of alarmed horror and righteous indignation forming in her gut to offer Melanie a jerky nod. Good. The girl seemed honestly relieved with her compliance, and if Catherine didn't know better, she'd have thought that she might actually care, at least a little, about Catherine's well-being. As it was, Melanie was one of the main reasons she was in the bind she was in in the first place. Catherine played the part of a good little hostage, as Lucas did precisely what Melanie said he would do and checked them out of the motel. When they escorted her out the door a few minutes later, she could feel the cool, flat edge of Lucas's blade through the thin fabric of her shirt. It was enough to deter her from running. Still, she had hoped to be able to meet some stranger's eyes in the parking lot and mouth some sort of S.O.S. at them— but the tar lot was empty, and thus that plan foiled. Catherine knew they had reached Lucas's vehicle when they stopped in front of a beat-up 1980s Buick, and Melanie manually unlocked the doors. She only recognized the make and model because her grandfather had used to own one before he'd died. Lucas's was even uglier than his had been. There was rust present by all four wheels, a sizable dent in the hood, 
and no other word described the car's color better than brownish. Still holding the blunt side of the knife against her back, Lucas shuffled her towards the back passenger side door, opening it with his free hand. Get in. With no other choice, Catherine reluctantly obeyed. The car was as outdated on the inside as the outside, featuring crank-operated windows and a fabric ceiling that drooped in places. Lucas lowered himself into the back seat next to Catherine, and she scooted as far away from him as the cramped seating allowed. Melanie smoothly slid into the driver's seat before relocking the doors. She dug her hand into a duffel bag Catherine assumed she'd either packed from Haven Falls or had picked up at the same store as the other supplies, and pulled out a roll of duct tape similar to the one from earlier, handing it back to Lucas. "'Give him your wrists, Catherine,' she ordered. Catherine stiffened. Being tied up would make escaping substantially harder. "'Melanie, please, I promise not to—' Catherine rushed to try to persuade her. "'She said, give me your wrists,' Lucas said, roughly grabbing at them. "'Life's going to be hard for you where we're going if you can't follow simple instructions.' He wound the tape around her wrists several times before deeming her sufficiently bound and ripping the tape from the roll with his teeth. "'If you're quiet, we can forego taping your mouth,' Melanie offered from the front seat. "'I don't know. You think she can behave?' Lucas mocked. Catherine fought the urge to roll her eyes. "'Probably not, but I don't see the harm. It's not like she can scream for help. Well, she could, I suppose, but it's not like anyone will hear her.' "'I guess,' Lucas agreed, before startling Catherine and grabbing her by the chin. He squeezed her cheeks, forcing her lips to pucker. "'Anyhow, it'd be a shame to have to cover that pretty mouth.' Catherine's heart leapt into her throat, but Lucas just released her face with a laugh. Let's hit the road. Without further ado, Melanie started the vehicle. Catherine stared down at her bound wrists as they drove down the highway. She was grateful that Lucas had been foolish, or maybe just overconfident, enough to let her keep her hands in front of her instead of binding them behind her back. She was determined to make him pay for the mistake. He wasn't even watching her, really. He was leaning back into his seat with his hands behind his head as he bragged to Melanie about his prowess as a hunter. I'm not as good as Gerard is, of course. No one is. But I'm a close second. You should see some of the beasts that roam the woods where we live. Catherine thought, very briefly, about using her fingers to manually unlock the door and simply jumping from the car, but ultimately dismissed the idea. Not only was leaping from a moving vehicle not worth the risk of hurting her baby, but the fall would almost certainly injure her as well, and there was no way she could hobble away fast enough to escape. There was no way around it. Catherine was going to have to get them to stop somewhere. Just last year, I took down a buck with twenty-some points, Lucas continued to talk next to Catherine, oblivious to her scheming. Man, that venison was some of the best I've ever tasted. Catherine's stomach rumbled at the mention of food. She hadn't eaten in nearly twenty-four hours, but the direness of her situation had masked any hunger she may have felt. Until now. A painful twinge shot through Catherine's belly as it demanded sustenance. And just like that, a light bulb went off in her head. I'm hungry she blurted, interrupting Lucas mid-brag if the disgruntled look he shot her was any indication. Melanie nodded from the front seat. I figured you would be. You slept through supper last night. Catherine supposed that was true if one counted being knocked unconscious, sleeping. Here. Melanie tossed a box of granola bars in the back seat. Crap. Catherine bit her lip. She recalled Melanie's numerous glances to her belly the night before. Maybe. Please, Melanie, my baby needs real food. Melanie frowned, a genuine hint of concern glimmering in her eyes for perhaps the first time that morning. 
What do you want? Bingo. I don't know, a burger or something? We could stop somewhere and... No. Lucas immediately cut her off. We're not stopping anywhere, he reiterated, shooting Catherine a suspicious look. I guess we could go to a drive through Melanie said. But you'll have to be quiet. Say a single word, and I'm stepping on the gas. Burger or no burger. Catherine could work with that. If you don't trust her, we could always stuff her in the trunk, Lucas suggested. Catherine stiffened. She couldn't quite tell if he was kidding or not. She's pregnant, Melanie scolded lightly. The next town they came across had a McDonald's. It was too early in the day to get a hamburger, though, so Melanie ordered her a breakfast sandwich with extra bacon. She also insisted on getting Catherine a large orange juice. I'm sure the vitamin C is good for the baby, she explained. Catherine wrinkled her forehead at the strangely thoughtful gesture, but nodded. As they approached the drive through window, Catherine tried to catch the eye of the pimply teenager working the cash register. She succeeded in making eye contact, but before Catherine could mouth some sort of message to him or flash him the tape around her wrists, his eyes flickered back down to the register. That'll be 7.59, he said, a red flush crawling up his neck. He didn't look back up. Catherine deflated. So much for that idea. At least the sandwich Melanie handed her was a consolation prize of sorts. The biscuit that made up the outer parts of the sandwich was practically saturated with grease, and the cheese was half stuck to the wrapper the sandwich came in, but Catherine didn't care. She wolfed it down within minutes. To make up for it, she took her time nursing her orange juice, the sweet taste washing away the aftertaste of liquefied lard. Less than an hour later, it felt like the baby in her belly was trying to play a game of soccer with her rapidly filling bladder, with her bladder as the ball, of course, and another idea came to Catherine. I have to pee, she announced bluntly. Lucas, who had closed his eyes and was attempting to sleep next to her, snorted. Good for you. Catherine frowned. Seriously, she said. This baby is sitting directly on my bladder. I have to go, and soon. She had no qualms about using her pregnancy to hammer the point home, not after Melanie had proved susceptible to the manipulation. You went this morning, Lucas pointed out, brushing her off. I think you can hold it. Yeah, and I've drunk what was probably a quart of juice since then, Catherine replied crossly. If you don't get me to a bathroom now, I'm going to piss in your car. Lucas shrugged. Go right ahead, he said. It's not like the car is actually mine. Catherine frowned. She knew the Buick wasn't Melanie's, but if it didn't belong to her or Lucas, then... Whose is it? Gerard's? she asked, testing the name out on her tongue. Lucas sniggered at the suggestion. No. We have no use for cars where we live. I borrowed this doozy from an old man who was concerned for the well-being of a young, down-on-his-luck hitchhiker. Lucas pulled a worn wallet from the back pocket of his cargo shorts, flashing Melanie a driver's license. Catherine's stomach filled with foreboding as she stared at the picture of an elderly man with a green newsboy cap on his head, and a smile stretched across his weathered face. The license read Oliver Hampton. He treated us at the motel, too, Lucas added, as Melanie took in the other side of the wallet that was lined with credit cards. I is he... I mean, you didn't... She stuttered. Let's just say I don't think good old Ollie will be reporting his car stolen any time soon. Or, you know, ever. Catherine could read between the lines. The man was dead. Just for being in the wrong place at the wrong time and having a tender enough heart to try to help someone he thought was in a jam. It was awful, and the sandwich she'd eaten earlier threatened to make a reappearance as bile churned in her stomach. Focus on the plan, Catherine scolded herself. 
Yes, well, you may not care about the condition of the car, she finally managed to say, but you'll still have to smell it when I soak the seat. He waved off her concern. I smell the same and worse all the time. There's no fancy indoor plumbing where we're going. That gave Catherine pause. For the first time since it was revealed that Lucas and Melanie were taking her to the Western Colony, Catherine thought of Bastion's comments about the place and its people's primitive way of living. She recalled him claiming that they were more wolf than man. Really? she asked. Catherine could surmise well enough that they did their business in the woods, but... How do you bathe? Lucas rolled his eyes, like he was the one being forced to suffer the company of a stupid brat and not the other way around. In the river, of course. But what about during the winter when it's iced over? Like now. Lucas shrugged. We melt some water over a fire and wash up with that, he explained, like it wasn't completely unhygienic to go months without a proper bath. Catherine glanced at Melanie, wondering if she knew of the living conditions of the Western Colony before agreeing to go with Lucas, but the girl's expression hadn't changed at all due to his words, so Catherine figured she must have already known. Catherine frowned. Okay, she allowed, but are you really going to present me to this Gerard person reeking of urine? It was the first of her arguments that gave Lucas pause. Before he could respond one way or the other, though, Melanie sighed from the front seat, likely as sick of the discussion about bodily functions as Catherine was. For Christ's sake, Lucas, she's pregnant. You should have figured we'd have to stop and let her use the toilet at least once on this trip. I'll just pull over at the next rest stop I see that's secluded enough. Lucas frowned, probably at the annoyance in Melanie's tone that seemed directed at him but conceded. Fine. Less than ten minutes later, Melanie was pulling off the highway and driving the car up a smaller gravel road towards where a billboard advertised a rest stop. She parked. Knife, Melanie requested as she unbuckled her seatbelt. Lucas handed the blade over to her, handle side first. Just hurry it up. Melanie nodded before leaving her seat. She opened Catherine's door and let her outside. Although the sun was shining, it made the snow-covered ground positively gleam. It was still bitterly cold, especially when the wind gusted. As such, the park they'd stopped at, and its restrooms, were vacant. With no one around to have to hide the knife from, Melanie held it loosely in her hand as she followed Catherine into the brick shelter. The inside of the bathroom was in good condition, considering. There was a cobweb in one of the ceiling's corners, and a few dry, scattered leaves on the ground that had somehow got inside and escaped the snow. But besides that, and the usual dank smell that seemed a staple in every outdoor bathroom there ever was, it was clean. Catherine glanced into one of the stalls before turning to address Melanie. I don't suppose you'll untie me. Melanie raised an eyebrow. No. Catherine glanced down at the button and zipper of her jeans, or tried to, anyway, her belly was in the way, and wondered how she was going to pull this off with bound hands. Do you need help? Catherine grit her teeth at the sarcasm. I'll manage, she muttered before entering one of the stalls. Melanie didn't allow her to close it, so Catherine had to do her best to ignore her presence as she unzipped her jeans and tugged them down a little at a time. She relieved herself. She really did have to pee. Before beginning the much more impossible task of pulling the jeans up. In the end, she had to bite her tongue as Melanie helped her. Afterwards, Catherine went to wash her hands. She cranked on the faucet, trying not to flinch as freezing cold water hit her bound hands. She watched Melanie through the mirror in front of her. The girl was resting on the wall behind her, her usual hawk-like stare absent from Catherine's form, as she seemed to be contemplating something or another, Lucas's knife held loosely in her hand. Catherine directed her gaze to her own eyes, 
looking in the green orbs as she attempted to calm the sudden racing of her heart. This was it. It was now or never. If she didn't try something now, there was no way she could escape before they reached the colony. Catherine took a deep breath, and then furiously slammed her bound hands into the mirror. It shattered with a crash, pieces of the reflective surface flying everywhere. Melanie startled at the sudden noise, but quickly leapt into action, grabbing Catherine from behind in an attempt to restrain her. Catherine clumsily wrapped her hands around one of the larger pieces of broken mirror, ignoring the way the glass bit into her fingers. They tussled for a solid minute, evenly matched in size and strength, but Catherine had desperation on her side. Plus, Melanie seemed to be holding back in an attempt to be mindful of Catherine's pregnant stomach. She hadn't even attempted to use the knife. Catherine had no such reservations. When she managed to wrench herself from Melanie's grip, she turned on her heel and plunged the glass shard into Melanie's shoulder. The girl stumbled backward in shock, her eyes jumping from Catherine's unrepentant expression to the piece of glass sticking out of her shoulder, then back to Catherine's face again. She shrieked, and Catherine bolted. She hurried out of the shelter, peeking only once behind her shoulder as she sprinted into the thick of the forest behind the brick restrooms. She saw Lucas scramble from the Buick in response to Melanie's scream, and picked up her pace. Catherine was fast, but she was also pregnant, and no match for Lucas's speed. As she ran and carelessly swatted the low-hanging branches out of her way— she could only hope he chose to attend to Melanie rather than give chase. It soon became apparent that wasn't the case. She hadn't made it far into the woods at all when she heard and felt him behind her. Catherine didn't have time to brace herself before he leapt at her, wrapping his arms around her waist and tackling her to the ground. Her left hip connected hard with what felt like a rock buried under the snow— and a sharp jolt of pain shot through her belly. Fear for her unborn child squeezed at her heart. It was the last thing Catherine felt before Lucas's angry fist came down at her head and darkness reigned. Chapter 12 Her dream wolf. His belly was pressed flush against the snow-covered ground, his large paws covering his snout as he whined. A ball of pure emotion welled in Catherine's throat at the sight. Hey, it's okay, she attempted to soothe him, reaching out with a hand and laying it on the flat of his head between his ears. The wolf jerked away from the touch, peering up at her through his paws. When Catherine caught sight of his eyes, she suddenly couldn't breathe. The wolf's, Bastion's, lovely blue eyes were completely black. It looked like even the whites of his eyes had been swallowed by his pupils as he stared. And then he started growling. Spittle hung from his sharp teeth as he bared them at her. It was clear to Catherine that the animal in front of her was rabid. He slowly got to his feet, taking one threatening step towards her and then another. Catherine squeezed her eyes tightly shut at the sight pressing the palms of her hands into her sockets as she wished with all her might to be out of this nightmare. Don't know what he was thinking. She's so little. How am I supposed to— Catherine felt like she was underwater as her ears strained to pick up snippets of a conversation. The words sounded slurred to her waterlogged brain, and her understanding of them was murky at best. She only knew that she didn't recognize the voices, or voice, really, as what she seemed to be hearing was a singular person talking to herself. It was with that thought in mind that she didn't know who the voice belonged to. Catherine forced herself to open her eyes. She tried to, anyway. Her left eye was sealed almost completely shut. What in the world? Catherine's hand darted up to her face, fingers gently probing the hot, puffy skin around the eye in question. It sparked a memory. 
the isolated rest stop surrounded by trees, Melanie staring at her with a piece of glass sticking out of her bloodied shoulder, a sharp pain in her belly, Lucas's fist hurtling towards her face. She'd been kidnapped, and her escape attempt thoroughly thwarted. Catherine pushed herself up on her knees, resting a hand on her belly. A little foot or hand poked at her from the inside, and relief flooded her. Thank God. Assured that her baby seemed to be okay, Catherine glanced around at the strange space she'd awakened in, wondering if they had reached the Western Colony. As she took in her surroundings, she figured they must have. Catherine was kneeling in what appeared to be a hut of sorts. Wooden poles were stacked on top of each other in an intricate pattern to create walls seven or so feet up from the ground before they began to form a dome-like ceiling. Cracks between the poles were plastered in mud that had long since dried. Every inch of the dirt ground inside the hut was covered with animal pelts, except for the very middle, where a fire pit had been dug. A low blaze was simmering in it, smoke from the fire billowing up through a small opening in the hut's ceiling. Overall, it was a crude, primitive dwelling, but impressive in its own right. As Catherine looked around the hut, as much as she could, anyway, considering she only had a sliver of vision in her left eye, she spotted the silhouette of a person— the person in question was standing in one of the shadows naturally formed by the fire. When they stepped forward, the tall, thin form of a woman was revealed. As no one else seemed to be in the hut, Catherine deduced that the voice she'd heard earlier must have belonged to her. "'You're awake,' the woman blurted. She seemed shocked. Catherine carefully observed her. She was young, like her— maybe a few years older, judging by the stress that pulled at her otherwise pretty features. Her skin was a lot darker than Catherine's own, a beautiful, toffee color that spoke of Hispanic descent, and her dark hair looked similar to Melanie's in cut and color, but was thick and textured instead of thin and brittle. Her eyes were a warm chocolate. Ultimately, the woman reminded Catherine of a thinner, darker version of the Amazonian Sophie. "'Here, let me,' she said, taking two steps forward and kneeling in front of Catherine. She brought the damp piece of cloth she was holding in her hand to Catherine's nose, dabbing delicately underneath it at what Catherine assumed was dried blood. "'I'm sorry to be meeting you this way. I'm sure you must be scared.' Catherine, finally managing to shake off her own shock at the woman's... girls? Attempt to treat her injuries, swatted her hand away. "'Who are you?' she demanded. Her eyes softened. "'I'm Serena,' she said, introducing herself quietly before glancing down at Catherine's belly. She frowned. "'I'd say it's good to meet you, but I don't think those sentiments would be returned.' Catherine licked her dry lips, wondering what in the world she was supposed to say to that. The woman, Serena, seemed to know that she hadn't been brought there of her own free will, but she wasn't doing anything to aid Catherine either, in spite of her apparent sorrow over it. As she finally took note of her unbound hands, though, Catherine realized that she didn't need her help. Pushing off the ground, she shakily got to her feet, ignoring the painful twinge that shot through her left hip. "'What are you doing?' Serena asked, sounding fretful as she stood as well. "'Please, sit. You don't—' Before Catherine could make a run for it, before Serena could even finish her sentence, they both froze at the sudden sound of loud footfalls and even louder voices approaching the hut. Serena snapped her mouth shut. "'I better not be disappointed, Lucas,' a masculine voice drawled. "'I swear, Alpha, you will be so pleased. "'That's a bold thing to say. "'You know the consequences if you're wrong.' Then the thick animal-skin flap that served as the hut's door was spread open, and two people stepped inside. 
There was Lucas, of course, and another man whom Catherine had never seen before. Judging by Lucas's submissive stance, he held himself with his head bowed slightly to his chest, and the almost reverent way he regarded the other man, he must have been none other than Gerard. Gerard was big. Standing at what had to have been six and a half feet tall, and with bulky muscles bulging under the animal furs he was draped in, his physique practically screamed Alpha. He had brown hair that fell in tangles down to his shoulders and gleamed gold in the firelight. It matched his beard, which, while not especially thick, was certainly more than just stubble. He had noble features, with an angular nose that was just the tiniest bit crooked. It told Catherine that it had likely been broken a few times too many to heal completely straight. His eyes were dark brown, like Serena's, but unlike hers, they weren't warm in the slightest. They left her feeling cold, a shiver of something more than just apprehension tingling down her spine as they took her in. When his dark eyes finally connected with hers, Catherine jerked her green ones away from him. Instead of meeting his intrusive stare head-on, she focused her attention on the lesser threat in the room. Lucas. "'Where's Melanie?' she demanded. She couldn't help but wonder about the severity of the injury she'd inflicted upon her. Lucas looked something between shocked and offended that Catherine dared to speak to him without first addressing Gerard. He glanced timidly at the man in question before answering. "'She's resting?' he bit out snappishly. "'Although she's lucky to even be alive. You nearly nicked an artery.' Catherine raised her eyebrows in disbelief at the accusatory tone. "'You'll have to forgive me for my lack of remorse.' she muttered sarcastically. Lucas bristled at her impudence, while Gerard merely snorted. "'This is all you could find?' he asked, speaking for the first time since entering the room as he turned to face the blonde man. "'She's pretty under all the bruises,' Lucas defended. "'Yeah, just like I'm sure you're a real catch under all the excess body hair and jackassery,' Catherine spit out, addressing Gerard for the first time. It was much easier to do without the intensity of his stare directed at her. In retrospect, antagonizing the man who looked like he could crush her puny body with the same amount of exertion as it took for him to lift a pinky finger probably wasn't her smartest idea. Before Catherine could blink, he had his meaty fingers wrapped around her bicep and was throwing her to the floor. She just barely managed to protect her pregnant belly from impact and catch herself with her hands. Before she could push herself back up, however, he'd lifted his booted foot and was pressing it to the side of her face, the grooves of his well-worn footwear digging into the sensitive skin of her cheek as he ground it against the floor. Now, that wasn't very nice. After all, you don't even know me, he said. The man didn't sound mad, but rather... amused. The realization sent a jolt of fear through Catherine stronger than any she would have experienced if he would have spoken with anger at lacing his voice. "'Say you're sorry,' he demanded. Despite the fear swirling in her gut, Catherine pressed her lips together and remained silent. Gerard grinned at her reaction, or lack thereof, and he turned to once again face Lucas. "'Stubborn thing, isn't she?' I thought you might like that about her, Alpha. Hmm, Gerard hummed. It wasn't a denial, and Catherine felt sick. Tell you what, Gerard said after a moment, voice practically dripping in faux understanding. Since you've had a rough go of it the past few days, I'll give you another chance to apologize. But let me be perfectly clear. If you don't cooperate, you will be sorry when I ease this boot off your face and violently introduce it to your belly. He paused. Do you understand? Catherine felt her heart fluttering in her chest at the threat. The baby kicked her in the abdomen like it was urging her to agree. 
She nodded as much as the uncomfortable position she'd been forced into allowed. Well, then. Catherine forced herself to swallow her pride. Sorry, she bit out between clenched teeth. Gerard literally tisked at her. Like you mean it, he reprimanded. And call me Alpha. Catherine took a deep breath in through her nose, stamping down the angry humiliation she could feel threatening to creep up her face in the form of a heated blush. I'm sorry, Alpha, she managed to force out more respectfully. There, that wasn't so bad, was it? Gerard taunted her, removing the pressure of his boot off her face. Catherine hurriedly pushed herself back into a standing position. She nearly lost her balance, however, when as soon as she got to her feet, Gerard took her roughly by the chin. Catherine instinctively jerked away, but Gerard just grabbed at it again, this time painfully enough that she winced. Let me look at you, he demanded and she withheld the urge to punch him in his smug mouth as he proceeded to turn her face this way and that, hungry eyes roaming her features. He fingered the faded scar on the left side of her face. Lucas hesitantly spoke up from behind Gerard after a few minutes, but what felt more like a few hours to Catherine, of his invasive inspection. Is she to your tastes? he asked sounding nervous and hopeful at the same time. Gerard finally let go of her chin, taking a step back out of her space. Catherine released a gust of air she hadn't even been aware she was holding. She'll do, Gerard said, turning to refocus his attention back on Lucas. I must admit, your competence surprises me. Lucas's face lit up like Gerard had just pronounced him heir to some imaginary throne instead of having offered him a lukewarm compliment. He bowed his head. Thank you, Alpha. Catherine nearly jumped out of her skin when Gerard's eyes suddenly flashed yellow and one of his hands shot forward, wrapping it around Lucas's throat and squeezing. She watched in subdued horror as hair started growing on Gerard's hand his nails lengthening until they were long and sharp enough to pierce Lucas's throat if Gerard willed it. But next time, Gerard instructed in a deceptively calm voice, bring my property back to me in one piece. I prefer any marks she wear to be my own. He released Lucas, shoving him backwards as he shook his head. Honestly, nearly outsmarted by some little bitch. Yes, Alpha. Of course, Alpha. I'm sorry, Alpha. Gerard waved off the apology. You can go, he dismissed Lucas. You too, Serena, he added, addressing the woman who, with all of the commotion, Catherine had forgotten was still in the room. I'll finish fixing her up. Serena seemed reluctant to leave, her body language practically radiating shame as she stood quietly in a corner of the room. Catherine stared at her, imploring her with her eyes to somehow intervene, but the woman couldn't even bring herself to look at Catherine as she handed Gerard the cloth and fled. She was alone with him. Catherine stood stiffly in the tense silence that befell them as Gerard dipped the rag into the nearby bowl of water. He strained the cloth of excess water with his hands. His hands. Catherine watched them carefully, the scene she'd been privy to mere minutes before replaying in her mind. She didn't know if his partial shift into a wolf spoke of impeccable control or none at all. Catherine forced herself to remain absolutely still as he brought the rag up to her face, wiping at her mouth and chin with a deceivingly gentle touch that had her on edge. "'What's your name?' he asked, as he once again dipped the rag in warm water. Catherine clenched her teeth together, refusing to answer. She didn't want the man to know her name. She didn't want him to have that power over her. Gerard smirked at her non-compliance, abandoning the rag in favor of touching her face with his bare hands. 
He trailed his fingers down her neck in a soft caress that sent shivers down Catherine's spine, before resting his thumb gently over her pulse point. You know, he whispered softly, leaning forward and speaking into her ear, we can do this the easy way, or the hard way. He pressed his thumb harder into her neck. And I do so love the hard way. It'd be foolish to tempt me. Why do you care? Catherine demanded after a moment. He increased the pressure of his thumb on her pulse point, digging into it until Catherine was sure he could actually feel the erratic beat of her heart, fluttering against his finger like a trapped butterfly pinned to the pavement. Catherine protested the only way she could under the circumstances. When she opened her mouth, she lied. Mallory, she blurted, spitting out the name of her high school rival. It was a risk, Catherine knew, to deceive him, even with something as inconsequential as her name, but she did it anyway. She didn't want her name, the name her parents, her pack, and Bastion called her, coming out of Gerard's foul mouth. Mallory, he drawled, raising both eyebrows as he slowly released her. It doesn't quite suit you. Catherine couldn't tell whether he was being sarcastic or if he somehow already knew she was lying. Melanie certainly knew her name, after all, and presumably Lucas as well. Either way, Catherine wanted to retch. Well, Mallory, he repeated the name once more. I trust Lucas explained to you why you're here. Or has he failed me in that regard as well? Catherine shifted uncomfortably, playing with the slightly too long sleeves of her coat with her fingers. He said something about you wanting an heir, she muttered. Gerard grinned. That's right. Catherine stiffened and she forced herself to remain absolutely still when he took a step forward into her immediate space and unzipped her jacket, pulling it slowly off of her one sleeve at a time. He stared at her belly, which was much more prominent without the jacket on. And I think it's pretty clear you know exactly how one goes about making one. It's also clear that I have a mate, she snapped back before she could think better of it. He's the head alpha of our colony, too. He's strong, smart, and stupidly protective. When he finds me, and believe me, he will find me. He's going to rip your head straight off your shoulders. Gerard raised his eyebrows at the tangent, seemingly unimpressed by the threat she ended it with. If you're really that bothered by the idea of betraying him, I can certainly have him taken care of to ease your conscience. Now, what was that you said? Head Alpha? Catherine stiffened, immediately regretting the way she'd just ignorantly spewed information at him. A mix of fear and anger tore at her stomach. Best you forget about him, lovely, he said, voice dripping in condescension as he took in her reaction. Mate or no mate? You happen to be in possession of the most fertile uterus in all the land. The worthless women of this pack are as barren as the damn desert. Really, I'm stuck with you just as much as you're stuck with me. Right. Now, he continued, taking a seat on the makeshift mattress stuffed with the feathers of game birds that Catherine assumed served as his bed. Come lay with me. Catherine knew the order was coming, some variation of it, anyway. It had been made clear to her precisely what she was there for, after all, but that didn't mean she was going to make it easy for him. She took a step away from the man, stealing her resolve. No. Gerard froze. For the first time since she'd opened her mouth, her defiance seemed to actually bother him rather than merely amuse. No he repeated softly, standing and stepping into her space. Catherine held her ground, jutting out her chin as she crossed her arms over her chest. 
You can do what you want to me. We both know I can't stop you. But I will never willingly submit to you. It'll be a cold day in hell before I just lay there and take it as you— Catherine paused, swallowing around a lump in her throat. As he rapes you, her mind whispered viciously, refusing to shield her from the harsh words. As you try to impregnate me with your child, she finally settled on. I'll fight you every time, until you regret the day you ever even thought of using my body this way. Catherine was out of breath by the time she had finished the rant. Gerard smiled, showing all his teeth. You will do as I say. Catherine didn't bother to respond, merely snorting in disbelief. What made him think that? Do you know why? He continued softly, boldly palming her belly. Catherine froze, a fear greater than any she'd felt before slamming into her like a tsunami crashing onto a shoreline, crushing her resolve much like such a storm would rip trees from their roots, tear buildings to the ground, and generally destroy anything worthwhile in its path. Because if you don't... I'll cut this babe from your body, and perchance he survives that. I'll drown him in front of your very eyes. He paused. But if you're a good girl and cooperate, I might not only let the little bastard live, I'll let you keep him. He was using her unborn baby as leverage against her and there was nothing Catherine could do about it. The worst part was that she knew it wouldn't stop when the baby was born. Theoretically, Gerard could hold the threat of harming her child over her head forever. Catherine wasn't even aware of the silent tears trailing down her cheeks until he condescendingly caught one with his finger. He patted her cheek. Don't cry, lovely. It's not a good look on you. Now... He sat back down on his bed. Lay with me. Catherine had no choice but to obey. She approached the bed with jerky steps, tensely sitting on the downy mattress before lying back. Gerard didn't touch her. He just stared. It was unnerving, and she somehow tensed further when he ran a hand through her disheveled hair. Just get it over with she snapped. Get what over with? He mocked as he leaned forward and dug his nose into her hair, inhaling her scent. You know what, she accused, fighting the urge to lurch away from him. Gerard laughed, pulling back enough to once again observe her. You think I'm going to take you with another man's bastard in your belly? What's the point? There's hardly room for my seed to grow in there, is there? His eyes gleamed in the firelight as he leaned forward, lips brushing her ear as he spoke. No, I think I'll wait. After all, the anticipation will make it all the sweeter when the time comes to finally claim you. He flashed her a perverse grin before flopping back down on his side of the bed, where he lay, serving as a barrier between her and the door. Sweet dreams, Catherine, he added, offering her one last smirk before turning his back on her. Catherine's breath hitched at the sound of her name coming out of the uncouth man's mouth. He had known it all along. Lucas must have told him it before they'd even walked into his hut. But what was the point of making Catherine tell him it, then? Because the power he lorded over her gave him some sort of sick thrill, obviously. Tears filled Catherine's eyes at the thought, hands clenching protectively at her belly as the man beside her settled in for sleep. The tears were as much of relief as they were of fear and frustration. Gerard had granted her a reprieve, after all. In a surprised twist of events, the baby inside of her was protecting her from harm as much as she was trying to protect him or her. Catherine couldn't help but think of what would happen, though, when the time came to give birth 
and they could no longer afford each other any sort of real protection. She sniffled quietly, hoping the man beside her had surrendered to sleep and didn't hear her sniveling. She could only hope that Bastion and the pack found her before it came to that. It was with that thought in mind that Catherine closed her eyes and prayed. Not to any deity that may or may not have been watching over her, but to a man she believed in more than any of them. Hurry, Bastion. Please. Chapter 13 He didn't come for her. Not in her dreams, and certainly not in real life. Instead of waking in Bastion's embrace, his limbs wound snugly around hers, Catherine woke in the same strange hut-like habitation she'd somehow fallen asleep in the night before. At least the bed she'd woken up in was empty, cold where Gerard had slept the night before. She sat up and glanced around the hut. It didn't look much different in the daylight. It was difficult to tell it was even morning— there were no windows in the crude dwelling. She only knew the sun had risen, in fact, because of the rays of light that had snuck in under the animal skin flap that served as a door. Inspecting the room, Catherine's eyes roamed over bare walls before taking in the furniture she'd been too distressed to notice last night. There wasn't much of it, just a crudely built wooden table and two matching chairs— there was also a large clay basin filled with water near the fire pit. The blaze from the night before had been reduced to red and orange embers, only a thin trail of smoke rising up towards the small opening in the ceiling. The smoke smelled strange, different from the night before. It made Catherine's nose wrinkle, and she wondered if some sort of incense had been added to it. The hut was also vacant, save for herself and Serena. The woman was sitting on the floor near the fire, weaving what looked like a basket of sorts in her lap. Her eyes widened when they flickered up and met Catherine's. Serena instinctively stood, wiping her hands on the dirty apron-type garment that covered an equally dirty dress. The dress was collared and may have once been a bright yellow color, but had dulled with age. It looked like it was from the seventies. It probably was. Good morning. Catherine stared. Yeah, it's a great one, she deadpanned after a moment, pulling the furs off her lap. She didn't remember being under any covers when she'd fallen asleep, and it disturbed her to think Gerard had placed them over her sometime during the night. The idea of his hands anywhere near her while she was unconscious made her stomach twist in revulsion. Serena bit her lip at Catherine's obvious sarcasm, but offered forth no rebuff. Catherine ignored the woman. Girl, really, she wasn't much older than her, as she threw her legs off the bed. Her bare feet landed on the pelt-covered ground, the plush fur soft beneath her toes. Catherine frowned bare feet? She could have sworn she'd had her boots on last night when she'd fallen asleep. She eyed the girl near the fire. Where are my boots? Catherine searched the ground for them, as well as the coat Gerard had stripped her of the night before. And my jacket. Serena didn't immediately answer, but her eyes flitted towards the fire pit. That strange smell— Catherine's eyes widened as realization dawned. She rushed towards the nearly extinguished fire. Inside she spotted her boots, or what used to be her boots, anyway. They were burnt, charred nearly beyond recognition, covered in black soot with their rubber grips melted. They'd been rendered useless, but Catherine couldn't resist her gut reaction to reach forward and snatch them from the fire. Serena grabbed her by the wrist before her hand got too close to the hot embers, tugging her backward. What are you doing? You're going to hurt yourself. Catherine raised her eyebrows in disbelief. What am I... hurt myself? Hysterical laughter bubbled up her throat. Is that how you think this happened, Serena? She demanded, gesturing furiously at her bruised face. I hurt myself? She shook her head. 
What am I supposed to do without any shoes? Or my jacket? She assumed that had been destroyed as well. How am I supposed to— Catherine cut herself off before she could blurt out the word escape. She closed her eyes, taking a deep breath in through her nose before opening her mouth again. How am I supposed to go outside without any shoes? She asked as calmly as she could manage. She couldn't leave the hut with bare feet, at least not for any substantial amount of time. The Western Colony was stationed somewhere in northwest Canada. Catherine didn't have to go outside to know that not only was the temperature well below freezing, but that every inch of the ground was covered in ice, snow, or a mixture of both. A frown tugged at Serena's mouth. You're not, she confessed quietly. It's a preventative measure. Gerard wants to make sure you don't get any ideas. He wanted to... That was... He was positively conniving. Catherine only had a vague idea where they were geographically, but knew it was safe to assume that the Western Colony was located somewhere in the vast wilderness, with nothing, and nobody, around for miles. Werewolf or not, if she made a run for it, she'd get frostbite, and possibly, probably, lose both her feet well before she could reach anyone who could help her. Catherine pressed the palms of her hands into her eyes in an effort to hold back frustrated tears. "'I'm sorry,' Serena offered softly. "'You're sorry?' Catherine demanded, ripping her hands from her face. "'If you're so sorry, then go get me some damn shoes. Better yet, give me yours and point me the hell out of here.' Catherine was tempted to just wrestle the girl to the floor and take her shoes. They weren't heavy-duty snow boots, but the ankle-high, fur-lined moccasins would more than do. She felt she stood a good chance of coming out on top in a squabble with Serena, too, despite their size difference. The girl seemed fairly reserved, and Catherine was a scrapper. But she didn't know what or who was waiting for her beyond the hut's door, and Catherine wasn't quite desperate enough to take such a risk. Not yet, anyway. I'm sorry, Serena whispered again. Catherine snorted. A lot of good that does me. Silence reigned for a long moment, both girls staring into what remained of the fire. We're cousins, Serena murmured quietly when it became obvious Catherine wasn't going to say anything more. Catherine frowned. What? she asked incredulously. Gerard and I, she explained as she picked nervously at the threadbare fringe of her dress. Our fathers were brothers. We're cousins. Catherine pressed her lips together. My condolences. Serena laughed at that. It was one of the saddest sounds Catherine had ever heard. Keep them, she insisted. He wasn't always like this. Catherine folded her arms across her chest. Like what? A complete psychopath who thinks it's perfectly acceptable to kidnap people and force them to have his babies? She demanded. Right. Serena's shoulders slumped, her gaze falling to the ground. When we were kids, he used to make me dandelion necklaces. He's ten years older than me, and all the other kids made fun of him for it. But he didn't care. He just cared about making me smile. Catherine stared. So what if Gerard used to make jewelry out of flowers for his baby cousin? He was also holding Catherine hostage with intentions of using her as the frickin' breeding mare Penelope had accused her of being a week ago. Was it really a wonder that the latter took precedence when it came to Catherine forming her opinion of the man? Still, she wasn't about to turn down free information— the small brunette needed to gather as much intel as she possibly could on Gerard if she wanted to stand any chance at all of escaping him. "'What happened?' she asked Serena, inflecting as much sympathy in her voice as she could, given the circumstances. Serena's brow furrowed, and she bit her lip, like she was debating whether or not it was a good idea to answer the question. She glanced at Catherine's pregnant stomach— and something like resolve hardened in her eyes. Gerard's mother died during childbirth, she finally recounted, after a tense moment. I don't 
think his father ever forgave him for it. It wasn't his fault, of course, but his dad, his name was Dane, was hard on him. Too hard on him, in a lot of ways. Serena didn't say the word abuse, but it was obvious enough what she meant. My dad tried to intervene on Gerard's behalf, but Dane didn't want him having anything to do with his son. Serena paused, swallowing. Then my mom died. She blinked away tears. She was murdered, and there was evidence that Dane was involved. He and my father fought. Dane won. Serena sniffled. Again, the details were in what she didn't say. Dane had not only killed her mother, but also her father. Then what? Catherine prodded. Serena offered her a watery smile. Gerard challenged his father to an alpha fight. Dane was weak from battling my dad, and Gerard won handily. When he did, he took revenge on Dane for all of us. He killed him, in other words. Then it was only Gerard and me. He's all I have left in this world. I'm sorry. I... I wish... She trailed off as she wiped tears from her eyes. Catherine frowned. You wish what? The only word to describe Serena's expression was contrite. I wish it didn't have to be this way, she admitted softly. Catherine saw her opening and took it. Then why does it have to? she demanded. I know you feel some misguided sense of loyalty to Gerard. I get it. I do. But aren't there other alphas in the colony who can help you? No, Serena said, cutting her off. Catherine blinked. No what? There are no other alphas. No other alphas? Catherine repeated dumbly, a lump of dread settling in her stomach. How can that be? Gerard's father, Dane. He was head alpha before he died. Oh. Oh. When Gerard killed him, he inherited the position, Sophie explained needlessly. The first thing Gerard did afterward was strip every other alpha in the community of their title. Most protested, of course, but Gerard demolished anyone who challenged him to a fight. Eventually, it became common knowledge not to question him if you valued your life. No one even bothers to announce himself an Alpha anymore. All the packs merged into one, and he is Alpha to everyone. Serena bit her lip. We haven't been called a colony in a very long time, she finished softly. Catherine struggled to take in all the information Sophie spewed at her. It certainly explained why Gerard thought he had rights to everything and every one he came across. What do you call yourselves, then? she finally asked. If not a colony. Serena shrugged. Just pack, I suppose. Just pack, huh? How many people make up this pack? Do they actually enjoy living under Gerard's rule, or are they just afraid to speak out? Surely there are enough of you to rise up against him. He doesn't seem to treat anyone very well, after all. He doesn't seem to treat you very well. Serena blinked at the avalanche of questions and observations Catherine shot at her. What? I mean, I, I don't. The animal skin flap that served as a door suddenly flew open, and Gerard entered the hut. Speak of the devil. Gerard paused in the doorway, frowning at the swift, suspicious silence as he took in Catherine and Serena standing across from each other near the fire pit. What's this? he asked narrowing his eyes as he approached. He directed his words at Catherine. I sure hope you aren't trying to manipulate sweet Serena here. She's rather harebrained, after all. He patted Serena on the head, and Catherine felt angry for the girl. It'd be cruel to take advantage of her. Of course not, Catherine spat, crossing her arms over her chest. I'm not a monster. 
Gerard's mouth hardened into an unimpressed straight line at the implication that he was. Serena, he questioned, his dark eyes remaining glued to Catherine's green ones. He probably hoped to catch some sort of telling reaction. We were just talking, Serena confirmed, and Catherine fought to keep her inner relief from showing on her face. Hmm, if you say so, Gerard finally said, tearing his eyes from Catherine's as he plopped a large slab of raw, bloody meat onto the hut's lone table. He pulled a serrated knife from its sheath on his waistband and sliced the meat into three portions before transferring them onto chipped ceramic plates. I caught us lunch, he announced, pushing one of the plates Catherine's way. Eat. Catherine balked. The meat Gerard had dragged in, she was pretty sure it was venison, hadn't been cooked in the least. It was literally bleeding on her plate. She grimaced in disgust. Why even put it on a dish? Gerard glowered. I said, eat. How can I eat something that was literally running around and breathing a few minutes ago? Catherine was no stranger to eating fresh meat in her wolf form, and before she'd gotten pregnant, she didn't care how rare her venison was served. She'd preferred most of her meat pink, in fact. Since she had fallen pregnant, however, and she'd temporarily lost her ability to shift into her animal form, most meat turned Catherine off, especially of the red variety. It'd be no problem to cook it over a little fire, Serena spoke up from where she continued to stand and take in the scene. Gerard had handed her a plate of venison as well. That won't be necessary, Serena, Gerard snapped, interrupting her mid-sentence. I don't think the problem's the meat. He eyed Catherine. I think the problem is that this ungrateful bitch has been spoiled rotten. He reached forward and allowed his fingers to toy with some of the soft brown hair that framed Catherine's face. She stomped down the urge to swat his hand away. Rest assured, I'm doing her a favor by reacquainting her with her more primitive side. He released her hair and nodded towards the exit. Now take your food back to your hut. There's a deer carcass outside that needs to be gutted. Serena nodded. Of course, she hastily agreed, shooting Catherine an apologetic glance before taking her leave. Gerard pushed the plate of raw venison, a tiny puddle of blood pooling beneath the slab of meat, even closer to Catherine. You can eat this or nothing at all, he said. Then he sat and began digging into his own portion, gnashing chunks of pink muscle and white fat between his blunt teeth blood dribbled down his chin. Catherine fought not to puke at the sight. So her choices were to either die via starvation or food poisoning? That was wonderful. Just wonderful. Bastion didn't come for Catherine the next day, or the one after that, either. She didn't think she could have gone more than the first day without giving in and attempting to nibble on the raw meat Gerard continued to shove under her nose if it wasn't for Serena. Her belly had felt like it was caving in on itself, guilt licking at her insides whenever she felt her growing baby squirm or kick in protest at the lack of food. When the woman had arrived the morning before with provisions, Catherine sat near the fire pit using the large basin of water warming by the flame and a rag to wipe away what felt like a month's worth of grime clinging to her skin. She'd already cleaned her face and had her sleeves bunched up past her elbows, attempting to scrub away the dirt that was stubbornly sticking to her arms. Catherine didn't even know how it had gotten there. She was still wearing the shirt Melanie had bought for her in Vanderhoof. Scrubbing the dirt from her body served a dual purpose— it improved her hygiene, of course, and served to distract her from the gnawing pit of emptiness that was her stomach. The organ felt like it was twisted in a permanent cramp, and worry for her unborn baby had Catherine eyeing the slab of meat that Gerard had thrown on the table for breakfast. 
she was seriously considering trying to eat it, and was internally debating the best way to consume the food that Gerard had so lovingly supplied her, taking slow, tiny bites, or just shoveling the whole thing in her mouth and swallowing it as fast as she could, when Serena peeked inside the hut and shuffled inside. Good, you're here, Gerard exclaimed when he spotted her. I need you to watch her, he demanded, nodding towards Catherine. While I go check the bear traps. Serena nodded. Has she eaten? she asked softly, worriedly. No, Gerard answered, his eyes hardening. Though I hardly see why it's any of your concern, Serena. She won't starve herself. It goes completely against every self-preservation instinct we have. Serena didn't look convinced, but nodded her understanding. Right. Don't let her talk you into giving her anything, he added firmly, to which Serena offered another nod. Gerard turned his attention back to Catherine at the girl's compliance, squatting down so he was at her level. He took her roughly by the chin, forcing Catherine to meet his eyes. Be good, lovely, he ordered shortly, before taking her by surprise and roughly pressing his mouth to hers. Catherine didn't have time to react to the dry lips suddenly forcing themselves on hers when Gerard just as abruptly released her, rising back to his full height. He grinned at the panicked anger undoubtedly alit in Catherine's eyes. I'll be back in an hour, he informed Serena offhandedly, giving Catherine one last leer before turning and leaving the hut. Catherine glared at his retreating form. The man was just so... so... There weren't words to describe what kind of monster he was. Besides sadistic, Catherine supposed, and cruel. Barbaric fit, too. Catherine gave up on washing her arms, throwing the rag she was using back into the water basin in frustration as she finally acknowledged the truth to herself. The filth covering her arms wasn't dirt at all but faded bruises from the rough treatment she'd suffered at the hands of Lucas and Gerard the past few days. "'Are you okay?' Serena asked hesitantly. Catherine directed her glare, and all the inner turmoil she was feeling, at her in response. "'What do you think?' Serena bit her bottom lip, shuffling fretfully from side to side before approaching Catherine. "'I think you're probably really hungry.' Here, she said, pulling out what looked like a handful of nuts from a pocket of her apron. Catherine stared at the small pile of dehydrated walnuts and almonds. What? I stole them from our dry food storage, Serena explained, a nervous sort of tremor in her voice as she glanced at the door of the hut. I don't care what Gerard says. You need to eat something. I mean, I know it isn't much, but— no. Catherine interjected sharply. No, Serena, this is great. I mean, I... thank you, she finally said, popping one of the nuts into her mouth. She forced herself to eat the tiny, protein-packed morsels as slowly as possible, in an attempt to trick her brain and stomach into believing that the snack was more than just that. A snack. Regardless, a few minutes later, the nuts were gone. Catherine shamelessly licked her fingers, trying to glean every last bit of flavor from the seasoning that had stuck to her digits. Serena frowned at the display. I'll bring you more tonight, she assured. I promise. Serena kept her word, and had been sneaking Catherine an array of food from the pack's dry food storage ever since. It always felt more like Catherine was meeting with a back-alley drug dealer for a quick fix than Serena just sneaking her food. She brought her more nuts, two jars of preserved fruits, and just the night before, she dared to roast some beans over the fire for Catherine. Despite knowing that Serena must have been feeding her something, because the meat he kept offering Catherine remained untouched, Gerard continued to leave her alone with Serena often. Catherine used the many opportunities to try to convince Serena to set her free. You're a good person, Serena. I know you know that Gerard holding me against my will is wrong. 
Think of the baby. This stress can't be good for him. And what about after he's born? Is he supposed to grow up without his dad? Am I just supposed to move on without my mate? Catherine even tried to entice Serena to come back with her to Haven Falls. You shouldn't have to live like this either. There's electricity in Haven Falls, and indoor plumbing, plenty of warm food, clean clothes, and companionship. Don't you want to know what it feels like to be part of a real pack? Find a mate someday, maybe? How are you going to do that here? So far, nothing had worked. I, I can't just leave him, Catherine. And I can't let you leave him either. All of that stuff sounds nice, but I owe Gerard everything. Still, Catherine was convinced that Serena would come to her senses over time. She could already see little cracks forming in the girl's mental armor. She could see guilt swimming in her eyes whenever she focused her gaze on Catherine's belly, and Catherine caught her trying to peek at the claiming mark on her neck more than once, curiosity and even longing painted on her face. Despite her obvious interest, though, Serena never asked Catherine anything about her mate. Catherine didn't volunteer any information either. In fact, she tried not to think of Bastion at all, at least not during the day. At night, when she closed her eyes, thoughts of Bastion were all her mind could conjure. How was he dealing with her absence? Was he eating? Sleeping? Had he come any closer to finding her? The worry that enveloped Catherine whenever she thought of him drove her batty, which was why she made the decision to save thoughts of him for at night, compartmentalizing her feelings so she could keep her wits about her during the day. She had to, or she'd go insane with worry. As a result, however, her days were rather dull. Boredom was never a feeling Catherine thought she'd ever associate with being kidnapped and held hostage against her will, but there it was, nevertheless. There just wasn't anything to do. She was kept in the hut day in and day out, and only ever offered the company of Gerard or Serena. They didn't even let her go outside to use the bathroom. Instead, whenever she had to go— Serena would fetch her a large pot that she did her business in. Then Serena would empty the container outside. It was beyond humiliating. It was dehumanizing, but hardly the worst aspect of being held captive. It was a strange thing, teeter-tottering between boredom and an intense combination of fear and panic all day. It felt like she was constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop, for Gerard to... Well, to... Catherine grimaced, trying not to think about that, either. She just wished she could go outside. She yearned to breathe in the fresh, wintry air, and be able to do something as simple as listen to the snow crunch under her non-existent boots or brush her hand over the rough bark of a pine tree. If Catherine knew the manner in which she'd be granted her wish that afternoon, however— perhaps she wouldn't have longed for it quite so much. Gerard was gone, perhaps hunting or lording over someone other than Catherine for a change. Serena was kneeling by the fire, washing clothes. She would dunk them into a basin full of snow-melted water before scrubbing them against an honest-to-God wooden washboard. Catherine only knew what it was because she'd seen a few while watching Little House on the Prairie as a girl. Gerard was the only person she'd seen who consistently wore furs. Everyone else knew she'd encountered since being kidnapped, granted that was only Serena and Lucas, wore normal clothes made of cotton and denim. Much of what Serena wore, however, showed obvious signs of wear. Shirts were faded and stretched out. Pants were ripped in places. Serena was currently washing a maroon sweatshirt with a gaping hole in the arm that had a University of Minnesota logo on it. A bemused frown pulled at Catherine's mouth. So, where do you get all this stuff? she asked, pushing herself up from where she sat in the corner of the hut and walking over to look at the heap of clothes piled near Serena. 
Serena crinkled her brow. What do you mean? These clothes, Catherine clarified. No offense, but your pack doesn't exactly make education a priority. Serena had already explained to her that they didn't have a formal school like Haven Falls did. Why do you have a university sweatshirt? Oh, Serena winced. Well, Gerard and some of the others lift them from hikers and hunting parties that get too close to camp. I mean, I know stealing is wrong, she hastily acknowledged. But at least they aren't hurting anybody. Right. If they were just stealing, Catherine would willingly lay down and let Gerard take her. She remembered what Lucas did to that poor old man, Oliver Hampton, in order to commandeer his car. It was very likely that the original owner of the sweatshirt Serena was holding was dead. Serena, of course, refused to see what was right in front of her, and anger on behalf of whomever had once owned the sweatshirt filled Catherine as the girl attempted to hand it to her. Do you want it? she asked. And just like that, the anger deflated, swiftly replaced with sadness, pity, even. Catherine just shook her head at the misguided offer. She was still wearing the same outfit Melanie had given her at the motel in Vanderhoof, but she wasn't about to put on something that belonged to some murdered college student. She'd rather wear the dregs she was in until they fell off. Catherine wandered back over to the corner of the hut where she liked to lurk. She made it a point not to go near Gerard's bed unless he ordered it, where she sat and pulled her knees up to her chest. Serena was still doing laundry when the sudden sound of footsteps approaching the hut caught Catherine's attention. She braced herself for Gerard's company, but when the flap door was briskly pushed to the side, a man Catherine had never seen before strode into the room. If Catherine had to guess, she would say he was in his late thirties. He was lean, but not particularly tall, with grime clinging to every exposed part of him. The hair atop his head was wild, sticking up every which way, with a sloppily cut beard on his face to match. Serena immediately pushed herself off her knees and stood at his presence. "'What are you doing here?' she demanded. "'You know no one is allowed in here without Gerard's express permission.' "'Where is he?' the man barked, not even pretending to acknowledge Serena's words. "'Lucas is causing trouble again, skipping out on firewood duty early to entertain that tramp he brought back with him from the so-called important mission your cousin sent him out on. He's been taking more than his fair share of the rations, too. If Gerard doesn't do something about him, I'm going to—' He paused, his voice trailing off when his gaze suddenly landed on Catherine. "'Well,' he muttered taking a step towards her. Catherine hastily got to her feet. Well, well. His eyes caught sight of her protruding belly, and they widened in a manic sort of glee. What do we have here? Catherine wrapped her arms protectively around her stomach. What, never seen a pregnant chick before? She snapped at him. He offered her a crooked smile. Not one so pretty. Stop. Serena demanded sharply when he took another step towards Catherine. Leave her alone, Blake. She's Gerard's and the reason for Lucas's extra rations. He's being rewarded for bringing her to him. The man, Blake, apparently, didn't recoil at the new information. His smile, however, did slide from his face. I was forced to offer forth my mate when he first began his quest for an heir he spat. The least Gerard can do is share his new pet with me. She's here for the express purpose of conceiving Gerard's offspring, Serena argued. The man shrugged. Well, then maybe she can have mine after. Stop, Serena repeated her earlier order when he took yet another step towards Catherine, but her voice shook with nerves. She shifted uncertainly on her feet, like she didn't know what to do. I'm going to go get him, she announced abruptly, apparently having come to a decision. She shot Catherine an apologetic glance before fleeing, leaving her alone with the strange man. He continued to stare at her. It's just like Gerard, he complained, 
expecting us all to share everything we have with him while he hoards all the best things for himself. He shook his head, his resentment palpable. Honestly, hiding you away in here like some greedy hog. Catherine didn't have time to respond before one of the man's hands shot forward. He grabbed her by the bicep and pulled her close to him. Let go of me, Catherine snapped, slapping at him with her free hand, but he merely caught her by the wrist, twisting it behind her back and forcing her chest to press against his. So pretty, he muttered, his breath hot on her face. Catherine kneed him in the groin. Blake released her with a grunt, his hands immediately going to his bits. You bitch, he roared at her. Catherine made to dart around him, intent on reaching the exit he was blocking with his body, but the man threw himself at her, grabbing her by the waist and knocking her to the ground. Catherine only just managed to throw her hands out in time to catch her fall. She clutched anxiously at her belly, and Blake took advantage of her momentary distraction by climbing on top of her, forcing her stomach flush against the ground as he straddled her. Catherine stiffened when she felt him grind against her from behind. This is only a preview of what's to come, he promised, leaning over and hissing the words into her ear. Then he was abruptly torn off her. Catherine wasted no time scrambling to her feet. Serena had returned with Gerard, and the latter was holding Blake by the scruff of his shirt, forcing him to stand on his tiptoes as he stared him down nose to nose. All the boisterous daring was wiped clean from Blake's face at Gerard's obvious rage. What do you think you're doing? Gerard asked, his voice deceptively calm as he slowly enunciated each word. Blake twitched in his grasp. I just, you see, she— Gerard raised a hand in the air, calling for silence. Blake snapped his mouth shut. I'll give you one chance to explain why you think it's okay to touch my property. Blake's mouth worked up and down. I don't, I mean, it's just that I didn't know she belonged to you, he finally finished lamely. It was an obvious lie, and there was no way Gerard didn't know it. Regardless, he lowered Blake to the ground, releasing the grip he had on his shirt. Okay. Blake blinked, like he couldn't believe his good luck. Catherine couldn't believe it either. Okay, he repeated dumbly. Gerard nodded. Okay. Oh, thank you, Alpha, I swear, I— Gerard's eyes flashed yellow, and he lashed out, his hand transforming mid-swipe into a furry paw. His jagged nails ripped into the fragile skin of the other man's throat— Catherine froze, completely stunned, as blood splattered on her shirt. Blake collapsed, more of the red substance pooling in his throat. I detest liars, Gerard informed the man calmly as he choked on his own blood. Less than a minute later, he was dead. Come here, Gerard bit out, roughly grabbing a shell-shocked Catherine by the arm. He hauled her forward with one hand, dragging the lifeless body of Blake carelessly on the ground with the other as he exited the hut. It was the first time Catherine had been outside in nearly a week, but she could hardly relish the experience. Cold snow bit into her feet, and a harsh wind whipped her hair around her face. She'd just seen a man die. It was Catherine's first look at the Western Colony— or what used to be the Western Colony, anyway. She was in too much shock to take in much detail, but counted at least a couple dozen huts built similarly to Gerard's. They were all stationed around a massive fire pit, its flame climbing high into the sky. A few men near the fire wore furs like Gerard's, but everyone else meandering outside were in threadbare jackets and hats. Gerard roared. Everyone stopped what they were doing, directing their attention at Gerard. Faces peeked out of huts. A child who had dirt streaked across his rosy nose and was riding his mother's hip stared at them. At her. They all stared at her. 
she even spotted Lucas and Melanie looking their way from where they sat near the massive flame. Apparently, I should have made introductions earlier, he thrust Catherine forward. This here is Catherine. She's mine. And this, he said, throwing Blake's lifeless body to the ground, is what happens when you touch what's mine without permission. A fair-haired woman across the fire shrieked at the sight, nearly collapsing onto her knees, but the heavy-set woman standing next to her wrapped her arms around her and kept her upright. She glared at Catherine as she comforted her weeping friend. Lucas, take care of this, Gerard ordered coolly, before yanking Catherine out of everyone's sight and dragging her back towards his hut. He pulled open the flap door and tossed her inside. Catherine landed on the ground, and she was thankful for the soft fur that broke her fall, or her hands and knees would have otherwise been skinned. She must have still been in shock, because when she opened her mouth, the stupidest thing tumbled out of it. Well, I'm glad to know I'm to be your personal sex slave and not the community one, she snarked. Gerard didn't laugh. To be fair, neither did she. Something akin to panic blossomed in her chest, though, when she noticed he was unclasping the belt that held his pants up. What are you doing? she demanded, a hysterical edge to her voice as she attempted to climb to her feet. Gerard grabbed her by the back of the head his fingers winding themselves in her long, dark hair as he pushed her down and forced her to remain kneeling. Stay there and don't move. I should have done this the first night. It's bad enough that you reek of that mate of yours, but now you smell like that little piss ant, too. He held her still as he pulled himself free from his pants. No, wait, stop, Catherine demanded choking on the last word as he fondled himself, but Gerard didn't listen. Soon, a hot stream of urine was soaking the shoulder of her shirt, running down her arm and torso. Her entire body was shaking by the time he was finished. Gerard hardly cared that she felt more violated than she ever had in her life. He merely released her hair and abandoned her trembling form on the floor. He stomped out of the hut, leaving Catherine alone with Serena, who'd quietly bore witness to the entire ordeal. As Catherine sat there, clenching her hands together in an effort to stop them from trembling, she realized something, the real reason Gerard had yet to force himself on her. It was because of her pregnant belly, but not for the rationale he'd claimed. He didn't care that her pregnancy meant she was currently infertile, but the physical evidence that another man had been with her not only turned him off, it enraged him. Gerard was as possessive as he was cruel. As evidenced by the heavy smell of piss in the air. What would Bastion think? Catherine allowed the tears that filled her eyes to fall for the first time since that first night. Serena rushed over to help her up from the floor and when the girl offered her the maroon sweatshirt, this time Catherine took it. Better to wear a long dead man's shirt, she told herself, than one soaked with urine and a freshly dead man's blood. Chapter 14 Day 6 of Captivity Or, Catherine thought it was day 6, anyway. The days were starting to run together. Like it had so often lately, Catherine's hand rose of its own accord to trace the claiming mark on the juncture of her neck and shoulder. Brushing her fingers over the small indentations there worked to calm the anxiety that constantly buzzed under her skin. It also served to reassure Catherine that no matter what Gerard or anyone else did to her, she didn't belong to them. She was Bastion's alone, and Bastion was hers. Where is he, then? A wicked voice whispered in the back of her mind. She banished it from her brain. He'll come. Catherine knew he would, and she refused to think otherwise. Her hand dropped back down onto her lap when Gerard abruptly entered the hut. Serena shot her a concerned sort of glance from where she sat, stoking the fire. 
Catherine had been in a subdued mood since Gerard had humiliated her three days before. Shockingly, Gerard had been rather reserved as well, actually allowing Catherine her space. He didn't antagonize her beyond making her share a bed with him at night, at any rate. Catherine watched as he approached the water basin near the fire, peeling off his fur tunic and throwing it on the floor. It was covered in blood. He was covered in blood. The red substance was spattered across his face and in his beard, streaked up and down his muscle-bound arms. His hands were stained with it. Catherine's sense of horror was dulled, trapped beneath the surface layer of numbness and practiced sarcasm. Who'd you kill this time? Gerard shot her an annoyed look. Don't be dramatic, he scolded. I took down a bear. Yeah, he had sprayed her with another human being's blood a few days ago, and assuming he'd gone and killed another person when he returned to the hut covered in blood was her being dramatic. Because that was fair. Gerard scooped a handful of water from the basin and splashed his face. As he wiped the excess water on his hands off on his chest, he eyed her contemplatively. Catherine didn't like it. You know, he said, a sly smile pulling at the corner of his mouth. If the blood bothers you that much, you're certainly welcome to wash it off me. Catherine stiffened, pulling her knees up to her chest, as much as her protruding stomach allowed, anyway. No, thank you. Gerard's eyebrows rose to nearly his hairline. Did I word that as a question? Silly me. You don't have a choice in the matter, lovely. I think I've let you mope around here long enough. Serena, go fetch us some clean water. Then you're excused. Serena bit her lip at the order, but got to her feet, and after nervously shifting her weight from foot to foot, grabbed the basin and headed outside. Her eyes wouldn't quite meet Catherine's when she returned to the hut, the basin full of snow that she set to warm by the fire. Gerard snatched a rag that was hanging on the back of one of the table's chairs. He threw it at Catherine, where she had yet to budge from her place on the floor in the corner of the room. The scrap of cloth hit her in the face. Gerard sat on a chair, stretching his legs out in front of him. Well, he demanded, don't get shy on me now. Catherine grit her teeth, but realizing she had no real choice in the matter, pushed herself up from the floor and hesitantly approached the man. She took her time lifting the basin of already melting snow up onto the table. Then she dipped the rag in icy water, rinsing it before hesitantly bringing it to his arm, wiping away the blood that was crusted there. Gerard hummed his approval slouching back further into his seat as she mechanically cleaned his arms and bare chest. He'd gotten his face well enough before, so she left that alone. By the time Catherine was finished, the rag and the water still remaining in the basin were colored dark pink. Before Catherine could hand Gerard the rag and retreat back to her corner, however, the man grabbed her by the waist, pulling her onto his lap in one sharp yank. Catherine tried to jerk away from him, but Gerard's grip on her hips was ironclad, his fingers digging brutally into her skin as he forced her to sit. You forgot something, he teased, jutting his chin out, where she spotted some red still speckled in his beard. Catherine bit the inside of her cheek in annoyance, but nonetheless reached forward, and with the rag she still held in her hand, washed the blood away. Gerard released the hold one of his hands had on her waist to capture her wrist. His long fingers easily circled around it, and he dragged it down his muscled chest, past the V that formed over his waistband, and down lower still. He forced her to palm what lay between his legs. Catherine tried to wrench her hand away, but he kept it there over the outline of his manhood. Not knowing what else to do, Catherine remained absolutely still, clenching her eyes shut and pretending what was happening, well, wasn't. Gerard, though, just laughed at what his demented mind perceived as shyness. No need to be intimidated, he mocked her. 
I know it's impressive, but I promise to be gentle when the time comes. When he finally released her, Catherine wrenched her hand away and scrambled off his lap. She didn't know what possessed her to open her mouth. I'm hardly intimidated, she spat. What you have packing is an embarrassment compared to what Bastion has to work with. Gerard stared at her for a solid minute. She didn't know who was in more disbelief at her blatant insolence, him or her. Then he grabbed the rim of the basin and doused her with the cold water. It soaked her. Gerard stood, ignoring the way Catherine's wet hair had plastered itself to her face and taking her roughly by the chin. Bastion, hmm? I take it that's your mate's name. He bent down and leaned forward, pressing his forehead to hers in a display of mock affection. Say it again, he dared, and I'll make good on that promise to track him down. After all, it won't be difficult, especially now that I have a name to work with. Catherine stiffened at the threat. Logically, she knew that Gerard could have demanded Bastion's name from Melanie whenever he wanted, but the fact that it was she who had given it to him caused guilt to squeeze her heart. Gerard released her chin. Clean this up, he ordered offhandedly as he sat back in his chair. Catherine frowned at the command, but lowered herself to her knees and begrudgingly did as she was told. Her wet clothes clung to her body, and a shiver passed through her. Soon, even her teeth were chattering, but Catherine ignored the chill. After all, no matter how cold she got on the outside, it couldn't compare to how cold and bleak she was feeling on the inside. Day Nine of Captivity Catherine sat, curled up in the corner of the hut like usual. Serena was mending a pair of pants near the fire, her hands working in a mechanical motion with a needle and thread, in and out of the ratty pair of jeans in her hands. In and out. In and out. Gerard was in the room, too, sitting on his feather-stuffed mattress and staring into the fire. That was perfectly fine with Catherine. His behavior grew more erratic with each passing day, and she was all too happy to ignore him if he was willing to pay her the same courtesy. Maybe she should have been paying better attention to him, though. If she had been, perhaps she'd have noticed his brow furrow. For he wasn't quite staring into the fire, like she'd assumed. In actuality, his eyes were fixated on something under the table. Catherine didn't think much of him rising and stalking across the floor until he suddenly flipped the slab of wood and flimsy legs that made up the table on its side. The meager stack of cracked dishes that had been sitting on top of the shabby thing hit the ground with a crash. Catherine nearly jumped out of her skin at the unexpectedness of his actions and the resulting noise. Serena just stared. Gerard bent over and picked something up off the ground. When he stood back up, Catherine's heart skipped a beat when she saw what it was in his hand— for pinched between his thumb and forefinger was one of the black cherries Serena had brought her to eat a few days ago. Its skin was dry and wrinkled from sitting unnoticed on the floor since then, but there was no mistaking what it was. She and Serena must have overlooked the tiny morsel falling from Serena's apron pocket, or possibly rolling off the table. Gerard directed his gaze at Serena. "'What's this?' he demanded. The dark-haired girl immediately stood, abandoning the jeans she was trying to fix on the floor. I, I don't, I mean, well, it's, she stuttered, tripping over her words. It's a cherry, Catherine deadpanned, finishing Serena's sentence for her as she got to her own feet. She hated seeing Serena so tongue-tied over something as silly as a piece of fruit. Gerard shot Catherine an unimpressed glare before returning his gaze to Serena. Have you been feeding these to her? he asked, jerking his head in Catherine's direction. His voice was deceptively calm as he took a threatening step in her direction. After I expressly told you not to give her anything? he added. It was so ridiculous that a dark part of Catherine wanted to laugh. 
he could see with his own eyes that Catherine wasn't dying of starvation, after all, and she had yet to touch the raw meat he continued to leave out for her. Did he really need physical proof to know that Serena was sneaking her food? Had he been lying in wait for said proof to reveal itself? Or was he just in a particularly bad mood that day? Catherine was nearly positive her second theory was closer to the truth. Well, Gerard snapped. Serena's eyes flitted to the ground. Yes, she admitted softly. Gerard stared down at her. And what else have you been giving her? Serena nervously licked her lips. Just some nuts and beans, she confessed. And a couple of rice patties the other day, too. Catherine pressed her lips together in annoyance. The girl was irritatingly honest. And why did you do that? Gerard demanded. Surely you don't think you know better than me. Serena blinked clearly taken off guard by the accusation. What? No, no, of course not. It's just that... She trailed off, her gaze darting past Gerard to Catherine. Gerard, she's pregnant, she finished softly. Gerard regarded Serena silently. I see, he finally said, when the tension in the air had grown so thick it was nearly palpable. Well, I'd hate to have this food that you so thoughtfully provided Catherine go to waste. He dropped the shriveled cherry to the floor. On your knees. Tears filled Serena's eyes. Gerard, she tried to protest. I said on your knees, he barked, grabbing Serena by the nape of her neck and forcing her to the floor. He didn't release her until her face was inches from the cherry. Well, he demanded. What are you waiting for? Eat. Anger at the way Gerard was treating Serena burned beneath Catherine's skin. Her fury was evidenced by the way a hot flush bloomed across her cheeks, and by the thoughtless words that escaped her mouth. What's wrong with you? Catherine snapped, springing to her feet as fast as her pregnant belly allowed. How can you treat the one person who doesn't actively despise you like such utter crap? For God's sake, that cherry is as rotten as you are. You ought to— Before Catherine could tell him what he ought to do, she wasn't exactly sure what was going to come out of her mouth, but she was fairly certain it would have been a violent suggestion with a cuss word or two thrown in for good measure, Gerard took two strides towards her and yanked hard enough on her hair that her neck was forced backward at an angle so severe she could barely breathe. Eat the damn thing, Serena, Gerard repeated or I'll make Catherine do it instead. That was all it took. With tears swimming in her eyes, Serena lowered herself the rest of the way to the ground and ate the cherry from the floor. When she tried to swallow the spoiled piece of fruit, however, she gagged. After a moment of attempting to get it down her throat, she wound up spitting it back up on the floor. I'm sorry, Serena sniffled. Gerard snorted in disgust. Pathetic, he muttered, but released Catherine, shoving her away from him. Clean that shit up before I make you eat that, too. Without further ado, he breezed out of the hut. Catherine hesitated only a moment before approaching Serena. She kneeled down next to the girl sitting quietly on the floor, fingers clenched in her lap. Catherine laid what she hoped was a comforting hand on her shoulder. Are you okay? It wasn't the first time that Catherine had seen Gerard's rage directed at someone other than herself, but it was the first time she'd seen him target Serena. The girl nodded. It's just... it's the full moon. It drives us all a little crazy, she mumbled, attempting to somehow justify Gerard's behavior. Catherine stared, in shock for a moment. It was the flimsiest excuse she'd ever heard. She wanted to call Serena out on it, too. Surely she had to know that the words coming from her mouth were absolute bull. But by the way her eyes refused to meet Catherine's, she figured the girl already knew. There was no point in Catherine pointing out something Serena was already well aware of. How many days away is it? she eventually asked instead. The full moon. 
If Bastion hadn't arrived by then, Catherine had already resolved to attempt an escape. Gerard and Serena would have to leave her alone when they transformed into their wolf forms, after all. She didn't know how close to the camp they planned to stay throughout the night, but she was counting on them liking to run wild through the woods as much as she and her pack did on full moons. She figured she could search the couple dozen huts that made up the camp while they were occupied until she found a decent pair of shoes and a coat. Then she'd make a break for it. She knew it was a poorly thought-out, danger-filled plan, especially with wolves lurking around. But Catherine didn't know what other choice she had. Three days, Serena answered her softly. Catherine nodded. Three days. Day Eleven of Captivity I made this for you. Catherine stared uncomprehendingly at the scrap of cloth Serena held out for her before hesitantly reaching forward and taking it. Upon closer inspection, it wasn't a scrap of cloth at all, but a tiny, homemade baby gown. It was a patchworked mess of mismatched fabrics, heavily featuring faded green and burnt orange. Tears sprang into Catherine's eyes at the sight of it. "'I'm sorry,' Serena blurted when she saw the suspicious wetness. I know it's not the prettiest thing. It was hideous, but that wasn't why Catherine was holding back tears. I had to make do with the fabric I had available. It's warm, at least, and soft. They weren't tears of happiness, either, despite Serena's sweet intentions. Catherine had tried not to think about it, mostly because she was determined to be hundreds of miles away from this hut by the time her baby came but heaven forbid she still was there when she went into labor. This outfit was all her baby had to its name. Besides love, the shabby one piece in her hands was all she had to offer him. She couldn't even promise her baby something as simple as safety. Serena fretted over Catherine's teary reaction to her gift and tried to snatch the outfit back. Maybe I can try to put together something else. No, Catherine shouted startling even herself as she hugged the little gown to her chest. No, it's perfect, Serena, really. Thank you. It was hard to see against Serena's tan skin, but Catherine could swear she saw pink creep up the girl's neck at the praise. Oh, well, it was nothing, really. I was glad to do it. Maybe I can trade for some more fabric to make something for when the baby starts to grow out of it. Get out! Catherine stiffened at Gerard's sudden interference. He'd been watching the scene contemplatively from his place near the simmering fire, but he hadn't interrupted them until now. Serena frowned at the order clearly directed at her. But— I said leave, Serena, or are you deaf? The girl bit her lip at the reprimand and tucked her head to her chest in a submissive pose before obeying Gerard's command and ducking out of the hut. She shot Catherine a singular, concerned glance over her shoulder before she disappeared behind the animal-skin door. The night of the full moon was looming ever nearer, and with Gerard's behavior as unpredictable as ever, Catherine remained perfectly still as he approached her. He nodded at her belly. When are you due? It was the first real interest he'd shown in her pregnancy, and that fact had Catherine on edge. She set down the outfit Serena had given her and wrapped her arms protectively around her middle. I don't know for sure, she answered slowly. It was the truth. I imagine I'll give birth sometime in the next month. That fact scared her, and part of the reason she was determined to act against Gerard soon. She didn't want to be anywhere near him or his stupid hut when the time came. Let me see he demanded, gesturing at her stomach. Catherine didn't think she ever wanted to say no more in her life. She knew that wasn't a viable option, however, so she slowly got to her feet. She recoiled, but didn't make a move to stop Gerard as he lifted her shirt. He stared at her round belly. She sucked in a breath when he had the nerve to thumb her slightly protruding belly button. Not very big, are you? She felt her defenses rise at the comment. 
Yeah, well, I haven't exactly been on the most optimal of diets for the past few weeks, have I? She shot back. Gerard smirked but ignored the retort. It's probably a runt. I doubt if it'll survive childbirth, let alone its first winner. He palmed her belly with both hands. Rage rang in Catherine's ears at his nerve. Fear of retaliation was the only thing that held her back from shoving him away from her. But then the baby in her belly kicked, pushing with what felt like a foot at Gerard's right hand. Catherine liked to think the little one was showing his revulsion at the man's prodding, but Gerard's grin only widened at the sensation. Then again, perhaps it'll surprise me. If he's strong enough, maybe I'll even claim him as my own. That was it. Catherine's fury reached a boiling point. She'd been trying to minimize her anger all throughout captivity in an attempt at self-preservation. It had simmered under her skin, like lava lying dormant in a volcano, but at least it had been under control barring a minor flare-up or two. But with the audacity of Gerard's words repeating on a loop in her ears, combined with the knowledge that Bastion had never got to feel his baby move, but the asshole in front of her had, that volcano erupted. She was enraged, and before she could quell the impulse, smack. Catherine slapped Gerard clean across the face. Time froze. For a long moment, Gerard's head remained fixed in the direction it had snapped when she'd hit him. Then he slowly turned to face her. It was the first time Catherine had dared to physically retaliate against the man— and despite the fear that blossomed in her chest, she couldn't help but feel a smidgen of satisfaction when a tiny drop of red trickled from his mouth. She'd made him bleed. Good. But that sense of satisfaction didn't last long. She grimaced in disgust when Gerard licked the droplet of blood from the corner of his mouth. Then he bared his teeth at her. She could see more blood pooling in the cracks— and grabbed her by the arm. You uppity little bitch! That's what I get for taking such good care of you? Catherine stared in disbelief. You had me kidnapped and are holding me hostage in some shack, threatening to rape me every other day. You're using the safety of my unborn child as leverage against me to get me to behave. What part of that sounds nice to you? You're alive, aren't you? He spat back in retaliation, shaking her. Relatively unharmed? A maniacal grin overtook his face. Well, at least, you were. Before she could react to that suggestive statement, he used his grip on her arm to begin dragging her towards the fire pit. There were no active flames, just smoke, but a sense of foreboding befell Catherine, dread pooling in her gut. What are you doing? she demanded shrilly trying to yank herself out of Gerard's grasp, but failing. He was twice her size, after all. Reminding you of your place, he spat. Without further warning, he forced her arm into the fire pit, mashing the palm of her hand against the smoldering remains of the fire and holding it there. Catherine screamed. Pain engulfed her arm. It engulfed her entire being and she was only half aware of Serena rushing in the hut at the noise. Gerard kept her hand pressed against the embers for just a few seconds, but to Catherine it felt more like a few hours. When he released her, she immediately jerked her hand out of the pit, cradling it delicately to her chest. Tears blurred her vision, and Catherine didn't want to look at it, but she forced herself to glance down at her hand anyway. Her entire palm was beet red, the delicate skin there already beginning to blister. She choked on a sob at the sight. Maybe that will teach you to keep your hands to yourself. I'd say it would teach you to keep your mouth shut as well, but I know better than to hope anything other than divine intervention would be capable of that. He snorted in twisted amusement at his own joke before leaving the hut. Serena wasted no time rushing over to Catherine in his absence. She took Catherine carefully by the elbow of her injured arm, looking at the angry burn on her hand. She sucked in a breath through her teeth at the sight. You shouldn't provoke him, 
she scolded gently. Catherine stiffened. Serena hadn't even been in the room when she'd slapped him, a slap Gerard had earned a hundred times over the past eleven days. What? So it's my fault your cousin's a raging psychopath? Serena's brown eyes widened to the size of saucers. Of course not. No, Catherine, I, I swear I didn't mean— She rushed to explain. Catherine tore her arm free from the girl's grasp. Just leave me alone, Serena. I'll tend to the wound, you know, the one that I apparently deserve, by myself. Serena looked like she wanted to argue, but her shoulders drooped when Catherine directed a glare her way, and she backed away from her, retreating to a corner of the room. Catherine braced herself before dunking her hand in the basin of cool water sitting near the fire pit. Catherine forced down a wail that wanted to escape at the sensation. After all, the way her entire hand throbbed in pain was nothing compared to how her insides twisted into knots whenever she thought about the fact that she hadn't seen Bastion in nearly two weeks. She had no idea how he was doing. If he was okay or not. She was betting not. Why he had yet to show up and save her from this hell. The full moon was tomorrow night, after all. She hadn't given up on the man— Catherine would never give up on him, but hope dwindled. The next morning, Bastion still hadn't come. Chapter 15 Please, take it. Catherine pursed her lips at the jar of salve that Serena held out to her. She'd been ignoring the girl since the evening before, when Gerard had seen fit to burn a layer of skin off her hand, and Serena's immediate response hadn't been to denounce his actions. As irate as she was with Serena, however, she was in no position to turn down help, no matter the form it came in. Thus, she begrudgingly reached forward with her good hand and accepted the jar of goop. Unfortunately, with her right hand, her good hand— currently useless, there was no way Catherine could twist open the jar's lid, at least not in any dignified manner. She was determined to try, though, and unraveled the plain white t-shirt Serena had wrapped around the wound yesterday evening in an effort to protect it from outside irritants and hasten its healing. Serena watched her struggle to somehow open the jar with her forearm for less than a minute before intervening. "'Here, let me help,' she said, reaching for the jar." She hesitated, however, before taking it. Well, as long as that's okay with you, she hedged. Catherine pursed her lips, but nodded. Serena, exhaling in apparent relief, grabbed the jar. She opened it with a quick flick of the wrist. Your hand, she requested. Catherine hesitantly held it out. The skin of her palm was pink as new skin began to emerge where her old skin used to be. So... Everywhere, basically. Serena dipped two fingers into the jar of salve, and scooping a large portion out, began spreading the clear jelly generously over her palm, making sure to cover every last inch of her wound. She took the time to carefully rub the soothing salve into Catherine's sensitive skin. Opal, she's the Pax healer and brews all our medicinal potions and creams, said the salve should ease the pain of the burn pretty much right away— and that it reduces the chance of scarring. Serena's eyes jumped up to Catherine. Not that I think it will scar, she hurried to add. It already looks much better today. She glanced over at Gerard, who was watching them intently from his seat near the fire, but not interfering. Not that that makes it okay, she added pointedly, lowly enough so only Catherine could hear. Then louder, she said, There, feel better? Catherine knew Serena felt guilty for her thoughtless comment the evening before. It was demonstrated clearly enough by the way she'd been hovering over her like a mother hen since, and staring into her hopeful, imploring gaze, Catherine was tempted to throw her a bone and end the silent treatment. She didn't forgive Serena exactly, but she understood her. In a very real way, Serena was as trapped there mentally as Catherine was physically— it didn't help that the girl strongly reminded her of Caleb. Not in the looks department, of course. Serena was as dark as Caleb was fair. 
but in their matching, nurturing demeanors. Catherine sighed. Yes, she finally said. It does feel better. Thank you, Serena. Serena seemed startled by her response, like for a long moment she couldn't believe that Catherine was speaking to her again. Then her eyes lit up as brightly as the angel her parents always topped the Christmas tree with, and Catherine couldn't help but feel a little guilty that she'd stopped speaking to her at all, even if it had only been for less than a day. She knew Serena probably didn't have too many other people she could talk to within her pack. She was probably the girl's only friend, if they could be considered that. No, thank you, Serena blurted. Then she shook her head, like she was trying to regain her bearings. I mean, that is, what I meant to say is, I'm glad you're feeling better. I'm sorry. Catherine softened further. I know you are. It's okay. Serena, Gerard barked pulling both girls from their coded conversation. We need more firewood. Serena glanced at the substantial pile of wood near the fire. She furrowed her brow in confusion. But— Did I stutter? Now. Serena offered Catherine the same regretful look she'd been treated to so many times in the past before nodding at Gerard's order. Of course, she said, standing and hesitantly shuffling out of the room. Catherine didn't blame her for leaving, but that didn't stop her stomach from churning with anxiety over the fact that she was being left alone with Gerard. She didn't think anyone could fault her for feeling that way. The last time Gerard had sent Serena out of the hut, he'd ended up shoving her hand in the fire pit, after all. Her already frayed nerves stood to attention when the man slowly made his way over to her usual hangout in the corner of the hut. He stopped directly in front of her, staring down at her with his arms crossed over his chest. Do you really think I don't know what you're doing? He asked. Catherine frowned. I'm not doing anything, she argued, using the wall as a crutch to pull herself to her feet, not out of respect or anything like that, but because she didn't like the perceived power imbalance of him standing over her. It made her feel smaller than she already was. Gerard was quiet for a moment as he eyed her up and down. You know, Serena never used to question my orders before you showed up. Now you've got her rushing to attend your every need, even going behind my back to feed you. He snorted, shaking his head like he was amused by something. You know, it's not going to work. Curiosity and annoyance battled for dominance inside her, but Catherine fought to keep either from showing on her face. "'What's not going to work?' she asked blandly instead. Gerard smirked. "'Why, turning her against me, of course,' he explained. "'Serena's been under my thumb for as long as I can remember, for as long as she can remember. Poor girl doesn't know any other way to be.' He said it like it was an accomplishment to be proud of. Maybe the full moon did make werewolves crazy, or maybe she just wasn't up to playing one of Gerard's little games after what had happened last night, because when Catherine opened her mouth to reply, she didn't even try to hold her tongue. You know, you're pathetic, she spat. You really think that people can belong to you? You're nothing but a bully who everyone despises. It's no wonder why even your father didn't want anything to do with you. Gerard stiffened. What did you say? He demanded lowly. Catherine knew it was stupid to antagonize the man, but she just couldn't help herself. There was no point in taking the words back, anyway. I said, she repeated brazenly, making sure to enunciate each word, no wonder your father wanted nothing to do with you. Gerard didn't immediately respond. He just stared. Serena tell you that? He eventually asked. Catherine shrugged, trying not to lose her nerve at the man's strange non-reaction. Maybe, she admitted. She wasn't giving away much. It wasn't like anyone else could have told her. Gerard nodded, a thoughtful expression on his face. What else did she tell you? 
Catherine frowned, but figured that the truth couldn't dig her into any deeper a hole than she was already in. That he was nearly as bad a leader as you are? That he killed her mother and father before you managed to take him out? A smile slowly stretched across Gerard's mouth until his toothy grin easily took up half of his face. He tipped his head back and laughed. Catherine gawked, the demented sound of his snickers all she could hear. What are you laughing at? she demanded harshly. She recalled the grief that had enveloped her when she had thought her mom and dad were dead. Nothing about losing one's parents was funny. Gerard wiped an invisible tear from his eye. Oh, it's just amusing, is all, that she still thinks that. Catherine frowned. Thinks what? she asked, frustration with the way he seemed intent on speaking riddles leaking into her voice. That Dane, he said, drawing out the name and pointedly refusing to call him his father, killed her mother. Catherine shifted uncertainly. But he did, didn't he? Nope, Gerard replied, voice impossibly smug. But Serena said she said what she's been told, Gerard asserted, interrupting Catherine with a flippant wave of his hand. What she thinks she knows. You see, he said, his grin returning to his face. It looked as diabolical as ever. It was I who killed my poor Auntie Sarah. The air was sucked straight from Catherine's lungs. What? she whispered. Well, how else could I have orchestrated a fight between my father and hers? he demanded, sounding suddenly angry. How else could I have ensured Dane was worn down enough to take in an alpha contest? Her mother's life was an unfortunate but necessary sacrifice. Catherine stared at the man before her, wading in the pool of disbelief that was threatening to drown her. Necessary sacrifice? She was a person. Catherine shook her head, utterly disgusted. But I suppose you wouldn't know much about that, would you? You're not one. You're a monster. Gerard shrugged off the insult. Call me what you want. I know what it takes to get ahead in this world. Not only did I prove my fool of a father wrong about me, I have everyone in my life exactly where I want them. A smirk pulled at the corner of his mouth. I admit that you've been a tough case, but I'm confident that soon enough I'll have your stubborn little self right where I want it to. He leaned in close, his mouth a mere hair's breadth away from her ear as he whispered, On your back, legs spread wide open welcoming me into your sweet little... Catherine lashed out, punching Gerard as hard as she could in the chest with her good hand and attempting to push him away. Keep dreaming, asshole, she spat. I will never willingly submit to you. Gerard easily caught her wrist and then reached for the other one so that he had them both captured in front of him. Oh, lovely, he said like he felt sorry for her inability to keep up. I never said that you'd be willing. Before Catherine could absorb the implication of the words, Gerard crashed his lips onto hers. It was nothing like the times he teased her by pressing their mouths together. He mashed his lips to hers, invading the cavern of her mouth with his fat tongue. He was so forceful that Catherine nearly choked on it. Just because her hands were trapped between their bodies, however, didn't mean that Catherine was completely helpless. He blocked her from kneeing him in the groin, but she managed to deliver a swift kick to one of his shins before he abruptly spun her around, twisting her wrists behind her back and shoving her belly first into the wall. She cried out as a sharp spark of pain shot through her middle. Gerard ignored her, wrestling her wrists into one hand so that the other could begin working on the clasp of her jeans. Zip. The sound of him unzipping her pants was loud in her ears, his fingers dipping past the waistline of her plain cotton panties. Let me go, she yelled, recalling her fighting lessons with Marcus and Zane all those months ago, and throwing her head backwards as hard as she could. Damn it. 
Catherine connected with something, and she assumed by Gerard's cussing that it was probably his nose. The hand inside her underwear disappeared, winding itself in her long, dark hair instead. He pulled, using his grip on it to bend her head backwards over his shoulder. He ran his tongue over the sensitive skin of her neck before sucking the lobe of her ear into his mouth. Then she felt teeth, sharp, inhuman teeth, scrape against the juncture of her neck, right where her claiming mark was. A scream was stuck in the back of Catherine's throat, desperately wanting to come out, but much like she was, it was trapped. Gerard, stop! Catherine didn't immediately comprehend hearing Serena's voice over the panic taking over her thoughts, but there she was, suddenly tugging on Gerard's arm. Gerard released Catherine, throwing her roughly to the floor. Somehow she managed to get her hands out in front of herself in time to protect her belly from impact. Then he backhanded Serena across the face. The force of the blow knocked the girl off her feet. A bruise immediately began to bloom over her cheek, and a droplet of blood trickled from her nose. She looked a mix of shocked and heartbroken. "'What the hell do you think you're doing?' Gerard demanded, voice laced with anger. Serena blinked. "'I... I don't,' she mumbled. He snorted. "'You're utterly useless. Never mind. You can make up for your indiscretion by helping me with her.' Catherine was still trying to catch her breath on the floor. She wasn't exactly sure at what point during her ordeal that she apparently decided to stop breathing. Alarm at Gerard's words, however, had her scrambling to her feet. What did he mean? What do you mean? Serena asked slowly, voicing Catherine's thoughts aloud. Catherine flinched when Gerard reached out and grabbed her by the arm, dragging her over to the bed in two giant strides and throwing her onto the mattress. "'What are you doing?' she asked, voice just this side of shrill. Gerard ignored her. "'Get the rope that's lying outside,' he told Serena. Catherine's heart stuttered in her chest. Her escape plan. She tried to get up from the bed, but Gerard wrestled her down." ignoring the way she clawed at his arms and even his face. Ultimately, he was forced to sit on her waist, just below her protruding belly, and hold her hands above her head to keep her still. Serena stared at the scene with wide, tear-filled eyes when she returned with the rope. Tie her ankles together, he ordered succinctly. Catherine shot her a beseeching look, desperately wanting to tell Serena what she'd just learned about her parents' deaths, specifically who was responsible for them, but she didn't dare do it in front of Gerard. It was too risky. For all Catherine knew, he'd kill Serena. Or her. Or both of them. So Catherine settled for alternately glaring at Gerard and shooting Serena pleading glances. Now, Serena, Gerard barked. The girl's betrayal stung when Serena, eyes carefully blank, did as she was ordered. Cut it, then hand it here, Gerard muttered when Serena was finished. Then, much rougher than his cousin had been, he looped the rope around her wrists. It scratched her burn with each pass, and she desperately tried to hold back tears, before tying it in an intricate knot. When he was finished, Gerard lowered himself until his face was mere inches from hers, satisfaction gleaming in his eyes. Surely you didn't think I'd leave you free to roam about the camp during the full moon, he teased, patting her cheek condescendingly. Oh, Catherine. He leaned forward further still, resting his forehead against hers. You better hope I don't come back to finish what I started, he whispered. After all, there's no reasoning with the wolf when he's in charge. Leaving that one last disgusting threat resounding in her ears, Gerard stood. Come, he said, grabbing Serena's arm. The full moon is due to rise within the hour. Serena, who'd been quiet ever since saving her from Gerard's assault and getting backhanded for her efforts, allowed herself to be pulled from the hut. Catherine lay there, horizontal in Gerard's bed, her wrists and ankles bound. Any chance at escape was gone. 
A violent storm of fury, frustration, and fear swirled within her. Catherine screamed. Catherine screamed until her voice was hoarse. While she raged, she thought of Gerard. I hate you! Bastion, where are you? Her pack. Aren't you looking for me? Even Serena. Why won't you help me? She didn't stop until another spike of pain enveloped her belly. It was a stark reminder that there was another life at stake other than her own, and she needed to pull herself together. Catherine closed her eyes, willing a sense of calm to encase her. She'd been told that screaming could be therapeutic, that it was healthy to release one's emotions that way, that it alleviated stress and would somehow cause tension to flow serenely from her muscles but it didn't do any of those things. All it had done was leave her with a raw, ragged throat and the sticky residue of tears clinging to her face. Catherine opened her eyes and stared at the ceiling, tracing the crisscross pattern of wood as she begged herself to think of something, anything, to get her out of the damnable situation she found herself in. Unfortunately, she was basically immobile unless she wanted to try to roll off the bed, out of the hut, and into the snow outside. Which, as far as Catherine could tell, would be pointless and risky to her unborn baby. She was concerned enough for the little one's well-being after being shoved so roughly into the wall. Sporadic pain had been lacing through her belly ever since. Gerard's parting threat was also present on her mind. Catherine didn't want to think that the man was so depraved as to return to the hut in his wolf form and, well, and, like Catherine said, she didn't want to think it. Unfortunately, there was nothing to do at the moment but overthink and worry. She heard constant noises outside, trees and bushes rustling with what Catherine hoped were small critters and not werewolves roaming around camp. An intermittent howl would also reach her ears every so often. After countless hours had passed, however, and the animal skin door hadn't so much as fluttered in the breeze, Catherine's worry began to wane. Exhaustion, both physical and mental, replaced it. Eventually, it was this bone-deep fatigue that caused her eyes to slowly drift shut and lull Catherine to sleep. Something startled her awake an indeterminable amount of time later. Catherine wasn't sure what it was that awoke her, but the tiny hairs on the back of her neck were standing on end, and her entire body felt tense with something. Anticipation, maybe? Catherine quickly glanced around the hut, but as far as she could tell, everything looked the same as it had before she had fallen asleep. The hut was still empty except for her, and the outside yet dark. She knew because there was no sunlight peeking in through the bottom of the flap door. It mustn't have been much past dawn, if even that. Then a howl pierced the air. It was loud and commanding, filled with desperation, rage, and penetrating intent. More than all that, though, it was intimately familiar. The sound was like an electric shock to Catherine's heart. It began beating madly in her chest, throwing itself against her ribs in the vigor of its sudden liveliness. Could it be? She squeezed her eyes shut, willing for the howl to sound a second time. A handful of minutes passed, but Catherine didn't hear it again. But she smelt something. Smoke. Catherine snapped open her eyes. It was too overpowering a smell to be coming from the gentle swirl rising from the hut's simmering fire pit. It was so strong, in fact, that when she took in a mouthful of air, she could taste it. Something, somewhere, was burning. Catherine's head whipped in the direction of the door at the sudden sound of approaching footsteps. Whoever they belonged to was running. Serena! Relief and disappointment clashed within her when she saw who rushed through the door. Relief because it wasn't Gerard. Disappointment because it wasn't... Well, the howl had sounded so familiar. Confusion and even a smidgen of hope joined the brawl when Catherine saw that Serena, still nude from the shift, 
had a coat slung over one of her shoulders and a pair of moccasins in her hands. She threw them to the floor before running to Catherine, dropping to her knees, and immediately beginning to work on the rope that bound her wrists. "'What's going on?' Catherine demanded. "'I thought I heard—' "'There's no time. We've got to get you out of here.' Serena loosened the knot enough so that Catherine could pull her hands free. Carefully avoiding the burn on her right palm, she massaged the sore skin that the coarse rope had been digging into for hours. Serena began undoing the rope tied around her ankles. Catherine should have been jumping for joy at the sudden turn of events. She was getting her chance to escape, after all. But something held her back. An ominous feeling loomed over her, dampening any sense of glee. That howl. Serena, she said, addressing the other girl sharply and grabbing her by her shoulders, forcing her to focus. What's going on? she repeated slowly. Serena took a deep breath and tucked a strand of stray hair behind her ear. It's your mate, she said softly. Bastion. His name sounded foreign on Serena's tongue, but the admiration was plain in her voice as she said it. She didn't know where Serena had heard it before. He's come for you. And there was that joy. More than joy. Exultation. It had been him, Catherine had heard howling. Her jubilation was cut short, however, when Serena shoved the moccasins she'd come in with into her lap. Catherine frowned. Well, I can hardly leave if he's here. It makes way more sense to stay put and let him find me than to go traipsing out into the woods. Serena shook her head. You have to leave. It's absolute chaos outside, and the bedlam is only getting closer. Attacking immediately after the full moon was smart. It's when we're naturally at our weakest, and no one, not even Gerard, was expecting it. Everyone able is fighting, wolf or human form, it doesn't matter. Someone's hut started on fire in the confusion, and the flames from it have already ignited two others. It just isn't safe to stay here. Just as quickly as that joy had emerged, it came crashing down, shattering to pieces as the reality of the danger Bastion was in set in. The wolves of the Western Colony, or whatever they called themselves now, were vicious, none more so than Gerard. And although Catherine had never seen his wolf form, she knew, judging by his human one, that he was almost certainly bigger and stronger than Bastion. Serena shoved the coat she'd brought in with her at Catherine. It was the same coat Melanie had bought for her in Vanderhoof. She'd thought that they'd destroyed it, but obviously not. It must have been too useful to burn. No, Serena, Catherine said, pushing the coat away. I don't care how dangerous it is. I must stay. How else is Bastion supposed to find me? Besides, she couldn't just abandon him to whatever pandemonium was happening outside. Serena stared trying to communicate with her eyes the importance of her next words. Catherine, you don't understand. It's not just the fighting or fire that's dangerous. If Gerard gets to you before Bastion... She trailed off, swallowing. I know, my cousin. If he thinks he can't have you, he'll make sure that no one else can either. He'd kill her. Catherine knew it was true. She clenched her hands into fists in a desperate bid to stop them from shaking. Come with me, she blurted, not thinking twice about the offer. Serena smiled, but there was a sadness to it that told Catherine what her answer would be before she even opened her mouth. She shook her head. I can't, she whispered. Why not? We'll find you a coat and some shoes. I said I can't, she interjected sharply. Catherine stared in disbelief, clenching her jaw as incredulity-fueled anger filled her. Surely you don't still feel a sense of loyalty to that bastard. Serena's eyes flitted to the ground. No, she denied. But I can't abandon my home, Catherine. It's where I grew up, and... And it's the only place I have any memory of my parents, she finished softly. Tension fled Catherine's shoulders as Serena revealed her real motive for staying behind. 
her anger deflated, but that didn't mean she agreed with the girl's decision. She just didn't have time to argue. Okay, okay, fine, she said, slipping on the shoes and shoving her arms through the sleeves of the puffy coat Serena had brought her. There was something nagging at Catherine, though, and she couldn't leave without telling Serena what she'd learned. Serena, your mom, I know, she said, interrupting Catherine before she could say anything further. Tears flooded Serena's eyes, and she pressed her lips together, taking a moment to compose herself. She inhaled deeply through her nose. When I was coming back from collecting firewood, I heard what Gerard said. Th that he killed my mom. Her voice broke on the last word. I just didn't know how to react. I was in shock, maybe, or even denial. I think I've been in that for years. She buried her face in her hands. I'm so sorry, Catherine. Catherine didn't know what to say in the face of such sincere anguish. You came back for me. That's all that matters, she finally settled on. Thank you. Despite Serena's turning a blind eye to all of Gerard's wrongdoings, she really was grateful for the other girl. She'd still be tied up, stuck in Gerard's bed, if it wasn't for her. Serena sniffled. Don't thank me, she mumbled, lifting her head from her hands and revealing tear tracks on her cheeks. I should have gotten you out of here a long time ago. It was true. But when Catherine looked at Serena, she didn't feel anger. Just pity and reluctant affection. She didn't know how to tell Serena that, though, so she showcased her feelings the only way she knew how and pulled the melancholy girl into a hug. Stay safe, Serena, she muttered into her bony shoulder. Serena tensed at the sudden movement, but her stiff muscles relaxed at Catherine's words. She wrapped her arms around Catherine in return. You too, she whispered. Unfortunately, Catherine didn't have any more time to waste. She pulled herself from Serena's embrace and headed for the door. She glanced once at the girl over her shoulder, then pulled back the animal skin flap and ducked out of the room she'd been held captive in for so long. It was the first time Catherine had been outside since that man, Blake, had wandered into Gerard's hut and set off the man's temper. The layout of camp was precisely how Catherine remembered— Two or three dozen huts like Gerard's were spread out across a massive man-made clearing, a huge fire pit at its center. Unlike last time, the fire in the pit was a mere smolder. A much more impressive flame was climbing high into the sky in the northwest section of the camp, where at least three huts had caught on fire. It was almost certain to spread further. Smoke was already thick in the air, overpowering enough to clog Catherine's nostrils, but not quite dense enough to completely obscure her vision. Because of this, she could see the chaos Serena spoke of. Screams and snarls reached her ears as wolves and humans alike threw themselves into battle. The closest skirmish was less than fifty feet away from where she stood, and just like Serena had said, the bedlam was getting closer and closer to the center of camp. Catherine took heart that it was a strong indication the outside forces— Bastion and whoever made up his army of invaders, were winning. She was sorely tempted to ignore Serena's advice and stay. She ached to not only see Bastion, but to feel his arms around her. She was starved of his touch and wanted nothing more than to bury herself in his strong, capable embrace and never leave it. Another shock of pain shot through Catherine's belly— this one strong enough to make Catherine reflexively curl into herself. The baby. She had to go. Following gut instinct alone, Catherine headed east. She sprinted away from camp, well, as much as one could sprint with a pregnant belly, and disappeared into the line of trees there. She wasn't running towards anything in particular, but she was running away from something, someone, and that was motivation enough to keep her moving. She pumped her arms as she leapt over overgrown roots peeking out through the snow and ducked under low-hanging tree branches. Catherine hadn't been running long before she got the sense that someone was following her. Paranoia buzzed under her skin, making her hyper-aware of the sound of snapping branches 
and the occasional whiff she caught of a familiar scent on the breeze. The suspicion that she was being tailed only made her move faster, however, and she ignored the sporadic spark of pain in her belly as she ran further and further from what used to be the Western colony. Catherine was just beginning to think that paranoia had gotten the best of her when a figure suddenly jumped out in front of her, forcing her to careen to a stop before they violently collided. Catherine fought to catch her breath, resting her hands on her knees as she took in the person before her. Melanie, she managed to gasp out between desperate gasps for oxygen. What are you doing? The girl stood in front of Catherine, her own heavy breathing evident in the puffs of condensed carbon dioxide that formed in the frigid air. She had a familiar hunting knife grasped in one of her hands. Even more concerning, it was covered in blood. I can't let you leave, Catherine. The longer the words sat in the air between them, the longer that Catherine stared at the two-faced girl she'd thought was her friend once upon a time, the more anger began to accumulate in her gut until it had transformed into an uncontainable storm of swirling rage. The sheer nerve of her to stand between Catherine and escape. Why the hell not? she yelled. You got what you wanted, didn't you? You have Lucas. You have the precious pack that you were so desperate for. What do you care if I run away and you never have to see my face again? I thought you'd be the last person to object to that. Or do you really hate me that much? Melanie pursed her lips. You overestimate your own importance. She paused, casually adding, Lucas did too. A chill traveled down Catherine's spine. She eyed the bloody knife in Melanie's hand, slick and shining in the approaching dawn. Where is he? she demanded. Melanie shrugged. His usefulness ran out. He was killed in the fray. It's quite the battle your dear Bastion is leading, by the way, she added offhandedly. He must really love you. She sounded the definition of bitter. Anyway, I thought I'd take advantage of the chaos to pay you a visit. I wanted to see you earlier, of course, but Gerard's made it pretty clear that he doesn't deal well with unexpected guests, nor is he very good at sharing his things. I'm sure you can imagine my surprise to see you, not cooped up in his hut like I had assumed, but running wild into the woods. Catherine didn't know what part of Melanie's monologue to address first. I thought Lucas was your mate, she finally settled on. You don't sound all that upset at his passing. She held up the knife. I never said who it was that killed him. Mate in name or not, Lucas was a means to an end for me, nothing more. Catherine was horrified. The tiny uptick in the corner of her mouth was the only thing that gave away Melanie's amusement. And to think, you were concerned that he was using me. Catherine swallowed forcing herself to ignore both the dig and the fact that Melanie had just all but admitted to killing her mate. "'What end are you talking about?' she demanded instead. Melanie's eyes flitted down to her belly. "'How's the baby been?' she asked, the first hint of true sincerity in her voice. "'Is he taking to the change of environment well?' Catherine felt whiplash at the sudden turn of Melanie's demeanor. Why do you care? she began to ask, but trailed off as understanding dawned. Something finally clicked in her brain. Despite her obvious loathing, Melanie had shown Catherine a certain level of care throughout their entire road trip to the Western Colony. She constantly asked after her well-being. She made sure she was watered and fed. Truthfully, she wasn't concerned at all about Catherine's comfort or well-being, how she was feeling, whether she ate or not. She just cared about the baby. Everything suddenly made perfect sense. Melanie's motives were startlingly clear. You want my baby, she murmured, horror-struck as her hand involuntarily went to her belly. Melanie snorted. About time you figured that out. Why? Why? Melanie repeated incredulously. 
Why do you think? She shook her head like she was truly disappointed in Catherine's inability to figure it out. You're right. I do want a pack, but not one that will turn on me at the drop of a hat. Not one that will abandon me whenever the mood strikes. I want someone who would never even think of leaving my side. A child. Since the odds of conceiving one on my own are so low, I figured why not seize the opportunity that fell into my lap when you suddenly got pregnant? Why not make what was yours mine? The fact that I get to take such a tremendous gift away from the person who turned her back on me in the first place is just an added bonus. Catherine stared. Apparently, Bastion making the girl an outcast did way more damage to her mentally than Catherine could have ever imagined. Somehow, Melanie's mind had twisted things so that Catherine was the one who had wronged her, so that she was the reason for Melanie's exile, instead of the girl's own actions. Melanie pointed the hunting knife at her. It was the first time she had directly threatened Catherine with the weapon since cornering her. The good news is, if you come with me willingly, I won't hurt you. Catherine struggled to calm her racing thoughts enough to form some sort of plan. She had to think of a way to get the knife away from Melanie. Until she could come up with something, though, Catherine knew she had to stall. You wouldn't hurt me anyway, she pointed out, calling Melanie out on what she hoped was a bluff. You would never risk harming the baby. Melanie's mouth transformed into a twisted sort of smile. That's where you're wrong. The baby is close enough to term to survive outside the womb now. I'll slice you open if I have to. She shrugged nonchalantly, like she hadn't just threatened Catherine's life. Or you can come with me peacefully. It's your choice, really. Catherine's mind whirled as she desperately tried to think of a way out of her current situation that didn't involve leaving with Melanie or getting cut open. Where would you take me? she asked, attempting to dually reason with the girl and buy time to think. Whatever remains of the colony is burning as we speak. A large cloud of smoke was visible in the distance, and Catherine hoped that no trees had caught on fire. Even if we do go back, you know as well as I that you don't stand a chance against the winner of the fight between Bastion and Gerard. It would be Bastion, of course. It had to be. Catherine refused to think otherwise. Lucas told me about a cluster of abandoned cabins a few more miles south. We'll hide out there until you give birth, Melanie replied, dismissing her concerns. If you cooperate, I'll even let you leave afterwards. Catherine pressed her lips together, thinking, You'll take the baby and just let me go back to Haven Falls? To Bastion? I don't care where or who you go to as long as you leave the baby behind with me. Catherine inhaled through her nose, holding the air in her lungs for a moment before the burn got to be too much. Okay, she agreed slowly. Okay, fine. I'll go with you. She lifted her hands in the air to indicate her surrender. Just get that knife out of my face. Melanie snorted but lowered the blade. She reached out for Catherine with her free hand. Whatever, just come on. Catherine shuffled closer to the girl, and Melanie was inches away from grabbing onto the sleeve of her coat and dragging her the rest of the way when Catherine put her half-cocked plan into motion and abruptly rushed her. Melanie staggered but didn't lose her balance when Catherine threw herself at her. Catherine had hoped that the suddenness of the attack would loosen Melanie's grip on the knife, but she didn't drop it, so Catherine was forced to grapple with her for it. "'Did you really think I'd just let you have my kid?' she demanded derisively, one hand wrapped around the wrist of the hand with the knife, the other attempting to pry Melanie's thin fingers from the handle of the blade. Melanie fought back, trying to maintain possession of the weapon while simultaneously shoving Catherine off of her. No, she admitted with a grunt, trying and failing to jerk her hand, and the weapon in it, from Catherine's grasp. But I had hoped, for your sake, that you wouldn't be so damn stupid. Melanie managed to push her away at the same time she shouted that last word, the force of the shove causing Catherine to trip over a log buried in the snow behind her. 
Even though she'd landed on her butt, pain ricocheted through her belly. The intensity of it distracted her for only a second, but it was enough time for Melanie to take advantage. As Catherine wrapped her arms around her belly and fought not to fold into herself, Melanie climbed on top of her, straddling her around the waist. She held the sharp edge of the knife to Catherine's cheek. You know, Melanie said, breathing loudly from their scuffle, I didn't want to do this. Despite what everyone thinks, I have never sought to hurt you. She shook her head. But now you've left me no choice. Melanie raised the knife above her head. Goodbye, Catherine. Catherine threw her arms above her head in a desperate bid to protect herself, waiting for the whoosh of the knife cutting through air to reach her ears. But the sound never came. Instead, a ferocious snarl the likes of which Catherine had never heard before reverberated through the trees, and Catherine lowered her arms just in time to see a huge wolf spring at Melanie. It happened so fast that the girl didn't even have time to scream. The slight widening of her dark eyes was the only indication she even knew what was about to happen. Sharp teeth ripped into her jugular, and blood sprayed everywhere. The wolf jerked Melanie's body this way and that before tossing it carelessly to the ground, a mere two feet from Catherine. She landed with her face turned towards Catherine, and nausea caused her stomach to churn as she took in the sight of Melanie's lifeless eyes and the blood trickling from her wide-open mouth. She was dead, and it had all happened within seconds. As Catherine tried to wrap her mind around the fact that she'd just seen the second person killed in front of her in as many weeks, the wolf, blood dripping from his snout, took a step towards her. Fear lacing up her spine, Catherine scrambled backward in an awkward sort of crab walk, pain shooting up her arm where her burn connected with icy snow. She backed herself up against the trunk of a tree, where she sat helplessly, heart pounding in her chest as she pictured her throat being torn open next. She clenched eyes tightly shut, bracing herself to meet the same untimely end as Melanie, but nothing happened. Seconds passed, and then an entire minute. Resolving herself to look death in the face, Catherine pried open her eyes and immediately recognized the ones in the wolfish face before her. Chapter 16 Astonishment bombarded Catherine, and then elation. Marcus, she choked. Catherine didn't think, she just acted. Launching herself forward, she threw her arms around the wolf's neck, burying her face in his thick fur. The familiar, comforting scent of worn leather washed over her. Tears flooded her eyes as disbelief-tinged relief engulfed her. In a matter of minutes, she'd gone from about to be sliced open and left to bleed to death on the forest floor to feeling as safe as she had since she was kidnapped nearly a fortnight ago. Marcus, she repeated, sniffling and tightening her grip on his fur until she was sure she was pulling it, but the wolf didn't make any noise of complaint. He was probably too consumed with shoving his snout into the crook of Catherine's neck and inhaling her scent to even notice. She winced as his wet nose prodded her, and she pulled back, placing her hands on either side of his face. She ignored the blood, Melanie's blood, that covered his snout. "'What took you so long?' she asked. The question had meant to be more of a wisecrack than anything— but her voice broke on the last words as the same tears that threatened to fall from her eyes gathered at the base of her throat. She really wanted to know the answer. The wolf whined at the light-hearted rebuke and insisted on sticking his nose back into her face. He nuzzled his cheek against hers before using his large tongue to lick her from chin to forehead. Marcus Gross, she chided, but she couldn't stop a swell of laughter from bubbling up her throat. It was her first real laugh in weeks. S stop she protested through giggles as he gave the other side of her face the same treatment, this time making sure to swipe his slobbery tongue over a bit of her hair, causing a chunk of it to stick up on end. Jerk, she accused with a playful shove that didn't budge the wolf in the least. The sound of a branch snapping in the distance made Catherine freeze. 
The tiny smile pulling at the corner of her lips disappeared as quickly as it had come, and she shifted closer to Marcus, eyeing the suddenly ominous-looking forest around them. She took comfort in the fact that Marcus didn't seem perturbed by the noise, but her muscles stiffened further when the sound of more rustling reached her ears. A moment later, another wolf bounded through an opening in the trees. Catherine's shoulders slumped in relief when she recognized the familiar form of Zane. "'You could have told me,' she scolded Marcus. He looked as outwardly amused as a wolf could, and swatted him on the shoulder. He snorted. Turning her attention back on Zane, Catherine was taken off guard when he approached her slowly, almost cautiously. There was still about five feet between them when he lowered his belly to the ground, resting his head on his paws and staring at her with forlorn eyes. Catherine frowned, standing and making up the remaining distance between them before kneeling and laying her good hand on his head. She smoothed down the fur between his ears. What's wrong? He whimpered, nuzzling his snout into her palm, and all at once, Catherine realized he must have still been feeling responsible for letting her out of his sight two weeks ago. It was the event that had led to her kidnapping. It wasn't his fault, of course. She'd practically begged him to let her have an hour to herself. Then she was the one who had stupidly gone to visit Melanie on her own, and Melanie and Lucas were responsible for their own actions. Oh, Zane, she whispered to the usually stoic man, or wolf, in this instance. Come here. He didn't need to be told twice. Zane practically pounced on her in his enthusiasm, and soon both he and Marcus were all over her as they refamiliarized themselves with her scent. They pressed their cheeks against hers, sticking their noses into her hair. Marcus even poked his snout under her jacket, no doubt trying to check on the baby in his own way. Overall, their behavior wasn't unlike that of hyperactive dogs greeting their owner after she had been gone for an extended trip. They were even wagging their tails. Catherine couldn't suppress a watery smile at the sight. They were never going to live it down. She would hold the tail wagging over them for ages. Not one of them acknowledged the dead body laying only a handful of feet away. Personally, Catherine was pretending it didn't exist. Okay, okay, she said, when the forcefulness of their affection nearly knocked her off her knees. I missed you guys too, she assured, pushing them away. As glad as she was to see them, though, a sense of gloom hung over their reunion. Her happiness was bittersweet. She nervously tucked a piece of hair behind her ear before addressing the elephant in the room, or the wolf not in the forest, to be more accurate. "'Where's Bastion?' she asked carefully. "'And the others?' Marcus and Zane glanced at each other before the former took the lead and jerked his head in the direction of the western colony. It was just a confirmation of what she already knew— but the overwhelming relief she'd experienced upon recognizing Marcus shriveled away into nothing as fear once again took hold of her. She pulled herself up into a standing position, stiffening as a sharp jolt of pain shot through her. Catherine couldn't stop herself from giving her discomfort away with a quick intake of air as she braced herself against a nearby tree. Both wolves immediately began yipping their concern. I'm fine, she assured them straightening when the pain eased. They didn't look convinced. Marcus whined, nosing the palm of her injured hand, clearly calling her out on the ludicrous statement. Catherine could hardly blame him. She knew she must have made quite the sight. She hadn't had a proper bath in well over a week, and dirt and bruises alike decorated her skin. Her hair was a wild mess of greasy waves, the recent addition of Marcus's slobber probably the least offensive thing about it. Okay, she acknowledged. I'm not exactly fine, but I will be, I swear. As soon as we find Bastion. She took a step in the direction of the colony, but Zane immediately leapt in front of her, blocking her way. Marcus went a step further and grabbed hold of the sleeve of her coat with his teeth, gently pulling her backward. It didn't take a genius to figure out what they intended. "'What are you doing? We can't just leave them there to fend for themselves,' she objected. She knew very well that they weren't completely on their own. 
From the glimpse of the battle Catherine had caught before she'd booked it into the forest, Bastion had brought most of Haven Falls with him. What if... she started to ask, but couldn't finish. She swallowed. What if... she tried again, but her voice once again trailed off. What if Bastion was killed? She couldn't even vocalize the possibility aloud. Catherine honestly didn't think she would survive it. Marcus tugged a bit more sharply on her sleeve, and Zane butted his head against her side, clearly trying to steer her in the opposite direction of the colony. Realization dawned. Wait, did Bastion specifically assign you two to babysitting duty? Catherine demanded. She didn't even need to see their resulting sheepish stares to know the answer. She was almost certain that the extent of their job during the raid had been to retrieve and protect her. That sweet, caring, self-sacrificing jerk, sending two of his best fighters to defend her instead of using their skills in combat. Never mind that the whole point of waging war on what remained of the Western colony was to get Catherine out of there safely. How could he put himself at risk like that? The other members of his troop at risk. Another twinge of pain caused her belly to tighten, and Catherine knew exactly how. She laid a hand over her protruding stomach. She, too, had someone she knew she would protect at all costs, even if it meant abandoning Bastion to battle. Marcus finally released his grip on her coat to yip at her. Catherine frowned, recognizing the scolding quality of his tone. I know, okay? I know. You're right. It's not like I would be much help in my current condition anyway. It's just that... It was just so hard to leave him and the others behind. She dragged her good hand roughly over her face. It's just hard, okay? But I get it. I wish I didn't, but I do. She took a deep breath. So what now? Marcus relocked his jaws around her coat sleeve and used his grip on the fabric to direct her hand to his back. Catherine raised her eyebrows. You want me to pet you? she asked incredulously. If wolves could roll their eyes, Catherine suspected that was exactly what Marcus would be doing right then. Zane walked over to Marcus, hopping up on his hind legs and placing both paws on his back. Catherine's brow wrinkled in confusion. You want me to climb on top of you? she guessed hesitantly, not truly thinking she was interpreting their impromptu game of charades correctly. It wasn't like it was logical for them to shift into their human forms, though, not when their naked bodies would be vulnerable to the elements. Imagine Catherine's surprise when both wolves yipped in approval and began bobbing their heads up and down at her guess. What, seriously? she demanded. Catherine could only assume that they wanted to take her somewhere, perhaps a safe house of some sort that they'd prepared before the raid, and the fastest way to get her there was to... Well, give her a ride, so to speak. Either that, or they just wanted to get her as far away from Gerard and his pack as possible. Catherine could definitely get behind that idea, but still. Riding on Marcus's back? Zane hopped off Marcus and used his head to nudge Catherine towards him. She threw her hands in the air in surrender. Okay, okay, fine. She pointed a finger at first Zane and then Marcus but you two are never to speak of this. Marcus's nose twitched, and his mouth formed something that looked suspiciously like a smirk as she approached him. Catherine wasn't sure exactly how to climb on top of him, but eventually just decided to approach the task how she would approach ascending a horse. Marcus wasn't that large, of course, but his back was still higher up from the ground than her waist— so Catherine firmly grabbed him by the scruff before using her hold on it to pull herself up enough to swing a leg over his back. Once she was sitting, she draped herself over him, awkwardly pressing her pregnant belly to his back as she wrapped her arms around his neck and squeezed her legs around his torso. Realizing he was waiting for a signal that she was settled, Catherine took a deep breath before announcing, I'm ready. And they were off. It felt like a betrayal as Marcus and Zane took her further and further from battle, from Bastion.
but Catherine knew that disregarding Bastion's wishes for her to stay out of the skirmish would have been the real betrayal. Trees flashed by in her peripheral vision as Marcus sprinted through the forest, his powerful legs easily supporting her weight. He was fast, and the natural motion of his movement was somewhat jostling. Combined, the speed and roughness of the ride made Catherine feel a bit woozy. She buried her face into his fur in an attempt to both protect it from the whipping wind and control the lightheadedness. She shifted uncomfortably when she experienced another burst of pain in her lower belly. Now that she had much less to occupy her mind with, concern for her unborn baby threatened to consume Catherine. With everything else going on, she hadn't been able to properly obsess over the intermittent pain she'd been experiencing ever since Gerard had shoved her stomach first into the wall. But now... Worry gnawed at her insides. They hadn't been on the move for more than ten minutes when another spark of pain shot down her spine this one so strong that she nearly lost her grip on Marcus. Her stomach clenched involuntarily, her entire middle becoming incredibly tight. Stop, she moaned into Marcus's fur. Either he didn't hear her or he was outright ignoring her. Keeping one arm looped around his neck, she tugged on his ear. Marcus, let me off. I don't feel good. Marcus seemed disgruntled by the order. He clearly didn't want to stop or even slow his pace, probably on the off chance that someone was following them. Something in her voice must have convinced him to listen to her, though, because he slowed to a stop. Catherine released a sigh of relief when her feet hit the ground, and she waddled over to a nearby tree, laying her forehead against the rough bark of its trunk and attempting to compose herself. Catherine was glad that Marcus and Zane were preoccupied with checking to make sure no one was pursuing them, their ears perked and eyes bright as they took in their surroundings, when another burst of pain overtook her. She bent over at the waist, hugging her belly with her arms, as she finally forced herself to acknowledge the possibility that she might be going into early labor. Nearly as soon as the disquieting thought broke free through her shield of denial, however, Catherine dismissed it. That couldn't be it. She was barely five months along, another whole month away from giving birth. Almost as soon as she had banished that theory from her mind, though, another jolt of pain, this one nearly crippling, had her desperately swallowing back a whimper. She fought to remain standing, and when the pain finally passed, Catherine noticed a warm trickle running down her inner thighs— Embarrassment flooded her as she assumed she had wet herself. It was way more embarrassing than the tail-wagging material she had over Marcus and Zane. But the fluid didn't stop leaking from between her legs, and soon her underwear was completely soaked. Slowly, irrefutable understanding dawned. Uh, guys, Catherine said voice quivering as she took in the stain slowly spreading across the seat of her pants. I think my water just broke. Chapter 17 Within seconds, where two shell-shocked-looking wolves once stood, appeared two lumbering, stark-naked men. Both Marcus and Zane had concern etched across their features, neither even acknowledging the icy snow that bit into their feet or the bitterly cold wind that beat against their bare chests as they hurried over to her. "'Are you sure?' Marcus demanded. Terror at the prospect of giving birth in the middle of the frozen forest caused Catherine to lash out at the question. "'What, do you think I pissed myself or something?' she snapped. Never mind that a minute ago, that was exactly what she had thought. "'Of course I'm sure!' Catherine knew she must have looked in even worse shape than she felt when Marcus didn't bark something equally as insulting back at her. "'Have you had any contractions?' Zane asked, marginally calmer than either of them. Catherine ran an agitated hand through her tangled hair before shrugging. "'I think so,' she admitted. Marcus stiffened. "'What?' he cried. "'Why didn't you say anything?' "'Because I wasn't sure what they were until now, okay?' I'm not even due for another month. Saying it out loud only made the fear buzzing under Catherine's skin that much more tangible. She buried her head in her hands. Oh, God. Catherine, just stay calm, all right? Zane said, 
running his hand in soothing circles on her back while shooting a glare at Marcus over her head. The other man huffed, throwing his hands up in the air in frustration. Everything will be fine, Zane assured. We didn't know what condition we would find you in when we invaded the Western Colony this morning, so we made sure that Gabriella was waiting to meet us at a nearby safe house, an abandoned hunter's cabin not far from here. So that's where they were going, to see Gabriella. Praise whatever deity was watching over her. How many contractions would you say you've had? Zane asked evenly. And about how much time passes between them? I don't know how many... Catherine confessed, rubbing tiredly at her eyes before letting her hands drop back down to her sides. But they began last night, I think, and are starting to come every five minutes or so. Zane blinked. Oh. Catherine's eyes immediately zeroed in on the man at the one-syllable response. It was plain to see that while Zane's mouth may have only uttered, Oh, his eyes said, Oh, shit. What's that supposed to mean? Marcus demanded harshly, voicing Catherine's own question aloud. Zane pressed his lips together. Nothing. It's just that, theoretically, you could have that baby any minute. Catherine's heart stuttered to a halt inside her chest in reaction to Zane's words, before starting up again twice as fast. Marcus seemed to take the news in a similar manner, staring in disbelief at Zane for a solid minute. Then, Quite suddenly, his features hardened. He offered Zane a terse nod. Well, let's get her to the cabin, then, and fast, he declared, sounding determined. The two men seemed to communicate telepathically, and simultaneously come to the conclusion that Catherine could no longer ride safely on either of their backs. It was true. As soon as a contraction hit, she was liable to fall off. They turned towards her. Can you walk? Zane asked. Catherine frowned, but hesitantly nodded. I think so. But she couldn't even finish the sentence before a sudden spasm of pain, which Catherine now knew was a contraction, caused her belly to tighten to the point of nearly unbearable agony. The pain was centered in her lower belly, but it radiated all the way up to her ribs and even down her thighs. She wrapped her arms around her stomach like that could somehow keep the baby inside her for longer. No sooner had the contraction ended than was Marcus scooping her up in his arms, forcing her head to rest against his burly chest as he held her to him. I'll carry her, he informed Zane bluntly. You can't, Catherine half-heartedly protested, but her voice was still a bit shaky from the contraction, and she knew it didn't ring true. You'll freeze— Although neither man had complained of being cold since transforming into their human forms, both of their lips had already turned blue, and Catherine could feel how freezing Marcus's fingers were even through the thick layers of her shirt and coat. Despite their body's natural, built-in resistance to a large range of temperatures, werewolves weren't made to function in such extremes for long periods of time, at least not in their human forms. I'll be fine, Marcus said brushing off her concern. Zane shook his head. Nah, she's right, Marcus. The cabin is still six or seven miles south. You'll get frostbite before we even get halfway there. Wrinkles formed on his forehead as Zane fought to think of a solution. But I recall there being another vacant cabin that's only a mile or two southwest from here. His eyes met Marcus's. I don't think we have a choice. We have to take her there. Catherine opened her mouth to protest that plan, too. After all, what about Gabriella? She needed the woman to help her deliver her baby. Before she could point that out, though, Zane added, When we get there, one of us can go get Gabriella. Catherine didn't like it, but then her belly tensed again. Her breath hitched, a pathetic little keen escaping her mouth as she tried to curl up into herself, even cradled as she was in Marcus's arms. Despite any reservations she had, she didn't know if they would get to any cabin at this rate, so she hurriedly nodded her agreement against Marcus's chest. Marcus, who'd stiffened at Catherine's obvious distress, held her even tighter to him. What are we waiting for? Let's go. Zane nodded, and shifting back into his wolf form, began leading the way to their destination. 
human Marcus wasn't nearly as fast as Wolf Zane or Wolf Marcus, especially with the extra weight in his arms, not that he showed a hint of strain as he carried her, but he set a respectable enough pace, and at least the ride was smoother than it had been before. Catherine burrowed her face into Marcus's shoulder. Distract me, she begged, voice muffled against his skin. He must have still heard her, though. Glad to see you're the same bossy little thing as always, he said, the tiniest hint of a smirk on his face. Catherine huffed, but secretly reveled in the familiar teasing. And I'm pleased to see you're the same loud-mouthed prick you've always been. He laughed at that, sticking his nose into her hair, and Catherine realized he was still eagerly taking in her scent, even as a human. She grimaced recalling Gerard's crude attempt to cover her natural scent with his. She frowned, shifting uncomfortably in Marcus's arms as paranoia suddenly took hold of her. "'Do I smell bad?' she asked quietly, keeping her voice carefully void of emotion. Marcus must not have consciously realized he was still inhaling her scent, because he jerked his nose out of her hair at the question. Not quite embarrassed. Marcus and embarrassment didn't equate, but close. No, he said after a moment. You still smell like you under all the sweat and grime. Hell, that might even make your scent more potent. I mean, the smell of smoke is clinging to your clothes, and there's another foreign scent overlaying yours for some reason. Catherine stiffened at the confirmation that she smelled like Gerard, trying to keep her expression blank, but unable to stop tears from filling her eyes. Marcus paused, a sudden frown pulling at the corners of his mouth as he took in the suspicious sheen. Catherine, he demanded, voice as sharp as she'd ever heard it. What happened? What did that bastard do to you? Catherine bit her bottom lip, her teeth digging into tender flesh. I don't want to talk about it right now. She hoped the or ever was implied as she once again attempted to hide her face in Marcus's shoulder. But princess, no, Marcus, she snapped, peeking up at him. You know, you're not very good at this whole distracting thing. He raised an eyebrow, but let the subject drop, picking up his pace when Zane yipped at them to keep moving from where he waited, nearly thirty feet ahead of them. Well, at least I know where you get your attitude from now, Marcus said as he walked, breaking the tense silence that threatened to descend upon them. You're nearly as impossible as your sister. Catherine frowned. My sister? Before she got an answer out of him, however, another contraction took hold of her, and the breath was sucked from her body. Marcus tucked his head over hers, his own way of offering comfort, Catherine supposed, as she wrote it out. When the pain eased enough for Catherine to speak, she took a moment to compose herself before demanding, When did you talk to my sister? Marcus shrugged. After you disappeared, we wanted to make sure we covered all our bases. Catherine bristled. What? You thought I'd just pay an impromptu visit to my parents without telling anyone? She demanded incredulously. It hurt to think they thought she was capable of something so thoughtless. We didn't know what to think, Catherine, he snapped back. We searched the entirety of Haven Falls and couldn't find hide nor hair of you. We were terrified. I was terrified. Bastion was... There are no words to describe the state he was in. And just like that, the guilt that she'd been unconsciously harboring since she was snatched nearly two weeks ago swelled in her chest, overflowing in the form of tears from her eyes. Well, I'm sorry, okay? She yelled. It's not like I meant for this to happen. Hot tears plugged her throat, and Catherine jerked her hood over her head, once again hiding her face in Marcus's shoulder. Hey, no. Don't be sorry. I know it's not your fault. That isn't what I meant, okay? When Catherine ignored him, Marcus sighed, and in a blatant effort to make her laugh, added, Please don't tell Bastion I made you cry within an hour of us getting you back. It worked. Catherine released an involuntary snort, slapping his chest. Jerk, she muttered. You know it, he agreed. Then, after a moment, added, we never really thought you would just leave. We only wanted to make sure to cover all of our bases. Catherine sniffled, nodding. I guess that makes sense. 
she acknowledged. She desperately wanted to ask after Bastion. Marcus's comment about the state he was in reminded her starkly of her dream wolf. But she was afraid of the answer she'd get if she did. So how is Sam? she asked instead. Seemed fine, as far as I could tell, though she wasn't too thrilled to learn you were keeping the fact that she was about to become anti-Sam from her. Catherine stiffened. Marcus, she exclaimed, voice just this side of shrill. You told them? Yep, he confirmed, sounding amused. An angry flush licked at her cheeks. How could you do that? she demanded. Catherine knew it was a silly thing to be upset about, considering their current circumstances, but Marcus didn't have to sound so irritatingly proud of himself for informing her family of her condition. For his part, Marcus frowned when it became apparent she really was distraught. I'm sorry, all right? I slipped up when I was talking to your mom. She's something else. Oh, God, Catherine muttered, covering her eyes. She could only imagine Elaine's response to Marcus, of all people, telling her that she was about to become a grandma. That was my reaction to talking to the woman. Who are you? I thought Bastion was the name of Catherine's boyfriend, he mocked in a high-pitched voice. She hasn't gotten herself caught up in some depraved sort of orgy, has she? Is she on drugs? Catherine was horrified. And you decided to add that I was pregnant to the conversation? she asked incredulously. It was more of an interrogation, Marcus pointed out. And like I said, it was an accident. Apparently you haven't called her in a while, he said, raising his eyebrows. Catherine winced. She had been putting off calling her parents before she was kidnapped, because she didn't know how to tell them she was pregnant. Luckily, for her, Marcus had now taken care of that. Anyway, your mom was accusing me of purposefully keeping you from the phone, convinced that you had been manipulated into joining some kind of sexual cult or something like that, anyhow. Her tangents are hard to understand when she gets going. That's when I said something along the lines of, Hey, don't take your pissiness out on me, lady. I'm not the one who knocked your daughter up. Catherine gaped. Marcus? What? I was flustered. Anyway, the news must have given her a mini heart attack, because the next thing I know, she hands off the phone to your sister, who casually informs me she's going to chop off my dick and make me eat it. Catherine blinked. Apparently, she also knows about a dozen different places to hide a dead body. The man sounded strangely admiring. Why was she threatening to kill you? Catherine asked. She was a bit perturbed by the seemingly protective reaction. She didn't have a bad relationship with her sister, so much as a stilted one. And it hadn't exactly improved since Sam's ex-husband had tried to force himself on her, either. I'm sure she heard your mother hysterically going on about an orgy-filled sexual cult and that you were pregnant and put two and two together and got forty-seven. Anyway, by the time I had managed to clear up that I wasn't your baby daddy, and that your mother's imaginary scenarios were just that, imaginary, she was insisting you come home. He frowned. That's when I had to explain the reason I was calling in the first place. I told them that you had disappeared. They were upset, of course, but didn't quite understand the urgency of the situation. You had run away from home, from them, before, after all, and were just fine. Marcus shrugged. So, with Bastion's permission, I told them about werewolves. Catherine's eyes widened. You did what? Every time she thought she got her footing in her conversation with Marcus, he ripped the rug out from under her. Marcus snorted. Don't act like you didn't already tell your dad. He shrugged. Anyway, they didn't believe me. Not until your dad got home to confirm, anyhow. They made me wait on the line for over an hour. Catherine pressed her lips together. Of course, Marcus would focus on that, of all things. How'd they take it? Surprisingly well compared to the pregnancy announcement, though I think that Sam specifically is still skeptical. Either way, they made it clear that they plan to move to Haven Falls as soon as possible. Catherine stiffened. There were some non-werewolves in Haven Falls, of course, but it wasn't like they had much choice in their living arrangements. They were family members of changed wolves, and their knowledge of the supernatural made it too much of a liability to let them stay elsewhere. What? But why would they—I mean, 
I can't ask them to do that. Marcus frowned. Catherine, you didn't ask them, though maybe you should have to begin with. You can't make other people's decisions for them, Princess, even when you think they'll make the wrong ones on their own. Your family loves you and has apparently decided that any sacrifice they have to make to live in Haven Falls is worth it to have you in their lives. Catherine played with the cuffs of her overly long coat sleeves at the gentle reprimand. It was weird hearing Marcus, of all people, spouting wisdom at her. You're right, I guess, she acknowledged. But I still don't understand why you had to be the one to tell them all this. Why not someone more sensitive? Like Sophie or Caleb. Or better yet, why hadn't Bastion, who they already knew of, at least, done it? Catherine chewed on her bottom lip, once again questioning the man's state of mind at the time. I can be sensitive, Marcus argued, ignorant of her inner dialogue and taking faux offense at the comment. Catherine rolled her eyes. Right. As soon as the sarcastic word escaped her mouth, another contraction hit. Catherine released an involuntary cry, looping her arms around Marcus's neck and digging her nails into his skin as the pain in her lower belly increased to nearly unbearable levels. Shh, you're okay, Marcus muttered into her hair. We're almost there. Just relax. As the pain slowly tapered off, she was tempted to tell him to just relax. Isn't there any good news you can tell me, she said instead. Surely you can think of something that will distract me, but not, you know, make me want to stab someone. Marcus was quiet for an extended period, and if she wasn't so sore, Catherine would have offered a sardonic laugh at the fact that it took him so long to think of something good that had happened since she'd been taken. The pregnant lady, he blurted after nearly two minutes had passed. Catherine's brow scrunched in confusion. The last she had checked, she was the only pregnant lady around. What? she asked. The lady you picked at that silly baby shower game you women like to play, he explained, and she could only assume Sophie had told him about the event. Apparently she's expecting. Catherine raised her eyebrows in disbelief. Really? Yeah. Naturally, everyone's happiness at the news was muted, considering your disappearance, but there's that. He smirked. Of course, now the entire town is just that much more convinced you're some sort of fertility goddess. Catherine groaned. Great, she deadpanned, then stiffened when another contraction shot through her belly. She held her breath, taken off guard by how fast it had come on. Only three minutes had passed since the last one, and struggled not to whimper through it. As the pain once again eased, Catherine found herself grateful for the unspoken agreement she had with Marcus that he wouldn't say anything about the pathetic noises she made in the midst of a contraction if she refrained from commenting on his violent shivering or the permanent goosebumps on his arms. She prayed for both their sakes that they would reach this mysterious cabin soon. Marcus let her recover before picking up the conversation where they'd left it off. That lady, Charlotte, I think her name is, isn't the only one newly pregnant, either. Rip's mate, Priscilla, found out she was expecting the day after you disappeared. A flicker of delight warmed Catherine at the news, followed almost immediately by concern. She was happy enough for Priscilla, but with a mate like Rip, well... Really? That's... great? Marcus snorted at the blatant uncertainty in her voice. You'd be the only person who thinks so. That idiot isn't fit to raise anyone. It was clear enough that he was talking about Rip. Catherine often forgot that, in blood, at least, Marcus and Rip were brothers. I guess it hardly matters, though. Bastion banished them. Catherine blinked at the offhanded statement. What? Well, he banished Rip, Marcus clarified. But Priscilla chose to leave with him. Catherine shook her head in dismay. Why would she— Marcus's stern expression stopped her question in its tracks. Remember what I said about letting people make their own choices, good or bad? Catherine frowned but swallowed her displeasure. Your dad allowed this? she asked instead. Catherine vividly recalled the man defending Rip when he'd cornered her in the girls' locker room over a year ago. Marcus snorted. 
Not even he approves of his son threatening the head Alpha's pregnant mate. Catherine bit her bottom lip. Bastion knows that he threatened me? Marcus rolled his eyes. Of course he knows. You don't think that Zane told him about it as soon as it became clear that you were missing? When we couldn't find you, he was the first person Bastion confronted. Why do you think he banished Rip in the first place? Marcus shook his head. And he didn't just exile him to the outskirts of town like he did your little friend Melanie. He did what he should have done back then and made it clear that Rip isn't welcome within a ten-mile radius of the town, and in particular, you. He paused. Of course, this was after he beat him to a bloody pulp. The muscle in the man's jaw twitched. Bastion nearly killed him, Catherine. If not for his werewolf-enhanced healing, I'm almost certain that Rip would have died. Catherine didn't exactly feel bad for Rip, but her worry for Bastion's mental state tripled at the news he had lost control like that. Despite his animalistic nature, Bastion was one of the most controlled people Catherine knew. How is he? she asked quietly, the question nearly lost in the wind, as she finally worked up the nerve to ask the thing she desperately wanted to know and didn't want to know at the same time. It was obvious enough, of course, that she was asking after Bastion, and not Rip. Marcus winced. Not good, princess. He didn't immediately elaborate, and Catherine recognized that he was giving her the option of retracting the question. He would shield her from the answer if she wanted. She knew that was exactly what Bastion would do, but to Catherine, not knowing was worse. She inhaled through her nose. Tell me. Marcus sighed, like he had already figured that would be her response. The only word I can think of to accurately describe his actions these past weeks, he explained carefully, is rabid. If I didn't already know him before you were taken, I would think he was out of his damn mind. It's almost like his inner wolf has taken over, even when he's physically in his human form. He paused a moment letting that information sink in. When we first knew for certain that you were gone, he was wild in his rage. He disappeared into the woods for hours, just howling. When he came back, he was covered in blood. No one even dared to ask him about the poor animals he'd slain. Marcus's mouth hardened in a stiff, straight line. I won't lie to you, the first week was rough. He's been in marginally better control of himself since we discovered where you had likely been taken, but he only eats what Sophie manages to force down his throat, and I literally don't think I've seen him sleep since you've been kidnapped. He's committed himself so wholly to finding you. For once, Catherine appreciated Marcus's bluntness, but that didn't mean tears didn't wet her eyes at his description of Bastion. You think he'll be okay when he sees me? she asked through the tears she could feel burning in the back of her nose and throat. You don't really think his wolf is permanently in control, do you? Marcus's eyes softened at her obvious concern. I have a feeling that as soon as he sees that you're safe, he'll revert back to his usual overprotective, overbearing, smothering you in love, non-rabid self. Just don't expect to be let out of his sight in the next decade. Hell, don't expect to be let out of my sight. Before Catherine could mutter an obligatory protest to that, another contraction gripped her belly. Marcus, she choked, clinging desperately to him as she was enveloped in pain. It's okay. You're okay. I've got you. I think the cabin is just past this underbrush. Zane, who'd been quietly leading the way until then, yipped in agreement. Thank God. Catherine sniffled as she recovered from the intense contraction. She didn't think she could stand to hear any more about Bastion just then. How did you guys find me? she asked tiredly. Marcus readjusted his grip on her. Luther found those books you ordered near Melanie's cottage, he explained. He realized he hadn't seen her in a while, since around the same time you'd disappeared, and went to go check on her. When he found the books in the snow, he immediately took them to Bastion. Marcus winced. When we went to investigate, we found some of your blood splattered near the doorframe. Catherine nodded thoughtfully. They hit me on the head. 
Marcus's jaw clenched at the revelation, but he refrained from comment. We inspected every inch of the cottage after that, but the only other clue we could find about what might have happened was a strange scent that didn't belong to either you or Melanie clinging to the little house. That, along with Luther's reminder that there had been suspicious footprints in that area for months, confirmed what we'd already suspected. Someone had snatched you. Lucas, Catherine agreed. Marcus tensed. Is that the name of the bastard who did that to your hand? It was the first time either Zane or Marcus had brought up the angry burn, at least in person, and Catherine stiffened before ultimately shaking her head no. When she didn't elaborate, Marcus sighed. Anyway, since the Western colony was the closest civilized— Catherine snorted at that particular descriptor— assemblage of wolves in the area, Bastion sent two alphas to find out if anyone had recently disappeared from there as well. Imagine their surprise when they spotted Melanie snuggling up to a man near a bonfire on the edge of the colony. Marcus shook his head in disgust. No one was sure right away if Melanie had been kidnapped, too, or if she was just an accomplice in the scheme to grab you. Apparently, what they saw was proof enough that she was there willingly. More importantly, though, her presence was a good indication that you were somewhere in the Western Colony's camp as well. Catherine pursed her lips. Yeah, Gerard's hut. Marcus eyed her. Is that the bastard's name? Catherine still didn't want to talk about it, but she also didn't want to lie, so she compromised by nodding wearily against his chest. Anyway, Marcus continued, when it became clear she wasn't going to explain. They managed to leave the camp unnoticed. Melanie and her beau were quite occupied. Catherine could only imagine how occupied they were, considering the way they had gone at it in front of her at the motel. As soon as they returned to Haven Falls and Bastion heard their report, he gathered up the most able-bodied alphas and betas of Haven Falls, only leaving a few behind to protect the town, and took off. We've been scouting out the area the past few days. We set up a camp in one of the abandoned cabins we came across along our way and made the decision to attack the Western Colony this morning after the full moon. It was utter hell keeping Bastion from invading on his own last night as soon as he turned, but somehow we managed. And now— Marcus paused, offering her a grim smile. Here we are. It was quite the story. Here we are, Catherine agreed, just as a tiny lodge came into view through the trees. And now we're here, finally— Catherine couldn't even begin to feel true relief, though, because mere seconds after they came upon the cabin, another contraction took hold of her. Catherine grit her teeth, but a strangled sort of scream still managed to crawl up her throat and escape. She fought to keep breathing as her entire belly spasmed. Zane, I don't know how much more of this she can take, she heard Marcus say through the haze of pain. It was the first time she'd heard even a hint of panic in his voice since she had announced her water had broken. She knew he had probably been quietly freaking out the entire time. She certainly was, but trying to hide it from her so as not to set off her own panic. Catherine wanted to tell him that it was far too late for that. Zane quickly transformed back into his human form and was jiggling the cabin's door handle as her contraction eased and she came back to her surroundings. It's locked, he announced tightly before unceremoniously ramming his shoulder into the slab of wood and breaking it off its hinges. Both men, with Catherine still cradled in Marcus's arms, hurried inside. There was no running heat or electricity, of course, but it was still much warmer in the tightly sealed cabin. It had been tightly sealed before Zane had broken down the door, anyway, then outside. It was dark and dusty, but Catherine could still make out sparsely decorated walls and lumps of furniture covered by sheets. Judging by the dirt that had accumulated on the once white cotton fabric, she didn't think anyone had stayed there in a long time. There was only one level of the dwelling to explore, and Zane made fast work of it, ducking his head into one room and then another, before finally peeking into a third room and calling out to Marcus, Come lay her down in here. Marcus hurried to obey, following Zane into what looked like it used to be a bedroom. The small ten-by-ten-foot space was empty save for an old ratty mattress laying on the floor, protected by a singular dingy sheet. 
It wasn't even resting on a box spring. Catherine was in no state to complain, however, and merely curled up on her side, clutching her knees as close to her chest as possible when Marcus set her down. Catherine could practically feel the man's sense of helplessness as he stared down at her, clenching and unclenching his hands uselessly at his sides as he stood at the side of the bed. Zane must have sensed his uncharacteristic restlessness because he jerked his head towards the door. Go see if you can find some candles and something to light them with. Marcus didn't need to be told twice. He practically ran from the room, presumably to do as Zane had instructed. It was strange seeing him so eager to take orders, but Catherine didn't have time to be properly amused by it, for as soon as he left the room, another contraction gripped her. Gabriella, she managed to stutter amid the pain, her arms wrapped tightly around her belly. Uh, aren't you going to go get her? Zane grimaced, an apology written so clearly on his face that he may as well have markered the word sorry across his forehead in big block letters. He kneeled near the mattress. I don't think there's time for that. Catherine's already overworked heart leapt into her throat as her inner panic intensified. But you said you'd go get her, she argued. She could hear the beginnings of hysteria creeping into her voice, but was unable to do anything about it. Hey, look at me, Zane ordered firmly, reaching out with gentle hands and grasping her by either side of her face. I won't let anything bad happen to you, all right? I may not be Gabriella, but I know enough about human anatomy to get you through this. Catherine stared at him for a long time before finally quipping in a wobbly voice. I guess all that reading really does pay off. Zane offered her a tiny smirk at the comment, but his expression was void of any real amusement. Of course, it does. Catherine took a deep breath, nodding. Okay. Okay. It wasn't like she actually had a choice in the matter. After all, the baby was going to come whether it was Gabriella, Zane, or nobody at all helping her through labor. At that moment, Marcus rushed back into the room, his arms overflowing with supplies he'd apparently found around the cabin. Here, he said, throwing a dusty pair of jeans and an oversized plaid button-up shirt at Zane. I found these stashed away in a closet. Marcus had already dressed himself in similar dregs, and as Zane pulled the jeans up his legs and shoved his arms into the sleeves of the shirt, Catherine couldn't help but think they looked like a pair of rugged lumberjacks or maybe even hillbillies. She would have appreciated the comical sight more if she wasn't in so much discomfort. I also found this, Marcus said, throwing a frayed blanket over Catherine's huddled form. And there weren't any candles, but there was a flashlight in the back of a kitchen drawer. He turned it on and set it on the floor near Zane. It didn't offer a lot of extra lighting, but it was better than nothing. That's fine, Zane said. Did you happen to see any shoes with the clothes? Some boots with laces, maybe? I'm going to need some string and something sharp, like a pair of scissors or a knife. Catherine stiffened. What do you need that stuff for? She demanded. He was supposed to be helping her give birth, not doing arts and crafts. I need something to tie off and sever the umbilical cord with when the baby comes out, he explained patiently. When it comes out... If only it was as easy as he made it sound. Marcus left to go hunt down the object Zane requested. I'm going to need you to lay on your back, Zane told her. She didn't want to, like she instinctively knew it would make the pain worse, but she allowed him to roll her over anyway. He pushed the blanket Marcus had found for her up to her waist. I'm going to take these off, okay? He said, grabbing for the clasp of her jeans. His clumsy fingers couldn't help but remind Catherine of Gerard's forceful ones, and she shoved his hands away. Zane froze, a concerned frown tugging at his mouth and a hint of suspicion lurking in his eyes. It was like he knew. Just let me, Catherine insisted, and began to peel off her pants along with her underwear. They were stuck around her knees for a minute when a contraction hit and she had to take a break, but she managed. Zane had just covered her back up with the blanket when Marcus returned with a shoelace and serrated steak knife in his hands. This was her life. I don't think I can do this, she said in a small, tinny voice she barely recognized. Of course you can, 
Zane assured calmly. Women have been doing this since the beginning of time. Catherine knew that Zane meant for the logic to be comforting, but the comment only made her want to strangle him, especially when another contraction hit. Catherine fought back a scream. She was breathing hard by the time it finally ended. She could feel pieces of her hair sticking to the beads of sweat that had formed on her forehead despite the fact that the cabin was a cool forty degrees. As a matter of fact, her entire body felt incredibly warm. Marcus must have noticed the flush on her cheeks, because he kneeled and pressed the back of his hand to her forehead. "'She's burning up,' he informed Zane bluntly. "'It's normal,' Zane assured. "'Her body's gearing up to give birth. Temperature fluctuations are expected. Catherine, do you want your coat off?' She nodded jerkily, and Marcus helped her unzip it and get her arms out of the sleeves just in time for another contraction to hit. "'Something's happening,' She choked as an unbearable pressure in her lower back and belly suddenly demanded that she bear down. What? Zane demanded. What's happening? I, I think I've got to, to push, she croaked, snatching Marcus's hand without permission and squeezing so hard that she could feel his bones grind together. Marcus didn't dare complain. Zane pushed the blanket back up to her waist. Okay, Catherine, to open the birth canal as much as possible. I'm going to need you to grab your knees and pull your legs up to your chest, okay? Catherine obeyed, releasing Marcus's hand to clutch her left leg by the back of the knee. She hesitated, however, to use her injured right hand to do anything. Zane immediately picked up on her dilemma. Help her, Marcus, he barked. The man looked slightly nauseous, but immediately obliged, looping his arm around the back of her right knee. She was in so much pain she didn't even care that they were looking directly into the most private part of her body. Nothing was private about giving birth. Catherine could feel another contraction coming on, and she fought not to tense. Take a deep breath, Zane instructed calmly. And when the urge to push comes, bear down as hard as you can, okay? Catherine nodded. And when the contraction came, that's just what she did. She didn't even get a chance to catch her breath before another one came. And another. And another. Harder, Catherine. Come on. It continued like that, painful contractions hitting her over and over again, barely a minute between each one, for well over a half hour. She couldn't get a proper break to even breathe, and another ten minutes into it, she was a sobbing mess, covered in sweat and tears. Push, Catherine. Zane ordered for the umpteenth time. I can't, she cried, even as her body demanded that she bear down. She was so tired, and everything hurt. She finally understood what her great-aunt Minnie had meant by ring of fire. The contraction passed after a minute, and still there was no baby to show for it. I can't do this, Catherine sniffled, no longer caring how pathetic she sounded. Any attempt to tough it out and not let anyone on to how much she was hurting had gone out the window twenty contractions ago. This baby is never going to come out. It's stuck and I'm going to die like this. It wasn't the first time she'd expressed such a sentiment in the past half hour, but Marcus must have finally had enough of her dramatics because he grabbed her firmly by the chin, forcing her to look at him. You survived us. You survived multiple attempts on your life from werewolves and hunters alike. Hell. You were kidnapped and held hostage for weeks while that sick asshole Gerard did who knows what to you. You're covered in bruises, and for God's sake, look at your hand. Marcus clenched his jaw, the muscle in his cheek twitching as he was forced to take in his own words. But you're still alive, aren't you? He pointed out a moment later. You're tougher than all of us, and you're going to let this defeat you? The next time a contraction comes, you're going to push until you physically can't anymore, and then you're going to push harder still. Got it? Catherine squeezed her eyes shut, but nodded. Okay. She didn't get a chance to ready herself, though, because a second later, another contraction rocked her body. Push, Zane ordered. Catherine grit her teeth, and then she screamed. Everything hurt as she strained to somehow get her baby out of her. 
She already felt stretched beyond natural limits when she felt a strange tugging sensation down there. Something was happening. Is that the head? she heard Marcus ask through the thick layer of pain that blanketed her. He sounded queasy. Keep pushing, Catherine, Zane ordered loudly, ignoring Marcus altogether. Don't you dare stop now. Catherine's lungs burned for oxygen, and her entire body was shaking as she somehow kept it taut. She pushed with all her might, and then... Sweet relief. With a wet sort of plop, the pressure, stretching, pain, everything was gone. A baby's cry reached her ears, and all at once it was like her body told her she could relax. She allowed herself to flop against the mattress. As much as she wanted to see her baby right that second, she didn't think she had the strength to even lift her head. She allowed herself to close her eyes, just for a moment. Marcus, she heard Zane's voice buzz in her ears. Hand me that string. Now the scissors. Catherine forced her eyes back open, giving Zane a second to clip the umbilical cord before asking, Is he okay? Instead of answering, Zane carefully laid the tiny human in his hands on her chest. Catherine, acting purely on instinct, wrapped her arms around him. She looks fine, Zane said, a dopey sort of grin on his face that spoke of his inner awe. Catherine blinked owlishly. It's a girl? she asked, dumbfounded for a moment as she stared down at her baby. Although she and Bastion had never found out the gender of their unborn child, for some reason she had always just assumed it was a boy. Definitely a girl, he confirmed. Once the surprise wore off, an unimaginable sort of pride and a kind of love Catherine didn't even know existed swelled in her chest. She couldn't tear her eyes away from the awkward-looking, wrinkly, perfect being in her arms. The baby was covered in a thin coating of blood, mucus, and whatever else, but somehow she was still the most beautiful thing Catherine had ever seen. She was also awake and looking up at Catherine with startlingly blue eyes. She knew from her biology class at her old high school that all babies started life with blue eyes, but Catherine knew intrinsically that those particular ones were bastions. "'You did it, princess,' Marcus said, sounding impressed as he, too, stared down at the tiny baby. Catherine sniffled. She couldn't deny it. "'Yeah.' A pause. "'I don't suppose that Marcella is still on the table for potential names.' Catherine choked on a laugh, flying high on a hormone-charged chemical imbalance as she stared at her new baby's sweet face. I was thinking Margaret, actually, after Bastion's mother. Margaret rose. She bit her lip, feeling suddenly self-conscious about the choice. She and Bastion had never really discussed names, after all. They'd thought they had more time. Do you think Bastion will like it? With a calloused hand, Marcus smoothed back a piece of hair that was sticking stubbornly to her sweaty forehead. He'll love it, he assured softly. Chapter 18 As Zane subtly delivered the placenta, Catherine hardly even noticed so enraptured was she with the tiny being in her arms. Her little Maggie. Are you sure she's healthy? she asked for what had to have been the fifth time in as many minutes. She's so small. The impatient little thing had come close to a month early, too. She's got good color, Zane assured, and she's alert and trying to look around already. I don't think you have anything to worry about. Staring at the tiny girl in her arms, taking in the tuft of dark hair on her head, her perfect button nose and round cheeks— Catherine couldn't help but think she'd be worrying for the rest of her life. She couldn't wait. This is all I could find, Marcus said, returning from rummaging through the rest of the cabin in search of something to bundle the baby in. He handed Catherine a plaid button-up not unlike the one he was wearing. Catherine took it, 
carefully wrapping Maggie in the shirt so that it fit around her like a snug blanket. She even makes plaid look good, she observed offhandedly. Zane snorted. I would say you're looking at her through a mother's eyes, but she is pretty cute. Marcus smirked. I can hardly believe that Bastion helped make her. You sure you don't have something to tell us? We'll keep your secret. After all, we're bonded by the horror of the birthing experience now. Catherine rolled her eyes, but couldn't stop a hint of a smile from pulling on her lips. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who actually experienced birth, she pointed out. She only hoped she could look back on it someday and not associate the event with mind-numbing terror. Despite everything, the entire situation was so outrageous that it was almost funny, in a very, very dark way. Then a loud, fury-fueled howl pierced the air, and suddenly nothing about it was even a little bit humorous. Whatever coziness they were enjoying was sucked from the room, leaving behind nothing but cold air. Goosebumps broke out on Catherine's arms as she hugged Maggie to her bosom. Because that howl certainly didn't belong to Bastion. Catherine didn't think it belonged to anyone from Haven Falls. Dread filled her when another rapacious howl sounded, this one minutely closer to the cabin that served as their shelter than the last. We've got to go, Zane announced curtly, standing and wiping his bloody hands on the thighs of his jeans. Marcus grabbed Catherine's pants, her coat, too. Marcus seized said articles of clothing from the floor. Give Zane the baby, he ordered, pulling Catherine into a sitting position and throwing the coat over her shoulders. Before she could obey, or protest, or do or say anything, really, yet another howl reverberated through the air, this one even closer. Catherine stared down at the little girl she was clutching tightly to her chest, knowing already what she had to do. She took a deep breath. No. No? Marcus repeated, sounding a cross between annoyed and incredulous. Catherine, we don't have time for this. Come on. I can barely walk, Marcus, she exploded in return. Even if one of you carries me, we'll never get away in time. Besides, Catherine paused, swallowing. He only wants me. She already knew deep in her bones that the howl belonged to Gerard. He'd discovered she was gone, and now he was coming for her. She knew it wouldn't be hard to track her scent, either, especially not once he reached the spot in the woods where her water had broken. The very thought of him finding her made Catherine want to puke. What are you saying? Zane demanded, but judging by his furrowed brow, he already knew. Catherine licked her lips. I'm saying that it only makes sense for you to leave me behind. Both the men standing over her erupted into an explosion of activity at her words. Are you crazy, woman? Marcus demanded, throwing his hands in the air. We just got you back. After all of this, Zane said, gesturing vaguely around the room with his hands. Do you really think that leaving you behind is a viable option for us? That we would just let you fall back into the arms of whatever sadist did this to you? How much blood have you lost? Marcus asked in disbelief, then turned and redirected the question at Zane. Has she lost a lot of blood? That's the only explanation I can think of for— Stop, Catherine insisted, but it was like they didn't hear her. This insanity— I mean, Christ, Marcus continued, turning and getting in her face. Do you want this Gerard person to find you? Tears sprang into Catherine's eyes at the tasteless remark. Enough, she yelled projecting her voice so that it was loud enough to be heard over their affronted rambling. Just stop, she reiterated. You guys don't get it. Of course I don't want to wind up back with Gerard, she directed this comment at Marcus. I would never ask you guys to leave me behind without good reason. Zane's eyebrows shot up. Well, he demanded. I'm waiting to hear this supposedly good reason. Maggie, Catherine interjected sharply. Zane shut his mouth with an audible snap. He and Marcus stared at her. What about her? The latter hedged. All three of them shifted their attention to the baby snuggled up to Catherine's chest, chewing innocently on her tiny fist. 
We have to protect her, Catherine said softly, running a finger down the gentle slope of her nose. First and foremost, that's what we have to do. Protect her. When neither Marcus nor Zane objected to the sentiment, Catherine forced herself to drag her eyes away from the baby in her arms and back up at the two men staring down at her. As far as I can see, the only way to do that is if you guys take her and go. Run as fast and as far away from here as you can. As long as I'm not with you, D Gerard, she stumbled on his name, won't follow. Even as she said it, instincts that she didn't even know she had screamed at her not to let go of her baby. Her arms felt rigid, locked around the little being resting on her chest. Please, she choked, when neither man made a move to take Maggie from her. For me. With that, she finally managed to force her stiff arms to move, peeling the baby off her chest, and after pressing a single, chaste kiss to her forehead, Catherine thrust her newborn at Zane, who stood there, looking frozen in indecision. He didn't immediately take the baby. Instead, he glanced at Marcus over Catherine's head. The two men must have communicated something with their eyes because a moment later, when Zane ripped his gaze away from him, he looked resolved. Catherine didn't know if it was the suddenly determined set of his shoulders or the stubborn line of his jaw, but she knew Maggie was in safe hands when he sat gingerly on the bed and carefully scooped her out of Catherine's arms. Okay, okay, you win. Relief and grief battled within Catherine as she took in the sight of her child in Zane's arms. She offered him a jerky nod of acknowledgement. Thank you. As soon as Zane stood, the baby started fussing. It's okay, he said, attempting to soothe her. I won't let anything bad happen to you. Then he looked at Catherine with serious eyes, like he was trying to assure her with them that he knew precisely how sacred the task he was being entrusted with was. I'll protect her with my life, he promised her quietly. Catherine nodded stiffly. I know, she sniffled. Now go! Zane carefully tucked the baby inside of his shirt, most likely to provide her with some extra protection from the elements, and then he turned looked once more at Marcus and Catherine over his shoulder, and ran. Catherine watched as her newborn daughter disappeared from her life just as quickly as she'd come into it. Goodbye, sweet girl, she whispered softly to no one. I love you. She desperately wanted to break down and cry, but Catherine found it impossible to let herself go when Marcus remained, standing there stupidly her pants still in his hands. "'What are you waiting for?' she snapped. "'Go with Zane! Get out of here while you still can!' Marcus snorted, crossing his arms over his chest like he was unimpressed by her outburst. "'You didn't think I would really leave you behind, did you, princess?' He didn't wait for an answer, kneeling and taking her forcefully by the arm before trying to shove the limb through the sleeve of her coat. "'Come on, we've got to move.' Confusion bombarded her. Why would he... he couldn't? Catherine shook her head in denial, attempting to give voice to her thoughts. Marcus, you can't... He ignored her. Are you going to put on these pants, or am I going to have to put them on for you? Catherine bristled. Marcus, you don't get it. Gerard, he'll kill you. Marcus stiffened at her sharp tone. Well, then I'll die, he exclaimed finally turning to acknowledge her. That would still be better than allowing the bastard who did this to you, he gestured crudely at her bruised form, to get you back in his possession. I'd rather die a hundred times than knowingly, willingly, allowing that to happen. He paused, making sure that that sunk in. Now, are you going to help me or not? Catherine stared the self-sacrificing idiot down trying to remind herself of the man's own words. You can't make other people's decisions for them, princess. Afraid she'd choke on the lump of gratefulness in her throat, Catherine merely nodded. Marcus handed the brunette her pants, and ignoring the blood painted on her inner thighs, she pulled them up her legs. Meanwhile, Marcus slipped the moccasin Serena had borrowed her back on her feet. Once she was dressed, 
Catherine tried to pull her sore body up into a standing position. She didn't get very far, though, before Marcus intervened, pulling her into his arms. She didn't bother to protest. She wasn't sure her wobbly legs could support her full weight anyway, merely resting her head against his shoulder. Then they exited the cabin the same way they'd entered it only a few hours before, with Catherine cradled carefully in Marcus's arms. Another of Gerard's howls pierced the air as he loomed ever nearer. We need to lead him away from Zane and the baby, Catherine reminded Marcus quietly. Seeing as Zane's tracks went south, he was likely headed in the direction of the safe house where Gabriella still awaited them. Marcus nodded and turned north. He ran, his pace much faster than the one he had adapted when he'd followed Zane to the cabin earlier that morning. Catherine imagined that the boots he had found at the cabin helped. Although it had to have been well past dawn by then, the sun remained hidden behind thick clouds, and the forest appeared appropriately ominous as Marcus dashed past tree after tree. He held her close to his chest, trying not to jostle her as he ducked under low-hanging branches and kicked up snow. Regardless, she was feeling lightheaded after only a few minutes. There was no sense in complaining, though. It wasn't like they could stop. She and Marcus were both quiet, neither acknowledging her blood-soaked pants or the intermittent howl that reverberated through the forest. The sound was growing closer and closer, and served as proof of the imminent danger that was stalking them. Dread filled Catherine's veins like lead, causing her to grow heavier with each howl that resounded through the air. An appropriate metaphor, Catherine mused, as she truly felt like dead weight in Marcus's arms. Fanciful thoughts of metaphors fled her mind, however, when Marcus stepped foot into a small clearing, and all at once three strange wolves were upon them. They were huge and mean-looking, none more so than the giant russet-colored one in the middle. He was larger than any wolf Catherine had ever seen, with paws half the size of Catherine's head and a snout that looked the length of her forearm. She didn't even have to look into his feral yellow eyes to know it was Gerard. All three wolves were crouched in threatening poses, baring their teeth and resting their weight on their haunches as they prepared to pounce. The trio surrounded them, Gerard in front, the gray wolf on the right, and the auburn-haired one on the left. Without turning his back on the wolves, Marcus took two steps backward and gingerly set Catherine down against the trunk of a tree. He pressed his nose into her hair, inhaling her scent. Catherine didn't know which of the two of them the action was intended to comfort, or if it was wholly involuntary. And then he straightened, facing the wolves slowly encroaching upon them without a flicker of fear on his face. Bring it on, motherfuckers, he dared with a reckless, broken sort of grin. Then he shifted. The other wolves were on him immediately. Marcus was prepared for them, though, and managed to buck the first, the ginger, off his back without much trouble. The gray wolf, however, managed to dig his teeth into Marcus's right shoulder. Marcus released a furious growl before using his superior strength to throw that wolf off of him as well. He was only one person, though, and slowly but surely the other two wolves began gaining the upper hand. They fell into a pattern of tag-teaming him, attacking when he was distracted by the other. Catherine could do nothing but watch helplessly from the sidelines. It was maddening. Perhaps the most infuriating thing of all, however, was the way the largest wolf, Gerard, merely sat back and let his two underlings do his bidding. It was almost a taunt, like he was saying Marcus wasn't worth his time. He wasn't even watching the fight. Instead, Gerard's eyes seemed to be fixated on her from across the clearing. As unnerving as his stare was, however, and as insulting as his actions— or inaction, rather, were, she was mostly just grateful that Gerard had yet to join the fray. Marcus didn't stand a chance against three wolves, let alone if one of them was as physically dominating as Gerard. As it was, he was starting to have a hard time holding his own against two. He was still standing, but Catherine could see blood shining where it had doused his coat. 
It was strange, the mix of guilt and gratitude she felt, watching him defend her. Catherine watched in horror as the gray wolf managed to lock his jaws around one of Marcus's front legs. Marcus dug his own teeth into the wolf's ear, and he released him with a whine, but Catherine could see that Marcus was hurt. He refused to put any weight on the paw of the injured leg, hopping awkwardly on his other one. At least until the auburn-colored wolf dug his teeth into that limb as well. Catherine sucked a breath of air in through her teeth as she watched him go down. He was able to pick himself back up, barely, but he was clearly in a lot of pain, his mobility limited as he snarled and snapped his jaws angrily, his ears flat against his skull. That, of course, was when Gerard chose to act. He stalked forward slowly, almost like he was teasing Marcus, before fast as lightning he attacked. He jumped on him, digging his claws and teeth into his back as he forced him to the ground. Marcus was valiant in his efforts to fight back, trying to buck him off, but he was already injured, and Gerard was just too strong. Gerard stood over him, slobber dripping from his sharp teeth as he bared them at Marcus in a sick parody of a grin. Tears blurred Catherine's vision as she watched, frozen in her horror. When she realized Marcus was about to die right in front of her as she sat helplessly less than fifteen feet away, she desperately tried to use the tree she was leaning on to stand. As useless as she currently was, surely she could do something. As soon as she put weight on her legs, however, and tried to take a faltering step forward on them, she felt a wet gush between her thighs before the wobbly things gave out on her. Pain shot up Catherine's right hand when she used it to help break her fall. She looked up from where she lay, sprawled across the snowy ground, just in time to watch Gerard take aim at Marcus's jugular. Please, God, no. Like a warrior angel sent down to answer her prayers, a big black blur suddenly flew in from the trees, colliding harshly with Gerard and knocking him clean off of Marcus. The blur was actually a wolf. A wolf with a recognizable dark coat and familiar blue eyes. Bastion. Disbelief. And then euphoria. Bastion! Catherine choked, unable to stop herself from addressing him. He twisted his head her way immediately, and after the longest two weeks of her life, her eyes finally connected with his. She was overwhelmed by the emotion she saw there, brimming beneath the surface of his irises. Relief, fear, anger, love. They were all pouring out at her through his eyes. Catherine could relate, particularly to the relief. Bastion was there. He was safe, at least for now. And better still, he looked relatively unharmed. The relief didn't last long, though. It was overcome by a wave of trepidation that washed over her like a tsunami as out of the corner of her eye she saw Gerard get back to his feet. As he recovered from Bastion's brutal shove, his subordinates gathered around him. Thankfully, aid arrived for Bastion a moment later in the form of two more wolves springing forth from the dark of the trees. Catherine recognized them immediately, Sophie and Caleb. She was thrilled to see that, like Bastion, they appeared to be in fairly good shape, although Caleb had a nasty-looking laceration on his side, his tawny fur slick with blood. Neither trio of wolves waited for the other to be ready before hurtling into action. Sophie took on the gray wolf while Caleb engaged the auburn-haired one. No one held back, teeth and claws ripping into tender flesh whenever opportunity arose. Catherine watched as Sophie clamped her jaw down around the gray wolf's ankle, and he released an agonizing howl. Caleb was having a harder time with the ginger wolf, but Marcus, injured as he was, managed to get up to help him. Meanwhile, in the eye of the chaos, Gerard and Bastion circled each other, taking the time to size each other up before making any sudden movements. Not wanting to distract Bastion, or any of her packmates for that matter, Catherine didn't call out to him again. She pushed herself back up into a sitting position, 
ignoring the sensation of more blood trickling down her legs. Her stomach churned, and she felt woozy as she glanced down at the blossoming red stain in the snow beneath her. She tore her eyes away from it, concentrating instead on the battle waging in front of her. She looked up just in time to see Bastion leap at Gerard. Gerard copied the action, and the two huge wolves clashed in midair. Their teeth were bared as they violently snapped their powerful jaws at each other, trying to dig their teeth into the other wherever they could. Their claws were out, too, and they brutally slashed them at each other, trying to inflict as much hurt as possible. Catherine watched the frenzied fight with her heart stuck in her throat. The jackhammering organ sunk to the bottom of her stomach, however, when Gerard suddenly managed to slice his claws into the thin skin of Bastion's snout, and Bastion was forced to take two staggering steps backward, jerking his head back and forth as he tried to shake off the blow. Catherine's heart was beginning to calm. Bastion seemed more annoyed by the injury than anything. When Gerard shocked everyone by unexpectedly transforming into his human form at the center of the battlefield, for lack of a better term. Even the other wolves engaged in their own skirmishes around him paused in their confusion. Gerard reveled in the attention. You must be Bastion, he drawled, addressing Bastion with a lewd sort of grin. Bastion, understandably confused by Gerard's decision to shift into his weaker form in the middle of a fight, held back from mindlessly attacking him, undoubtedly suspicious that it was some sort of trap. I had wondered about the man who looked after pretty little Catherine before she came to be in my care. Catherine snorted at the word care. Almost as if he'd heard her, Gerard's eyes shifted her way. Catherine stiffened under their scrutiny. Thankfully, a furious snarl had Gerard redirecting his gaze back at Bastion. I was curious what sort of man had the patience to deal with her near-constant defiance, he continued. Catherine felt sick when his grin widened, and she knew what was about to come out of his mouth before he even reopened it. Don't worry. I beat that rebellious streak right out of her for you. Bastion's growling increased in intensity. Then I stuck her like a pig, Gerard spat. She squealed like one, too. Then, lowering his voice, like he was telling Bastion some sort of dirty secret, he added, I think she liked it. Bastion's growling had transformed into an all-out roar by then, and Catherine felt her nausea increase. She didn't understand why Gerard was trying to goad Bastion into attacking him when he was in his weaker form, but she knew that whatever he had planned, it couldn't be good. "'That's not true, Bastion!' Catherine yelled from where she sat in the snow. "'Don't listen to him! He's just trying to mess with your head!' But Catherine could tell Bastion was well past the point of being able to hear her, so caught up was he in his overpowering rage. His eyes were pitch black. Let me see the man behind the wolf, Gerard continued to taunt. Wouldn't it be so much more satisfying to beat me with your fists? And suddenly, Catherine knew exactly what Gerard was doing. The man could shift on a dime, after all. His human and wolf were so intertwined. He could even perform a partial shift. She remembered vividly the way his nails had elongated into claws when he had slashed at Lucas for damaging his property. The way they'd done the same thing when he'd ripped out the throat of the man who had tried to help himself to Catherine. A jolt of terror shot down her spine and became all-encompassing as Catherine realized that was exactly what Gerard had intended for Bastion. Bastion, no! she shouted but it was already too late. Where a monstrous black wolf once stood, human bastion appeared. Dirt clung to his sculpted chest, and his hands were clenched into fists at his sides. Wisps of hair hung into his face over dark, wild eyes. Gerard didn't seem intimidated in the least. Why would he be? He was taller, stronger, crazier than bastion ever could be. His eyes glided back over to Catherine. Good thing he's handsome, he teased, because he's not too bright. 
Don't look at her, Bastion snarled, his voice booming across the clearing. Gerard smirked, taking a step in Bastion's direction. Why ever not? he asked, voice dripping in derision. After all, I want to see the light leave her eyes as she watches you die for your stupidity. Then Gerard rushed him. Catherine didn't know if he was moving so fast that he was just a blur or if her vision was beginning to waver. Either way, Gerard was upon Bastion in seconds. His extended claws glinted in the scarce morning light as he pulled his disfigured hand back behind his head, ready to strike. Catherine wanted to scream, but the sound got stuck somewhere on its way out, and she was slowly suffocating on her own fear. But Gerard's deadly blow never landed. For a moment, Catherine had trouble believing what she was seeing. Maybe she'd fainted from blood loss, and it was all just a strange dream. Gerard's claws didn't connect with Bastion's flesh, because Bastion had lashed out with his own partially transformed hand, wrapping his own claws around Gerard's throat and sinking his own sharp talons deep into the man's neck. Blood was already leaking from the puncture wounds. Gerard only had time to release a sort of shocked, garbled noise before, with one savage yank, Bastion ripped his throat out. Everyone watched in disbelief as the man's knees gave out from under him, and he collapsed. Gerard was dead before he hit the ground. Catherine stared at his still form, lying in the snow. He'd fallen face down, and she was grateful she didn't have to see what was undoubtedly a gaping, gory injury. As the violent act replayed itself over in her mind— Catherine vaguely recalled Marcus's words about Bastion's wolf being in control since she was taken nearly two weeks ago. She wondered if that was what had allowed him to partially shift. As she watched Gerard's two battered sidekicks surrender at the downfall of their leader, it occurred to her that she should be happy. Gerard was dead. And even more thrilling, her reunion with Bastion was nigh. But quite suddenly... Catherine felt like she was feeling everything through a filter. She was there, but she wasn't. It was as if Bastion's victory, the knowledge that he would be okay, triggered the bone-deep exhaustion she'd been quietly battling for days to surface. She was completely spent. Numb. Even as her surroundings began to grow hazy. She was oblivious to the crimson-stained snow beneath her steadfastly growing darker. Feeling the familiar warmth of Bastion's gaze on her, Catherine turned towards him. His worried eyes, the same striking blue that he unknowingly shared with his daughter, were the last things she saw before the blackness slowly infringing upon the edges of her vision finally pulled her all the way under. Chapter 19 Catherine swayed in a dark sea of unconsciousness, only occasionally coming up for air. There were glimpses of distorted awareness. Bastion hugging her limp body to his chest, wailing, screaming his displeasure to the unfeeling, unyielding forest. Warm kisses pressed to her cold lips as gentle hands smoothed back her hair. Her body wasn't under any command of her own. Consciousness would come and go, but even when awareness tugged at her and she was able to break the surface of oblivion, she could only pick up on vague impressions of moments. A tense conversation. She's stable, but her blood pressure is still extremely low. She's lost a lot of blood. What happened? It's called postpartum hemorrhaging. It's rare, but can happen for a variety of reasons. In this case, it looks like Catherine's placenta didn't totally separate from her uterine wall, making it impossible for the uterus to contract all the way. Because it couldn't contract, the blood vessels inside of the organ continued to bleed after she gave birth. Luckily, when you brought her to me, I massaged her belly and was able to force the piece of placenta out and stop the excess bleeding. So she'll be okay. A pause. It's impossible to say for sure... The blood loss is concerning. It's what triggered the other issues, 
low blood pressure and a racing pulse, and in turn caused her to faint. Give her mine. Another pause. Your what? My blood. A sigh. I don't have the equipment to perform a procedure like that. Besides, who knows if your blood types are even compatible? We'll do something. Labored breathing. That's your job, isn't it? To make her better. I'm afraid that the only person who can make Catherine better is Catherine. Until her blood supply replenishes itself. Then she was pulled back under. Declarations of love whispered in her ear as Bastion begged, beseeched her to stay with him. Please don't leave me, sweetheart. I'm sorry it took me so long to find you. Why don't you open those pretty eyes of yours so I can properly plead for forgiveness? I love you so much. You're so strong, the strongest person I know. I could never live without you. I need you, Catherine. Wake up. Please. Then more blackness. As much as Bastion's pleas pulled at her heartstrings, whatever part of Catherine that oversaw her healing remained unmoved and insisted on keeping her immersed in the thick fog of unconsciousness while her battered body recovered. It wasn't until an undeterminable amount of time later that true cognizance beckoned her. As it flooded her body, Catherine knew almost immediately that this time was different. She was actually there, not just some removed, barely sentient being, numbly eavesdropping on a scene of what seemed like someone else's life. Her feelings were not only alive and well, buzzing beneath her skin, they were somehow amplified. Her entire body ached. Her head felt like it was stuffed with cotton, and her pelvis and the space between her legs were especially sore. Somehow she managed to crack open her eyes despite the fact that it felt like weights were attached to the lids. Speaking of weights, there was a solid one lying on her stomach. Glancing down, Catherine took in the slumped form of Bastion. He was sleeping, his head resting on her belly. Catherine was nearly overcome by the rush of affection that enveloped her as she drank in the sight of him. His face was relaxed, a stark difference from the last time she'd seen it, expression contorted with worry and the remnants of rage still present in his eyes. Even in sleep, though, Catherine could tell he wasn't completely at ease. There was a little wrinkle of worry etched on his brow— and she couldn't resist the urge to gently flatten it with her thumb. Her fingers danced across his face as she refamiliarized herself with the stubborn angle of his jaw and the slope of his regal nose. She buried them in his thick mop of dark hair. She didn't ever want to stop touching him, or even looking at him. Eventually, though, she managed to pry her eyes away from his face to glance around the familiar room she'd awakened in. It was the bedroom she shared with Bastion in Haven Falls, and everything was exactly as she remembered it. Except, of course, for the intricate cradle Bastion had made specifically for the baby lying in shambles on the hardwood floor. The baby. Maggie. A jolt of realization shot through Catherine, followed swiftly by fear. Bastion, she croaked, her voice hoarse from lack of use. Pushing herself up into a sitting position, she used her good hand to give his shoulder a little shake. Bastion, wake up! Bastion's eyes fluttered open, his blue orbs glazed over in confusion before they suddenly cleared. Catherine, he whispered, shock evident in his voice, and then louder and absolutely saturated in relief. Catherine! He pulled her to him, burying his head into the crook of her neck. He pressed a kiss to the hollow of her throat and dug his nose into the little dips of her collar like he wanted to live there. And she would gladly let him, but first... The baby, Bastion. Maggie. Where is she? Sophie has her, he answered after taking a moment to breathe in her scent. She's so beautiful, sweetheart, he added, nearly choking on the words. Just perfect. You did so good. I'm so sorry I missed it. 
The relief was instant, and tension drained from Catherine's shoulders. She did feel a little guilt at Bastion's answer, though. The well-being of Sophie and her other packmates had totally slipped her mind in the overpowering presence of her worry for Maggie. How is Sophie? she asked quietly. Marcus, Zane, and Caleb, of course. Are they okay? They're just fine, he assured. Marcus's wrists are broken and Caleb has a gash on his side that needed stitches, but they'll both be okay. He snorted. Honestly, I think they're both too smitten with the baby to even really notice their injuries. Catherine's throat threatened to balloon shut in the sudden fondness she felt for her packmates. Will you get her? she asked in a small, tinny voice. The baby? Face still buried in the juncture of her neck and shoulder, Bastion nodded. Of course, he agreed, but Catherine could tell it took a lot of effort for him to rip himself away from her. He cupped her cheeks with both hands. I'll be back in a second. Just stay here, okay? Catherine was tempted to ask him where he thought she could possibly go, but realized that the last time someone had left her alone to her own devices, well... She nodded her compliance. Bastion stood, reaching the door in two giant strides. He was gone for less than a minute before returning, with Maggie nestled in his arms. Catherine instinctively reached out for her, and Bastion sat carefully on the edge of the bed before handing her over. Catherine took her, staring at the sleeping babe as she unconsciously snuggled up to her chest. She looked so peaceful, her tiny pink lips puckered in a little O. Oh. We've been feeding her formula since you haven't been able to nurse, Bastion informed her quietly. I hope that's okay. It's fine, Catherine assured softly, barely even hearing Bastion's words. She was completely besotted with Maggie's tiny face. It was already slightly different than when Catherine had last seen her. It helped that Maggie was clean, of course. The patch of feathery hair on her head looked much lighter now that it wasn't covered in bodily fluids. She wasn't quite as wrinkly as before, and her cheeks looked a little fuller. How long have I been unconscious? Catherine asked, glancing at Bastion. Bastion pressed his lips together, the answer obviously upsetting to him. Three days, he said tightly. Catherine was horrified to feel tears threatening to fill her eyes at the answer. She hurriedly blinked them away, feeling stupid for nearly crying. After all, three days wasn't all that long considering the length of time it had taken her to heal from the wounds Cain had inflicted on her a year before. But the guilt of missing out on her daughter's first days out of the womb nagged at her. She knew Maggie hadn't noticed her absence, of course. She was a newborn. What did she care as long as her needs were attended to? Still, as she stared at the little girl in her arms, Catherine resolved to make it up to her, somehow. She looks just like you, Bastion muttered pressing a kiss to Catherine's shoulder as he, too, gazed intently at their baby. I could hardly stand looking at her right away because of it. I asked myself what right I had to enjoy her when you were lying there, covered in bruises and basically comatose. Compassion swelled in her chest. Oh, Bastion, she murmured, carefully cradling Maggie with one arm and using the other to reach for Bastion's hand. She squeezed it as tightly as she could. I missed you so much, he confessed, rubbing a calloused thumb over her knuckles. I missed you too, she whispered, allowing her head to rest on his shoulder. Do you mind if I... he asked, trailing off as he nodded towards the empty space next to her. He wanted to get into bed with her. Catherine blinked. Of course... She wondered why he'd felt the need to ask at all. The answer came to her when he gathered her up in his arms, lying down and throwing one of his legs over hers. He rubbed his callous cheek against hers and gently ran his hand up and down one of her arms. Except for where Maggie lay sandwiched between them, he covered as much of her body with his as possible. He was scenting her. The abrupt realization caused Catherine to stiffen. 
she felt clean. There certainly wasn't blood and dirt sticking to every other inch of her like it had been in the forest three days ago. She could only conclude that she must have been given a bath at some point while she was unconscious. Regardless, at least a hint of Gerard's scent must have still been clinging to her. It made Catherine want to scream. Somehow, she swallowed the urge. She could only imagine what Bastion thought. Gerard's scent mixed with hers, combined with the horrible words he'd spewed in that clearing. Catherine bit her lip before taking a deep breath. Bastion, about the things Gerard said. She trailed off when Bastion's entire body stiffened at the mention of the other man's name. What about them? he asked tersely, his grip on her tightening. They're not true, she assured softly, and despite the fact that her injured hand was wrapped in bandages, Catherine used it to pet Bastion's hair. He was quiet for a long time. You know it wouldn't matter to me if they were, right? He shook his head. That's not right, he retracted, pulling away from her just enough to meet her gaze. Of course it matters to me. I already regret granting that bastard such a swift death. If he... Bastion paused, swallowing. If he touched you the way he said he did, it only gives me more reason to wish I had made his death slower. The and more painful was implied. Bastion kept his eyes trained on hers. But his actions could never change how I see you. Nothing anyone could ever do would change how much I adore you. You don't have to hide anything from me. You know that, right? If Maggie wasn't resting between them, Catherine imagined she would have flung herself at Bastion and never let go. I know that, she said instead. I do. And Gerard, he did... touch me sometimes, she admitted softly. Bastion's grip around her tightened. And the intention to do more was definitely there, she added. Catherine wasn't about to tell him about Gerard's intentions of making her little more than a breeding mare, though. At least not right then. She knew there was only so much the man could handle at once. But he never got the chance, she swiftly assured. Honestly, I think my pregnancy turned him off. He didn't like the proof that another man had been with me. Incredulity-laced anger sparked in Bastion's eyes, but his gaze softened slightly when he glanced at the baby still peacefully snoozing between them. Then I guess I have this little one to thank for your well-being, huh? He muttered. Catherine paused in her answer, another face popping up in her mind. And one other person, she admitted carefully. Bastion frowned. He didn't push, but was obviously waiting for her to elaborate. Her name is Serena. She's, well, she was, Catherine amended, Gerard's cousin. Bastion's eyes widened, and he clenched his jaw so tightly that the veins bulged out of his neck. She's related to that monster, he demanded. Just listen, Catherine begged. Please. Bastion took a deep breath. Go on, he allowed, voice clipped. Serena took care of me from the very beginning. From the moment I woke up in that place, she was there. She went behind Gerard's back to make sure I was fed, she treated my injuries and kept me company. She even stopped Gerard when he tried to... Catherine paused, taking a moment to brace herself. Well, when he tried to rape me, she said bluntly. Bastion flinched at the R word. I'm glad she did all that. Of course I am, he allowed. But did she ever try to get you out of there? Not until the end, after you had invaded, Catherine admitted. He pressed his lips together into a firm, unyielding line. Then what she did wasn't good enough. Part of Catherine agreed, and yet... You have to understand... Gerard has, well, had, been manipulating Serena for her entire life. 
I know it's hard for you to see. It was hard for me to see at first, too. But she's a good person. Catherine remembered Serena's expression when she left her behind in Gerard's hut, frightened but accepting of whatever fate had in store for her. Catherine hoped that the Alphas of Haven Falls didn't blindly attack her. She really hoped Gerard didn't purposely do so. I wonder if she's okay, she murmured aloud. I wish there was a way I could find out. Bastion was quiet for a moment, seeming to be debating something in his head, before finally sighing. That might be easier than you think. He ran an agitated hand through his hair. Your description of Serena, he said, testing her name out on his tongue, fits a lot of people of the Western Colony, victims more than cohorts of Gerard's rule. Half of their camp burned to the ground during their skirmish with us. It left women and children without protection from the harsh winter. He paused, shaking his head like he still couldn't believe what had happened next. The only humane thing to do was allow those who denounced Gerard to come back to Haven Falls with us. Pride swelled in her chest. She knew how hard a decision like that had to have been for Bastion. After all, the last time he'd shown mercy to someone, Melanie, it had come back to bite him. Well, Catherine, really. In the butt. That was very compassionate of you. If any of them even looks at you the wrong way, I'll— I'm not worried, Catherine assured, cutting him off before he could finish what was sure to be a string of threats. So do you think Serena is here, then? Bastion shrugged. Probably. Catherine nodded, the beginnings of an idea coming to fruition in her mind. What do you think about inviting her to join the pack, or live with us, at least? She quickly backtracked at Bastion's expression. Maybe on a trial basis? She was almost as surprised as he was when the suggestion came tumbling out of her mouth. She didn't realize until right then how attached to the girl she'd become. Bastion, for his part, didn't immediately shoot down the idea, although critical would have been a kind way to describe his expression. That's asking a lot, he finally settled on as an answer, or non-answer, as it was. It was asking a lot. Catherine knew it was. Why would Bastion want anyone who had a hand in taking and holding his mate captive, no matter how gentle or unwilling said hand was, anywhere near them or their baby? Besides, he continued, there might not be room. Catherine frowned. What? Why? There were plenty of extra bedrooms upstairs, and it wasn't like Maggie took up a lot of space— She'd be rooming with them for the foreseeable future, in any case. Bastion frowned. I was informed that Marcus had told you. Your parents and sister, they're arriving next week. Catherine froze. Marcus had dumped so much information on her that morning three days ago, not that she hadn't asked him to do it, that she'd completely forgotten that tidbit. And that's okay with you? Catherine hedged. His first meeting with her parents hadn't exactly been ideal. Chad had assaulted her, her mom and dad had kicked Bastion out of the house, and then she'd proceeded to run away with him, all in a matter of twenty-four hours. She remembered her dad's accusing question when she'd warned him she was leaving. Are... are you pregnant? And winced. With Maggie still slumbering between them, Bastion rested his forehead against hers, he offered her a weary sort of grin. How could I deny my daughter the opportunity to know the only living grandparents she has left? Catherine bit her lip. That reminded her. Her name, Margaret Rose. Is it okay? We never got the chance to discuss what we were going to call her. I mean, we didn't even know it was a her, she rambled nervously. But I thought you might like to name her after your mother. I didn't want you to be reminded of painful memories whenever anyone said her name, though, so I figured if she went by Maggie... Bastion cut her off by pressing a finger to her lips. Maggie's perfect, he assured. I love it. She 
would have loved it. And Sophie certainly approves, as far as I can tell, although she's been so busy bragging to anyone that'll listen how she knew the baby was a girl the whole time that I don't think she's even given her name much thought. Catherine allowed an amused smile to pull at her lips. She had a feeling that Sophie would be pleased with her daughter's gender. She also had a feeling that the blonde's shopping hobby was about to become more of an addiction. When Maggie suddenly began to stir, Catherine looked down at the precious baby in her arms. The newborn blinked open her blue, blue eyes. Catherine's small smile transformed into a full-blown grin. She has your eyes, she pointed out quietly. The only way to describe Bastion's expression in response to her comment was a strange smile frown. The corners of his lips were curled up, but his brow was furrowed. How can you tell? I thought that all babies were born with blue eyes. It's not just the color, Catherine argued, though the shade is spot on. It's the kindness and generosity of spirit they exude. Just like yours. Catherine knew it was an incredibly sappy sentiment, but that didn't make it any less true. Besides, she figured she was allowed to be a little corny considering the unbelievable strain she'd been under the past few weeks. The past year and a half, really. I don't know. I haven't been feeling overly kind lately. Bastion's eyes wandered over to the pile of wooden shards in the corner of the room. It was hard for Catherine to comprehend that the gentle hands holding her right then were the same ones that had torn the hand-carved cradle to shreds, the same ones that had violently ripped a man's throat out mere days ago. Catherine pressed her lips together, remembering how Marcus had explained that Bastion's wolf hadn't been far from the surface ever since she'd been kidnapped. She eyed the broken cradle. What happened? she asked softly, though she could figure it out well enough on her own. She just wanted confirmation. Bastion sighed, dragging a hand down his face, and Catherine could tell he was ashamed of the answer. I destroyed it when I found out you were gone, he explained succinctly, not offering any further detail. Regardless, Catherine could imagine his fit of rage well enough. I swear I'll make you a new one. Catherine frowned at the obvious upset in his voice. Hey, it's okay, she assured quietly, and then, in an attempt to lighten the mood, added, I don't think I want her out of my arms for a long time anyway. Bastion tightened his own grip around Catherine, burying his face into her hair. I know the feeling. Catherine allowed herself to sink into the warmth of his embrace. Are you okay now? she asked after a moment. Marcus said your wolf has been in control since, well, since, you know. She was already tired of discussing her kidnapping. Bastion snorted. You're lying in bed, recovering from massive blood loss and having been held in a hostile environment for weeks. You have a nasty burn on your hand and bruises are covering half your body. Yet you're asking me if I'm okay? His voice was saturated in disbelief. Catherine frowned at his depiction of her. Bruises, burns, and blood loss. He made her sound so... bludgeoned. She supposed it wasn't far from the truth. She knew that they had a lot to discuss, not the least of which was how she got all those injuries. Catherine wasn't quite ready to discuss what all she'd gone through when she was held hostage, though. She wanted to savor her reunion with Bastion and Maggie, not dampen the moment by discussing, or even acknowledging, the cruelty she had experienced at Gerard's hands. Well... She pressed after a near minute had passed and he didn't answer her question. Will you be okay? Bastion sighed. She didn't know if the hint of exasperation she heard in the sound was the result of her choice to ignore his half-hearted probing or something else entirely, but his answer was so sweet that she didn't even care. Now that I have you back in my arms, I will be. That was all she needed to hear. 
because despite everything she had been through, as she lay there, enveloped in Bastion's familiar body heat and holding a totally new source of warmth in her arms, perfect little Maggie, Catherine knew that eventually she would be okay too. Chapter 20 Catherine was not okay. It had been an entire month since she'd returned to Haven Falls, an entire month since her mom, dad, and Sam had arrived. If Catherine thought the house had been full before, before she'd been kidnapped, before she'd had Maggie, before her family had come, it was positively overflowing now. Overflowing with love, laundry, sarcasm, hormones, everything. It was, in a word, overwhelming. Shockingly, though, the transition hadn't been nearly as difficult for everyone, her parents, her sister, the pack, as she'd thought it would be. Her dad took to the simplistic outdoor living like a fish to water, his training as a paramedic even earning him a job of sorts as Gabriella's assistant. It had taken Catherine's mother and sister a little longer to warm up to the idea of living without modern commodities like cell phones or the internet. Spending time with Maggie seemed to help, though. For all the anxiety that had gnawed at Catherine about how her mother, especially, would take the fact that her seventeen-year-old daughter was having a baby, once Elaine was able to shake off the fact that not only had Catherine been pregnant, but that she'd already given birth, her mother had accepted Maggie with open arms. Well, after subjecting Catherine to a horrifying demonstration on how condoms were meant to be used, anyway, suffice to say, a banana had been involved. Even her sister, Samantha, seemed charmed by little Maggie, and had engaged Sophie in a silent but highly competitive contest to see who could buy the one-month-old the most extravagant gifts— Catherine was fairly certain that Maggie got more entertainment out of chewing on her tiny fist than any of the fancy toys they'd gotten her, but that didn't stop them from trying. They weren't the only ones enamored with the little girl, either. They all were. It was a constant battle over who got to hold her, rock her, play with her. Even Marcus seemed smitten, and Catherine had caught the pack's patent jackass playing peekaboo with Maggie more than once, using a garishly high-pitched voice and all. Oddly enough, Maggie wasn't the only one that Marcus was fascinated by. His hazel eyes seemed drawn to Sam, of all people. It wasn't that Catherine blamed him. Her sister was gorgeous, a bombshell, even— with her near-perfect figure and stylish bob of platinum blonde hair. But she couldn't be more different from Marcus. Sam was prim and proper, snobbish, even, whereas Marcus was a brutish, rude, rough-around-the-edges... well, jerk, to be honest. Regardless, it became apparent soon enough that his interest was reciprocated. The way they gravitated towards each other was disturbing, to say the least. Watching them interact was akin to catching a glimpse of some bizarre mating ritual on the Discovery Channel, and being too weirdly captivated to look away, even though you desperately wanted to. Catherine watched them trade insult-laced compliments every day, like it was some sort of foreplay. For example— Sam had descended the stairs in a curve-hugging, off-the-shoulder cashmere sweater the other day that had probably cost as much money as Marcus's entire wardrobe. She'd done well in her divorce settlement. Marcus's response? What the hell do you think this is, Blondie? A damn photo op for Vogue or something? Who are you trying to impress? Sam's reply? Certainly not you. Anyway, the last I checked, I'm not the one who wanders around here without a shirt on. Maybe you should think about who it is that you're trying to impress. Or perhaps they were compliment-laced insults. It was hard to tell. Either way, there was an electric sort of sexual tension underlying it all that made Catherine want to simultaneously blush and barf. Attraction bloomed elsewhere as well, although it formed between two much more endearing people. 
Catherine really should have foreseen it. Caleb and Serena. With Bastion's help, it had been easy enough to locate the girl. Like most of the Western Colony's women and children, she had surrendered to his troop when they had invaded, and she had been assigned to stay with whatever pack in Haven Falls was willing to take her in. Serena, along with many others, had wound up with Luther. In fact, in an ironic twist of events, she was currently staying in what used to be Melanie's room with three other women. When Catherine had tracked her down and insisted that she visit, she had the pleasure of seeing Caleb catch sight of Serena for the first time. She'd watched as Caleb's brown eyes widened with a kind of awe she'd never seen in them before. Serena had flushed when she'd noticed him, her tanned cheeks coloring crimson at his dumbstruck expression. The girl had spent the rest of that first visit staring at the floor. At Catherine's request, Serena had shown up the next day, though, and the next, until she spent nearly every day at the Prince House. She progressed from staring at the floor to sneaking peeks at Caleb through her hair to finally being able to look him in the eye. Caleb took Serena's wariness in stride. Despite the flush he often wore in her presence, he constantly made an effort to pull out her chair for her and walk her to the door. After finding out that she'd survived on a very limited diet of raw meat, nuts, and the scant variety of fruits and plants that the Canadian wilderness had to offer, Caleb also insisted on making her a new dish to try every time she visited. It was sickeningly sweet, really, but Catherine got to enjoy the leftovers and wasn't about to complain. Serena didn't know how to accept the positive attention, and usually just quietly allowed Caleb to serve her whatever he wanted. The girl was fascinated by how they lived. Catherine could tell by the enthralled way she would watch Caleb expertly maneuver around the kitchen, but also easily overwhelmed. Catherine understood. She'd only been forced to live in the Western Colony for a handful of weeks, and even she had experienced a bit of culture shock upon returning to Haven Falls. For his part, Bastion had only eyed Serena suspiciously the first few times she visited. It didn't take long for him to realize that she was basically harmless. Catherine hoped that one day he would even be able to see past her relation to Gerard and allow her to join the pack, as Caleb's mate or otherwise, though Catherine was betting on the first scenario. It had taken Serena a while to work up the nerve to ask about Caleb, but eventually she had done just that. She had delivered the question to Catherine a week ago in a hesitant voice, hands clenched nervously in front of her. Does Caleb... I mean, he, he couldn't... He doesn't have a mate, does he? I haven't seen anyone around. Catherine offered the girl a mischievous smile. She'd been waiting for Serena to ask something like that. No, but I happen to know that he's interested in someone... Surprise flashed in Serena's eyes. Oh, followed by disappointment. Of course he is. I'm sure she's wonderful, smart and pretty, of course. She'd have to be to catch his eye. I certainly think so, Catherine agreed, amusement lacing her tone. She's you. Me? Serena repeated, hope tinged disbelief in her voice. I don't know... Do you really think... Serena, Catherine interrupted exasperatedly. It's pretty obvious that he adores you. But why? I'm nothing special. I don't deserve someone like him. Compassion softened her. What you deserve is to be happy. It was a piece of advice that Catherine knew she ought to take herself. After all, she had everything that she'd ever wanted— her first and second families, even Serena, blending together to fit seamlessly into her life. She even had everything she never knew she wanted in the form of little Maggie. Despite it all, though, the fact remained. Catherine wasn't okay. Nightmares plagued her, all of them featuring Gerard. Huge, clawed hands gripping her pregnant belly pinpricks of blood welling around the sharp talons as they dug into her skin. 
the grooves of a booted foot pressed against her cheek. Forceful fingers ripping off the zipper of her jeans. Flames licking at her skin as the smell of charred flesh clogged her nose. A flash of yellow eyes. Some were actual memories, some just figments of her imagination born of fear. But whenever she closed her eyes to sleep, they all jumbled together to make her heart race in terror. Every other night, she would wake up terrified, a film of cold sweat on her forehead and a scream stuck in her throat. And even though Gerard was dead, it was like he wasn't. He even haunted her during the day. Little things would set her off. Marcus would pat her on the head in his usual condescending manner, or Sophie would pull her into an unexpected hug, and Catherine would find herself silently talking herself down from a panic attack. Once, She'd even had to swallow down vomit when Caleb had brought back black cherries from the market. Even as bile had churned in her stomach, though, Catherine didn't want anyone to know. They, everyone, worried about her enough as it was. Bastion worried. The only thing that seemed to calm her during those moments was scooping up Maggie, or snatching her from whoever had inevitably insisted on holding her and hugging the baby to her chest. It was one of the reasons why, with close to a dozen people constantly clamoring for a turn with her, Catherine made it a point to sneak away with Maggie at least a handful of times each day. She would take the time alone to just hold her, to rub her back and smell her hair, to relish that sweet newborn scent that clung to her. Sometimes Catherine would even sing to her, as off-key as her voice was, Maggie seemed to enjoy it, usually offering her a gummy smile when she would try, and fail, to hit any note higher than a C-sharp. She wondered if all mothers felt the same innate connection with their children as she felt with Maggie, or if it was just because of all they'd been through together that Catherine felt so close to her. Either way, holding Maggie had a cathartic effect on Catherine. Her presence chased thoughts of Gerard away, while no one else's did. Not even Bastion's. Out of everyone, he was the hardest to conceal her anxiety from. It was next to impossible to hide her nightmares. She tried to blame her restlessness on the stress of caring for a newborn, but Catherine knew Bastion must have suspected the way she tossed and turned at night was due to something more than that. After all, he'd woken her up from nightmares more than once by peppering kisses on her forehead, her nose, the gentle slope of her chin, her hero in waking and sleeping hours. Whenever it happened, he would wrap his warm arms around her shaking form and hold her. Only once had he questioned her about it. Bad dream? Bastion asked. Catherine pressed her lips together, nodding. Do you remember what it was about? He asked, pulling her trembling form to him and resting his chin on top of her head. Catherine shook her head, burying her face in Bastion's chest so he couldn't see her expression. She remembered enough. Blood, fire, Gerard. But she didn't want to share. Bastion didn't push. He was so understanding. It only made her feel worse for keeping him at arm's length. As embarrassing as it was to admit, she and Bastion had yet to be intimate since she was kidnapped a month and a half ago. It hadn't been such an odd thing right away. She had just given birth. But with each passing day that she didn't allow more than innocent kisses and touches to be exchanged between them, Catherine knew that it was only a matter of time before Bastion questioned her odd behavior. It hadn't been that long ago that she had been begging him to have sex with her for the first time, after all. Catherine wanted to want to have sex, but every time she thought of initiating something with Bastion, she would remember how Gerard's fat tongue had felt invading her mouth, or the way his nails had scraped against her belly as his fingers had dipped into her underwear— the thought of associating Gerard with her sweet Bastion made Catherine sick. She could never do that to him. 
but she couldn't ignore him either. Bastion hadn't complained about their lack of sexual intimacy, but she could still feel his hot gaze on her at night, the way he longingly ran his fingers up and down her arm, or flirted with the hem of the oversized T-shirt she liked to wear to bed. Catherine wasn't sure if he suspected the real reason she was so reluctant to be with him that way. There were excuses abound, after all. Maybe he thought that Catherine was exhausted from caring for a newborn all day. Or maybe he thought she was turned off by the fact that the only thing not overflowing in the prince house was privacy. While both of those things were true, neither were the reason why she was so skittish. It was the pair of yellow eyes that kept flashing in the back of her mind, promising violence and pain. Despite her misgivings, though, Catherine wasn't about to let Gerard control her life, especially not from beyond the grave. She was determined to never let that happen. So she had resolved to do it, literally, it, with Bastion that very night. After all, what better occasion to prove to herself that she could still enjoy sex with her mate without thinking of Gerard than Bastion's birthday? Well, the night before he turned twenty, anyway. Catherine still felt guilty about the man's last birthday. She'd had no idea he was turning nineteen until Sophie had shoved a present under his nose. With no gift to give him herself, Catherine had shamefacedly offered him a kiss. It was nothing compared to the present he had given her a handful of months later on her seventeenth birthday. She cherished the family heirloom he'd given her the golden ring that featured a wolf with sapphires for eyes and a giant glimmering jewel in its mouth. She rarely took it off, and it had been a stroke of pure luck that the simple chain necklace the ring was attached to had irritated her sensitive skin during pregnancy, and she hadn't been wearing the exquisite piece of jewelry when she'd been kidnapped. She didn't know what she would have done if Gerard had snatched it from her along with all the other things he'd tried to take, like her dignity or the sense of control over her own life, for example. Anyway, Catherine was determined to give Bastion a gift that meant just as much. She was going to have sex with him, and she was going to enjoy it, damn it. Which was precisely how Catherine found herself locked in the bathroom, staring into the huge mirror there, as she patiently waited for the telltale sounds of Bastion entering their bedroom. After putting Maggie to bed, Catherine had dug through her underwear drawer, trying on all the different lingerie Sophie had bought for her over the past year and a half, but that she never wore. She couldn't even look at herself in most of the get-ups without flushing red. Eventually, she decided on a modest, lilac-colored bra and panty set. The silky material featured a lace fringe, and was so light it was almost sheer— but it was still one of the more modest pieces of lingerie she'd shimmied on. Looking at her reflection, Catherine thought she looked okay. The color of the silk worked well with her skin, and the bra seemed to amplify what little cleavage she did have. Even though she felt as comfortable as she probably ever would in such fancy underwear, Catherine couldn't quite ignore the way a hundred butterflies seemed to have spontaneously appeared in her stomach their tiny wings beating against her insides as she waited for Bastion to arrive. She knew it was silly to be nervous, but it had been so long since she and Bastion had been intimate that it almost felt like the first time all over again. Catherine was shaking her hair out of the sloppy ponytail it had been contained in all day, allowing the dark tresses to fall in waves around her shoulders, when she heard the bedroom door open. There was the sound of feet shuffling across the floor, and then the bed squeaking under Bastion's weight. Catherine eyed her reflection one last time, her eyes drawn to the faint stretch marks above her hips. Self-consciousness threatened to rear its ugly head, and she knew if she didn't go out there right then, her nerves would get the best of her, and she'd end up changing into the typical dregs she tended to wear to bed. Catherine took a deep breath and then exited the bathroom. Bastion was sitting on the bed when she stepped into the room. 
He'd already flung his shirt off, it lay in a crumpled heap on the floor, and he was bent over at the waist, untying his boots. She stood in front of the bathroom door, clasping her hands behind her back as she patiently waited for him to look up and notice her. She didn't have to wait long. When Bastion glanced up, his entire body stiffened. His pupils threatened to swallow his irises whole as he drank in the sight of her. She tried not to fidget as his eyes wandered up and down her form. What? I mean, that is to say, wow. Catherine blushed at the man's incoherent attempt to form a sentence. Does that mean you like it? she asked, daring to take one step forward and then another, until she was standing right in front of him. A grin pulled at the corner of his mouth. What a silly question, he said, reaching out and resting his hands on her waist. His thumbs gently caressed her exposed hip bones before he pulled her onto his lap. You look beautiful. I mean, you're always beautiful, but this... I mean, may I ask the occasion? Catherine looped her arms around his neck. I thought I'd give you an early birthday present. And what present would that be? He teased, his grin widening into a full-blown smirk as he ran his hands up and down her sides, his feather-light touch tickling her ribcage. She huffed. Me, of course. Bastion laughed before pressing a kiss to her shoulder, and then her neck, his stubble brushing against the sensitive skin of her clavicle. Does that mean I get to unwrap you? He asked dragging his lips against the delicate shell of her ear as he spoke. That is the general idea, Catherine pointed out, her voice just the slightest bit hoarse. He leaned back far enough so he could run his eyes over her again, and she tried not to blush at the obvious scrutiny. I don't know where to start, he admitted. I do. Carefully cupping his cheeks, Catherine pulled him towards her until his face was a mere hair's breadth away from hers, his lips even closer. And then she leaned forward and pressed her mouth to his. What started as a sweet kiss quickly evolved into something more. Bastion's lips moved sensually against hers, and his teeth nipped playfully at her bottom lip before his tongue prodded at it, demanding entrance into her mouth. Catherine obliged. She was rewarded for her hospitality, and heat pooled in her lower belly as Bastion's tongue dominated hers, lapping at the inside of her mouth and leaving Catherine so breathless that she was forced to jerk away from him to take in some much-needed air, before her brain short-circuited from either lack of oxygen or, more likely, overwhelming desire. Bastion wasn't deterred by her retreat in the least, his eager mouth only moving to latch onto the sensitive skin beneath her left ear, dragging his teeth over the indentations of the claiming mark there. A flash of a memory, of someone else's teeth scraping against the mark, made Catherine freeze, her desire suddenly shriveling away into nothing. Despite the warmth radiating from Bastion, she felt suddenly very cold. Bastion's hand yanked down one of the flimsy cups of her bra, and Catherine came careening back down to earth. "'What are you doing?' she asked shakily, as she desperately tried to banish thoughts of Gerard from her mind. "'What does it look like I'm doing?' Bastion teased playfully, brushing his calloused thumb over her pebbled nipple. Catherine stiffened at the sensation. She felt trapped— stuck in a zealous tug-of-war between lust and fear, the present and past, and she clenched her legs around him when he brazenly pinched the pink bud, choking down a sort of sob. She had no chance at disguising her noisy intake of air, though, when Bastion abruptly lowered his head, his mouth capturing her other nipple through the thin fabric of her bra and sucking hard. Her hands latched onto the roots of his hair of their own accord, and even Catherine didn't know what she intended to do, push him away or pull him to her tighter, when he released the tortured nipple with a wet pop, leaving a lewd spot behind on her bra. 
he stared at her with lust-darkened eyes. God, you're so lovely. If Catherine was cold before, her entire body turned to ice as that word, that stupid word, reverberated in her head. Don't cry, lovely. Be good, lovely. You don't have a choice in the matter, lovely. Horrifying memory after horrifying memory compiled in her head, overwhelming Catherine to the point that involuntary tears sprung into her eyes. It was Bastion's turn to freeze when he spotted the suspicious sheen. He palmed either side of her face, brushing his thumbs under her eyes like he was waiting for the tears to fall so he could catch them. What's wrong? He sounded stricken. Catherine didn't know what to do. Squeezing words out of her throat seemed impossible. As it was, it felt like there was a giant weight on her chest, constricting her lungs and making even breathing a challenge. I'm sorry, she managed to wheeze. I... I can't. And refusing to look at him, she leapt from his lap and bolted from the room. She ran into the bathroom, and after slamming the door behind her, she sunk to the tiled floor. Pulling her legs to her chest and squeezing her eyes tightly shut, she rested her head on her knees. Memories assaulted her, and she bit down viciously on the inside of her cheek, hoping the pain would distract her. Oh, lovely. I never said that you'd be willing. But it didn't. She was vaguely aware of Bastion jiggling the doorknob behind her, before he began pounding on the wooden slab that separated them with his fist, the strength behind the blows causing the door to quake against her back. Catherine, what's going on? Are you okay? He sounded close to outright panic himself. Catherine wanted to call out to him, to assure him that she was fine. But the lie wouldn't come. No words would come. They got stuck at the base of her throat with her gathering tears. She had more important things to worry about, anyway, like breathing. She forced herself to suck in a lungful of oxygen, the desperate gasping noise she made sounding frightening to even her own ears. So help me, if you don't open this door in the next ten seconds, I'll break it down. Catherine knew he would, too. After making herself take in two more shaky breaths through her nose, she forced herself to stand. The memory of Gerard, and the panic that had overtaken her, hadn't completely faded. It lingered there, an invisible entity on the edges of her consciousness, but had diminished enough that she, at least, felt in control of herself. Fumbling with the knob, Catherine jerkily opened the door and stepped back into the bedroom. Bastion was upon her within seconds, his strong arms winding themselves around her in a comforting embrace he buried his face in her hair. What's going on? he demanded, as he pressed his nose into the side of her head. Catherine knew she could no longer hide it from him, not after that. She swallowed around the lump in her throat. G Gerard, she attempted feebly, before pausing to compose herself. Gerard used to call me that, she sniffled. Lovely, she clarified. It was some sort of demented nickname. Bastion's grip on her had tightened as soon as the word Gerard had escaped her mouth, and his embrace only grew snugger as she explained what had set her off. Despite the pent-up rage Catherine could feel vibrating under his skin, he didn't sound angry at all when he responded. He sounded defeated. Oh, Catherine, I'm so sorry. She hated it. Don't say that, she snapped. I'm the one who's sorry. She attempted to wrench herself away from him, but he held her fast. Realizing that he wasn't about to let her out of his arms any time soon, Catherine finally allowed herself to sink into him. I don't know what's wrong with me, she muttered tearfully against his chest, desperately trying to hold back a sob. It's been a month, and still it's like he's right there, hanging over me all the time. I can't even get a break in my dreams. He haunts those, too. 
constantly making me relive the worst moments of my life over and over again. Bastion tucked his chin over her head, carefully petting her hair. Sweetheart, why didn't you say anything? She sniffled. Because I didn't, I don't want you to worry. I mean, I just, I don't want you to think that he ruined me or something, she finally blurted, tears leaking from her eyes as the truth burst forth. What? Bastion sounded truly flabbergasted as he took her by the shoulders and pulled back just far enough so that Catherine was forced to look at him. Of course you're not ruined. Is that what you think, Catherine? You are exquisite. You're loyal, caring, so incredibly brave. You embody so many positive attributes that if I stood here and listed them all, we'd be here all night. He rested his forehead against hers. And even if you weren't all those things, I would still love you. Nothing could ever change that. I thought you knew that. Catherine pressed her lips together, fighting back tears for a whole new reason after that little speech. I do know that, she assured softly. He told her it often enough. I guess sometimes when I remember some of the things he did... I just get scared, she admitted quietly. Even though Catherine had purposely omitted his name, Bastion still tensed. He squeezed her shoulders. What can I do? he implored. Just hold me. Of course. Bastion pulled her back into his warm embrace and, scooping her up in his arms, carried her to the bed. He sat on the edge of the mattress Catherine huddled in his lap and did just as she had asked. He held her. He rubbed his hand in soothing circles over her back while she rested against his chest and listened to the reassuring sound of his heartbeat. Catherine silently wiped away the tears threatening to stain her cheeks. This is the worst birthday present ever, she pointed out in a self-deprecating manner after a few minutes had passed. Even worse than last year's. Bastion snorted, pressing a kiss to the crown of her hair. What are you talking about? Last year's present was wonderful. Catherine frowned. Really? she demanded incredulously. All I gave you was a kiss. Clearly you underestimate the power of your kisses, then. It was the best present I've ever received. Well, until now. Catherine fought the urge to roll her eyes. Do you have a daily contest with yourself to see how many corny comments you can make come out of your mouth? Because I think you're setting a record today. He nuzzled her with his nose. It was a wolfish behavior that occasionally emerged even when he was in his human form. Yes, well, I have been told my mouth is very talented, he retorted lightheartedly. She released a surprised bark of laughter. Bastion! A smile pulled at his lips at the sound of her mirth. What? I meant with words, obviously. Obviously, Catherine agreed sarcastically. After she got her giggles under control, Bastion tucked a piece of wayward hair behind her ear. Feeling better? He asked quietly, seriously. Catherine nodded. Yeah. It was the truth. She felt much lighter, like a weight had literally been stripped from her shoulders now that she had told Bastion what had been bothering her, now that he knew she was having a hard time coming to terms with all Gerard had done to her. But still, she sighed. I really am sorry, though. Bastion crinkled his brow. Hey, now. You don't ever have to apologize to me for your feelings. Catherine dug her teeth into the tender flesh of her bottom lip. Even if it means that we can't do anything tonight? Bastion knew very well what she meant by anything. Of course. Catherine shifted uncomfortably in his lap, but forced herself to keep eye contact with him. Even if it means we don't do anything ever... Catherine could tell she had caught him off guard, and he blinked in surprise at what he probably thought was a melodramatic question. 
regardless, when he rested his forehead against hers and answered softly, Even then, she found she believed him. It warmed her from the inside out. And yet, it wasn't what Catherine wanted. She frowned. Maybe if you just— She splayed her hands out over his bare chest, and while continuing to straddle him, Catherine pushed Bastion backward until he was flush against the sheets. Lay back. The muscle in his jaw spasmed when she allowed her fingers to wander the length of his chest. You don't have to do this, he reminded her tightly. I know, she assured softly. I want to. Just keep your hands where they are, okay? It would allow her at least the semblance of control. Bastion offered her a jerky nod. At his compliance, Catherine reinvigorated her efforts to explore his chest. She knew the lines and dips of his muscles well, but that didn't make the way the goosebumps erupted over his taut flesh any less fascinating as her fingers danced over them. He groaned when she took things a step further by leaning over and pressing a chaste kiss to one of his nipples, and then making sure that he was looking at her. He was. His eyes were practically riveted. She began peppering open-mouthed versions of them along the grooved V that disappeared into the waistband of his pants. Catherine, he moaned her name, his hands twitching at his sides. He clenched and unclenched his fingers, clearly yearning to touch her, but even more determined to honor his promise to keep his hands where they were. It was a heady, intoxicating feeling to have that much power over another person. But Catherine would never abuse it. And she knew that Bastion never would either. She trusted him with all of her being. As that particular realization dawned, Catherine placed one more kiss on his heated skin, right on top of the man's hip bone, before crawling up his chest stopping to graze her lips on his bobbing Adam's apple and give it a little nip before she finally reached her destination. She stared into Bastion's dark eyes, so close to him that her lips brushed his as she spoke. Touch me. Please. Like he'd been waiting with bated breath to hear those words, and Catherine supposed he had been, Bastion's hands were tangled in her hair less than a second later, holding her in place as his lips crashed against hers and engaged her in a frenzied battle of the mouths. As he sucked her bottom lip into his mouth, his hands moved down to grip her round the waist, and cradling her carefully against his chest, Bastion flipped them so that it was he who was pinning her to the bed. Ripping his mouth from hers, he lavished attention on her clavicles and the exposed swell of her breasts. Catherine groaned at the feeling of his hot mouth on her skin. Things escalated quickly after that, the desire building between them erupting into a blazing inferno of pure want. The flames grew hotter and hotter with each kiss or touch that Bastion bestowed upon her, until Catherine was half convinced she was on fire. The good kind. Catherine tugged off Bastion's pants, and his hands pulled indiscriminately at whatever scrap of fabric they happened to land on until they were both naked. She could feel the thick length of him pressed against her most intimate place, radiating so much heat that Catherine knew the man must have felt like fire personified. Yet he didn't take her. He just stared at her, his blue eyes searching her green ones. Catherine wondered if he saw the love she had for him swimming in them. Do you want me to stop? He finally asked, and though she could tell it took a lot of effort for him to choke out the question, she knew he'd do just that if Catherine so much as indicated she was uncomfortable. But Catherine didn't want him to stop. She never wanted him to stop. She wanted Bastion to keep being the brooding, stubborn, stupidly overprotective, perfect man he had been since the very first day she had met him. The man who had loved her through everything. Catherine pressed a kiss to the underside of his jaw. Don't you dare. He didn't, and Catherine knew, 
that as long as she wanted him, and she would always want him, he never would. This concludes Luminous by Noelle Marie. Narrated by Sarah Mollo Christensen. Copyright 2016 by Noel Marie. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Noel Marie and was produced in the year 2017 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Noel Marie and was produced in the year 2017 by Tantor Media, Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright thereto. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks and to take advantage of special offers. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.